The guy who was lost on a deserted island with a beautiful girl was lucky to receive a system that helped him analyze everything. The story must have started a few days before that on a luxury yacht. A guy with glasses was proposing to the beauty queen Deep Lamb. Everyone around saw it and cheered enthusiastically, but I don't know if she agreed. This guy is the male lead, who loves watching our survival shows. That day, the sky suddenly rained heavily, creating very strong waves. Everyone panicked and ran inside the ship. Realizing that he could not return in time, Tan Thien chose to grab the buoy and was swept into the water by the storm. When he woke up, he found himself on an island. There was no sign of human habitation, so it must be a deserted island. If nothing happens, it is estimated that the rescue team will find their way here in about five days. Fortunately, there are many coconuts on this island, and living on them can probably last for a week. After collecting them, Tan Thien used a knife to cut them into mouthfuls to refresh himself. The host has awakened. Do you want to open the novice gift? What is this? Stereoscopic lens? Tan Thien curiously clicked on it and received encyclopedias on commonly encountered animals and plants. But the miraculous thing is that this information is directly transmitted to his brain. When he looks at the coconut, detailed information immediately appears. The coconut belongs to the palm family, about 10 meters high. The trunk is rough, usually with ribbed roots. The fruit is round or nearly round, and the core is the endosperm. Hearing a loud noise, Tan Thien immediately ran there and saw that the beauty queen Deep Lamb was being attacked by a snake. Fortunately, it was just a non-venomous water snake of medium to small size. Living in most freshwater areas such as ponds, rice fields, canals. Save me. Tan Thien directly grabbed it with his hand and smashed its head on the coconut tree. You, who are you? You should put on your clothes first. Earlier, Deep Lamb was going to take off her clothes and hang them in the forest. Unexpectedly, this happened. It's really embarrassing. This person is quite upright. Just saved me. Could it be that I have no charm at all? He didn't even look at me. Thank you for just now. My name is Deep Lam, a student at Kwong Dai School. Tan Thien is also a student at Kwong Dai School. Deep Lam was very happy to meet someone who shared her plight, sitting alone and finishing several coconuts. Does she have anything on her that could be used to contact the outside world, like a phone or a recorder? Deep Lam shook her head no, but she remained optimistic, believing that someone would come to rescue her soon. Tonight, Tan Thien planned to build a fire to ward off the snakes and insects. However, the real problem was figuring out how to actually make a fire. Tan Thien and Deep Lam searched the beach for a long time before finding a bottle. Deep Lam intended to throw it away. But fortunately, Tan Thien stopped her just in time. What's so exciting about a plastic bottle? You'll see in a bit. Tan Thien gathered some wood and used the water bottle as a magnifying glass, which generated enough heat to ignite the fire. In the evening, Deep Lam was a bit worried about starving to death, but in reality, there was no need to worry. What are you doing with that? Take a guess. Tan Thien cut open the snake's belly. Don't tell me you plan to grill and eat it? Even if I were starving here, I wouldn't eat a single bite. In fact, having meat on a deserted island is already quite a treat. Tan Thien didn't believe that Deep Lam could resist later on. Snake meat, crispy on the outside and tender on the inside, is truly a delicacy. Deep Lam still tried to ignore it, but after a while she couldn't hold it in any longer. I'll eat it. Do you have any objections? No, no. You were just complaining about it, but now you're eating it as if nothing had happened. Fortunately, thanks to the system, I was able to identify this as a purple flower water snake, otherwise I would have been starving. The sudden appearance of the system shocked Tan Thien. No one else could see this system except him. Host, you get 100 points for making a fire. You can use these points to redeem many useful items in the store. But even the cheapest item here costs 2000 points. It seems that I have to study it slowly. While lying down to sleep, Tan Thien talked to Deep Lamb for a while, but she had already fallen asleep. But she looks really pretty, and she doesn't even guard against me at all. The moon is quite beautiful tonight. While sleeping, Tan Thien suddenly woke up feeling cold all over. Deep Lamb seemed to be the same. Tan Thien went to wake her up, but she misunderstood and thought that Tan Thien wanted to do something to her. I thought you were a man of integrity, but I didn't expect you to be like this. Don't even think about doing anything wrong, even though there are only two of us here. Tan Thien said that this was just a misunderstanding. If you don't want to freeze to death, I suggest you come here and warm yourself by the fire. The temperature difference between day and night is very large. Even if you warm yourself by the fire, it won't warm you up much, especially since you don't have many clothes to wear. If this goes on, we'll freeze to death. Tan Thien suggested to Deep Lamb that they should use their bodies to warm each other up so that they could survive the night. But she refused. The weather was getting colder and colder. Deep Lamb couldn't stand it anymore, so she had to agree with Tan Thien. Close your eyes and don't look. 
Hey, why are you taking off your clothes? Don't the male and female leads in the movie take off all their clothes to fight the cold? Tan Thien said that this was not necessary, unless they were wearing too many clothes. Normally, just hugging each other like this would be warm enough. A long, cold night passed like this. When the sun came up, everything would be much warmer. But the scenery here is really beautiful. Seeing that the seawater had receded, Tan Thien immediately ran out to catch some new sea crabs. After a while, he had collected quite a few. Now all he had to do was clean them up and grill them. Crabs are cold in nature, so eating too much of them will make your stomach feel heavy, especially the shells, so you should eat them in moderation. However, it cannot be denied that their meat is extremely delicious and juicy, just like 18-year-old girls. Later, Tan Thien planned to go into the jungle to build a shelter to avoid the cold wind at night. Deep Lamb didn't like to go into the jungle very much, but there were more trees and materials there that were convenient for building a house, so she had to accept. Before setting off, they had to prepare enough fresh water. Climbing coconut trees is not easy for those who do not have the skills. So Tan Thien tied a belt around his feet to increase friction, but he still felt very tired. After picking the coconuts, Tan Thien cut them all open and poured the water into the bottle. When they left, Deep Lamb brought a few more, but Tan Thien felt that this was unnecessary because drinking too much could cause diarrhea. The two quickly entered the forest and left an SOS sign behind. It was quite hot in the jungle and very uncomfortable because of the plants and grass. The top priority now was to find more water. If there were water snakes here, then there must be water. Wherever there were traces of trampled grass, it was the path of wild animals, and wild animals, like humans, needed to replenish their water supply. Tan Thien and Deep Lamb therefore decided to follow this path. After half a day of tiring travel, Tan Thien suddenly heard the sound of water and rushed over there. Sure enough, the water looked very clean, but no matter how clean it was, it should not be drunk directly. Tan Thien planned to set up the tent a little further away instead of setting it up right here to avoid contact with other wild animals. Also, if it rains and the water rises, it could overflow the banks. So it would be most reasonable to set up the tent in an open area like this. Tan Thien asked Deep Lamb to go and find some large, wide leaves, while he went to dry some firewood and then make a fire. Before the sun sets, I remember that when we first got here, we passed by a patch of newly grown trees with trunks about as wide as my hand, which would be perfect for building a tent. I just don't know what to use to cut them down. Tan Thien had watched many survival shows before, and through them he learned how to use stones to hit each other to create a sharper stone blade. But when he chopped down trees with his bare hands like this, he still felt very weak and it took a lot of time. He chopped hard until it was dark before he finally got a certain amount. Tan Thien, are you back? Ta-da, look what I found. There are not many materials yet, so Tan Thien planned to build a simple sloping tent, using tree bark to tie everything together. The banana leaves only needed to be attached, and then two sharp sticks were driven into the ground, and the tent was complete. Deep Lamb was quite disappointed because the tent looked rather shabby, even the system seemed to mock Tan Thien, giving him 1000 encouragement points. Boiling water in a plastic bottle like this is very dangerous, but it's still much better than dying of thirst. Now they had a tent to shelter from the cold wind at night, but food was still a problem that needed consideration. This place is a bit far from the beach so it's not possible to catch crabs during the tide, and while coconuts provide carbohydrates, they're not filling enough. Going to the banana forest tomorrow seems like the most sensible choice as deep lamb is being attacked by jungle mosquitoes. Being bitten and having swelling and redness for a few days is normal, and it can also cause fever. Tan Thien. Quick, help me. After attracting the mosquitoes towards himself, Tan Thien threw a fresh branch onto the fire to create smoke to drive the mosquitoes away. Tonight is much warmer than last night, so they don't need to huddle together anymore. There are many wild animals in the forest, Tan Thien thinks they should take turns keeping watch, but Deep Lamb has already fallen asleep. Exhausted from the day's activities, Tan Thien ends up keeping watch alone. The call of a bird signals the approach of dawn. Deep Lamb wakes up feeling very refreshed. Tonight it's her turn to keep watch, or else I'll deal with her. I'm sorry, but I was really sleepy last night. You can sleep tonight and I'll keep watch. That's fine. Let's take turns. Before you do anything, you should wash your face to wake yourself up. According to Deep Lamb, the banana forest is not far away. If you follow the stream for a few hundred meters, you will reach it. This red fruit is raspberry, also known as wild strawberry. It belongs to a thorny shrub that grows on mountain slopes, blossoms in two to three months and bears fruit in four to six months. It is effective in invigorating the kidneys, improving eyesight, and relieving hangovers and thirst. Deep Lamb was very happy to see it, but when she ate it, it was very sour. 
In fact, it was sour because it was not ripe yet. This is the banana forest, which belongs to the western banana species. The tree is 3 to 4 meters tall and about 40 centimeters wide, so we don't have to worry about breakfast this morning. Tan Thien tied a rope to a stone and threw it into the banana bunch. I thought you just wanted to pull the banana bunch down, but I didn't expect you to pull the whole tree down. Fortunately the banana leaves are relatively soft. Tan Thien, are you okay? Are you hungry? Have a banana. Get out of the way, are you trying to poison me? Tan Thien peeled the banana and ate it, but it was too hard. The problem is not that it is green or ripe, but that it has too many seeds, which is very different from cultivated bananas, so it is basically inedible. Tan Thien groped around on the banana leaves and sure enough found some banana worms, which contain six times more protein than beef. If you fry them until they are golden brown, they will make your mouth water. Deep Lamb was not afraid of them at all. On the contrary, she ate them very deliciously, much more delicious than snake meat, so she did not resist at all. I was surprised by the banana worms. Don't all the snack shops on the side of the road sell roasted pupae now? I've tried them before. This is a fish trap that Tan Thien just made. Oh, so it's really a fish trap. When I came back just now, I saw quite a few fish in the stream. With this trap, I'm sure I can catch some small fish. Are you just using this plastic bottle? Just this bottle. Put it in the middle of the stream and secure it with rocks. And add some banana whiskers inside as bait. Do you smell something? I think I do smell something. Deep Lamb followed the scent and found a mint plant. Its leaves contain a special essential oil that can be used to repel mosquitoes. Bring some back and plant it around the tent, it will definitely work. This is not too difficult and does not take too much effort. We will definitely be able to sleep well tonight. Tan Thien had just finished making a stone axe when the system rewarded him with 200 points. If he continues like this, he will soon have enough points to exchange for items. It's just an axe, is there any need to be so happy? Deep Lamb and Tan Thien returned to the beach to collect some more coconuts. But they were surprised to find that the coconuts they had picked last time had all been torn in half. Could it be a wild animal like a tiger or a lion? No, my dear. Those two big guys eat meat. Besides, have you ever heard of wild animals drinking coconut water? Look at these marks. They were left by a coconut crab. After following the trail for a while, they both found a coconut tree and saw the coconut crab there. It can be up to one meter long, making it not only the largest land crab but also the largest land arthropod. The pair of large, strong claws that are strong enough to tear open a coconut shell. Today they were lucky to find a coconut crab weighing about one kilogram. Let's go. This coconut crab is edible, but how can we catch it if it doesn't come down? After waiting in ambush for a while, the crab finally jumped down. Quick, quick. The coconut crab is climbing back up now. Don't worry, it can't run away. You look so evil. This crab peels coconuts as easily as peeling bananas. Tan Thien waited until it had finished peeling before he sneakily jumped out and took it, so he wouldn't have to chop the coconut. Damn it, it's so spicy. I just finished peeling one and this little bastard stole it from me. I'm so pissed off I could curse. Come on, come and pinch me. Tan Thien used to tease dogs, but now he's teasing coconut crabs. Now it's time to go into the pot, baby. But it looks like a villain, doesn't it? Tan Thien and Deep Lamb set off to return to the tent. But these coconuts are too heavy. Deep Lamb was tired after walking for a while and couldn't go on. She was a little down because three days had passed and the rescue team still hadn't arrived. However, this was not the time to be sad, but to quickly regain her spirits and continue to survive. And checking the trap at the stream, Tan Thien was surprised to find three small fish, so he simply processed them there and used the entrails as new bait. The advantage of the trap is that you don't have to stand guard, you just need to hope for the best. Host completed the fishing task, received 500 points. Tan Thien has now collected 1000 points, just enough to exchange for items in the store. After returning to the camp, Deep Lamb prepared a barbecue. Tonight's dinner was a coconut crab and three fish, which were very delicious and sweet. Especially the crab meat, even the smallest leg was full of meat. Deep Lamb will be in charge of the night watch tonight. She looked confident, but in fact she was very afraid of wild animals. When she was suddenly touched, she attacked wildly. It's me, it's me. You scared me to death. Tan Thien told Deep Lamb to go to sleep and he would take her place. Otherwise she would be so scared that she would get a concussion. Deep Lamb went to sleep. While sitting idle, Tan Thien boiled some water to warm his stomach and added mint leaves to increase his alertness. Deep Lamb was dreaming in her sleep, sadly shedding tears. She seemed to want to go home very much. If the rescue team still didn't arrive in seven days, she would definitely be desperate. In order to improve the situation, 
Tan Thien used his 2,000 points to exchange for crafting knowledge in the store. With this, he could make many things himself, such as bows and arrows and tiles. The system gave Tan Thien an additional free spin, and what he got from it depended on his luck. After the spin, Tan Thien received the keen talent of a leopard. I'm so happy. I thought my life was going to blossom this time, but I didn't expect it to be only usable once. That's so unlucky. When Deep Lam woke up in the morning, she didn't see Tan Thien anywhere, so she looked around anxiously. It turned out that Tan Thien had just been grilling fish. Deep Lam was going to take a bath in the stream, so she told Tan Thien not to go there under any circumstances. But he thought she wanted to go to the toilet, and told her to bury it properly to avoid polluting the water source. What do you mean, bury it? I'm going to take a bath, just take a bath. Speaking of which, Tan Thien hasn't taken a bath in several days. Why don't I go out there and take a peek at him and then take a bath? There is a horseshoe mushroom growing on this big tree. Although they are not edible, they can be used as bait. On the way to find Tan Thien, he found a few other fruits. But they were beyond the system's knowledge, so he didn't know if they were edible. Rabbit happened to run past Tan Thien. Their top speed can reach up to 70 kilometers per hour. There was no way he could catch up with it. Tan Thien tried to throw a stone axe at it, but missed. The rabbit then ran away very quickly, just like a rabbit walking on two legs. Tan Thien returned to his tent dejectedly. Hearing Deep Lamb's loud cry, he immediately ran over and saw a snake approaching her. But when he grabbed its head, he saw that it was just an eel. Slender body, snake-shaped, can grow up to one meter long, yellowish-brown skin, thick and delicious meat, usually lives in muddy places. Although not poisonous, it is very good at sneaking around. Stay away from me. Okay, okay. I was wondering what to eat just now. Now it's delicious. And this eel is quite big, isn't it? It must be at least one and a half meters long. Deep Lamb had finished bathing by now. Oh my god, I just had a quick look just now. But I have to admit that she is really beautiful. Why do you keep staring at me? I think you're very beautiful. Deep Lamb blushed and hurried back to the tent. Deep Lamb had many suitors before, and she was sick and tired of hearing this kind of praise. But for some reason, she was very happy now. Although eels are not social animals, they probably don't live alone. Tan Thien searched the stream and sure enough found their den. Usually, eel dens have only two holes. Block the lower hole and the eels will have no way to escape. However, it is still not allowed to catch them with your hands, because this could also be a den for water snakes or crabs. If you put your hand in it, you might even lose your life. When Tan Thien was young, he made a mistake once, but fortunately it was just a non-venomous banded krite. If it were summer, it would be different. That is the mating season for eels, and eels will release a large amount of foam in the water after they are pregnant. Based on this, we can know whether there are eels in it. But now it is autumn, so we need to use water grass to test it. Whether it's a snake or an eel, you can eat it all. Seeing that they had taken the bait, Tan Thien pulled it up very hard. After a whole lot of searching, he caught two more. This should be the limit of this stream. Three eels this big, grilled at once, will definitely not be enough to eat. Tan Thien thought of a way to smoke them. The simplest way is to smoke them for three or four hours, which should be enough to preserve them for a few days. Is there anything I can do? You're always busy and I'm just sitting here watching. It doesn't feel very good. Tan Thien showed Deep Lamb how to braid a rope, planning to build a windbreak wall tomorrow. Two fish got caught in the fish trap today, but since they had eels to eat for the next two days, Tan Thien made a stone pool to keep the fish in there for the time being. In the evening, Deep Lamb and Tan Thien were both looking forward to the grilled eel. If you want it to taste good, you have to add some color. Sprinkle a few raspberries on it like he sprinkles salt. Deep Lamb took a bite. The taste of the meat immediately spread, sweet and delicious. A few days passed and the eel meat was all eaten. There are only a few fish left, so Tan Thien hopes to catch a wild rabbit today. Two days ago, he took down the old tent and rebuilt it into a better two-roof tent. To avoid the cold wind at night, Tan Thien guessed that the rabbit's den must be nearby, and it really was nearby. To be exact, it is right under this tree. There is a saying, a cunning rabbit digs three burrows. Tan Thien found it and blocked all of them, but this den actually has five burrows. Tan Thien left two holes open, one for burning fire to blow smoke into, and the other for waiting for the rabbit with his arms around the tree. As soon as it jumped out, Tan Thien grabbed it by the head. But unexpectedly, there was another one. Wild rabbits usually live alone, so this must be a couple, and they even have a few children. Tan Thien caught them all without leaving a single one. Today is really a great day. You know, girls usually like cute things, so Tan Thien planned to go to the stream and process them all. But how can such a cute rabbit be eaten? If you want to eat it, 
you have to raise it until it is big and fat, then there will be more meat. This plot is a bit unreasonable, but it makes sense. Everything has to be raised before it can be eaten. Wild rabbit meat is very fishy, so the blood must be drained before it can be cooked. Even so, when grilled and eaten, it still tastes quite fishy. Tan Thien swallowed it all by himself, leaving the fish for Deep Lamb. Tomorrow is the seventh day, Deep Lamb is very hopeful that the rescue team will arrive, but the situation is still uncertain. What are you doing, Tan Thien? Although there is already a fire, Tan Thien still wants to try a few other methods. Knowing more is not a bad thing. Making fire with two wooden bows, making fire the way the Yak Oil Tribe does, making fire the old-fashioned way, and making fire by shaving wood, there are five main methods in total. The Yak Oil Tribe's method is the most effective but also the most complicated, so using a fire bow would be the best choice. It worked after only a few tries. Isn't that amazing? The next morning, Deep Lamb went to the beach, really believing that the rescue team would arrive. Seeing her so happy, Tan Thien couldn't bear to let her down so he pretended to agree. He prepared some firewood and coconuts, and sat with Deep Lamb waiting until the afternoon. What will happen will happen. Tan Thien, the rescue team is so late, it's almost dark, have they forgotten about us? Or have they given up on us? Tan Thien didn't know what to say anymore. Are we going to die here? Deep Lamb, calm down. Seeing that she couldn't calm down anymore, Tan Thien slapped her. Cry, cry it out. Deep Lamb cried quite loudly, hugging Tan Thien, looking quite affectionate. After the rain, the sky clears up. Oh no, after the dark night, the sky clears up. Deep Lamb fought back against Tan Thien, and even laughed after she was done. You're so cruel. You've made us lose faith in women. The tide is rising and falling. Tan Thien planned to wait here a little longer, waiting for the tide to go down to catch crabs to eat. Deep Lamb, after the sad night yesterday, has returned to normal today. Even if Tan Thien added a few more lines about the rescue team giving up, she didn't feel sad. After all, she could build a boat herself and row back to where she started. What are you looking at me for? The tide is out, let's go and collect some seafood. Who's looking at you? A few hours passed. Deep Lamb and Tan Thien have now returned to the camp. Fortunately, they did. Otherwise there is a high chance that the rabbits would have gnawed through the cage and escaped. The seafood is cooked. Let's eat. You eat first, I'll eat later. Oh, right, keep the scallop shells after you're done eating, don't throw them away. Is it useful? It's not useful for the time being, but it will be useful in the future. In the past few days, the low tide is always at noon, so we can go out and catch some seafood. Noticing that the dark circles under Tan Thien's eyes were quite serious, Deep Lamb decided to stay up all night that night, so that Tan Thien could sleep comfortably until morning. But because of this, she became the one with dark circles under her eyes. Let's rest today, we don't need to do anything else. Okay. Before going to the beach, Tan Thien decided to go into the forest to find some food. But after walking for two hours, he only found a few unknown wild fruits. He thought there would be nothing else today, but then he unexpectedly found a large bamboo forest. In nature, bamboo is known as the all-rounder for construction. It is both hard and flexible, so it is really difficult to cut down. Just cutting down one tree made his hands numb, so today he only brought back this much. Deep lamb was free at home grilling two fish while waiting for Tan Thien to return. Come here quickly, the fish is getting cold. What's this? Grilled fish wrapped in charcoal? Is something wrong? Why aren't you eating? This is too hot, I'm waiting for it to cool down before eating it. How does it taste? Is it delicious? I can tell it's not delicious just by looking at it. But Tan Thien still said, oh, this taste is really exciting. Really? Then I'll try a bite too. The fish tastes very bitter because it's all burnt. Deep Lamb apologized for wasting the food. But in fact, it's not really a waste. Next time just use a smaller fire. This fish can still be eaten, don't waste it. If you can't eat it, then eat the scallops and give me the fish. No, I have to eat it too. She said that, but in the end she still couldn't swallow it. Tan Thien is making a larger fish trap to meet the food demand, while Deep Lamb is cutting the bamboo segments into some water containers. There are three steps to making a fish trap. The first step is to split the bamboo into spokes and then weave the body of the trap alternately above and below. Then turn the remaining part into a funnel shape, making it easy to get in but difficult to get out. After a while, Deep Lamb had finished making the water containers. Tan Thien planned to go to the bamboo forest again tomorrow. I'll go with you too. I can help you more or less. Tan Thien suddenly smiled wickedly, making Deep Lamb regret what she had just said. The bamboo forest is incredibly large. It takes about two hours to walk from the camp to here. Deep Lamb thought that if she built a camp here, it would be very cool, but now food is the main problem. It's not time to move yet. 
Tan Thien handed the knife to Deep Lam, giving her the task of finding young bamboo shoots. This bamboo forest is very large, so there are naturally a lot of bamboo shoots. Deep Lam decided to only take the small bamboo shoots so that they would be easy to carry back. This should be enough to eat for a while. A herd of wild boars suddenly appeared and scared Deep Lam, so she hurriedly ran back to report this to Tan Thien. Are you sure you're not mistaken? I saw it clearly, there were about seven or eight of them. Let's go, we have to leave this place quickly. Although wild boars are not carnivores, they are very aggressive. They are very aggressive animals and have few opponents. In some rare cases they can even bite leopards to death. Faced with their fierce pursuit, Deep Lamb chose to stay behind, not wanting to implicate Tan Thien. But Tan Thien couldn't accept leaving her behind either. He faced the herd of wild boars and roared like a wolf, scaring them away. When wild boars travel in a herd, they are extremely timid, and none of them want to charge forward and suffer. Tan Thien threw the stone axe at their faces, successfully scaring them away with their tails between their legs. I thought we were safe this time, but when Tan Thien went to pick up the axe, he saw a wild boar that had lost its herd, and it had a wound on its body. Oh no, a wild boar that has lost its herd will be terrified, extremely violent. Once it feels that it is in danger, it will immediately fight to the death. Is today the 15th day of the lunar month? Why is it so unlucky? Tan Thien lured the wild boar away to give Deep Lamb a chance to escape. Then he immediately activated the leopard's speed talent, escaping at a speed of 100 kilometers per hour. Even if the wild boar had a rocket on its butt, it wouldn't be able to catch up. But this kind of speed consumes a lot of energy, and it can only last for three minutes at most. That damn pig was so persistent, Tan Thien had no more strength to run, so he had to climb up a tree to hide temporarily. The pig followed the smell and found Tan Thien in the tree, but it couldn't climb trees. It tried to ram the trunk, and although the tree shook violently, it was clear that it would not be easy to knock it down. The wild boar gave up and left. Judging by its appearance, it must weigh about a hundred caddies. If we can kill it and smoke it, we can eat it for at least a month. Seeing that it was so weak, Tan Thien jumped down and provoked the pig. The pig then accelerated and charged forward. When the time was ripe, Tan Thien dodged to one side and the pig stabbed straight into the big tree, its head spinning like a propeller. Seeing that it was not dead yet, he jumped up and stabbed it again in the head. The wild boar tried to resist, but its belly was too big. After a while of struggling, Tan Thien finally finished off the wild boar, but it was too heavy to carry back all at once. Besides, it was already dark. Tan Thien temporarily hid the pig to prevent it from being taken by other wild animals. Deep Lamb had returned to the tent by now, and quickly made another axe and prepared some bags of black ash to throw at the wild boars later. But now it was probably not necessary, because Tan Thien had returned. Are you okay? Are you hurt anywhere? Do I look like I'm hurt? That's great. That's really great. Let's not hug each other anymore. But why are you so wet? Did you just take a bath? Oh, come on, big brother. Why are you taking off your pants? Oh, I see. You want to dry your pants. Tan Thien told Deep Lamb to turn around and look, and then he showed her his dick. Ah, ah, ah. What are you doing? What are you yelling for? I didn't take off my underwear. It's a pity to think about it again. There are so many edible bamboo shoots in the bamboo forest, but they were all taken by the wild boars. Instead of being afraid of them, Tan Thien decided to kill them with a quality bamboo bow and arrow. Early in the morning, Tan Thien ran to the wild boar. Sure enough, he saw that it had been eaten by wild animals. But fortunately there was still a lot of meat left. Tan Thien cut off the front legs first and then rushed back to the tent before the leopard's talent disappeared. Deep Lamb was sharpening a rabbit bone when Tan Thien started startled her and stabbed her in the hand. You trying to scare me to death so you can inherit my fortune? Sorry, sorry. Wow, are these the four big pig legs cut from the pig? It's enough for us to eat for a week, right? If we eat sparingly, it will be no problem for half a month. Tan Thien also specially brought back some pork fat to fry into animal oil. But to fry it, we need a pot. So Tan Thien softened a lump of clay. There are six main ways to make pottery. One is to mold it by hand, two is to form it with clay strands, and three is to use clay sheets. Four is to pull a mold, five is to cast with a mold, and six is to press a mold. Tan Thien felt that method two was the easiest, so he chose it right away. And here is the result, open your eyes and look, does it look like a buffalo's dung? If we compare softness and skill, it is clear that women are much better. Tan Thien was proud of himself after molding a lump of clay, but when he looked at Deep Lamb's product, he was shocked. If we want to make some big pots, we can only hope for Deep Lamb. Tan Thien changed his profession and became a kiln worker to dry the products he had just made. After working for a while, it was already afternoon. Let's continue tomorrow. We've caught quite a few fish these days, not to mention the more than 10 caddies of dried pork left, 
which is enough to eat for a long time. The immediate goal now is to improve our lives. What's the matter? Why are you smiling so brightly? Oh, am I smiling? My clothes are almost torn to pieces. And even if I sew them, it will only be temporary. It seems that I have to do something new in a few days. To make my teeth stronger. Tan Thien came up with the idea of using crushed branches as a toothbrush and charcoal as toothpaste. Although it can't compare to toothpaste, it can still have some effect. Now the two of them are going to start firing pottery. This is really not easy. To be successful, you have to fire it at least five times. Then let it cool slowly to avoid cracking. While Tan Thien was firing, Deep Lam went and molded a few more. Wow, really? I fired for a whole day and only one was successful. To increase the success rate, Tan Thien crushed the fired pottery and mixed it with clay. In the middle of the night, Deep Lam was still trying to mold a few more large jars. After a whole day of firing pottery, Tan Thien gained a lot of experience and was able to fire quite a few successfully. Next day, the weather changed a bit, but it didn't matter. We could still sit and cook pork fat, and then add some clamshells to make soap. Oh, soap? You mean soap? What's the problem? The main component of all clamshells is calcium carbonate. That's what it is, but making soap from it is a complex process. Basically, you have to fire the clamshells and then mix them with charcoal ash to create a yellow solution, and then mix it with pork fat and it's done. A big rainstorm is coming, we have to reinforce the tent quickly. Deep Lamb had just finished taking a bath and thought the soap was very good, although it made her hair a little dry when she used it to wash her hair. This is for you. How did you make this? Thank you. This piece of wild boar skin is for you to process. You have to use a knife to scrape off the fat and meat scraps to prevent it from rotting. Next, Tan Thien decided to make a bamboo bow. Usually, the best material is bamboo that has been dried for two years, to prevent deformation. But on this deserted island, where can we find such a thing? So Tan Thien used fresh bamboo instead. The first step is to shape the bow. The thunder and lightning were roaring, signaling that the rain was coming. Tan Thien and Deep Lamb quickly brought all the important things into the tent. Deep Lamb had some doubts that Tan Thien was hiding his true abilities. Because making soap in this place is not a simple matter. In fact, all the knowledge was given by the system, but Tan Thien did not say it. He said that he just read some random books and learned it. While sleeping, Tan Thien heard a strange sound. So he woke Deep Lamb up, and then the roof was blown off. Tan Thien, what the hell is going on? I don't know, but we're definitely in danger. Tan Thien and Deep Lamb hid in the tree and after a while they saw a herd of animals running past frantically, including a herd of about 20 aggressive wild boars. In addition, there were two badly injured ones, who suddenly fell to the ground and died. I don't know what kind of beast could have caused such terrible wounds. Deep Lamb's body temperature was dropping very quickly, so she felt very cold. We can't just sit here and wait to die. Tan Thien threw his shoes down, successfully scaring away the two wild boars. Now let's go down. I'm ready. You jump down. Then I'll jump. Deep Lamb accidentally slipped and fell straight down, and crushed Tan Thien's face with her grapefruit. Fortunately, there were no injuries. The two young men quickly cleaned up everything. The rabbits had not escaped, but the soap was all ruined. But it could be quickly remade. Give me your underwear. No. Washing them together can save some soap. No, underwear is not allowed. The heavy rain last night caused the stream to rise a lot, so the fish pond was flooded. Fortunately, the fish cage was still there. All the clothes were wet, so Tan Thien had to make a makeshift pair of pants instead. Will the wild boars come again tonight? Even if they come, it doesn't matter. We can totally avoid them because they make so much noise when they run. Deep Lamb and Tan Thien took turns watching over the night, to fight against the wild boars. Tan Thien was determined to finish making the bow tonight. The power of the bow comes from the bow body, not the bowstring. So the bowstring must be elastic. Using the tendons of wild boars is probably the most feasible option at the moment. The bow is now complete. It looks pretty good at first glance. Next, we have to make arrows. After rounding them, they can be put into the fire to sharpen them into sharp arrows. The second way is to use a sharp stone as the tip of the arrow. Obviously this method is better but it also takes more time. Tan Thien was awarded 2000 points by the system after making the bow and arrow. If we add it all up, we now have 11,000 points, which can be used to exchange for the abilities of animals. Although the leopard is very fast, it consumes too much energy. If it is the strength of a buffalo, it will be easier to deal with wild boars, but that's only one-on-one. -on -one. If we're outnumbered, we still have to run. 
it's really hard to decide. Well, let's choose the ability of the leopard. If we're outnumbered, we can still run away with deep lamb. This morning, the two of them cleaned up their living quarters and spent the next two days making enough pottery for everyday use. On the third day, Tan Thien finally had time to practice archery. At first, he was not used to shooting, so he missed all the time. But of course, he became much more accurate after that. On the fourth day, Tan Thien went into the forest to find food and happened to see a tadpole tree. Because there are tadpoles living in the middle of the tree, that's why it's called that. Tan Thien went to the bamboo forest to pick some bamboo shoots to eat. And unexpectedly, he was lucky enough to see a few pheasants. It seems that today we will have chicken soup. Tan Thien thought so, but in reality, it was not so easy. Because his skill level was not high, he shot for a long time but still did not hit. Only when he got closer was he able to succeed and receive 200 more points from the system. And these chickens were too stupid, their reaction to danger was quite slow. Thanks to that, Tan Thien was able to catch two of them, and after returning home, he immediately put them in a pot to make soup. Deep lamb blew and sipped. It's really delicious, the chicken meat is as strong as chicken meat, and it's even more perfect when combined with young bamboo shoots. If there was a little more salt, it would be even better. Oh, I forgot, there's no salt on a desert island. Seeing that she wanted salt so much, Tan Thien had no choice but to follow her. Tomorrow, we will go to the beach to make salt. These chicken feathers can also be used as the tail of an arrow. The sea today is still as salty as yesterday. If you want salt, just boil the seawater until it dries. A pot of seawater with about 200 grams of salt is probably enough to eat for half a month. Now you know why you shouldn't drink seawater. If you want to eat salt, you have to filter it to remove the impurities, otherwise it will taste bitter. If you want to filter it, it's not too difficult. Just dissolve the salt in water and then filter it according to the following formula. It's just that doing it this way is very time consuming. It's already 6 p.m. Deep lamb ate chicken soup and ate all the silk. Well, it's because it's so delicious. It's true that anything with salt tastes much better. But your reaction is too much. 22 days have passed since Tan Thien and Deep Lamb first got lost here. This banana leaf hut is too shabby. Deep Lamb thought it should be rebuilt into a bamboo house or a wooden house for more security, and it could be used as a shelter when attacked by wild animals. Tan Thien also thought so, but we need to move to a better place first. That day, Tan Thien went to find a new campsite. This was really not easy. Tan Thien spent four days exploring before he was lucky enough to find a cave. Because he was afraid that there were wild animals inside, he shot a few arrows into it to see, and then he went in with peace of mind and found a lot of animal bones. The owner of the cave suddenly appeared and attacked Tan Thien. It was a panda. Thanks to the skills of the leopard, Tan Thien was able to escape and gave the panda a bamboo to eat. But strangely, it didn't want to eat and roared angrily at Tan Thien. But after a while, Tan Thien was nowhere to be seen. It turned out that he was hiding in a tree, aiming his arrow straight at the bear. But this was just like scratching an itch to it. Tan Thien had to run away again to distract the bear and then shoot a harder arrow. This time it worked. The bear turned red with anger and slapped Tan Thien. Fortunately he dodged it in time. Otherwise he would have said goodbye to his ancestors. After returning to the hut, Tan Thien told Deep Lamb everything. That panda was very different from modern pandas. To deal with it, Tan Thien planned to melt the belt buckle to make an arrowhead. Add a string to the tail, and you can pull it back after shooting it out. The melting point of iron is 1. 500 degrees Celsius, while the maximum burning temperature of firewood is only 700 degrees Celsius, so if you want to melt iron, you have to make a wind-blowing device. Tan Thien plans to make a rotating wind box, the theory is the same as in the picture. Deep Lamb is not sitting still either, using a knife to make a mold for the arrowhead. Ha ha, if you continue like this, you will have to take off your shirt later. I'm fine, you're not afraid of losing money. Because the temperature is 1500, of course it is very hot, both of them had to try their best to endure it before they could successfully melt the iron. Oh my god, my sister, her soul is gone. After pouring the molten iron into the mold, Tan Thien was awarded 500 more points by the system for completing the iron arrowhead. Now all that's left is to sharpen it. Tan Thien sharpened it overnight. Look at that sleeping face. This is Tan Thien's iron arrowhead after it was completed. He now has 4,700 points. Just enough to buy an animal encyclopedia plus a taming encyclopedia. After confirmation, the information went straight into Tan Thien's head. 
but the taming encyclopedia is a bit strange. When facing a kangaroo, you must be vigilant, wait until it kicks, and then you can slide down and use the big move to penetrate its butt. But this move is a bit strange. The hippopotamus has a large and round body, and its bite force is amazing. It cannot be confronted head on. So when you encounter them, you should immediately go behind them and then slide down the shovel. Attack its balls fiercely and punch it until it is crushed. Chimpanzees are considered to be very strong animals in the wild, but they are extremely easy to deal with. Just provoke it in the face, wait for it to go crazy and rush forward, and then take the opportunity to slide down the shovel, grab the AK-47, and shoot it. Damn it, if I knew who wrote this book, I would have punched him in the balls. Don has broken. After breakfast, Tan Thien set off to the bear's cave, and shot two wooden arrows into it to investigate. The bear was not home at the moment. He turned around and looked back a few times and saw it at his feet. According to the analysis of the animal encyclopedia, this is a primitive panda that first appeared 8,000 years ago. Meat-eating, not vegetarian. In other words, it is a prehistoric creature. The system says it can be tamed in two months, but first it has to be controlled. But if I slide down the shovel and punch the quail egg, forget it. It's better to anesthetize it physically. Tan Thien aimed the arrow straight at the fat bear's leg and then pulled the string back. The bear cried out in pain and tried to chase Tan Thien, but could not catch up, and was shot again by Tan Thien. The plan succeeded, and Tan Thien was exhausted, so he temporarily retreated. In the following days, Tan Thien would come every day to shoot the fat bear in the butt, thinking that the rain would eventually penetrate, but on the fourth day, Tan Thien was suddenly ambushed by the fat bear. Fortunately he dodged it in time. During the fight, an iron arrow was unfortunately damaged, so now only the spare arrow is left. That day, it was raining lightly. Tan Thien wandered in the forest and luckily found a species of poisonous dart frog. A species of frog with a turquoise color on its skin that contains a deadly poison. Thanks to eating ants and poisonous spiders, it has accumulated the ability to cause muscle paralysis and respiratory failure. Good times are coming. The indigenous people often use the poison of this frog to hunt large animals, which also means that it can be used to deal with that fat bear. Seeing that the rain was getting heavier, Tan Thien decided to return to the hut. As soon as he returned, he received a warm hug from Deep Lamb. Sorry, I scared you. Who said I was scared? I was just worried about you. This frog is so beautiful. Isn't it poisonous? Tan Thien said that the more colorful the frog, the stronger the poison. Similar to poisonous mushrooms. Early in the morning, Tan Thien roasted the poisonous frog over a fire, waiting for the poison to come out and then applying it to the prepared arrows. In addition to this, Tan Thien also asked Deep Lamb to make him some more primitive smoke bombs. When he arrived at the fat bear's cave, he threw all of them into it, and the smoke filled the air, making it difficult for the fat bear to breathe, and ran out to chase Tan Thien. After luring it into the jungle, Tan Thien sneaked around and shot a poisonous arrow into the fat bear's butt. It went crazy and attacked again. Tan Thien shot it again. The bear was so badly injured, but it was still so crazy. Fortunately it collapsed at the last minute. An hour passed, two hours passed, three hours passed, and after three hours the fat bear was able to walk again. Early the next morning, Tan Thien brought three fish and some bamboo shoots to the cave, and saw the fat bear lying there sunbathing. It seemed to be as stupid as its descendants today. Tan Thien stuffed the bamboo shoots into the fish and threw it to the bear. The fat bear was still angry with him, and wanted to bite him, but it couldn't move anymore. Seeing the delicious fish, it pounced on it and ate it. Although it didn't look very intelligent, it was very strong in combat. After being tamed, it could definitely become a powerful helper. Hey, fat bear, there's still more. If you want to eat, you should be obedient. The fat bear looked quite happy, probably because it had been starving all night. Tan Thien wanted to give it a name, but he couldn't think of a suitable one. Oh my god, this fat thing is going to sleep after eating. I hope it doesn't get the silver rice effect. It's so stupid. Tan Thien named it Babo, which means stupid in Korean. During dinner, Tan Thien told Deep Lamb about this, but because the name was so bad, Deep Lamb didn't know what to say. She suddenly stopped eating and hugged her stomach, saying it hurt. It must be that time of the month, right? No. Then it's coming soon. Deep Lamb got angry and scolded Tan Thien. Her temper is hot as a fist, and Tan Thien's head swelled up. To solve this problem for Deep Lamb, Tan Thien decided to start making paper tomorrow. When girls are on their period, they can be very irritable. If you don't deal with it quickly, you might get beaten up. The earliest paper in the world was produced during the Eastern Han Dynasty, but the paper at that time was quite crude and of poor quality. Even so, it was a long process to create it. At that time, 
People used to put plants in water and wait for them to rot under the action of microorganisms, then they would scoop them up and put them on a rack to dry and turn them into paper. When Deep Lamb woke up in the morning, she smelled something very smelly. She asked and found out that it was Tan Thien's urine. Do you still have this hobby? Tan Thien said that this is the raw material for making paper, and asked Deep Lamb to help him make a few more racks like that and it would be enough. I still don't understand what Tan Thien is doing, and even if I explained it, I don't think you would understand, so let it be. But roughly speaking, Tan Thien is making paper in a modern way, shortening the time it takes to create it, mixing all sorts of chemical solutions and picking a sufficient amount of grass and then mixing it into the solution. Under the chemical reaction, the grass will quickly turn into a white powder. The next step is to wash it and then add some clean water and stir it well, and then scoop a thin layer onto the rack and dry it in the sun. Host makes paper, get 1000 points. Because there is no bleach, it is a little yellow, and it is rougher and thicker than ordinary paper. Fortunately it is soft and flexible, and it is really good for wiping your butt. Say goodbye to leaves, and your butt doesn't have to suffer anymore. Don't talk about such things while eating. Three days passed, and Tan Thien finally had time to visit Babo today. Oh my god, this fat thing is sleeping again. It was quite alert at first, but when it saw the fish, it turned around very quickly, and sat quite upright. Fish, eat up. Babo, wait a few more days until you get used to it, and I'll feed you grass. Okay, I'm going home now. My wife is waiting at home. Two hours passed, and Tan Thien walked along the stream looking for some ginger. Oh, here it is. Ginger is a perennial herb that is about a few meters tall, and has a long growth cycle. It takes three years to harvest. Ginger has the effect of relieving fatigue, tonifying the kidneys and strengthening the young. This is obvious. Deep Lamb is currently suffering from severe menstrual cramps, which is not usually so painful, but today it is for some reason. In the past, Deep Lamb used to relieve pain by applying hot compresses and then drinking some red tea with eggs. Tan Thien, of course, didn't have any of those things, but he did have some ginger tea. Seeing that he was so kind, Deep Lamb had no reason to refuse. After nearly a month of domesticating Babo, Tan Thien gradually switched it to a vegetarian diet, and it gradually got used to it. Another half a month passed, and today there was only bamboo shoots. Eat quickly, it's very fresh. Babo didn't like it at first, but after eating it, it found it very delicious. The domestication mission seems to have been successful. The system appeared and gave Tan Thien a seal. It has the ability to connect with pets to identify their physical condition. Furthermore, once the connection is successful, the pet will never be able to harm the user. Tan Thien imprinted the seal directly on Babo. That's it. From today on, your name will be Babo, and I will be your master, okay? Today, Tan Thien brought Deep Lamb to meet Babo, and they soon became close friends. Lying like this is quite nice. Besides bamboo shoots, the fat bear can also eat bamboo. But that's only natural, since it is the ancestor of the giant panda. In the near future, Tan Thien plans to move to the cave, so the two of them have packed up all their belongings. It's really hard to leave now, but we have to move on because a bright future awaits us. Night sky is so beautiful tonight. You can see the entire Milky Way with your own eyes. Tan Thien said that it was even more beautiful in his hometown. Since we have Babo now, the two of us don't have to stay up all night anymore, which means we can sleep together. Is there a problem? Do you want to be my girlfriend? Who? Who said I wanted to be your girlfriend? Tan Thien, what are you trying to do? Don't do that, I'm not ready yet. Deep Lamb pretended to resist, but Tan Thien didn't do anything. But it was really frustrating. The fat was right in front of the cat's mouth, but it wouldn't eat it. On the second day of moving to the cave, Tan Thien and Deep Lamb dug up a lot of mud in front of the house to create more necessities. The section of the river near the cave is very wide, but the water is quite shallow and there are no large fish. Tan Thien therefore had to find a deeper section of the river. On the third day, the family went to the bamboo garden to collect bamboo, intending to build a kitchen. Hey, Babo, finish your work before you eat. Time flies, and the house for the two of them is almost finished. After another week of hard work, the kitchen was finally built. Tan Thien has collected quite a few points over the past few days, thanks to which he was able to exchange for an encyclopedia of plants. Let's go. Today I'll take you to get to know the surrounding environment. The river water here is very cool and pleasant. Deep Lamb was happily playing in the water when she accidentally stepped on something and hurt her foot. When she picked it up, she saw that it was a piece of ice jade, but it was actually quartz, which can be used to make glass. Today, 
Tan Thien and Deep Lam decided to go to the upper reaches of the water to look for some more abundant plant species. They hadn't gone far before they found a soapberry tree. Its fruit is very rich in soap, which can be boiled to wash clothes or used to wash hair. Seeing that Deep Lam really wanted it, Tan Thien activated his leopard talent and jumped straight up. In addition to being used to wash hair, the intestines of the soapberry can also be eaten. Tan Thien tied a safety rope and climbed down from each fruit, and then he discovered a sugarcane field in the distance. The two of them quickly went to the sugarcane field. Deep Lam naively touched the sugarcane leaf and ended up cutting her hand. That's only natural, since sugarcane leaves are sharper than razor blades. Tan Thien cut down a stalk. This is red sugarcane. The skin is hard and can break your teeth. It is more suitable for juicing. After returning home, the two of them set about extracting the white pulp from the soapberry fruit. It contains eight essential amino acids, but it's not easy to get out. The shell is hard and it hurts your hands. Let's eat. The soapberry rice is really not bad. It's just a pity that there is too little of it, enough to eat for a few meals. Tan Thien is squeezing sugarcane juice to make sugar. After a busy day, it was finally finished. But before making sugar, it had to be filtered once. Tan Thien, I'm back. Look what I found. Praise me. I spent a lot of time picking it on the way back. Yes, you're very good, super powerful beauty. Tan Thien found quite a few poisonous mushrooms among all these mushrooms. The first is the white poisonous mushroom. When it is young, it is egg-shaped and opens into the shape of an umbrella when it is mature. Its poison can weaken important organs, leading to a mortality rate of 95%. This orange mushroom is a fly-killing mushroom that contains a very strong neurotoxin. And this is a hallucinogenic mushroom. Although it won't kill you if you eat it, it will make you stoned and cause strong hallucinations. This mushroom is a chicken mushroom. It is bright yellow in color, but it is not poisonous and is very rich in vitamin C and carotene. After removing the poisonous mushrooms, only this much was left. In the next few days, Tan Thien plans to make toothpaste and shampoo. The recipe is very easy to understand and you can make it at a glance. Ginger water is too simple. If you want to make coconut oil, you have to squeeze the water out of the coconut rice and then boil it for about 30 minutes. Making peppermint oil is a little more complicated. You have to steam the peppermint leaves. The vapor from that will condense and turn into peppermint oil. All the ingredients are ready. Now just mix them according to the recipe with a ratio of 5 to 5 and you will get toothpaste and shampoo. Deep Lamb missed her shiny hair very much. That night, while sleeping, Tan Thien suddenly woke up when he heard a sinister laugh. Shiny hair shampoo, he 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 he. I'm so scared. I thought it was something. That night, it suddenly started to rain heavily. Babo didn't seem to be very comfortable. He was unusually alert. Tan Thien therefore read his memories and discovered the image of many wild boars. Tan Thien, did you say that the wild boars will really appear again? I don't know, but I have a feeling that if they do, you should stay here obediently. After a while, the wild boars did indeed come. Babo charged up and threw a frying pan into the boar's mouth, but they were quite numerous and immediately used that advantage to fight back, surrounding Babo on all sides. Even so, he did not retreat, roaring, and gave the wild boar a gentle kiss on the back of the neck. Tan Thien did not sit still either, taking his bow and shooting at the wild boars to support Babo. The poisoned arrows paralyzed the wild boars instantly. Tan Thien only had three arrows left, so he had to make sure each arrow was accurate. Three more wild boars were taken down, alarming the others. He then discovered Tan Thien and gave chase, but could not catch up with the leopard's speed. Tan Thien easily shook them off and hid safely in a tree. It was still raining heavily. Faced with Babo's power, the boars were afraid to fight anymore and turned tail and ran away. Calm down, my friend, the battle is over. A total of four wild boars were killed. Deep Lamb and Tan Thien only dragged them into the kitchen at dawn. It would not be finished until evening. Tan Thien temporarily wanted to go into the bamboo forest to collect bamboo shoots to replenish Babo's energy after last night's fierce battle. Seeing that there were too few bamboo shoots on the edge of the bamboo forest, Tan Thien went deeper and then suddenly saw a very frightening sight. The road was clearly marked with a long mark, as if a steamroller had just passed over it. Tan Thien did not dare to be curious, and hurriedly left the bamboo forest. But when he turned around, he saw a giant python right before his eyes. It was a titanoboa, the largest snake ever known and extinct 58 million years ago. The average size can be up to 12 meters long and weigh more than one ton. Run, run, run. Run fast while you still can. I thought it was strange enough that primitive pandas appeared on the island, but I didn't expect to see a giant python now. The system says that the titanoboa does not have any legs but still runs very fast, and is also very strong. 
it seems impossible to escape. So when you encounter this snake, you have to charge straight at it and jump into its mouth. Don't worry, most snakes swallow their food whole. Once you're in, you can use a knife to cut open its stomach and kill the snake. Damn it. I don't believe you. I'd rather run. Seeing a slope, Tan Thien slid straight down to avoid the giant python sight. Unfortunately, the poisoned arrows had run out last night, and it was not certain that they would work on this snake anyway. The current situation is really like a thousand pounds hanging on a thread. It was about to find him. Tan Thien had no choice but to risk jumping out and stabbing the snake's body, causing it to writhe in pain. Although this still could not kill it, it could not bite Tanthine either. After an hour of non-stop movement, the Titanoboa found the wild boar's den, and gave a deadly kiss to any fat and plump one it saw. Tanthine took the opportunity to jump off the snake and run away. In just a few seconds, the wild boar was wrapped so tightly that its bones were crushed. Tanthine was so worried that he slipped and fell into a mud puddle. Fortunately, he was okay but it was still dangerous to continue like this. Tan Thien put his hope in the system, but in the end, he only got a seal. It was really bad luck. The wild boars were still right there. He thought he wouldn't be discovered, but he was discovered the next second. Tan Thien tried to scare it like last time, but it didn't work, so he had to turn around and run away. Seeing the pile of dung right in front of him, Tan Thien jumped into it without hesitation. It smelled so bad, but it was thanks to that that he escaped the wild boar's pursuit. I just didn't expect them to sleep here. Staying in this pile of dung for a long time is no different than putting on a quilt in the middle of summer. It's so hot. Tan Thien planned to wait until near dawn before leaving this place. Seeing the fire from afar, he thought he was hallucinating, but the fire was actually Deep Lamb. Seeing Tan Thien in the dung with the pigs, Deep Lamb rode Babo and rushed over to chase them all away, looking as cool as a warrior goddess. Get out of the way, pig. Don't get hot and sweaty, or you'll get air conditioning. Tan Thien, are you okay? Thanks to you, I'm fine, but I'm very dirty. Don't come near me. Tan Thien was so exhausted that he almost fell down. Embarrassed. I didn't have dinner last night and I'm so hungry that I'm dizzy. It's dangerous at night, we have to leave here quickly. Deep Lamb asked Babo to try a little harder, and take them both back to the hut. Hold me tight, or you'll fall. Oh, oh, hold me if you want. It's not bad. After two hours of traveling, the three of them finally left the bamboo forest and reached the river near the camp. I want to take a shower too. Don't come over here. After escaping the danger, Tan Thien's exhaustion poured out like a flood. Don't want to move anymore but I wonder if she's peeking. After returning to the camp, Deep Lamb couldn't help but lie down on the bed and fall asleep. Tan Thien was so hungry that he went to the kitchen. When he saw the wild boar being gutted, he thought a wild beast had come in. It turned out that Deep Lamb had done it to get lard to make a torch. Tan Thien couldn't believe she was so brave. A sudden pain in his leg caused Tan Thien to collapse. It seemed that he needed to recuperate for a while. Host completed the mission to escape the snake's mouth and received 7,000 points. Tan Thien called Deep Lamb to get up and eat dinner, but she seemed to be very tired, and needed to rest a little longer. Tan Thien was also exhausted now and covered himself with some banana leaves to keep warm. While eating dinner, Tan Thien told Deep Lamb about the Titanoboa. It's really worrying. Will we be in danger here? If the snake wanted to appear, it would have appeared a long time ago. Then what about Babo's food in the future? I only saw traces of it deep in the bamboo forest. If it only operates on the edge of the forest, there should be no problem. Tan Thien thanked Deep Lamb for bravely coming to his rescue yesterday. She looks gentle, but in fact, she is very strong. This morning, Tan Thien had to deal with the pigs before they rotted. But with Deep Lamb's help, he only managed to process one of them in half a day. Pork is not easy to come by. Tan Thien therefore did not miss a thing. He processed everything from the organs to the large bones. After three busy days, Tan Thien was finally able to process all the wild boars. On the fourth day, the smoked meat was suddenly stolen. But strangely, there were no footprints of any animal. Babo was sleeping soundly, so it couldn't have been him. Moreover, when a wild beast approached, it would instinctively sense it. It seemed that he would have to stay up all night tonight to find out the reason. Tan Thien slept until 10 p.m. to prepare for the night watch and then made another bowl of mint porridge to wake himself up. Four wild boars weighed at least 300 pounds, enough to eat for half a year. Not to mention that their skin could be used to make clothes. But first, he needed to figure out what had happened to the meat. Tan Thien stayed up until almost dawn, but still didn't see the meat thief. Just when he thought he would come up empty-handed tonight, a golden eagle suddenly flew down. One meter long body, two meters wingspan, maximum speed of 320 kilometers per hour. Once it finds its prey, it will immediately dive down with its sharp claws straight into the target. The system says there are two ways to tame a golden eagle. 
One is to adopt it from a young age, cultivate feelings, and train it until it is mature. Two is to capture it and make it sleepy until its wildness disappears. Could it be that Yang Guo and Xiaolongnu are also living in seclusion on this island? Oh, brother sculptor, your number is up. When we were eating, the thief was a golden eagle. Yes, it was a very large golden eagle. No wonder it was able to silently take the smoked meat. Tonight, Tan Thien planned to set a trap to catch the golden eagle and then tame it. The structure of the trap will basically be like this. Tan Thien came to the first test, but it seemed that it was not very successful. Trying to press harder, so he was shot in the mouth. Babo, come here. Your thick skin and fat flesh will surely not be injured. It's just that using this much force is a bit too much. It seems that there are still many things to improve. Early the next morning, the golden eagle came again. Seeing the big fish, it swooped down at a speed of 300 kilometers per hour and then fell right into Tan Thien's trap. Tan Thien was in no hurry, waiting for it to struggle until it was exhausted before approaching gently. Is this the golden eagle? This one is so big, it's taller than my waist. Are you sure it's not because I'm short? Oh my. This bear's face looks just like the thief's. Anyway, this eagle is much bigger than the average size. It must not be an ordinary one. By the way, why is it called a golden eagle but its feathers are brown? Well, the tawny eagle doesn't have tawny either. That's right, tawny eagle. Hey, hey, don't tell me you're going to name it Sadeep. The name Sadeep sounds good, but if you call it Brother Sculptor, it will sound like a knockoff. Starting from today, your name will be Sadeep. The eagle showed its anger. Hee hee, it seems that you are very satisfied with this name? Tan Thien tried to put a slave seal on the eagle, but it didn't work because he hadn't tamed it yet. Tan Thien and Deep Lamb planned to take turns torturing the golden eagle all night until it submitted. Deep Lamb will be in charge of the day and Tan Thien will be in charge of the night. At noon on the first day, Brother Sculptor was going to bite the rope to escape, but Truck Dai was still watching. How could he escape? On the night of the second day, Tan Thien successfully created a toothbrush and received 200 points from the system. How is it? It looks good, doesn't it? Let's see how long you can hold out. On the morning of the third day, Brother Sculptor was very sleepy, but the fat bear wouldn't let him sleep. He would be startled by a sudden scare. On the night of the fourth day, the fat bear was knocked on the head by Tan Thien and forced to watch over Brother Sculptor. On the morning of the fifth day, Brother Sculptor was so sleepy that he wanted to pop both of his eyes out. Surrender early and I'll let you sleep. Brother Sculptor couldn't bear it anymore and agreed to bow his head and submit to Tan Thien. Tan Thien immediately linked the slave seal. After the slave seal was activated, the system began to display a message that the host had tamed the golden eagle and received 5,000 points. Next, countless memories of Sa Deep appeared before Tan Thien's eyes. Deep Lamb heard a noise outside and ran out to check. Sa Deep has been tamed just like that? It's even faster than expected. Well, Sa Deep is probably worried about its child. After hearing him say that, Deep Lamb was a little curious why he knew that it had a child. Knowing that he had just spoken faster than he thought, Tan Thien had no choice but to use his eloquent mouth and dance for her to hear. The Golden Eagle's breeding season is usually in the spring and summer. If not unexpectedly, this Sadeep must also have a child. After hearing Tan Thien's eloquent speech, Deep Lamb was delighted and said, That's great. If we can bring Sa Deep's child back to raise, we will have two golden eagles. Seeing that she really believed what he said, Tan Thien suggested, I think so too. So I plan to take a day off today and let Sa Deep take us to its home tomorrow. After saying that, Tan Thien reached out his hand for Sa Deep to perch on. Seeing Sa Deep perched on Tan Thien's hand was also a bit cool, making Deep Lamb a little curious, plus a little itchy hand that wanted to touch its feathers. But before her hand could touch it, Sa Deep called out, making little Lamb scared to sweat and say, Why can you pet it but I can't? Couldn't we tame it together? Hearing her say that, Tan Thien could only answer vaguely. Maybe because in the end the Golden Eagle submitted to me. Deep Lamb was angry when she heard Tan Thien's lame reason. What kind of aesthetics is that? You just stand there and watch me. After a while, the roller coaster left, and the little girl came back with two fish hanging in her hand, making Sa Deep look at it and think to itself that it was really fun to betray the master. Tan Thien looked at the golden eagle that had just been tamed and thought speechlessly. The golden eagle is so heroic, but it walks like a hen. It's not wrong to call you Sa Deep. After a day of rest, Tan Thien and Deep Lamb were refreshed. Early in the morning, they immediately prepared their belongings for a long journey. Through the slave beast's seal, 
Tan Thien learned that Sa Deep's children had unfortunately fallen from the nest. Although they were not dead, they had fallen into a crevice in the cliff. During this time, it wasn't that the golden eagle didn't try to save them, but because its body was too big to fit into the crevice, it could only guard it every day. Sa Deep had left enough food for its children beforehand, so there was no need to worry about them starving to death. But the young bird's feathers and wings had not yet grown enough to withstand the cold and damp night temperatures. If it rained on the island during this time, the young birds would surely die. Therefore, Tan Thien and the others needed to get there quickly. But after a whole day's journey, they were still in the forest. Seeing that the sun was starting to set, Tan Thien and the others decided to stop and rest to eat. After lighting a fire, Tan Thien began to sprinkle quicklime made from seashell powder around the area. This powder could repel insects to a certain extent. Although the effect was not as good as Realgar, it was better than nothing. The food was also cooked. The two of them ate together. While eating, Deep Lamb talked about the size of this forest. It was really too big. They had been walking for a whole day but had not yet reached the outside. Hearing Deep Lamb say this, Tan Thien also sat down and pondered. The average walking speed is about 4,000 meters per day, and in 10 hours, you can walk at least 40 kilometers. Although Deep Lamb and I have luggage on us, and the forest road is relatively slow. But even so, we should have walked at least 20 kilometers today, so this forest is extremely large. Just a forest is already this big, so the island that carries it will be much larger. Such a large island, but the rescue team can't find it, or rather, there is such a large island in the world that has not been discovered. Deep Lamb saw that he was so engrossed in his thoughts that he couldn't help but ask curiously, what are you thinking? Hearing Deep Lamb ask curiously, Tan Thien didn't forget to seize the opportunity to scare her. I'm thinking if we might encounter wild beasts. Oh my, how could you have thought of that? Well, we've already eaten, and it's already dark, so the two of them took the opportunity to rest by the fire. Just as he was dreaming that he had won the Viet Lot, a sudden noise startled Tan Thien awake. Both of them woke up and turned to see Babo growling at something in the forest. In the darkness, many glowing green dots were staring at them. Oh no, Tan Thien, it's not good. It's wild wolves. Deep Lamb said in a panic when she saw them approaching. Seeing her panic, Tan Thien reassured her, don't panic. With Babo here, they won't dare to attack us. No way. Babo was angry when he saw them coming over at night and staring at him, and he roared. Seeing this, Tan Thien had just finished reassuring her when he had to turn around and calm the panda down. Wolves are cooperative animals, unlike pigs that don't take a bath and just charge forward. If we were to rank them by their power, Babo, with his thick skin and fat body, would be equivalent to a tank. Deep Lamb and I would be equivalent to a gunner and a support, and the wolves would be equivalent to warriors. If Babo, the tank, were to leave, Deep Lamb and I would always be ambushed by the wild wolves and die. Unfortunately, Sa Deep is blind at night, otherwise we wouldn't have to be so afraid of these wolves. In the midst of the tension, suddenly a wolf approached the fire and then suddenly retreated in fear. Seeing this, Tan Thien told Deep Lamb to light a torch because wild beasts are afraid of fire. The wolves did not dare to approach easily, partly because they were afraid of Babo, and partly because they were afraid of the fire and being tricked. After thinking it over, the two of them took torches in their hands, and Tan Thien took the initiative to throw the torch towards the wolves. The wolf cub saw a strange object that was both bright and hot flying towards them, and they huddled back in a panic. Seizing the opportunity, Tan Thien ordered Babo to charge forward and fight them to the death. In the midst of the excitement, the bear roared, and the wolves in front of him ran away on all fours. Seeing that the wolves had left, the two of them dared to sit down and catch their breath. After that, Tan Thien and the others quickly packed up their belongings and left that night to avoid the wolves coming back to check on them. After a night of trekking through the forest, they finally made it out of the forest. Seeing Sa Deep in a hurry, Deep Lamb couldn't help but ask curiously, is its nest nearby? It must be eager to go back and see how its children are doing. After saying that, the two people and one bear continued to head towards the direction where Sa Deep was flying. After a while of climbing, Deep Lamb felt that her body was starting to recover. This mountain is really too steep. I can't even breathe, so how can I climb? Seeing that Deep Lamb was about to burn all the calories in her body, Han Thien had no choice but to tell her to stay here with Babo and rest, while he would continue to climb up. The mountain had also changed from steep to vertical. Tan Thien was struggling to climb up. Suddenly, the rock that his hand was holding onto broke. Fortunately, with the help of the gods above and his own quick reaction, he was able to avoid falling down the mountain. After a while of rolling and crawling, Tan Thien finally climbed to the top of the mountain. Looking down from above, Tan Thien could see the vastness of this island. 
But after standing there for a while and looking around, his eyes fell on a volcano. At the foot of the volcano, there were trees growing, so it must be an extinct volcano that had not erupted for many years. In the short term, there was no need to worry. The volcano's mineral resources and terrain were rich, and he would have the opportunity to go over and take a look. However, before Tan Thien could finish thinking about the wonders of this island, Sa Deep called out to wake its master up. Well, he had thought about it enough. They returned to their main mission of rescuing the baby bird. The baby bird's location was extremely steep. Unless he had professional tools, Tan Thien would not be able to climb down to save the baby bird. But even with professional tools, Tan Thien would not risk climbing down because he had a better way, enslaving beasts. Tan Thien could communicate simply with Sa Deep. He told Sa Deep to tell the baby bird to bite on the rope, and then he could pull the baby bird up from the crevice. After waiting for the right moment, Tan Thien finally pulled the baby bird up. The size of this bird also surprised Tan Thien. It was indeed the king of birds of prey. Even the baby bird was so big. Well, the mission to rescue the baby bird was complete. Tan Thien held the baby bird in his arms and climbed down. After a while of struggling and crawling, Tan Thien finally landed safely. This was truly a terrifying experience that he did not want to try again. But wait, stop for about two seconds. Where are Deep Lamb and Babo? After Tan Thien turned around, Deep Lamb and Babo were no longer there. After standing there for a while and observing, Tan Thien saw that Deep Lamb had left a message on the ground for him. It turned out that she and Babo had gone to look for resources. It just so happened that he was a little tired. He could rest for a while before Deep Lamb returned. After a while, Deep Lamb returned riding Babo. Looking at the worsening weather, it seemed like it was going to rain soon. Seeing that it was about to rain heavily, Tan Thien told everyone to leave quickly, in case the heavy rain caused a landslide, which would be very dangerous. After hearing what Tan Thien said, Deep Lamb panicked and shouted, Tan, Tan Thien, look over there. It's a plane. The plane looks like it's in trouble. The two of them rushed towards the direction it was falling. The plane was falling faster and faster, which made Deep Lamb even more frightened, and she said, Is something wrong? I don't see any explosions. Are the people on the plane okay, Tan Thien? What should we do? Seeing her panic, Tan Thien reassured Deep Lamb as they ran. Calm down. No matter what, let's go over there first and then figure it out. On this deserted island, the sudden appearance of a plane means something, and it goes without saying. It's no wonder that Deep Lamb lost control like that. After running until they were exhausted, Tan Thien and his group stopped in front of a cliff. There was no way to go from here. Seeing that the situation was not good, Tan Thien had no choice but to suppress his fatigue and turn to Deep Lamb to tell her to stop temporarily to think of a strategy before setting off again. After saying that, Tan Thien took a branch and drew a simple map of the location on the ground. This rock is our location. The X marks the spot where the plane crashed, and the O is our camp. We have enough food for now to sustain us. We will have plenty left over when we return to camp. But if we take a detour to the plane crash site to investigate, it is not certain whether the remaining food will be enough to sustain us until we return to camp. After hearing Tan Thien say this, Deep Lamb suggested that everyone return to camp together first and then make a plan later. But that's not certain either. Maybe it won't work for two people, but what if we do this? Deep Lamb looked at him drawing and scribbling and understood Tan Thien's idea. We will go together for a while. And then he will go alone to the plane crash site. Tan Thien saw that Deep Lamb not only had a beautiful heart but also a very quick mind. So he nodded like a bobblehead and said, That's right. If I go alone, the remaining food will definitely be enough. But can you return to camp by yourself halfway? Seeing that Tan Thien was afraid that she would get lost like the green-haired guy with three swords, Little Lamb became angry and thought, Don't challenge a rich person to eat soy sauce. After that, they traveled together until evening and stopped to rest under a tree. Looking at the cute baby bird, Deep Lamb asked, Tan Thien, didn't you say that you were going to raise this baby bird? It's not just about raising it. You have to make it understand your commands. Well, let's not think about that for now. Let's think about what to call it. Hearing Deep Lamb hit the nail on the head, Tan Thien lay down and propped his head up with his hand. He was quick-witted and scratched the right spot. How about we call it Little Sa Deep? Deep Lamb was furious when she heard Tan Thien's ridiculous name. What the hell? Sa Deep is your head. Let's call this one Little White. Our Little White can't have such a strange name. Tan Thien was so upset when he heard her say that his name was strange that he muttered, Babo. The name Sa Diu sounds so distinguished, 
She's a girl so she wouldn't understand my high-end Gucci style. The next morning, Deep Lamb took out a white block from a bamboo tube for Tanthine to carve. This is pine resin. Where did you get it? I collected it from the pine trees on the mountain yesterday. Then I hurried on my way and didn't have time to tell you. This could probably be used to make torches, right? Tan Thien, hearing her say this, happily took the bamboo tube and left. After setting off alone, Tan Thien would use his innate talent every hour. Heading north, he ran until noon before slowing down to move for a while. Tan Thien stopped and thought, although the weather changed yesterday, in the end, it didn't rain, so why is the ground here so damp? It's not normal at all. Then Tan Thien ordered Sa Diu to fly ahead to scout the path. Thanks to the beast seal, he could synchronize his view with that of Sa Diu, so there was no fear of encountering anything too strange. It's not clear, there's a lot of water ahead, could it be a lake or a river ahead? Well, it's still best to go and see for myself. Moving a bit further, in front of Tan Thien was a swamp in the forest. Seeing that the situation was not very good, Tan Thien decided to take a detour. Although it was a bit far, the safety factor would be the highest. However, no matter which direction Tan Thien went, he still encountered swamps. After walking around in the forest for a while, Tan Thien began to feel his calories decreasing faster than usual. Furthermore, the number of mosquitoes in the swamp was unimaginable. If they were bitten, scratching them randomly could cause infection. So, he had to leave the swamp before nightfall. He definitely couldn't stay here overnight. Water in the lake had not flowed for a long time, so a large number of bacteria had grown. If his feet were soaked in water for a long time, it would be easy for bacteria to infect them. Tan Thien had no choice but to wade through the water in places where he couldn't go around. After a while of struggling, he finally made it through but in return, the temperature became hotter and hotter. Yesterday, the sky was full of dark clouds, but in the end, not a single drop of rain fell. It was really strange. Tan Thien was busy drinking water to regain his strength when he suddenly noticed that the vines in front of him were a bit strange. Ah, mung bean. It turned out that the vines were not vines but a green snake in disguise. Tan Thien thought that after this, he would be able to ascend to the level of walking on clouds and returning to the wind and tell the king of hell how he had leveled up. But Sa Deep was quick to rush to her master's rescue. The system then popped up and explained that the Chuck Deep Tan is a type of snake, belonging to the green bamboo snake family. It has a large head, a thin neck, and a green body. It usually hangs or wraps itself around tree branches and eats animals such as frogs, lizards, birds, and small mammals. It is aggressive and venomous. And it's poisonous. Tan Thien broke out in a cold sweat after hearing the system's announcement and thought to himself that this green snake was no different from a vine. It was completely indistinguishable. Well, I should still get out of this swamp as soon as possible. After a while of riding through the lake, Tan Thien finally made it to the shore and continued to use his talent. If the road ahead could be kept in its current current condition, he would probably be able to reach the plane crash site before sunset. However, while he was happily flying down the road, Tan Thien suddenly stepped on a swamp. In an instant, he sank almost halfway down. But no matter what, he had to stay calm. The swamp had the same properties as quicksand in the desert. Once you fall into it, the more you struggle, the faster you sink. Unless you are sure that you can escape, you should never struggle randomly. Thinking of this, Tan Thien lay on his back to minimize the speed at which his body sank. He then ordered Sa Deep to find some branches for him, the longer the better. At the current speed, Tan Thien had about two hours before his body would sink completely. So, he was sure that he still had a chance to return to the group. After a while of flying around looking for things, Sa Deep finally brought Tan Thien two or three branches. Tan Thien then used a rope to tie the branches together to form a raft. Because the swamp was a sheer thickening fluid, a type of non-Newtonian fluid, this type of fluid yields to a force but becomes more solid when enough force is applied. Therefore, as long as enough pressure was applied to a certain area of the swamp, the swamp would become as hard as the ground in an instant. After an hour of clenching his buttocks and crawling, Tan Thien finally escaped from the swamp. This swamp really didn't look any different from the outside. Before you have a plan, you should never go forward. Suddenly, Tan Thien remembered the movie The Great Con Artist that he had stayed up all night to watch without his parents' knowledge. In the movie, there was a scene where Yang Guo crossed a swamp. Thinking of this, he took out the wooden stick and chose the eight thickest ones. He then used a knife to flatten them. Then she tied four sticks together into a bundle and spread them under her feet. That way, Tan Thien could stand on the surface of the swamp without sinking. This method was like a ski, increasing the bearing surface area and distributing his weight, allowing him to slide quickly on the surface of the swamp. After sliding for a while, Tan Thien saw the crash site of the plane in front of him. There was a foreign girl on the plane. 
After checking her location, she finally remembered. During the flight, we encountered a storm, and the plane lost control and was caught in a turbulent current. Fortunately, before the plane crashed, I managed to pull it up a bit higher. All the machinery was broken, and I was lucky not to get hurt. After knowing that she had landed safely, but the plane was completely damaged, the blonde girl asked for help. However, no one answered or appeared even though she had shouted until her throat was sore. It made sense. There was no one in such a remote place. The sun was about to set. It was better to stay in the plane for safety tonight. But before she could climb into the plane, she heard a noise behind her. The blonde girl turned around subconsciously, and then asked if anyone was there. Switch scenes to this side. Tan Thien finally got out of the swamp. He kept calling out to see if anyone was there. It had been so long since the plane crash. If the pilot had been injured, he would be in critical condition by now. So it was imperative to find the crash site quickly. Suddenly, Tan Thien received a notification from Sadeep. Xiao Bai had heard something nearby. The man and the bird quickly ran forward. It really is here. Is anyone there? Is anyone there? After a few calls but no response, Tan Thien ran towards the plane. He checked the cockpit but there was no sign of the pilot's blood. He must have just left temporarily. Although the plane looked new, its model seemed old. It didn't seem to have a radio to communicate with the outside world. However, before Tan Thien could finish thinking, he heard a sound from behind him, causing him to turn around. He then saw a blonde girl running towards him as fast as she could. When the blonde girl saw someone in front of her, she shouted in fear, run there's a crocodile behind you. The system also popped up a notification that this was a marsh crocodile, a species of crocodile belonging to Crocodilus, which grows to a length of 4 to 5 meters and weighs up to 1 ton when fully grown. It usually crawls on its belly but can also walk on its legs. Large individuals can reach speeds of 16 kilometers per hour. They swim underwater by moving their body and tail, and can reach speeds of up to 32 kilometers per hour but cannot maintain this speed for long periods of time. In addition to swamps, marsh crocodiles also live in rivers, ponds, and other wetlands. They prefer to move in shallow water less than 5 meters deep. Seeing that the situation was not looking good, Tan Thien quickly jumped into the plane and reached out to pull her up with him. However, his movement to get into the plane was a bit hasty, causing the blonde girl to lose her balance. She had no choice but to use her two large breasts to press down on Tan Thien to regain her balance. The crocodile below saw that the distance between the avatar and the grapefruit was still a bit far so it conveniently flicked its tail and slammed it into the fuselage of the plane, helping the avatar and the large breasts to get closer together. Tan Thien also enjoyed the collision, but he couldn't help but worry about the fact that the two of them were now completely surrounded by crocodiles. Looking at the situation in front of him, Tan Thien couldn't help but worry and wonder why these crocodiles were so aggressive, directly hitting the plane. If this continued, it would not be good. Thinking of this, Tan Thien quickly raised his bow and shot an arrow at a crocodile in front. However, the stone arrow had just hit its target when it was bounced away. The crocodile saw that his shot was like a mosquito bite on stainless steel, and immediately wanted him to shoot a few more itchy spots on its body. Tan Thien saw that this crocodile's skin was so thick and its flesh so fat that he had no choice but to change his target to their eyes. However, with his bazooka shooting skills, he would have to draw a black dot in the middle of his screen to hit the crocodile's eye. It really is as thick as a cow's hide. Not only did it not create any wounds, it also made them even more ferocious. If they continued to smash like this, the plane would be smashed to pieces in no more than 15 minutes. Thinking of this, Tan Thien had no choice but to entrust his life to the system to save him. During this time, he hadn't bought anything, so he had accumulated 12 points in the system. 700 points. Although it was enough to exchange for a talent, I still didn't use it because each talent is an insurance card, and I only know which one is the most effective when I am in real danger. With the current situation, it is the blessing of the centaur that is related to accurate archery. Suddenly, the blonde girl took out some alcohol and a lighter and told Tan Thien to use it to burn the crocodiles. Tan Thien was afraid that she would use it incorrectly and cause danger, so he had to remind her. However, with her ability to barely speak a sentence of how are you after five years of elementary school and four years of high school, and I am fine thank you and you, the blonde girl couldn't help but wonder which village this native was from. So she just said, give me the fire, to make it short and sweet. Sure enough, she understood and threw the lighter to him. With the lighter in hand, Tan Thien began to summon the system and exchange his talent points for the centaur's blessing. After a while of synchronizing the skill, the system popped up a notification that the host had successfully received the talent. Tan Thien was a little surprised when he heard that he had completed the process. Is it done? Last time when I received the talent of the agile blue leopard, 
I could clearly feel it, and my body changed. But now, I don't feel anything at all. Is the system cheating me? However, before he could finish thinking, the crocodiles attacked with even greater intensity. Well, it's better to save oneself than to save others. Then Tan Thien applied rosin to the tip of the arrow and used the lighter to light it into a flaming arrow. Although the arrow itself was not powerful enough, it was a different story when combined with fire. The fire was as bright as the lights of a city at night. Tan Thien pointed his bow forward and used his talent to aim. At this moment, a target, coordinates, wind direction, and other things appeared before his eyes, causing Tan Thien to be surprised and think. Is this the effect of the centaur's blessing? It's really like a shooting game. After aiming, the ruler next to it represented the current force being used and the force that needed to be reached. The wind speed represented the necessary angle of stability. If all the conditions were met, then it would be easy to hit the target. Every arrow that Tan Thien shot hit its target without fail not even missing by a hair's breadth. Seeing that Tan Thien was such a good archer, the blonde girl stood by and kept feeding him fire and arrows. The fifth one, then the sixth, the sixth, then the seventh, but before the eighth one could appear, the crocodiles that had been hit by Tan Thien's arrows had all burned to a crisp. Oh yeah, you're really the hero of my heart. Looking at how happy the blonde girl was, Tan Thien had no choice but to suppress his fatigue and turn to introduce himself and ask for her contact information. Hearing the hero ask for her contact information, the girl replied, my name is Jessica. Is there anyone else besides us? However, Tan Thien's English was limited, so he couldn't understand everything the girl said. Seeing that the hero didn't seem to understand everything she said, Jessica quickly asked him if he understood any other languages, such as Japanese or Korean. Could he be Chinese? But all the Chinese people I've met have very long braids. Do you have a mobile phone? Jessica asked Tan Thien. She wondered if he was asking for a phone. However, there were no phone lines here, so what good would it do to have a phone? After the two of them had been speaking in broken English for a while without understanding each other, it got dark, so they both sat down to rest and eat. Knowing that the hero had nothing to eat, Jessica gave him a box of ready-to-eat food. However, she had to open the box for him, as it was very rare. The food in the box looked very nutritious. But what did the year and month on the food box mean? Jessica saw that he was staring at the box and not eating, so she turned to ask him if there was a problem. However, because Tan Thien's English was limited, he couldn't ask her if the food in the box was still edible. Tan Thien watched her eat the food with relish, so he took a bite himself. At first, he thought it wouldn't taste good, but to his surprise, it was incredibly delicious. The taste was very ordinary. Could it be that the date on the box was not the production date? Well, the food had already been eaten. And after a tiring day, the two of them decided to sleep in the plane for the night to regain their strength. After a night's sleep, it was already morning. When Tan Thien woke up, Jessica was cooking breakfast. In her hands was a backpack from which she took out all sorts of things, just like Doraemon's magic pocket. Well, if she's so kind, I should do my part. Thinking of this, Tan Thien took out a piece of pork from somewhere and gave it to her to cook pork soup. After drinking the pork soup, Tan Thien and Jessica had fully recovered. Although Jessica had many questions to ask, Tan Thien could only understand a few simple words and didn't understand what she was saying. On the other hand, Tan Thien drew a map and told Jessica about their camp and the island while drawing. Tan Thien thought that Yi Lin would definitely be able to talk to Jessica, so he invited Jessica to the camp. Jessica felt that there would be safety in numbers, so she immediately agreed happily. As the two of them were about to leave, Jessica suddenly spotted a golden eagle flying overhead. Seeing it swooping towards Tan Thien, she was so frightened that she shouted to warn him. But just two seconds later, Jessica was surprised to see that this golden eagle was the hero's pet. As the two of them walked forward, the fog in the swamp suddenly became so thick that even Sadai couldn't see clearly what was ahead. Suddenly, Jessica felt that something was wrong with her body, so she told Tan Thien to stop and rest for a while. The two of them sat down to rest and drink some water. Suddenly, Jessica passed out. Before Tan Thien could figure out what was going on, he himself began to experience a headache and dizziness, but no nausea. Could it be caused by this white bone? Thinking of this, Tan Thien crawled towards Jessica to see if she was okay, but judging from her condition, it was obvious that she was not. Tan Thien tried his best to think with both hemispheres of his brain, and suddenly he realized that although Jessica was still unconscious, her condition seemed to be better than before. His hands were no longer weak. Thinking of this, Tan Thien borrowed Jessica's lighter to experiment. Fortunately, with his centaur talent, he was able to throw it accurately at a rock in the distance. As soon as the lighter hit the rock, it created a large explosion. 
From this, Tan Thien knew that the reason why he and Jessica were feeling so weak was because of the methane gas in the fog. But compared to air, methane is slightly lighter, so when he and Jessica lay down, their condition didn't get any worse. But it wasn't a solution to keep going like this. He had to wake Jessica up quickly and leave this place immediately. Thinking of this, Tan Thien had no choice but to search through his bag for something to help. The bag contained all sorts of things, including metal utensils, a sleeping bag, and a convenient tent, but now he was fumbling around because he couldn't understand the English on the medicine. But wait, this box is a battery. Thinking of this, Tan Thien began to make a device to help Jessica wake up. First, he needed to use a bamboo tube to hold most of the clean water, red gold ice, and blood clotting agent. Then he took out the lead from a pencil and the metal from a spoon. The lead from the pencil was connected to the positive pole of the battery. On the outside, the metal spoon was connected to the negative pole, forming a main circuit in the water. Put the pencil lead and metal spoon into the bamboo tube, turn on the battery, and after the water is electrified, an oxidation reduction reaction will occur, with oxygen being produced at the positive pole and hydrogen being produced at the negative pole, twice as much as oxygen. This phenomenon is the electrolysis of water, which is also the most modern and efficient method of producing oxygen. After waiting for a while, Tan Thien saw bubbles in the water in the bamboo tube, indicating that the electrolysis of water had been successful. Finally, he used the blood clotting agent to deliver the electrolyzed oxygen to Jessica. After a while of inhaling and sniffing, she woke up. Seeing that she had suddenly fainted, Jessica quickly turned to Tan Thien and asked what had happened. The surroundings are filled with methane gas. Jessica understood the situation when he told her this and quickly told Tan Thien to leave. An oxygen cylinder can only be used by two people alternately. When Jessica woke up, there wasn't much electricity left in the battery, so they had to cross the swamp in one breath before the battery ran out completely. After a lot of effort and with the help of the heavens, the two of them finally managed to escape from the fog. The air outside was fresh again. After Tan Thien and Jessica escaped from the swamp, it was getting late. The two of them had not yet fully recovered from the detoxification in the swamp, so they decided to find a suitable place in the forest to rest early and then return to the camp tomorrow. At the same time, back at the camp, Yi Lin was furious to the seventh degree because two ferrets had stolen his fish. What's more, one of them came back and stuck out its tongue at her, as if to say, you can't catch me, that's just great. Little White's fish had been stolen again, two of them, he had to make a new lid tonight. At this moment, Little White also came to Yi Lin to ask for food. Seeing how hungry he was, Yi Lin happily took out the fish from the jar and gave it to Little White to eat. But it's been three days, why hasn't Tan Thien come back? Nothing could have happened to him, could it? Maybe tomorrow, Babo and I will go look for him together. But before Yi Lin could finish her thought, Little White squealed with joy when he saw Sa Dai flying back. If Sa Dai is here, then Tan Thien must have returned. Tan Thien walked out of the forest and called out to her. But before Yi Lin could rejoice that Tan Thien had returned, a woman appeared beside him and greeted her. Seeing that Yi Lin was still not able to load her IC, Tan Thien seized the opportunity to take a few pot shots at her. Yi Lin, I'm back. Did you miss me after not seeing me for three days? Seeing her blushing in embarrassment, Tan Thien stopped teasing her and got back to business. This is the pilot of the other plane, Jessica. It's obvious that Jessica is a foreigner. With my level 4 English, it's really difficult to communicate. So I don't know if she's part of the rescue team or not. So I'll leave the communication with her to you. After Tan Thien finished explaining, he happily turned to greet and introduce Jessica. She introduced herself. Jessica also introduced herself. Hello, my full name is Alabaca Jessica. You can call me Jessica, but wait a minute. After a pause of about two seconds, Jessica, do you speak Chinese? And why didn't you say so sooner? Jessica looked at the hero with two eggs on his face and asked him, sticking out her tongue at him, you didn't ask me. Before that, you kept speaking English to me. I didn't know what country you were from. Tan Thien felt depressed after hearing what she said. I guess I'm really stupid. Why did you waste so much energy speaking English to me the whole way? Night had already begun to fall. After learning that Jessica could speak Chinese, Tan Thien and Yi Lin talked with her for a long time that night. Tan Thien told her the story of how they had been stranded on the island and what had happened after they arrived. At the same time, Tan Thien learned from Jessica that she was a paleontologist who studied fossils all over the world. Because of this, she often traveled all over the globe, so she had learned many languages in order to communicate easily. Not long ago, Jessica had heard that there was a species of animal that walked on its buttocks and nose on the Hieri Islands in the South Pacific. She was so excited that she immediately flew a plane to the area to investigate. But unexpectedly, she encountered a storm. 
the plane lost control, and she crashed on this island. Hearing this, Tan Thien and Yi Lin realized that she was not part of the rescue team. But at least we can use Jessica's flight path, combined with the location of the yacht, to guess the approximate location of this island. However, Yi Lin couldn't help but wonder why Jessica was not afraid at all to be stranded on this island, and instead seemed to be very happy. Hearing Yi Lin ask this, Jessica couldn't hide the excitement in her heart and explained. The original giant panda was thought to be extinct, but now it still exists in this world. How exciting is that? There may be other special creatures on this island. Just thinking about it is like going to heaven. Yi Lin looked at Jessica's bright eyes and knew that she was regretting not being able to dissect Babo and study it. This made the little bear lying next to her break out in a cold sweat with fear. After a while of chatting, the three of them learned that Jessica was from 1927. Jessica didn't look like she was lying, and her plane looked like a 20th century plane. And the expiration date printed on the food box was from 1927 to 1928. Could it really be true? Thinking of this, Tan Thien turned to ask her, what year is it in the common era now? I'm sure of it. This year is definitely 1927 in the common era. Then Jessica asked Tan Thien back, what year is it in the common era for you guys? 2020 in the common era. Oh shit, 2020. Could it be that Yi Lin and I have both come back from the future? Tan Thien looked at her in surprise and quickly said, I don't think so. Tan Thien remembered that Jessica had said that she had encountered a storm before the plane crashed. Could she describe the situation in detail? At that time, I was flying from Los Angeles, following the airline route to Hieri Island. Then I encountered a storm. It was clear and sunny one second, and the next I was caught in a vortex that I was completely unprepared for. Moreover, when the storm appeared, the measuring equipment was all broken. By the time I reacted, the plane was heading towards the island and then crashed. Yi Lin listened to her and felt that it was exactly the same as what she and Tan Thien had encountered before they arrived here. After listening to the two of them, Tan Thien also began to speculate that the storm they were talking about was something like a time-space corridor. Like the Bermuda Triangle, we were all caught in it, which is related to the speculation of the time-space corridor. For Tan Thien and the others, this was a very serious topic. If the speculation was true, what year were they in? Where was this island located? How could they return? And what kind of substance would they need to return? If it's not real, then how do we explain the giant panda, the titanoboa, and the three people from different eras? Han Thien saw that everyone was deep in thought, so he stood up and spoke to everyone about the important situation at hand. So the most important thing is to stop thinking about how to guard against wild beasts and start improving our quality of life. When Tan Thien mentioned the words wild beasts, Jessica couldn't help but ask curiously, is it possible that Babo was also brought to this island by the storm? Theoretically speaking, it's not impossible. Moreover, if that's the case, then the Titanoboa in the bamboo forest was probably also brought here by the storm, right? You just said Titanoboa? That's right. It's occupying the depths of the bamboo forest on the island, making us afraid to go near it. After listening to Tan Thien, Jessica also felt that something was wrong with his understanding of the Titanoboa. In the current paleontology community, it is believed that such a large ectotherm could only survive in temperatures of at least 30 to 34 degrees Celsius. Therefore, it should not appear in a shaded forest. In addition to this point, the Titanoboa lived in the tropical regions of the Paleocene. According to research, the tropics of that era were like a sauna. Based on the theory of evolution, we can speculate that in order to adapt to the hot and humid environment, its skin must be moist. If it were in a dry environment, it would definitely crack and bleed. Could it be that the Titanoboa has evolved due to the change in environment? Or could it be that the previous research results on the Titanoboa were wrong? The real mistake is really intriguing. After Jessica said this, Yi Lin spoke up and suggested, what if it was raining? If it was raining, would the Titanoboa be active in the bamboo forest? Now it's summer, and the temperature during the day can reach over 30 degrees Celsius, combined with the rain. Every time it rains, there are always violent beasts. Jessica looked at the two of them talking to each other and didn't understand what was going on, so she asked. I don't think I've loaded the IC yet. Tan Thien had to explain, actually, we've encountered two rainstorms before. See, if the temperature is high enough and there is enough rain, then it's true that the Titanoboa could be active in the bamboo forest, but its range of activity wouldn't be very large. It would probably be limited to the bamboo forest, so the violent beasts at night during the rain can be fully explained. But where would the Titanoboa normally be? Could it be in a cave? But if it's a cave, the required temperature wouldn't be met, right? Well, let's not worry about where it is. At least the threat of the Titanoboa has been eliminated. As long as we don't go looking for trouble, we'll be fine. It's getting late now. The two of you should go to bed. Yi Lin will let you two sleep on the bed tonight. And I'll go outside and keep watch. 
Jessica heard Yi Lin's words and felt a little awkward, so she turned to ask the two of them if they were in a relationship. Hey, hey, don't think nonsense. I've never even held a boy's hand before, so how could I be in a relationship? Oh, I see. So, do you two plan to develop a relationship? After hearing what she said, Yi Lin's face turned as red as a tomato. She flustered and said, Why are you suddenly asking this question? Seeing that the two of them were not thinking about this yet, Jessica seized the opportunity and said, If not, then it's no problem. Tonight, Tan Thien and I will sleep in one bed, and Yi Lin will sleep in another bed. That way, two beds will be enough. Oh, my friend, are you two going to sleep together? Yes, of course, but Tan Thien has to agree. The protective stance on the plane that day, in the swamp, not leaving me half a step, and the intelligence in making the ventilator, all fascinated me. I realized that I like this two egg hero. Tan Thien, can you be my boyfriend? After hearing Jessica's words, Tan Thien realized that he actually liked her too. Jessica's two malignant tumors looked so reasonable. However, before Tan Thien could nod his head like a bobblehead, the murderous aura behind him from Yi Lin sent chills down his spine. Damn it. Old man, if you're so capable, why don't you nod your head like a bobblehead and let me see? Knowing that teasing his wife was the most dangerous sport in the world, Tan Thien had no choice but to hold back his tongue and refuse. Seeing that Tan Thien was still addicted to it, and with a hint of regret, Jessica spoke up and gave him a chance. We'll develop our relationship slowly in the future. It's really great to be a two-egg hero. Well, it's getting late. Tan Thien had no choice but to run back to his backpack and take out his sleeping bag to sleep. He had already zipped it up. Yi Lin, I'm going to sleep first. Seeing that Tan Thien knew his place today, Yi Lin was happy to let his nightingale continue to sing. But wait, Jessica, why did you take off all your clothes? Seeing Yi Lin's surprised expression, Jessica replied happily, because they're dirty. Besides, it's more comfortable to sleep this way. Americans are really easygoing, but something's not right. Hey, old man. Why did you just zip up your head? Now you're sticking your avatar out. How is that possible? The scene shifts to the next morning. After a night of sleeping on the ground, Tan Thien felt a sore neck and shoulders. However, before he could stretch, the two grapefruit angel greeted him. But before Tan Thien could wait for Jessica to wash his eyes, Yi Lin greeted him from behind. Greeting him was also a good morning greeting. But it was so cold that it sent chills down his spine. Seeing Tan Thien enjoying himself so much, Yi Lin poured his bowl of meat soup into Jessica's bowl to make it easier for him to become skin and bones. I've poured all your meat into Jessica's bowl. You can just drink the soup. Tan Thien looked at his bowl of soup, which was even blander than snail water, and quickly grabbed the bowl and ran outside. Seeing that Yi Lin was not happy, Jessica asked Tan Thien what made her unhappy. Nothing. There's still a lot in the kitchen. I'm just kidding with him. Oh, I see. You like Tan Thien too, don't you? When Yi Lin heard Jessica say that she liked Tan Thien too, she was embarrassed and stammered to deny it. Isn't your country like a husband who is allowed to have many wives? I think it's divided into main rooms and secondary rooms. When I was young, I went to China and heard an old man say that. Let's work together. You met Tan Thien before me, so I can let you be the first wife. After hearing Jessica's words, Yi Lin's face turned as red as a monkey's butt, and she hurriedly made an excuse to run outside. On this side, Tan Thien went into the kitchen to get food and saw Yi Lin sitting huddled up inside. Yi Lin, what's wrong? Seeing Tan Thien coming, Yi Lin quickly seized the opportunity and said, I want to be the first wife. This made Tan Thien wonder what was going on. No, it's nothing. You heard wrong. Did Jessica say something to you again? That Jessica is really hard to deal with. After resting for the night, the three of them, Tan Thien, gathered together again and began to officially discuss their future plans. After some discussion, the three of them divided the plan into two stages. The first stage was to establish a firm foothold on the island and to explore the entire island once. Tan Thien currently has two talents. With Babo and Sa Dai, he is no longer afraid of wild boars. However, Tan Thien still decided to cut down trees and make a sharp fence around the entire meadow as a precaution. In addition, Tan Thien also planned to capture wild boars and raise them in captivity to ensure a stable food supply. It must be known that in a few months, winter will come, and after winter, the situation will be very unpredictable. As for the effort to explore the deserted island once, it is of course for the purpose of finding resources. To be precise, it is mineral resources, such as iron ore and copper ore. Iron ore is very important. It is related to whether there will be iron nails available in the process of shipbuilding. Of course, it is also possible to use wooden structures and wooden holes as substitutes, but this way, it will take more time to build the ship. In the second stage, of course, it is shipbuilding. This is also the ultimate goal, but for the time being, the three of them, Tan Thien, 
do not have too many thoughts about it. After all, the early stage is still uncertain, so no matter what you think, it won't work. But one thing is for sure, this stage will definitely take several years. Speaking of which, Jessica suddenly remembered that there were still quite a few things in her bag. Everyone, take a look and see if there's anything useful. With that, she took out a new set of clothes for Yi Lin to try on. Tan Thien looked at the two angels with four malignant tumors laughing and joking happily over the new clothes, and then looked at himself, who was wearing nothing but his teeth and testicles. Even the shirt he was wearing was about to evolve into a dishrag. Well, let's put aside the sadness and discomfort for now. Jessica also brought a lot of sharp iron tools. With these tools, it will be much easier to go to the bamboo forest tomorrow. The scene shifts to the next morning. Tan Thien and Babo are harvesting in the bamboo forest. Seeing that the little pig was so greedy, Tan Thien had no choice but to go over and tell him to go back and eat later. Sa Dai was flying around, scouting the forest, and there was no sign of the Titanoboa. As expected, Jessica's guess was correct. If that's the case, then there will be no threat when we get to the pile of dung. With that in mind, the man and the dragon bear headed together to the giant pile of dung from the other day. The smell was as bad as before. I can't believe I jumped into this before. But places where dung has been left for a long time also means that there may be something there. With that in mind, Tan Thien took a branch and poked it into the ground, and then used a lighter to try to light it. Sure enough, this kind of purple soil is called nutrient soil. It usually exists in dung heaps. The foot of the wall, the floor of the old house, the cliff of the cave, and the ground, were not washed away by the rain. Standard nitrate Kali soil is formed by the action of nitric acid bacteria and nitrous acid bacteria after the organic matter in the soil is decomposed. However, most of them have been combined with potassium, sodium, and sodium ions in the soil, existing in the form of salt. As long as potassium nitrate is extracted from the nutrient soil, it can be used to make black powder. So we will have another method of defense. The wild boars are about to go back to feed. Let's get some more bamboo shoots for Babo and then go back. After a while, Tan Thien finally arrived home. Seeing that Tan Thien had returned, Yi Lin happily asked him about his day. Jessica, who was standing next to him, did not forget to show him the results of her and Yi Lin's work. Looks like what you predicted. There's a lot of nutrient soil in the bamboo forest, isn't there? That's right. The harvest was very good. Leave it to me next. With that, Tan Thien told Yi Lin to take Jessica to explore the surroundings, and he would start working. The scene shifts to the next afternoon. The bathtub is finally finished. Next we will refine the potassium nitrate together. Refining potassium nitrate is divided into three steps. The first step is to mix the herbal mixture with the nutrient soil in a ratio of 18 to 1. The potassium ions in the herbal mixture replace the sodium ions in the nutrient soil to produce potassium nitrate. The second step is to cover the nutrient soil with bamboo poles and bamboo screens, and then pour hot water on it to dissolve the potassium nitrate and separate out the insoluble canamazy salt. However, in order to keep the nutrient soil sufficiently moist, we had no choice but to spend a long time pouring hot water on it little by little with a bowl. After a day of hard work, Tan Thien and his team finally finished. That's it for today. Wait until tomorrow to refine the potassium nitrate and we can make gunpowder. When Yi Lin heard Tan Thien mention gunpowder, she couldn't help but be surprised and turned to ask him again. So it's not possible? That's right, it's a bomb. At night, although everyone was half believing half doubting about the time-space tunnel, Jessica seemed to have already regarded Tan Thien and Yi Lin as travelers from the future and was curious to ask about many things. After a night of chatting and resting to regain their strength, the next day arrived. The nitrate water obtained by pouring and washing contains a lot of impurities. Before boiling the nitrate water, Tan Thien and the other three filtered it with cloth and then put it into the pot to boil the nitrate. The process is similar to that of making salt from seawater. The only difference is that when cooking nitrate, it needs to be stirred continuously during the nitrification process to prevent it from sticking to the bottom and flying away. When the nitrate evaporates and becomes viscous, solid precipitates begin to appear at the bottom of the tank. This is a mixture of sodium chloride and potassium chloride. Compared with potassium nitrate, they have a lower solubility and will precipitate earlier at this temperature. While the temperature of the water has not yet dropped, filter it again to remove the sodium chloride and potassium chloride from the nitrate water. When the water temperature cools down to warm, the solubility of potassium nitrate decreases sharply due to the change in water temperature, and a lot of it separates out. This time, the final filtration is carried out to obtain potassium nitrate. This process does not require much effort, but the process of waiting for the nitrate to cool down is very time-consuming. By the afternoon, the three of them had finally processed all the nitrate water. 
The nitrate left after filtration is commonly known as chat water. That's right, it is the kind of chat water that can be used to make tofu. It's just a pity that there is no soybean to make tofu now, so it can only be used to water the plants. After many days of hard work, Tan Thien and his team finally made gunpowder. However, Yi Lin and Jessica couldn't help but wonder why Tan Thien was so familiar with this work. I guess this is not the first time you've done this, is it? Tan Thien felt embarrassed when the two angels asked him, and he answered in a fluster. This matter? I used to blow up fish holes or something. Nani? You've blown up a shithole? Well, don't pay attention to that little thing. With that, Tan Thien also recalled a time when he was a naughty child. At that time, he and two other naughty children made firecrackers and then went to the toilet together. Seeing that there was someone constipated in the toilet, Tan Thien enthusiastically threw a firecracker into the window to help the person inside get more motivation to solve the problem faster. While taking a dump and surfing the top of the network, the firecrackers of the little bastard scared him and he dropped his phone into the toilet, making the gods inside so angry that they ran out on all fours. They cursed as they ran. That's really awesome. It's you little bastards again. Don't let us catch you, or we'll beat your ass. Yi Lin couldn't help but ask curiously when she saw Tan Thien standing alone and smiling. What are you laughing at? It's nothing, I just couldn't help but laugh. Okay, you guys take Babo to the cave. I have to go and test the gunpowder. Then Yi Lin led everyone into the cave to observe, while Tan Thien stood outside to test the gunpowder. After the gunpowder was lit, Tan Thien quickly swung his arm and threw it far forward. As soon as the gunpowder hit the ground, it immediately exploded with a loud bang, which frightened the birds in the forest and made them fly away one after another. At this time, the system also popped up a message. The host made a bomb and was rewarded with 5,000 points. But the power of the bomb seems to be a little weak. Did you put too little gunpowder in it? Tan Thien thought for a while and said, The amount of gunpowder will affect the power of the bomb but the most important thing is the black powder itself. In short, this kind of bamboo bomb cannot kill a large beast, but it is enough to scare them away at night. Tan Thien and the others made three more homemade bombs to increase their lethality. Tan Thien doubled the amount of black powder, but Jessica's sulfur was limited, so she could only make three. A few days later, Tan Thien and his team began to plan the construction of a defensive stronghold in the barracks. At first, they planned to burn bricks to build walls, but they found that even if they built several brick kilns, they could only burn a few bricks a day under the current conditions. In the end, they had no choice but to give up. Then they decided to choose wood and bamboo to build a wooden fence to block it, and try to finish it quickly before the rainy season. During the rainy season, the wild boars will often become violent. By mid-June, its summer has already begun. It's only the beginning of summer, and it's already so sunny. If it's the middle of the month, it will be too hot to die. Thinking of this, Tan Thien stopped to rest and took the opportunity to go into the house to get a drink of water to regain his spirits. Yi Lin had prepared some boiled water to quench her thirst. If she could drink some iced water, it would be even more refreshing. But wait, why did I forget about it? During this time, I have also been paying special attention to the matter of nutrient soil, and I have prepared a lot of potassium nitrate. If potassium nitrate is dissolved in water, it will absorb a large amount of heat. The ancients used this method to make ice. Thinking of this, Tan Thien poured water into an earthenware basin and then placed a pot of water in it, and then poured potassium nitrate into the water outside and stirred it evenly. Fortunately, potassium nitrate is soluble in water. It is only a physical change and can be separated later, otherwise I really dare not waste it. Under the current conditions, it is already the limit to be able to freeze this much ice. Next, Tan Thien took out some forest oil and mashed the fruit to extract the juice. The wild strawberries in summer are big and sweet. It's a pity that they are a bit far from the cave. Otherwise, with Jessica's help, we could have gotten more of this good stuff. After filtering, I used a water filter to get crushed ice. The last step is to pour strawberry juice on it. So a bowl of wild strawberry shaved ice is finished. Now just cover it to keep it warm. In a while, the two of them, Yi Lin and Jessica, should be almost home. As soon as the lid was put down on the table, the two of them arrived home. Yi Lin was so happy to see Tan Thien that she showed him her achievements. Tan Thien, look what this is. It's grapes. Where did you find them? I found them on the way back with sister Jessica. That's why little Lin is so happy. Jessica, who was standing by the side, did not forget to tease her a few words. Yi Lin kept asking for a surprise, so she was happy all the way. Oh, there's no need to say that, sister. Seeing how hard the two of them were working, 
Tan Thien said that he had prepared a reward for them, which made Jessica keep asking questions because she didn't know what the reward would be. With that, Tan Thien didn't let the two angels guess any longer and opened the lid directly. Ta-da, it's shaved ice. Yi Lin and Jessica saw the bowl of delicious shaved ice on the table and rushed over to eat it, and then praised it endlessly. The ice is so cool that it's freezing my brain. Jessica then turned to ask how it was made. Is this the magic that the Chinese people often talk about? But wait, beauty. Beauty just asked and put a spoon in the brother's mouth. How can the brother crow? Well, since the angel has asked, I will be happy to answer. It is because potassium nitrate dissolved in water can absorb most of the heat. Jessica was surprised when she heard him say that. She didn't expect that potassium nitrate could be used in this way. You are really smart. Tan Thien felt a little embarrassed when he was praised, so he turned to Yi Lin and asked her. Yi Lin, how do you like the taste of the ice? I think we can make more strawberry juice or something. But looking at little Lin's greedy face, I know that she didn't listen to what Tan Thien said at all. In order to make the ice better, Tan Thien asked Yi Lin to squeeze a few more ceramic jars like Russian dolls. Through the ceramic jars and pigskin, the heat insulation was maximized, which can greatly improve the cooling efficiency and increase the ice production rate. On the other hand, Jessica was not idle either. She was crushing the grapes that she had brought back during the day to make grape wine. The process of making grape wine is relatively simple. Just wash and crush the grapes, then mix the grapes with sugar in a ratio of 1 to 3, and then seal it. As the saying goes, spoiled wine turns into vinegar. The most important difference between brewing wine and vinegar is to seal the two jars of essence. The reason why it is not completely sealed is to use the acid in the air to make grape vinegar. After processing the grapes, Jessica happily ran to Tan Thien and asked him what he was doing. I'm making a fan blade, like an electric fan. Yi Lin, who was sitting beside him, was surprised when she heard Tan Thien say this, and turned to ask him, You want to make an electric fan? Don't get me wrong, I'm just saying that I want to make the fan blade of an electric fan. Not that I want to make an electric fan. The two of them couldn't help but wonder. Then what are you making the fan blade for? Of course it's for making a fan. So is it a handheld fan? Hearing Yi Lin say this, Tan Thien was about to turn around and explain that it was not automatic or, in other words, aerodynamic. I plan to use a long bamboo pole as the axis, install a fan blade on one end and a fixed bamboo sheet on the other end to form a dynamic blade. The dynamic blade is then driven by the steam when the water is boiled, which pushes the dynamic blade into a fan. I see. This is a great idea, just like a steam engine. I think we can add a condenser. Tan Thien agreed with Yi Lin's suggestion. In the blink of an eye, it was July, which was also the hottest time of the year. Before that, Tan Thien and the others had spent a lot of effort to make a boiler and add a condenser, so that the steam produced could not only drive the fan blades, but also be condensed into water through the condenser and used again in the boiler. During this time, they also used wild strawberry juice to make popsicles. Babo, who was sitting beside them, saw that the popsicles were done and turned to Tan Thien to ask for a piece. I know, I know. You're the only one who's in a hurry. I've let you try a few of them these past few days, so you're still craving them now. Popsicles plus fans, these two divine tools will reduce the heat, so this summer won't be so uncomfortable anymore. That's right, wear a little white and silly. Birds have a higher body temperature than humans, so the current temperature is normal for them. Just wait a moment and prepare some cold water. A moment later, the weather suddenly turned bad. Yi Lin was worried that the fence outside had not been completed yet when it started to rain heavily. If the wild boars get violent, what should we do? Seeing Yi Lin so worried, Tan Thien reassured her. Don't worry, our equipment is not the same as it used to be. Moreover, I have the blessing of the centaur talent, and Silly has also joined the camp, and there is the bomb-like killing intent. Wild boars are no longer a problem. The rain outside was getting heavier and heavier, and the wild boars were rushing out of the forest in droves. Seeing that they had arrived, Tan Thien and the others got ready for battle. Then Tan Thien and Jessica climbed up the fence to prepare for the attack. Didn't expect the rain to be so heavy this time. Fortunately, the eagle's outer feathers are waterproof. Moreover, the surface of the material is also coated with essential oil. As long as it is not soaked in water for a long time, the bird's wings will not get wet and unable to fly. Well, the enemy has come to our doorstep. We have worked so hard to build our camp, and we can't let you just barge in. With that, Tan Thien drew his bow forward and quickly shot an arrow. The wild boars saw their companion fall to the ground, unable to fight, and began to divide into two rows and charge forward. Seeing this, Tan Thien ordered Silly and Babo to take charge of the wild boars on the left, 
Receiving the order from their master, the two pets eagerly rushed forward to kill the wild boars. Although Babo and Silly blocked some of them, the number of wild boars charging towards Tanthine was still large and powerful. If this continues, they will break in. But before Tan Thien could think of a way, Yi Lin shouted from behind, telling everyone to get out of the way. The bomb is coming. Tan Thien, Jessica, be careful, be careful. With that, Yi Lin used all her strength to throw the bomb forward. Seeing a strange object flying out from inside the camp, the wild boars were wondering if they could escape, when suddenly there was a loud bang, which frightened the wild boars so much that they hurriedly ran into the forest on all fours. But it's really ridiculous. Do you think you can come and go as you please in this camp? If you want to leave, you have to leave something behind. With that, Tan Thien quickly shot and killed another wild boar that had lost its pack. Babo and Silly also did their best not to be outdone by their master. Seeing that the situation seemed to be stable, Tan Thien told them that they didn't need to chase after them anymore. The growth cycle of wild boars is very slow, unlike domestic pigs, which can grow to 50 to 60 kilograms in one or two years. If we kill too many wild boars, it might affect the population of wild boars, causing the number of wild boars to decrease. So we can't just drain the pond to catch all the fish. Sustainable development is the best way. With this batch of loot, they won't have to worry about food for the next two years. And the great weapon, the homemade bomb, is seen as a beacon of hope. The first time it was used, it was so effective, it immediately boosted everyone's confidence. After preparing enough food, Han Thien and the others hurriedly worked overtime to reinforce the fence at the last moment before the rainy season came. In the next half month, it rained a few more times, not too much and not too little. Tan Thien and the other three worked day and night and finally managed to finish the fence around the entire camp before the second big rain came. No need to worry about the violent wild boars anymore. Then the whole island entered a continuous rainy season. Another month later, the three of them completed the camp, built an unfired pottery storage room, bathroom, and arranged the living area and the functional area in a neat and orderly manner. The system notified the host that the task of upgrading the camp had been completed, and the reward was 2,000 points. It was already the end of summer. Little White had grown black feathers and could follow Yi Lin's simple commands. He thanked Yi Lin for repairing his clothes, which were extremely comfortable. It was worth the effort. He also praised the pigskin backpack, which was not only sturdy and durable, but could also hold all the things he usually carried with him, such as ropes and wine. It was really convenient. Yi Lin felt sad that he didn't understand that she had made it for him because she loved him. From today onwards, the three of them would begin the first phase of the second half of their journey. According to the plan, Tan Thien would take Babo and Silly to explore the plains where the plane crash had been discovered. Jessica and Yi Lin would be in charge of exploring the unknown areas around the camp. The last time Jessica had found the crashed plane by coincidence, she didn't have enough food, so she couldn't explore it thoroughly. This time, with Babo as a mount, and the ability to take turns using their talents, plus 10 days of food, they would definitely be able to explore every corner of the plains. Babo saw him suddenly running so fast. The last time, before nightfall, he had been attacked by a pack of prairie wolves. So this time he made a detour and set up camp a little further away. If he encountered them again, he could also bring a bomb with him. After entering autumn, the cold wind howled at night. Fortunately, he had Jessica's tent and sleeping bag, so he didn't have to worry about keeping warm at all. The next day, he entered the plains. His first destination was the volcano. He had seen before that the top of the mountain in the plains was probably divided into two inner and outer rings by the continuous long mountains. The outer ring was mostly wasteland and grassland, while the inner ring was surrounded by mountain ranges and covered with waist-high shrubs. The volcano was located in the center of the circle. The shrubs at the foot of the volcano were so dense that if he hadn't been wearing jeans, he would have been scratched by the thorns. Tan Thien saw that Babo was walking slowly and smelled something bad. It was the smell of sulfur. He told Babo to stay there and climbed up to take a look. There was a lot of sulfur ore in the volcano, and the composition of the gas emitted from the volcano was very complex. In most cases, water vapor accounted for the majority, with the remainder being carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and hydrogen sulfide. It will react to form sulfur, which will eventually accumulate near the crater. Not all craters have sulfur, but as long as there is sulfur in the volcano in front of you, it is fine. With this sulfur, he could make more bombs. Bombs. However, there was more than just sulfur in the volcano. In the late or middle stages of volcanic activity, 
Volcanoes emit gases and liquids that interact strongly and these hot gas and liquid flows often contain large amounts of heavy metal compounds. Under certain geological and chemical conditions, the gas liquid containing heavy metals interacts with the surrounding rocks in a complex manner, eventually accumulating and precipitating, and finally forming what is known as a volcanic hydrothermal deposit. The gases and liquids emitted by volcanoes cover a wide area, and the various surrounding minerals and rocks react with them, so the types of minerals produced are also very complex and diverse. A volcano is a museum. Seeing that his knowledge was insufficient, he bought an outdoor mineralogy encyclopedia from the system. He picked up a type of ore and the system displayed information. It was a common type of ore called sulfur. It was lead gray in color, with black cracks and a metallic luster. It was formed in metamorphic and sedimentary rocks, and volcanic sulfur was always coexisting with squat, which is easily weathered into lead alum and white lead ore on the ground. This is a material for making colorless glass. Two days later, he set up camp on the back of the mountain, and went to the crater every day to look for minerals. He also found copper ore and many other types of ore. The amount was not much. After searching the entire crater, he only found seven or eight pieces. He also tried to dig for ore underground, but the surface of the crater was extremely hard, and the pickaxe broke in half after only a few blows. His back and waist also began to ache. Without an iron pickaxe, it was very difficult to dig for iron ore. Without iron ore, it was impossible to make an iron pickaxe. This was a dead cycle. He could only remember this place for now and come back with the others next year to try his luck. Silly flew over. With Silly's ability, it only took an hour to fly, while it would take him a day to walk. The idea of using it to deliver letters was not bad. It's very good here. Be careful. Love you. Having someone to worry about and miss him was really something that made him happy. He stopped thinking about the iron ore, and planned to get some sulfur ore and some iron pyrite tomorrow and then return. He put on a mask, held the rope and lowered it down. It was corroded. As expected, the concentration of sulfuric acid in the pit was too high. The bamboo tube was not usable, so he used a straw. During the next period of time, he explored the resources of the plains everywhere. Compared to the forest, the ecological chain on the plains was rather monotonous, and he did not gain much. There were also some usable resources, but they could also be found in the forest near the camp, so there was no need to come here. On the morning of the eighth day, Tan Thien decided to return to the camp with the sulfur and minerals. He took a shortcut, but he did not expect to encounter the swamp. The last time he and Jessica went to the swamp, the white fog was so thick that he could not see the trees. But this time, he saw that the fog was gradually fading. The concentration of methane and the concentration of white fog were directly proportional. So he thought of the crocodile skin. Wouldn't it be delicious to make a thick bag? Silly went to investigate first, and it was just as he had guessed. He found a few two-legged animals nearby. He told Babo to stay behind because it was inconvenient to enter the swamp with such a large body. If anything goes wrong, you run out. Silly led him. After activating his talent, his maximum speed could reach 110 kilometers per hour. Converted, the distance of 5,000 meters could be covered in just three minutes. We're almost there. Let's go another 500 meters. At most 500 meters, he saw a girl running behind a group of people chasing her. Unexpectedly, she turned around and killed one of them, but she was surrounded by the large number of them. He saw that this was not a performance, but a life-threatening fight. He could not stand idly by. He immediately made a bomb in the ratio of 030201, mixing kalinitrate, baking soda, and brown sugar together, stirring well, and then making it like a homemade bomb adding clay, raw materials, and lead wires. The system now informs that the master has successfully manufactured the bullet and received 3,000 points. Successfully received 3,000. He was overjoyed because this was the first time he had ever attacked anyone on this deserted island. The law is not necessarily applicable, so he saved the girl without hurting anyone. He laughed bitterly. She really is a saint. While she was running away, he shot arrows continuously, causing them to stumble, and the girl ran past. Seeing her hiding behind the sacred tree, he threw out the bamboo bomb. Boom! He hurriedly shouted at the girl to run quickly. The others were tall, dark, and strong, with very rich combat experience. Even if he had two talents, it would be like a dream to try to beat them. He could only run away and meet up with Babo, and everything would be fine. Because of the heavy bleeding, her speed slowed down. If this continued, she would be gone. The four men caught up. He turned around and knelt down, signaling her to get on his back. Although he had never tried to activate the talent of carrying someone, but it would more or less increase his speed. Even if the power consumption could increase several times, she said something to him in a huff, then turned her back to him to block them so that he could run ahead. He quickly picked her up and ran. 
After adding another person, his speed decreased by one minute and he could not shake them off at all. If he was cornered, he would throw all the bombs in his bag. Suddenly, Silly reported that there was a large snake. The swamp was really a habitat for Titanoboa. It had only taken advantage of the heavy rain to crawl towards the bamboo forest, so it was really unlucky. The others did not dare to chase after seeing this. He thought to himself, there is more meat on the other side, so go after them. Unexpectedly, the python attacked him and the girl. He quickly dodged, and half of the snake's body tilted down. The girl ran up and stabbed the snake. The snake screamed and threw the girl away. Just as it was about to eat her, he hugged her and dodged to one side, quickly throwing a bomb into its mouth. Boom! Its whole body suddenly turned black, its mouth smoking, and it fell to the ground. He and the girl ran out of there quickly. After walking more than 300 meters, it suddenly woke up and screamed, heading towards the two people who were running. He led her into the bushes. He told her to relax, as long as she didn't make a sound, she would be fine. Pythons do not use their eyes, but infrared rays to find their prey, and the python's temperature sensing organ is just on its face and nose. Now its entire oral cavity has been blown up, its flesh and blood mixed together, its brain is dizzy, and its senses can no longer function normally. Therefore, it is not easy to find us. He communicated with her. Unfortunately, he accidentally touched her chest with one hand. Soon, the two of them walked to the edge of the swamp. She saw Babo, the beast, and immediately ran forward. Brother, you didn't save the wrong person. He clapped his hands and signaled Babo to lie down, inviting the little girl to ride on his pet. The little girl knelt down when she saw this. He and Babo were speechless. He helped the little girl onto Babo's back, and he also got on and left. After Tan Thien helped the girl ride on Babo, he left the swamp at the fastest speed. Run like crazy, my dear. He was only relieved when he entered the forest. There was a cut on the girl's hand. The wound was always very serious and needed to be stopped immediately. Seeing her struggling to light a fire, he took out his lighter. The little girl was surprised, unexpectedly making fire so fast. She was going to use a burning stick to stop the bleeding. He quickly told her not to do that, as it would be painful. He took out a bottle of saline and bandaged her hand. He pointed to the wound on her thigh, and the little girl immediately lifted her thigh for him to treat. It made him think right away. If it's sharp, it's not sharp, if it's not sharp, it's not. He built a hut. Seeing that she was sleeping outside and getting cold, he was about to carry her in when she reflexively threw something in her hand at him. He dodged in time. She accidentally stumbled and fell towards him. She knelt down to apologize. Just now, the little girl looked around and her stomach growled. She made this kind of martial arts gesture. If it were me, I would have thrown up the dinner I had last night. He offered her some dried pork. She bowed like a servant. After eating, he suggested that she sleep in the sleeping bag, but she refused. The next morning, he heard the sound of Silly in her calling. When he saw the two of them about to attack each other, he quickly stopped them. Silly immediately flew towards him. Afterwards, he thought of every possible way to communicate with the girl, hoping to get some news, but it was even more difficult than Jessica. At that time, Tan Thien did not understand the other party's language at all, and finally had to give up. He decided to take the young girl back to the camp and then figure it out. Deep Lam and Jessica went out to greet him together. Jessica said sarcastically, this is the girl you mentioned in your letter? She's so cute. I like this type. But this girl looks like she's still a minor. The girl immediately raised her hand and patted Jessica's shoulder. After talking for a while, they found out that this little girl's name was Nick Hanny, from a tribe called Lara, which was also around 81,939 before the outbreak of World War II. In the southwest of the Arabian Peninsula, a British colony, the entrance to the Red Sea is now Iran. But at that time, Iran was not yet a country. There were only small tribes in the country. Among them was a tribe called Lara. The Lara tribe had a total of more than 50 people living in the desert. But their location was close to an oasis, so the tribe did not have to worry about water, and there were many apple trees growing there. On this point, the British army stationed nearby often went to the Lara tribe to pick apples to quench their thirst, and were considered regular customers of the tribe. But one day in August 1939, when the British army arrived at the Lara tribe as usual, they found that everyone in the tribe had disappeared, and the food and drink were still there in each house. The soldiers thought it was strange, so they reported it to their superiors, who then contacted the Air Force patrolling the area. The response was that no trace of the tribe's movement had ever been seen. The Lara tribe is just like us, traveling through time and space to a desert island. In that case, we can borrow the tribe's strength to build a ship. We might be able to leave this island within a year. Nick said that not only were there more than 50 people, but there was also a group of people who came to this island by boat a year ago, three times the size of the Lara tribe, and attacked for no reason. 
The tribe fought back, but was quickly defeated. Most of the tribe became prisoners of war, but most of them were lucky enough to escape to a corner of the island. He was worried that the other five would go back and report, and then summon people to come here to kill us. Those people have rich combat experience, are well equipped, and outnumber us. If they find us here, we won't be able to fight them off even with bombs. The only way is to join forces with the Lara tribe. Through Jessica's translation, Tan Thien learned from Nick that when their tribe first arrived on this desert island, they were very short of food. In order to solve the food problem, the chief had organized the tribe to go hunting. But they encountered a thick fog, which they believed to be the territory of the god of death. Someone accidentally strayed into the white fog and was quietly taken away by the god of death. Afterwards, their people were curious about the extent of the white fog, so they followed the edge of the white fog for a whole week. As a result, they found that the white fog covered the entire island. The remarkable thing was that the white fog did not dissipate all year round, but would disappear for two days when the seasons changed. The white fog in the swamp has now reappeared, and the only way for those people to cross the white fog and get here is to wait until winter. We have about three months of safety. Nick hopes that Tan Thien is a shaman who can help her defeat her enemy. Every tribe has a shaman as its leader. Well, since it's mutually beneficial, we can agree to deceive the tribe once. Nick thanked him by kowtowing three times. Jessica suggested that Tan Thien and Deep Lam learn Arabic. Tan Thien seemed discouraged and didn't want to learn, because he had reluctantly passed level 4 in English after more than 10 years of study, and learning Arabic would take him forever. He was surprised to see the system display the world language encyclopedia. This way it's faster, no need to learn. After the conversation, everyone had their own tasks. Deep Lamb went to cook, while he went to the river to bathe. Although it was late autumn and he wanted to take a warm bath, he gave it up to Nick and Jessica. That's manly, isn't it, everyone? Jessica noticed that Nick had many old scars, big and small, and wondered what she had been through. Deep Lamb had set the table and invited everyone to eat. Today there was delicious pheasant soup, because Xiao Bai had gone out to play and caught a pheasant again. Oh, the poor pheasant is now in the bowl. Tan Thien and Jessica praised Deep Lamb as the number one cook in the camp. While Nick ate and suddenly remembered everyone at home, and was so sad that tears came to her eyes. Late at night, he put up a tent outside the cave and slept, because there was only enough room in the cave for three people to sleep. Jessica and Deep Lamb saw that Nick refused to sleep in bed and lay down on the ground, huddled in a corner, her hand always holding a stone knife, and they felt sorry for her. On the second day, Jessica taught him and Deep Lamb Arabic. After a while, he stood up and stretched as soon as he heard that today's lesson was over. Deep Lamb thought of making a boat to go and meet the Lara tribe. There's no time like the present. And that afternoon he went to cut down trees. He was cutting down the fourth tree when Nick ran over and offered to help, but he didn't want her to get hurt. But when she tried, she chopped down a tree right away. With one hand and a stone axe, she chopped faster than he did with an iron axe. She's not an ordinary person. With Nick's help, it took them less than three days to cut down enough wood. Then they set up a steel furnace and made iron nails to build the boat. The next day, Tan Thien and Nick started to smelt iron, while Deep Lamb and Jessica took Babo out to look for resources. Along with the heat waves from the iron smelting room, the pungent yellow smoke made the surrounding birds and animals dizzy. The main component of the pazite collected from the volcano is iron disulfide. Through the process of melting at more than 1, 500 degrees, the sulfur element will become sulfur dioxide gas, which has a pungent odor and is emitted. The iron will become molten iron. After a while, he held the iron in his hand with joy. Finally, he had entered the Iron Age. I thought Tan Thien was holding a stone in his hand. Damn it, it took me forever to get a few pieces of iron. No wonder people don't use pazite ore to make iron. He and Nick went to the lounge to rest, and there were fruits and glasses of water on the table. He glanced at Nick and saw that she looked like a standard lowly girl. Nick didn't understand why he was looking at her, because she was beautiful, so he looked at her for a while. In the afternoon, Tan Thien and Nick cooked and smelted the iron and poured it into the mold that Deep Lamb had prepared in advance, and waited for it to cool before removing it from the mold. A basic iron nail was completed. The four of them ate together. Deep Lamb had gone around and saw that there were a lot of fruits this season, but he was afraid that if he picked them all, they would go to waste. So he suggested that he dig a cellar for the winter. He thought that digging a cellar would be too much work for three people, so he decided to make canned fruit. The issue of food is always important for survival. 
the matter of building a boat was naturally pushed back. Making glass jars require silica. The next day, all four went to the stream to collect silica. The silica content in the stream was high, and it was also transparent and large, making it a high-quality silica. After a few minutes of picking a basket, they were able to collect a few pounds of stones. Deep Lamb held a slightly yellow and shiny piece and exclaimed, I found gold. The system in his head displayed the information. Gold, the elemental form of the chemical element gold, oh, is a soft, yellow metal, a precious metal that is resistant to corrosion. At this time, Nick took a large piece several times larger than his and handed it to him, only to find that there were many on the other side. This was a vein of ore. Jessica found a diamond. Damn, this is a fake, right? The system displayed. Diamond is a single crystal formed from the element carbon. Under conditions of high temperature and high pressure deep in the earth, the three of them were overjoyed. We're on the island of gold and silver. We're rich. Then a crow flew by. What good is it to have a lot of gold or jewels on a desert island? They continued to collect silica. After a busy morning, Tan Thien and the others finally collected a basket full of silica. They also took the gold and diamonds, just in case they could escape one day. Dreams are always necessary. In addition to silica, the materials used to make glass include powdered seashells, which are used as a reinforcing agent to increase the strength of the glass, and guarana, which provides lead elements to reduce the viscosity and solubility of the glass. Once these materials are available, they are ground into powder and mixed together. Glass is a silicate, it is amorphous and has no fixed melting point. It only has a melting range, it will soften at 800 degrees Celsius, and if you continue to increase the temperature, it will become a flowing glass liquid, much simpler than smelting iron. As the silica gradually melted, Deep Lamb and Jessica were responsible for kneading the blowpipe used to blow the glass, and shaping it during the process. First, use the blowpipe to take a certain amount of molten glass, then blow the molten glass like a bubble. Finally, use a tool to shape the molten glass. After blowing out the molten glass, it is necessary to rotate the blowpipe while the molten glass is still hot, using centrifugal force to make the molten glass evenly distributed. It is important to maintain a uniform speed, otherwise the molten glass will become a crooked ball like this, my friends. The system displayed a message, the host has created a piece of scrap and received 1,500 points. He made an excuse to let Deep Lamb try it, otherwise he would not know where to hide his face if he did it again. Puffing and puffing, he created a vase with a flared neck, but unfortunately he still didn't rotate it evenly. He and Jessica both praised Deep Lamb. She was very cool. Next, he used the luxurious diamond to cut them. Originally, when the glass was not yet cold, it would be dipped into cold water and then knocked out. He saw that he had enough points to buy the Encyclopedia of Languages, so he showed it to Nick. He understood everything, but in order not to reveal himself, he pretended to continue studying. For the next few days, Jessica taught Arabic while helping to pull the blowpipe, while Deep Lamb studied the techniques of glassmaking. Deep Lamb showed a strong learning ability, not only gradually getting used to Arabic, but also practicing to the level of daily conversation. The glass bottles made were also becoming more and more exquisite. Tan Thien and Nick continued to transport the soil to boil it into potassium nitrate and make bombs. After digging everything out, they only got three jars of potassium nitrate. The day of departure was approaching and most of the materials were ready. Tan Thien thought of the most important thing, the telescope. With the materials available, the only telescopes we can make are Galileo and Kepler. The working principle of a telescope is very simple. It uses the objective lens to focus the light path of a distant object behind it, condensing it into a reduced real image, which is then observed through the eyepiece. And a virtual image is seen, magnified many times. This is how the magnifying effect is achieved. The Galileo telescope uses a convex lens as the objective lens and a concave lens as the eyepiece, which is simple to make and creates an upright image. However, the field of view is small and the magnification is not easy to increase in the Kepler telescope. Both the objective lens and the eyepiece are convex lenses. The field of view is large, but the image is reversed up and down and left and right. It is necessary to add a convex lens between the objective lens and the eyepiece to achieve the effects of forward and reverse. It is called the upright image system. He made it according to the Kepler type, and asked Deep Lamb to make the mold and the new blank drawing machine for the convex lens. The next day, before making the mold, he used a round mud plate fired at a high temperature to make a simple blank drawing machine. According to Deep Lamb's request, he used the rotating force of the blank drawing machine and a shield to cut a small hole. Looking at the relatively smooth funnel on the mud blank, he used a hook as sandpaper to try to smooth out the scratches on the surface of the funnel, 
and at the same time carefully pressed down to try to wipe the sharp end of the funnel into a curved shape. After getting five molds, he just needed to pour the molten glass into the mold, let it cool, and then put the two flat convex glass plates together. The double convex lens was considered done. Then he adjusted the distance between the objective lens and the eyepiece and it was normal. The Kepler telescope has a distance between the objective lens and the eyepiece that is roughly equal to the sum of the focal lengths of the objective lens and the eyepiece, but the Tanthene group did not have any measuring tools, so they could only try slowly. Deep Lamb looked at it and saw a pair of golden birds from a distance, with a magnification effect of 78 times. Nick exclaimed in surprise, this is a divine eye. After determining the focal length, the telescope was considered half completed. Tan Thien and the others found a suitable bamboo tree to make the outer casing, and then divided the bamboo tube of the telescope into two parts, the objective tube and the eyepiece tube, to make a retractable telescope that was very compact. Nick loved it and didn't want to let it go. They also made some magnifying glasses to light fires. Although they now had lighters, the kerosene in them was a non-renewable resource, so everyone decided to use magnifying glasses to light fires, except in emergencies, when they would use magnifying glasses to light fires. Everything was ready, and the four of Tan Thien were finally ready to start building the boat. He saw that there were many types of savage technology encyclopedias, mostly small dugout canoes, wooden rafts and fishing boats. He found this boat to be stable in shape, with good load-bearing capacity, not easy to capsize at sea, and able to withstand waves. Add sails for strong winds, as relying solely on manual oars is easily affected by ocean currents. After deciding on the boat building plan, the four of Tan Thien started working. Because the structure of the double-hulled boat was simple, the construction speed was much faster than that of a single-hulled boat. He made a cabin on the deck so that he would not have to worry about wind and rain. It only took a week for the double-hulled boat to be completed and successfully tested in the water. That night, Nick used the telescope to look at the constellations in the sky and vowed to save everyone. Tan Thien and Deep Lamb sat down anxiously and confided in each other. Jessica also wanted to come and exchange feelings with the two of them, but after that, I don't know, my brothers. Early the next morning, Tan Thien's group calculated that they would climb up and arrive at the seashore on time. He, Jessica, and Nick set off, while Babo and Deep Lamb stayed in the camp. Babo couldn't bear to leave Tan Thien. Deep Lamb was determined to take good care of the camp, which was also helping them. Nick looked into the distance, I will save everyone, I will take them to the promised land. Jessica avoided the sea currents on the shore. When the waves hit the cliffs, they would be reflected back, forming a convection current. At noon, the wind on the sea was much smaller, but it was also very chaotic. Jessica could only furl the sails, the sun was not yet poisonous enough to make people doubt life. Without any shelter, exposing oneself to the sun for 10 minutes would cause the skin to burn and the most serious thing was light pollution. The sea surface was rippling like a mirror, reflecting the sunlight, and even the titanium alloy dog's eyes would be blinded. So the three of them hid in the bomb shelter to recover their strength and replenish their water. In the afternoon, the sea wind was still very small. Tan Thien and Jessica had no choice but to row the boat with the wooden planks they had prepared in advance. Haninik could only watch them helplessly because his arm was injured. Human speed could not compare to the wind. They would stop and rest after a while. In the end, all three of them still hadn't reached the deserted island by nightfall as expected. The three of them anchored their boat and spent the night there. There was not enough iron, so he made four wooden anchors and placed them at the four corners of the boat. Jessica was on night watch because she had more experience. Tan Thien slept for two or three hours before being awakened by a noise, and he sat talking with her until morning. The next day, the weather was very good and the sea wind was blowing steadily from early morning, and Tan Thien's group sailed with the wind. As the sun began to set, he looked through the telescope and saw the sandy shore, and hurriedly said, we have reached the other side of the island. He asked Sa Dai to scout ahead, and after landing, everyone set up camp and discussed. Nick advised everyone to be careful because the bad guys were looking for something, they could be anywhere, so we had to be careful when we went out. The next morning, the three of them continued on their way and found that the vegetation on this side was taller, but there were no shrubs. Nick had already seen the way back, but she stopped because she didn't see anyone guarding it, which was unusual. Tan Thien asked Sa Dai to scout ahead and found out that there were many two-legged beasts. 
He told Jessica to stay behind while he and Nick went in to take a look. Nick had already rushed in. At this time, inside the Lara tribe, they were discussing with the elder. After Nick went missing, the tribe leader, her father, and several warriors also went missing. She told everyone that first of all, she had not met with any mishaps, and that she had passed through the fog to the other side of the island. The other side was similar to this, and the second thing was that she had met the shaman, who was Tan Thien. Most people didn't believe her, when suddenly, Sadai swooped down and flew to Tan Thien's side, appearing. He acted so coolly to make everyone believe him, but he was still doubted, so he lit a fire in the air for everyone. Seeing the fire in the air, they believed that he was a shaman and knelt down to him. Suddenly, a tall, scarred man sitting on a chair challenged him. Nick stood in front of Tan Thien and told the tall man that the shaman had tamed the eagle, and had caught a big bird to fight a giant snake, but he still didn't give up the idea of fighting him. He used the speed of a cheetah, pressing only two fingers on his head and making him freeze. Everyone was amazed at his speed, which far surpassed that of mankind. He provoked him, if he could stand up, he would accept the challenge. But he tried his best and couldn't stand up, so it was considered a pass. Let me tell you a little secret, you can do this with everyone, you can use two fingers to subdue Qatar, it's a matter of skill, not strength. This has to do with human mechanics and physics. When a person goes from sitting to standing, they have to go through two directions. The first force is forward, and then upward. During this process, if you press down on his forehead with your hand, he will not be able to lean forward, and his center of gravity will fall on his buttocks, so no matter how strong he is, he will not be able to stand up. The elder thanked the shaman, and at this time, Jessica, everyone greeted the great female shaman. He and she stepped up and said loudly, that's right, the great shaman heard everyone's pleas, so he sent us here to save everyone from their plight. Everyone cheered and thanked them. It was already evening, and the elder led him and Jessica to a tent. While Nick was telling the shaman about his battle with the giant snake, she also has a good eye, it's the telescope, looking far away, very good. He prepared everything because he saw that the Lara tribe had only 20 people, including the old and the young so including him, there were only 10 people to fight, so even if they used the bombs, they would not be able to defeat those people. He brought the food and drew a sad face, asking him to help save the people of his tribe. He patted the child's head and promised him, and when the child's stomach suddenly growled, he brought him some meat, which the child ate like a starving tiger. Through Lu's account, he learned that the tribe had little food left, so the child was hungry. Before, because they were fleeing, they didn't have time to bring food, although after they settled down. Every day the warriors in the tribe went out to hunt, but the food they brought back was far from enough to support the entire tribe, plus the weather was getting colder. Animals were scarce outside, and the food the warriors brought back was getting less and less, so much so that now the people in the tribe could only take turns going out to find food in order to barely survive to this day. The elder brought a basket of food and blamed LLU for being here. He saw that there wasn't much food, but he brought it to him, and he told the old man to take it and share it with everyone. He gave the old man a backpack of dried meat to distribute to everyone, and he was so touched that he burst into tears. Early the next morning, Nick woke the two of them up, and he yawned and went out, but he didn't see anyone anywhere. The elder brought a basket of fruit and invited him to join them. Then he asked Nick to take him to the enemy's place to scout it out before attacking. The elder hoped to see firsthand how the shaman would defeat the enemy. Jessica and he came up with a reason, that the shaman had used up all his shamanic power when he came here, so he couldn't fight directly, but would use the wisdom of the shaman god to help the tribe. He and Nick learned from the tribe scouts that the bad guys had left a day ago, and usually traveled half a day. The two of them slowed down and arrived at their camp by noon the next day. He saw many wooden boats, all of them with young men wearing buffalo horn helmets and dragon head boats. Dragon head boat. He saw that their peace offering was extremely small. Nick saw his tribesmen, their hands and feet shackled in iron chains, carrying wood. He saw that their guards were lax, only one person at each of the four corners, when suddenly Sa Dieu signaled that someone was coming. He and Nick quickly hid. They were speaking Norwegian and arguing because they had followed the captain's orders to search but had found nothing. They sat down to think and talk about the giant snake. According to them, one of them had been shot in the thigh with an arrow and had been swallowed by the snake because he couldn't run fast enough. He had just learned that they had been chasing him and Nick before, and had only just returned. They said that if there was a giant snake, then there would definitely be the legendary treasure spring. He had to get the map from them in order to have a chance of returning to the mainland. After scouting the area, Tan Thien and Nick returned, while Qatar and two Lara tribesmen were hunting a little further away from the camp when they were chased by a group of pirates. Because one of them was running while carrying an injured man, their running speed was very slow. 
Qatar asked Rana to put Aruba down so that the two of them could escape. Aruba didn't want to die, so he begged Qatar to save him, but he was still left behind because if they were all captured, who would go out and hunt? The tribe would starve to death. Nick suddenly appeared and shouted at Qatar to charge and fight to protect his tribesmen. Tan Thien, hiding in the bushes, suddenly shot an arrow that hit a pirate in the thigh. Qatar advised everyone that if they fought, they should not let them blow the buffalo horn, it would be very dangerous. Because if they heard the horn, they would call for more support. Qatar's stone spear would be broken against their shields, so he had to strike a fatal blow. Qatar used the wooden head of his spear to push the pirate away. The pirates saw that they were not fighting well and laughed out loud. Qatar called Rana to help him. When the three of them were surrounded, Nick told Qatar to pretend to be unable to defeat them so that they would not blow the horn. While the enemy was off guard, Tan Thien rescued the people and left. He signaled Sa Diu to tell Nick that everything was okay, and to go ahead and kill them all. Nick killed one Kara, and then another. Tan Thien saw one of them trying to sound the horn and shot him too. Just like that, the three tribesmen killed two more. But the horn sounded, and Qatar killed the one who had blown it, and within three minutes, the other pirates would gather here. Everyone had to leave immediately, even the forest was disturbed. Nick ran to Tan Thien and said that it was not good to run now. The pirates were everywhere and it was easy to be caught, so they should find a place to hide and then figure out what to do at night. At the old place, a group of pirates ran to the place where the horn had been blown, and when they saw the bodies, they not only did not feel sorry, but also teased each other. Whoever arrived first, one of them discovered the bloodstains, and two of them did not want anyone to know because they would have to share 100 pounds with a native. Tan Thien treated Aruba's wound briefly to avoid leaving any bloodstains. He cried with emotion. Before nightfall, Tan Thien's group had found an extremely mysterious cave, and their agitated and anxious mood had just calmed down. At night, without torches, the pirates would not be able to find them easily, and with the added presence of wild beasts, they would not dare to search for them at night. Qatar and the other two, who had been hunting far from the tribe, had not caught anything and had been chased by pirates. Now their stomachs were growling. Tan Thien gave them dried pork. Aruba and Yana were very happy. Qatar seemed embarrassed. Aruba had been left behind, but he did not resent Qatar, because he had no choice but to do so for the sake of the tribe. Aruba teased Qatar, and finally he happily ate with them. The next day, as soon as it was light, Tan Thien's group set off immediately, and to their surprise, the way back was smooth and nothing happened. Under Sa Diu's guidance, they returned easily. Tan Thien told the guard that Aruba was injured and needed to be treated immediately. Tan Thien returned and discussed with Jessica that the pirate group had about 100 people equipped with iron armor and weapons. Jessica liked to learn about pirates through corpses and skeletons, which made Tan Thien speechless. After he talked to Jessica, he learned that the pirates were talking about the giant snake. The giant sea monster was not active around the deserted island. The fountain of youth could grant eternal life, but only with the holy grail. It sounded like pirates of the Caribbean. Tan Thien felt that it was still most important to solve the problem of food for the tribe. He came up with a plan to borrow food, but never return it. Tan Thien drew a map of the enemy's camp layout. The prison, the dining hall, the warehouse, and a plan to lure the pirates out of the camp to take advantage of the opportunity to rescue the people and take the pirates' food. Taking advantage of the enemy's greed, he had a plan to create Aquanesia to treat the people who had been captured and shackled. The next day, the elder brought him a chicken leg to thank him for saving Aruba, and he couldn't refuse. The lack of salt in the flavor reminded him of deep lamb's cooking. Tan Thien asked the elder to introduce him to the craftsman Ailes. Ailes was a strong and muscular girl with six-pack abs. She was a skilled craftsman who made tools and weapons. She was so focused on sharpening the spear blade that she didn't notice him coming. He watched her work in silence, and only when she was finished did she realize that the shaman had arrived and knelt down in shock. After Tan Thien had bought a good understanding of the language, he asked Alex to make a pipe and a test tube. She patted her chest and said she would make the most perfect bottle for him. Tan Thien smiled wryly, because he only needed a bottle that wouldn't leak, not one that was too perfect. Tan Thien wanted to ask for bones to make, but the elder thought he wanted the bones of the enemy to perform voodoo curses. When he asked for animal bones, he thought he wanted to summon the earth spirit. Jessica quickly told him that he wanted to make tools, and the elder finally believed him and led him away. He wanted to make matches from white phosphorus, and the method was as follows. Mix bone meal with carbon and silica, seal it from the air and heat it, then pass the resulting gas into water to cool it and collect the white phosphorus. He wrote to Deep Lamb and asked Sa Diu to bring him some casinoic. While he was free, he and Jessica went to look for food around the Lara tribe. They found that they could only eat bark and grass, because the tribe had picked everything else clean. 
two met Aruba, who was holding taro leaves under his armpits. Aruba didn't know that they were edible. He picked the leaves because they were convenient for covering his head from the sun. Tan Thien and Jessica were delighted and asked Aruba to take them to the taro plant, where they found many. Their eyes lit up, and the tribe would no longer have to worry about hunger. Let me introduce you to taro, a perennial herb in the Araceae family. Usually grown as an annual, and as an important vegetable and food crop with high nutritional and medicinal value, and as a suitable nutrient for all ages. Taro is very rich in starch, with starch grains as small as 1 19th of potato starch, and a digestibility rate of up to 98%. It can also be used to make vinegar, sour wine, and extract alkaloids. When Aruba saw the two of them about to pick and eat them, he hurriedly shouted, don't eat them. If you do, your teeth will swell, you will vomit, and your mouth and tongue will become dry. Tan Thien quickly explained that they were poisonous when unripe, and that they would only lose their toxicity when cooked. Aruba thought they were edible and happily pulled them all out. But after hearing what Tan Thien said again, he realized that only the stems could be eaten, and his face fell again because there was so little. Tan Thien was wondering where to start explaining when Jessica pulled up the whole plant and showed Aruba that the corn was edible. At this time, Aruba finally understood, and the three of them began to dig up the taro. Since they didn't have any bags, they had to use their clothes to wrap them up and take them back. The elder and Alex were surprised and didn't believe that this kind of tuber could be eaten. Tan Thien and Jessica had no choice but to prove it. Since there was no steamer, they had to boil it in water. It took about 10 minutes to boil the taro. During this time, the three of them stared at the taro pot as if they wanted to eat the whole pot. Tan Thien saw that it was cooked and opened the lid. A fragrant smell wafted out. To be sure, he poked the tuber with chopsticks. If it was cooked, it would go all the way in. He gave each of the three people a tuber. He himself also wanted to eat this starch very much. Eating fruit and meat all the time was getting boring. The three of them found that the tubers were still too hot and tossed them around to cool them down. After they had cooled down a bit, the three of them couldn't wait to eat them, including the skin. They found it so delicious that the elder was moved to tears. The Lara tribe would no longer have to go hungry. He knelt down to thank Tan Thien. The three of them ate their fill and went out to dig up more taro for the whole village to eat. The whole village smelled the delicious aroma and came running. They were each holding a frog in one hand. Tan Thien had already cooked three large pots of taro, and the whole village was overjoyed because these three large pots contained a lot of food. Everyone had a share. When Nick and Qatar brought back the wild boar, everyone showed them what was edible in the pot. Everyone listened to him and lifted the pot to eat. Lu wanted to give Tan Thien a tiger's tooth as a gift. He thanked Lu for the small gift and patted his head. Qatar also admitted that Tan Thien was friendly, unlike the stupid crab shaman who just sat in his tent doing mysterious things. These two still ate the whole thing, including the skin. Tan Thien informed everyone that the taro field could not be sustained for long. The pirates were still constantly narrowing the tribe's position, narrowing their living conditions. So everyone should hurry up and build boats. If they could rescue the people, they would take a boat to his camp. Everyone agreed to follow. Then, under Hamel's organization, the Lara tribe tried their best to stay away from the pirate camp, and set up a boat building site in the forest near the beach where Tan Thien's group had landed. Tan Thien went to Alex to get the pottery that he had asked her to make, but he didn't expect her to make it so beautiful. He only needed it to hold things. It took so much time, so she made him two sets. Even Jessica thought that this pottery was even more beautiful than what Deep Lamb had made. After preparing the experimental solution, Tan Thien went to the beach to collect seashells. After crushing the seashells and heating them, he could extract the lime. Then add lime to the water to get potassium hydroxide precipitate. Jessica was in charge of boiling seawater to get magnesium chloride, which is a white or colorless crystalline solid with a bitter taste, soluble in water and strongly hygroscopic, i.e. a halogen salt. After both materials were ready, add calcium oxide to the halogen salt. There are many metals in seawater, including magnesium, which exists in seawater as magnesium chloride. After magnesium chloride and potassium hydroxide in the halogen salt meet, they will react to form magnesium hydroxide precipitate and calcium oxide solution. But after I asked my chemistry teacher again, I found out that all these formulas were wrong. And I was already bad at chemistry, so I just gave up and didn't ask any more questions. Tan Thien used clothes to filter out the magnesium hydroxide precipitate from the quicklime. Jessica took the battery out of her backpack and prepared a saturated salt water solution. Under electrolysis conditions, the ions in the saturated salt water solution are ionized. The hydroxide and sodium ions combine to form sodium hydroxide solution, and the hydrogen and chlorine ions become gases. 
Tan thene collected chlorine and hydrogen chloride and passed them through water to form hydrochloric acid. The filtered magnesium hydroxide precipitate was bubbled into hydrochloric acid to cause a chemical reaction to produce a pure magnesium chloride solution. The final step is to evaporate the water by heating it to obtain solid magnesium chloride, which is then heated to a molten state and electrolyzed. The chlorine element in magnesium chloride becomes chlorine gas and is released, and what remains is white magnesium powder. After a busy day, it was finally finished. He and Jessica lit it up and it emitted a bright blue light. Some people in the tribe thought it was witchcraft. All the people in the tribe just needed to be fed, and they wouldn't get tired from cutting trees all day. Tan Thien had already drawn a blueprint of the wooden raft and gave it to Alex, because the tribe didn't have any iron. If they used hemp rope made from tree bark, it would be easily broken by the seawater. Alex looked at the blueprint he had drawn. It was amazing. Two pieces of wood could be connected together tightly. Alex thought it would take five days to finish, because it would take a long time to drill the holes to ensure they fit together. And there were limited tools for drilling. But Jessica said that she only needed to make the main parts that needed to be used, and she could finish it in three days. Tan Thien put his hands on her shoulders and confidently entrusted her with the task of building the boat. Sa Diu carried the bag of supplies that Deep Lam had sent, including glass experimental equipment. He didn't expect her to become a survival expert. She also sent him a safety report, which made him forget to send her a letter of peace. Tan Thien took the roasted bones and crushed them to get white phosphorus, then mixed the carbon powder, silicon powder, and bone powder and heated them at a high temperature. This part is about chemistry. If you don't understand it, you can skip it. Under high temperature conditions, silicon dioxide will react with calcium phosphate in the bones to produce calcium silicate and phosphorus pentoxide. After the phosphorus pentoxide is reduced by charcoal, it can produce phosphorus in the form of gas. And the carbon dioxide and phosphorus gas will turn into white particles when they meet water and sink into the water. Some particles float on the water and rise. White phosphorus is highly toxic, so you must keep a safe distance at this time to avoid death. With white phosphorus, you can make white phosphorus matches, but white phosphorus matches are not safe. What he wanted to do was safe, because white phosphorus ignites spontaneously if it exceeds 40 degrees and will burn on any surface due to friction. If the movement is slightly larger, the matches in the matchbox will rub against each other and ignite spontaneously, which is very dangerous. In 1852, the Swedish man Tasterum improved the safety match. The difference is that the igniter is red phosphorus instead of white phosphorus. Red phosphorus has a higher auto-ignition point and can only be ignited by friction on a surface coated with red phosphorus. It does not produce toxic gases when burned. The method of producing red phosphorus is very simple. Just heat white phosphorus to about 300 degrees and isolate it from the air. The temperature of a bonfire can be reached. Next, create the potassium chlorate that safety matches need. Add the calcium hydroxide solution obtained as a byproduct in the production of magnesium to the potassium carbonate solution, which is also lye water, to obtain calcium carbonate precipitate and potassium hydroxide solution. Chlorine gas is obtained by electrolyzing salt water again and then passing it into potassium chloride solution. Heating produces a solution of potassium chlorate and potassium chloride. The solubility of potassium chlorate and potassium chloride is used to cool the mixture, which can cause a large amount of potassium chlorate crystals to precipitate out of the solution. Finally, remove the bark from a twig, dry it to remove moisture, and cut and trim it as needed to complete the match. To make the match head, use a glue made from pig bones cooked earlier, mix in sand and sulfur, and then add water and mix well, the ratio of which is 1240, 6. Then the important step is to add potassium chlorate and red phosphorus. And this mixture is also the biggest difference between safety matches and white phosphorus matches. The system currently registers the host to make a special reward of 1000 points. Jessica was so happy that she hugged Tan Thien, so he was crushed by the mountain again. Hee <laughs> hee. Next, make aqua regia so that a large amount of white smoke from natural white phosphorus is generated and follows the pipe into hot water to produce phosphoric acid. Add potassium nitrate powder to the phosphoric acid solution and continue to heat it at a high temperature to produce a brown-red gas. Finally, through cooling water, 10 phosphoric acid can be collected to make aqua regia. Hydrochloric acid and phosphoric acid are ready. Aqua regia needs to be made and used immediately. Aqua regia is a very corrosive compound. 
I'll stop making it here. The two of them went to check on the progress of the boat. Nick had fully recovered from his injuries and was in good shape to fight. Ella introduced Tan Thien to the six relatively strong ones that they had built. The boat he built with nails could carry six people. He told Alex to make a few more boats so that the tribe could finish their research and join them. Four days later, Tan Thien gave everyone a box of matches. He demonstrated it and Lu did it right away. Seeing the fire in the air, everyone thought it was witchcraft. It was amazing. Alex found the spark very similar to the spark when she struck the stone. He instructed everyone how to use it, place the head of the match in the striker on the side of the matchbox and rub it quickly to create a fire. Katar found it very convenient. Tan Thien called for everyone's spirits. Because everyone had worked hard for the past few days, the time had come to rescue their fellow tribesmen. He chose a few suitable people to go with him to the rescue. He immediately chose a girl named Pakuma and Pahama as guards to supervise the outer circle of the tribe. Brotherly relations, neutral and handsome appearance. If it weren't for the differences in their bodies, just looking at their faces, it would be easy for people to mistake them for two brothers. Their main weapon is a bow and arrow, and their waists are very short. They are good at attacking from a distance. Another male named Virus is the oldest warrior in the tribe, about 40 years old, with a strong and upright body. His weapon is two stone axes, which he wields with skill and composure. The rest are Haninik, Katar, and Arna, who had met him before. Tan Thien and everyone gathered to discuss the plan. Jessica saw that he was worried because if he had to face killing someone, he still wouldn't dare. She advised him that if the other party attacked, he should take the first step and kill his opponent, as hesitation would lead to his own destruction. Those pirates were already devils with blood on their hands. She hugged him and hoped that he would return alive. Late at night the next day, two guards were sitting and arguing about having to stand guard at night in the cold weather when they suddenly saw a glowing area, which was Tan Thien tying a flashlight to Sa Diu. The pirates thought it was a fountain of youth and went to report it to the captain. At this time, the captain was sitting and holding a line to catch a shark. Just as the shark jumped up to take the bait, he threw a harpoon at it. Hearing that someone wanted to report that he had not caught it, he went out to meet the one who dared to disturb him. If the news was important he would reward the bearer with candy, but if not he would send him to the counting board. He saw the light that his subordinate reported as a treasure fountain and rewarded the bearer with some gold. The other pirates rushed to look for gold, but two smart ones chose to stay behind because they were not sure if they dared to take the treasure. They stole from the captain, the only result would be to eat bananas without peeling them and look at the chicken's butt, so the two of them sat still and watched, waiting for the fisherman to profit. The captain's nickname was O-Ri to see who was the fish and who was the fisherman today. The pirate saw the moving light and chased after it. Unfortunately, Tan Thien used binoculars to see that there were still 20 pirates who had not taken the bait. He handed the binoculars to the two archers. If they did not care, the two of them would cover from afar, Nick, Katar, and he would sneak in from behind. The wall was too high. He told Nick to help Katar go in first, but Katar jumped over it and Nick jumped over it too. He thought the wall was at least 3 meters high but the other two jumped over it as if it was nothing. They were the real kings of the land, not him. He used his cheetah speed to run and jump over it. All three of them saw that there was no one behind the barracks. Guessing roughly that it was on the southwest side of the barracks, Tan Thien stopped because he had seen two guards the last time he had scouted, but now he didn't know. Katar hurriedly said that there was no time to hesitate, so all three of them went into the prison to rescue the people. Nick ran to her father and her tribesmen and told them to rest assured that the master would rescue everyone. Tan Thien told Katar to stand guard while he went to prepare the Aqua Regia. The system showed that the Aqua Regia had been successfully prepared and awarded 1000 points. Aqua Regia is prepared in a ratio of 3 parts concentrated hydrochloric acid to 1 part concentrated nitric acid. The steps are very simple, but you must be careful. Concentrated hydrochloric acid is a highly corrosive liquid. If you drop it on your skin, it is very common to see white bones right away. He advised everyone to stand away from it and not touch it. He poured the first chain lock, then he called everyone to quickly reach out their hands and feet to the iron chain so that he could drop it. He gave Nick and Katar two bottles to save the people in the remaining cages. After everyone had escaped from the chains and walked outside, they heard a whistle signaling that someone was coming. The two archers outside were told by Tan Thien to use the strategy of meeting meat with a vegetable wall and shoot fire into the granary causing half of them to go and put out the fire. Because this was the granary for the winter, the captain, Ol, led the remaining people to the prison. He laughed when he saw the Lara tribesmen climbing the wall to escape. This time, he would catch them all at once. Tan Thien saw that these people were too smart to fall for his tricks, so he did not hesitate to take a bomb, 
light it, and throw it at the pirates. Tan Thien shouted for everyone to hurry up or they would all go to the meeting. He hoped that this bomb would intimidate the pirates. Suddenly, one of them flew towards Tan Thien. Qatar rushed forward to block him and then killed him. The captain, Ol, laughed gleefully and charged forward. Immediately after that, Qatar blocked him. He was very excited to meet Qatar. Tan Thien held a spare bomb. If the pirates attacked, he would send them all to the Western Paradise to recite scriptures. Captain Ol shouted, Advance all for your father, 200 gold for each native head. Then they rushed forward. He threw another bomb, but one of them knocked it into the air. He had claws on his hands and rushed towards Tan Thien. Nick quickly blocked the blow for him. Nick told him and everyone to go ahead, she would deal with them. He thought it would not be good to go, and while he was thinking, there was a rain of rockets that made the pirates stop to shield themselves, burning their shields and armor. The arrowheads were sprinkled with white phosphorus animal fur. When the arrow hit its target, the white phosphorus would fall from the fur. The ignition point of white phosphorus is low, and the flame at the tip of the arrow is used as a conductor to ignite it. He could not fight back in close combat, but he was okay at fighting from a distance. One of them was hit in the leg. He was about to shoot another one when suddenly one came from the left and one from the right behind the house and ran to cut him. When he found out, the patriarch blocked the blow and told him to run ahead. He ran over the fence to support him, but he saw that he was dodging very quickly and the other one had lost some of his chewing accessories. One of them lost his helmet. His eyes flashed with bloodlust and he unleashed a furious dragon kick, knocking the two of them down. With this, who needs help? He saw that Nick and the claw guy were evenly matched, but Qatar was being pinned down by Captain Ole. He laughed gleefully because he was still young and inexperienced. Without a powerful weapon, how could he fight back? Qatar had already suffered several wounds, and his fire arrows were almost gone. Tan Thien had to strike quickly and win quickly. He primed a stun grenade and shouted to his men, close your eyes. Take advantage of the moment to run quickly to the deep forest. After everyone had crossed the fence, he threw more smoke bombs to buy time. The pirates, unable to see anything, slashed at each other in confusion. The captain ordered all the pirates to cross the fence and follow the footprints. The pirates stopped in fear when they saw that it was dark, and the forest was full of wild animals. He said coldly, if you don't catch up, you will all go to reunite with your ancestors. The pirates were afraid of the captain, so they had to go into the forest to search for them. There were still pirates searching in the forest. If they were unlucky enough to meet them and the pirates chasing them, they would be surrounded in a circle. They will find the location of the tribe. We must follow the plan and run to the beach before dawn. If they chase us and get on the boat, there will be nowhere to hide on this deserted island. Nick discovered another small group of pirates. He told everyone to hide quickly and take advantage of the dark spots to hide. Half an hour later, Han Thien's group encountered another branch of the pirate patrol. The light of the torch was really too bright in the darkness. Tan Thien's group once again successfully hid from their pursuit. The third group of pirates left. Everyone was rejoicing when suddenly the third group of pirates returned. It turned out that they had pretended to extinguish the torch. They had seen everyone. Nick, Qatar, and the Patriarch rushed forward and killed several of them before they could react. Two of them were about to blow the bugle when they were shot dead by the Pakuma and Pahama brothers. In the battle just now, he felt a little sad when he saw five people die in front of him. He quickly led everyone away from there. Each pirate held a torch that illuminated the entire forest. He saw that it was no good to do the same thing again. If they were discovered, it would only attract more of them. He discussed with everyone that when he used smoke bullets and bombs to lure them, everyone had to run quickly. Nick, Qatar, and some of the other tribesmen tried to do it for him, but he wouldn't let them. He would lure the enemy. Because he had the talent of a cheetah, and no one could match him. He told them that after he returned, everyone had to listen to Jessica. He took a smoke bomb, lit it, and started running with a torch. Nick couldn't bear to let him do it alone but her father pulled her away and advised her not to waste the opportunity he had created. Han Thien had led a large number of pirates to chase after him, so Nick's group was less likely to be discovered, so he began to use a strategy to shake them off. Using the speed of a cheetah, the pirates couldn't keep up, and they thought it was the power of the Fountain of Eternal Youth. They blew the bugle again to call for their comrades. After using the speed of a cheetah, Tan Thien stood panting at the foot of a tree. Fortunately, after living on the island for so long, his physical strength had increased. Every once in a while, he would use his talent once, and it was easier to hide alone, 
which was why he wanted to be the bait. Han Thien heard the sounds around him and saw the torches surrounding him. He used a stun bomb and ran towards the cliff, took the umbrella out of his bag and jumped down. At this moment, he could only pray that the umbrella wouldn't break. At this time, the pirates on the cliff began to talk about the madman who had jumped off the cliff with blood rushing to his brain. He's crazy. As they were arguing, their captain, Ol, arrived. His face was as cold as if someone had stolen his money. He forced a smile and asked his men why they were gathered there. He had heard that he had summoned a fog, shining a bright light like the sun in the dark night, running as fast as the wind, and jumping off the cliff like a bird. He also thought that he had used the fountain of eternal youth to gain such strength and superpowers. He pushed one of them off the cliff and turned to his men and shouted, go down and find him alive or dead. He had landed safely at the bottom of the cliff, next to the sea. It was impossible to climb down on his own. Without any tools, the cliff was steep and sharp, making it difficult to climb down. The pirates were afraid of the sea monster, so they didn't dare to go into the water. He had calculated that the tide would not come in at this time. He would have to wait until dawn. He was folding his umbrella when he saw a pile of bodies that were as rotten as a boat. He thought that he had originally survived on the island, but now he was being hunted down. He found it hard to accept this fact. When it was dawn, Jessica was waiting for everyone to return. Everyone in the tribe was overjoyed to see each other again. From what Nick said, Jessica knew that he was fine. Tan Thien's side was using umbrellas as blankets because the dew had made their clothes wet and they were shivering from the cold. Early the next morning, Tan Thien woke up to the pirates above talking loudly about how to climb down the cliff. He smiled wryly to himself. It seemed that he couldn't just sit and wait for death. He saw that the sea was vast and there was no shore in sight. Swimming was impossible, but he saw a piece of driftwood floating by. It could also serve as food. For several days, he had been collecting pieces of wood to make a raft. He tried it out once, but after a while, he found that most of them were unusable. Suddenly, there was a saw dew sent by Jessica. He sent her the location on the coral reef below the cliff to the southeast of the pirate camp, and he could use the saw dew to lead the way. He told her to be careful, as the pirates were still searching. After stuffing the letter into the saw dew's leg, it flew away immediately. He could only wait and wait. At dusk, he was sitting there lost in thought, thinking that he wouldn't be rescued until noon tomorrow at the earliest, when he saw the saw dew flying towards him, followed by Nick, Katar, and Rana rowing towards him at the speed of light. Nick and Katar were so strong that Rana couldn't keep up with them and was out of breath. By dusk, the three of them, Nick, had exhausted a lot of their energy to get here as quickly as possible. They wanted to leave immediately, but it was impossible. They could only stop there for the night. Fortunately, they had brought food, water, and tents when they left. The four of them camped on the coral reef and spent the night in peace. The next day, they rowed back together. He helped Rana row the boat on the way back. Katar told everyone to sit down and then set off. On the other side, Jessica was looking out to sea, comforting Lou that everything would be okay. Everyone was overjoyed to see Nick's boat returning. He and Yana were almost panting when they arrived, exhausted from rowing too fast to keep up with Nick and Katar. Jessica had prepared nine boats to set sail, but in order to avoid being discovered by the pirates, the boats gradually moved away from the shore. Under the cover of darkness, Jessica gave the order. Today, we will move here, drop anchor, and link the boats together. Meanwhile, Tan Thien, who had spent two nights on the coral reef, was exhausted both mentally and physically. After setting off, he went into the cabin of the boat and fell fast asleep. Suddenly, he smelled something delicious and woke up. Jessica had brought him food to eat before he went to sleep. He ate like a tiger. He told her about everything he had encountered while rescuing the tribesmen, which made Jessica's heart skip a beat every time he mentioned a dangerous situation. Then she hugged him and said that it was so good to have him back. The next morning, at the village of the tribe, the pirates had found the base camp of the Lara tribe. The captain of the ship laughed proudly. This time, we'll catch you all. He ordered the pirates to charge in. A moment later, his subordinate reported that there was no one there, and he angrily ordered everyone to continue searching. The sky was clear and cloudless. Tan Thien's group had reached the other side of the island. Everyone saw that this place was not much different from the other side. They walked for another hour and arrived at his camp. Everyone heard a terrifying roar coming from the camp, and he told them that it was his pet. Everyone saw that he was truly a master of martial arts, and his pet was so terrifying. Yi Lin came out with Babo and Xiao Bai to welcome Tan Thien back. When the Lara tribe saw this, they knelt down and bowed to her, as she was their shaman. She and Babo didn't know what to say, so Jessica took over the arrangements for the Lara tribe so that he could have a chance to talk to Yi Lin. He had just called her name when she hugged him tightly. 
She sobbed and cried, worried about what she would do if he didn't come back. Later, at the Lara tribe's place, a delicious aroma filled the air. Everyone stood there with small bowls in their hands, drooling. Some people ate it while praising it, while others tried the smoked pork with spices. He saw that the cave was not big enough, and the Lara tribe now had 47 people, plus Tanthines 3, making a total of 50 people. With this number of people, the camp was overcrowded. Everyone could sit or lie down, but, if they moved around, they would bump into each other. It would also crowd the living space of Babo, Sajiu, and Xiao Bai. He felt that expanding the camp was urgent. Jessica came over to tease them about hugging each other just now, making Yi Lin blush and use the excuse of going to make stew. Jessica had seen everything that had happened just now, so now she wanted to hug him again. Well, he gave her a little hug to satisfy her craving. Everyone ate until their stomachs were full and round, as if they had never eaten so well before. He and Yi Lin saw that there was not enough sleeping space, so they gave priority to the elderly and children to sleep in the cave and the kitchen, while the others slept outside on the ground. One day, the tribesmen came out and burned several piles of firewood on the ground, forming a circle, and added another fire in the middle. Half of the Lara tribe lined the ground with animal skins to lie on, so that both their upper and lower bodies would feel warm. In addition, Tanthine also set up tents for those who were weak, such as Aruba, to rest in. At 10 p.m., after a busy day, Tanthine finally got to take a hot bath. His clothes had been stinking for days, and Yi Lin had boiled hot water for him. He felt very comfortable. Everyone was fast asleep. Next morning, everyone started to wake up. When Tan Thien opened his bleary eyes, he saw Yi Lin and Jessica sleeping in his arms. After a simple breakfast, they divided into three teams. The first team followed Tan Thien into the forest to cut bamboo to build a bamboo house for the night. The second team followed Jessica to the river to catch fish, even though there was still a lot of dried pork in the camp, but it was not enough to feed the entire tribe. The third team stayed in the camp with Yi Lin, who was in charge of doing odd jobs around the camp. Tan Thien directed everyone to build a bamboo hut, which reminded Yi Lin of the past when she and he had lived in one. Jessica came back and bragged to him that she had caught a lot of fish. In the evening, everyone built a big bonfire and held hands to dance around it. The three of them were sitting there when Jessica invited Yi Lin to dance with her, while Tan Thien sat and talked with the chief. He spoke English to Tan Thien, which made the elder curious. He asked the chief what language he was speaking, and the chief said that it was a special language that only the chief and the shaman knew. The chief said that he had learned it from the American soldiers, and when he saw that Tan Thien was using matches and lighters, he wanted to confirm it. He knelt down and thanked him, even though he was not a shaman, but if it had not been for him, the Lara tribe might have been wiped out. Next day, the urgent task was still to build bamboo huts and expand the camp. Tan Thien still divided them into three teams. The first team made bricks, the second team collected seashells, and the third team cut down trees around the camp. The seashells were mixed with sand to make mortar, but since everyone didn't understand, he told them to just do as they were told. He mixed the mortar and built bricks to create walls, and created four sides to form a house for everyone to see. One of the tribesmen pushed the wall to test it and found it soft and loose. He had just finished building it when he almost vomited blood, but fortunately it didn't break. He said that it would no longer be soft after a night, and it would harden again. The next day, everyone came out to see how the wall was doing. And even when they pushed it with all their strength, it wouldn't budge. Tan Thien showed it off to Aruba, but Qatar flew up and grabbed a spear. And with all his strength, he struck the wall, making a scratch and a crack in an area. Oh my god, man, next time I'll use cement to build it and you can try to break it. The elder Raman picked up a brick and cried. He recalled that when the tribe first arrived on the island, there were about 80 people. And in the autumn, it was very cold. Everyone was used to living in the desert and had few clothes, so due to the difference in climate, several people had died, either from being attacked by wild animals while searching for food or from eating poisonous mushrooms. A month later, just as they were adapting and building houses for themselves, winter came again. Because they had no food stored for the winter and had to endure going out to find it. Remembering what had happened in the past, he was very sad. He put his hand on the elder's shoulder to comfort him, and said that this winter would be warm. The tribe had been with Tan Thien for more than a week, and during this time, the pirates were still searching for them. They were standing in front of the white mist of the swamp, because it was too dangerous to go into the mud, and there was also methane gas that could kill people at any time, so no one dared to enter. The captain had heard that some natives had escaped into this mist, and he thought that it was because the spring of no age was there that they had not died. He was worried that even though he had been there for a year, he had not yet experienced a winter, so he ordered them to return and prepare for the winter. In another place, Yi Lin was making glass for everyone to see. 
Alex wanted to try it, and after a while, he made a bottle. Alex still wanted to continue, and he told everyone that he hoped everyone would make enough glass for the tribe to store food for the winter. He put Yi Lin in charge of it. Tan Thien saw that the blueprint for the camp needed to be revised a little. Time passed quickly, and he had just finished the design of the camp when Jessica had been waiting for him for more than 10 minutes, so she came in and let him to eat. When everyone ate, Tan Thien, Jessica, and Yi Lin saw that it was fish again. Even though they had cooked it in different ways, such as grilled fish and sour fish stew, they were really tired of eating it. Although dried pork was on the list of food reserves for the winter, they couldn't eat the same thing all the time, so he decided to improve the food structure for everyone. He asked the chief if the tribe's warriors were capable of catching wild boars. The chief said that if they were strays, it would be possible. But if it was a whole herd, it would probably not be possible. Tan Thien wanted to raise pigs, and after explaining it to the two of them, they finally understood. That if they raised pigs, the tribesmen would not have to risk their lives hunting in the future, and they would have pork to eat. Through domestication, the wildness of the boars would be worn away, but it would take several generations of successful breeding to domesticate them. The next day, he went with Babo and the young men of the tribe to catch pigs. The plan was to drive the pigs into a pit and then catch them and put them in a pen. Each person held a stick, and saw Dieu went to find the target. When they saw the wild boars sleeping, they surrounded them and had Babo roar, causing the wild boars to panic and run. One of the young men was scared when he saw so many pigs running towards them. Qatar jumped out and hit one of them, and it was then that the herd of pigs ran in the right direction, as planned. A few of the pigs in front fell into the pit, and the ones behind them stopped when they saw this. The others took wooden planks and pushed the rest of the pigs down, successfully capturing the herd of wild boars. Everyone cheered with joy, but unfortunately one of them escaped. Alex's group brought a car into the cage to transport them, and the tribesmen tied ropes around the pigs' legs and pulled them up. The other pigs were scared when they saw this, and one of them kept moving and couldn't be held still. Qatar was about to punch it to knock it out, but Tan Thien showed him a way. He just had to cover its head with a cloth and it would be quiet. Tan Thien's group caught seven pigs, both male and female. And when the wild boars mated, they could give birth to piglets, and the piglets would grow up and mate again to give birth to more piglets, and so on in a cycle. At the camp, everyone was building houses. Tan Thien's group returned, and Yi Lin and Jessica came out to greet them. Jessica led him to the pen that had been prepared for the pigs. He saw that the height was just right and that the wild boars didn't have much jumping power, so the pen was very stable for the next few days. Tan Thien continued to lead the tribe's warriors into the bamboo forest to catch pigs, and in no time, the number of wild boars in the camp reached 21. Lu and the others standing next to the pigsty laughed happily. On the fourth day, Sa Diu flew all over the sky above the bamboo forest, but he couldn't find any more pigs. And he didn't know if the wild boars had learned to hide intelligently or if they had all been caught. But 21 was already a lot, so there was no need to hunt anymore. Tan Thien was sitting in the cave. The system announced that the camp had been upgraded and rewarded with 5,000 points. He had already passed 13,000 points and could buy a talent. He wanted to choose guerrilla warfare, but then he thought that when he encountered a situation where he couldn't fight head on, it wouldn't be of much use, and it would be difficult to choose. So he decided to buy it when he needed it. Yi Lin called out to him and showed off the 50 glass jars that she and everyone else had made in one day. She gave everyone a little bit of knowledge about the process of making canned food. First, the glass jars were prepared, and the grapes were peeled and the pineapple was cored and put into boiling water to sterilize them. After they were sterilized, the grapes and pineapple were taken out and put into different glass jars. The lids were screwed on tightly, and then they were covered with animal skin that had been sterilized at a high temperature. Normally, rock sugar was added to make the food taste better, but since Tan Thien didn't have any, he used what he had. There were still some people who didn't believe that it could be stored for a long time, so he explained that the reason why plants rot is because of bacteria. If you just use high temperature to kill the microorganisms on the surface of the plant and then seal it to prevent microorganisms from outside from entering, you can achieve the purpose of storing the plant for a long time. The next day, he went with some people to the volcano to get some iron to make weapons to avoid being at a disadvantage when fighting the pirates. The elder, Qatar, and Rana said that even if they died, they would protect Tanthine. All he was thinking about at the moment was that he was just going to dig for ore, 
not go to the battlefield to fight the jinn. Was the whole place full of crossbow traps or something? Tan Thien had already gone twice, so he just needed to be careful. Yi Lin and Jessica both cheered him on and told him to come back quickly. The journey was smooth. They traveled for a whole day, and his group didn't encounter any danger. The sun had set, so they found a place in the forest to set up camp. Tan Thien's group rested. Nick asked if Iron could defeat the pirates. He showed her the iron knife. Nick saw that it was very hard and sharp. Alex was surprised. That's great. Before, I was always worried about making weapons as hard as the pirates. She wanted to know if they could make weapons like the pirates when they had steel. He happily replied that they could do even better. When everyone arrived at the volcano, Qatar found it very hot. One of the tribesmen saw a lake that didn't seem dangerous, so he warned them not to go swimming in it, because the acid was extremely corrosive. Everyone started digging. Two hours later, they had dug two holes but still hadn't found any pyrite, so they sat down to rest. As the afternoon passed and they dug two more large holes, they still didn't find any. He encouraged everyone not to lose heart. At night, they rested and continued digging the next day. In the evening, after everyone had eaten, they sat around the fire and made new stone axes. They worked until late at night to make the stone axes, and Alex alone made 30 of them. Tan Thien and I gave Olas a like. The girl was so good. The next morning, everyone got up early to collect bone water to drink. Even though they had brought water, it was always good to have more. They collected two bamboo tubes of water, which was enough for two people for one day. After everyone had finished eating, they continued digging. As he was digging, Nick suddenly called him over to see a strange rock she had dug up. It was another type of rock called volcanic rock because it had many holes. It was light and could float on water, so it was also called pumice. Its characteristics were that it was hard, insulating, heat-resistant, moisture-absorbing, fire-resistant, acid-resistant, and alkali-resistant, and had high corrosion resistance. He told Nick to keep it separate if she found any more. After that, he dug around but still didn't find any pyrite ore. On the fourth day, after they had almost finished digging around the mouth of the volcano, one of the tribesmen thought that the volcanic rock was useless and was about to throw it away, but Tan Thien called out to him. He suspected that it was pyrite ore. When he looked at it, he saw that there were no small holes on the surface of the rock. The surface was also a yellow color that was not easy to detect, although it was very different from the color of the pyrite he had brought back before. This heavy feeling was pyrite. He told everyone to keep digging, and everyone's spirits were lifted as they happily dug away. And sure enough, they found iron ore. They dug until the sun was about to set, and they still hadn't reached the bottom of the hole where the pyrite ore was. So, they could make an iron weapon for each person. As the old saying goes, if you work hard enough, you can turn iron into a crowbar. At night, Alex sat down and asked Tan Thien why the pyrite ore looked no different from the rock. He explained that the iron was inside. Qatar heard this and went to smash a piece open, but he still couldn't see anything different inside. Tan Thien told him that he had to use fire to heat it, but it was better to smash it first. Qatar turned his face away, probably not out of arrogance, but because he was embarrassed. Early in the morning on the fifth day, everyone built a blast furnace in the camp and began to smelt the iron. Alex and some of the others saw that the iron was very hard and dark. He encouraged everyone to finish smelting all the pyrite into iron today. He thought that they should smelt the iron into iron water and then forge it into iron tools. That way, they could dig for pyrite ore more quickly. He poured the iron water into the mold that Alex had made for him. Admin and Tan Thien gave Lux another like. The mold was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. Using lime water as the medium, I challenge you to speed up the process of transforming the iron ions in the iron material into a stable state of iron ions, so that the oxide film forms evenly and tightly. At the same time, lime water is alkaline and can neutralize the acidic components in the surrounding environment, slowing down corrosion. On the sixth day, after they had iron tools, the speed at which they dug for ore doubled. Tan Thien didn't know that winter was only about a month away, but it was already mid-October and it was about to snow. It was noon, and he and everyone else were very cold. The wind and sand were blowing, and small stones were hitting their faces, which was very painful. He saw that if they continued to dig, they wouldn't be able to transport the ore fast enough. He thought about smelting it at the pyrite ore pit, but that wouldn't be fast enough either. He figured that they had enough for everyone to make a weapon, so they could clean up and go back tomorrow. On the seventh day, everyone finished cleaning up and divided the weight of the ore among them. They were ready to go back, so their speed was slower. They didn't arrive back at the camp until noon the day after next, taking the same route back. Tan Thien's group left the grasslands and entered the jungle. Before it got dark, they found a place to spend the night and set up camp. 
everyone sat around the campfire, cleaning their iron hose as if they were cleaning sacred relics. Qatar heard a noise and grabbed his shovel defensively. Just then, a saber-toothed tiger jumped out. He hit it on the head with one blow. Tan Thien called out to Babo for help. Note for those who don't know much, saber-toothed tigers lived in the Pleistocene epoch. Their bodies were an average of 2.7 meters long and they weighed between 200 and 400 pounds. It was the largest cat in prehistoric times. It had 10 centimeter long fangs that could pierce the throats of animals. In the blink of an eye, it was the overlord of the Ice Age. Tan Thien saw that it was an animal that hunted in groups, and he warned everyone that there were more. Rana was holding a piece of wood in his hand when he spotted another one standing in front of him, raised its paw and swatted the piece of wood in half. When Rana fell, Nick ran over to help him and slashed at it, but it had already jumped into the bushes. One of them was about to attack Tan Thien when Qatar hit it. It was about to dodge Qatar's attack when a burning tree was thrown at its head, sending it tumbling into the bushes. Everyone huddled together to protect themselves from the tigers. One of the tribesmen praised Tan Thien for throwing a torch and hitting it. The shaman is so good. Admin and everyone else knows it. Tan Thien has the blessing of the centaur, so he never misses. There were three of them just now, and Tan Thien warned everyone to hold their weapons, so these saber-toothed tigers were very intelligent. Babo was fighting and roaring when the tiger bit him on the shoulder. He kicked the tiger with his other foot and it fell down, but it quickly got up and fought with Babo. Tan Thien saw the two animals wrestling together. Their positions were constantly changing, so it was impossible to aim an arrow. If they accidentally shot Babo, they would be helping the tiger. This type of tiger is very cunning. After attacking, it immediately retreats, very decisively, giving its prey no chance. It knows how to use the darkness to hide its body and wait for the right moment to strike. If his group showed any weakness, they would be attacked fatally. Tan Thien went into the system to hack and buy it right away. Qatar pretended to drop his shovel, and a saber-toothed tiger rushed over. He quickly jumped out of the way. After it was cornered by the group's wooden shields, Qatar hit it with his shovel, sending it flying and knocking it to the ground. There was another one standing next to it. Nick and Qatar charged forward. Nick took the one on the right, and another one came out of the bushes and saw that the people holding the wooden shields were vulnerable. He jumped out and charged. At that moment, everyone realized that there were four of them. Just then, the system popped up and said, registration complete, absorption complete. The cat's reaction was complete. His eyes, nose, and body vibrated. Time seemed to stop. He could even clearly see the saliva shooting out of the saber-toothed tiger's mouth. When the saber-toothed tiger charged at Alex and the others, he used his cheetah speed talent. Holding the knife in his hand, he flew under the first tiger's belly and slashed it. Qatar hit the tiger right in the head. Nick also took down one. Nick looked up and saw Tan Thien take down another one with lightning speed. Garana and the others were amazed. He really was the strongest shaman. Nick was surprised by his reaction and speed. And Qatar was just now realizing Tan Thien's true strength. It turned out that he had been going easy on him all this time. Tan Thien felt a little dizzy and light-headed from using his power. Nick was about to tell everyone to help Babo, but he said that there was no need, just surround him and help if he needed it. Babo told him that he wanted to win on his own. After that, he hit the tiger on the back and it died instantly. Babo roared with final authority. Everyone cheered when they won. On the morning of the eighth day, Tan Thien's group continued on their way back to the camp. But because Babo was injured, the cart had to be pulled by people, which slowed down the team's progress. They traveled all day, and by the time night fell, they were still in the forest, much later than they had originally planned. Fortunately, Tan Thien had sent Sa Deep back to the camp earlier to tell them to send reinforcements. With the help of the tribe led by Sa Deep, Tan Thien's group finally arrived back at the camp early in the morning. After that, he slept for over 10 hours. When he woke up and went outside, he saw people carrying wood, people carrying jars, and people building a perimeter wall. The camp had changed a lot. There were now many houses built of brick and a wall around it. He went down to the kitchen to find something to eat. Deep Lamb happily cooked him some dishes. He told Deep Lamb about his trip and how he had encountered saber-toothed tigers. Fortunately, the last time he and Deep Lamb had come to this island, they had Babo. Otherwise they would not have been able to defeat the saber-toothed tigers and would have been eaten by the green grass. Now Babo had many wounds on his body. He asked her how the progress of upgrading the camp was going. Deep Lamb happily told him that the eight large functional areas planned in the design drawings had been completed, including a dormitory for rest, a kitchen for eating, a bathroom for bathing, a breeding area for raising livestock, a laboratory for refining chemicals and medicines, a workshop for making all kinds of objects, foundry for high-temperature 
work, and a warehouse for storing all kinds of supplies. The dormitory, kitchen, bathroom, and breeding area for the big-bellied pigs had been completed, and the other functional areas that the tribesmen were responsible for building were also being worked on day and night and would be completed soon. The manufacture of the fruit weapons had also been completed. On the third day after his group had left, because the bananas and pineapples were ripe, they had already been picked, but everyone was still looking for food for the winter. Every day, Didu led people out to sea to catch fish. The Soma group discovered wild chickens in the bamboo forest and surrounded them to raise them like pigs. The weather had been getting colder these days. Deep Lamb was leading people to sew animal skins and shoes to keep out the cold. Tan Thien praised her for doing a great job. Apart from the team preparing food, it was time for everyone else to make weapons. Next day, everyone built a kiln. He told everyone to build a cast iron pool as well. Elaz didn't know what cast iron was. He explained that cast iron was the process of transforming raw iron into wrought iron. Elaz still thought that iron was like food, that it could be cooked and uncooked. He explained further that raw iron, wrought iron, and steel were all essentially iron. They were iron because the carbon content in them was different, resulting in different hardness. A carbon content of more than 2 is called raw iron. The carbon content in iron from 0, 0 0.05 to 62 is steel. The carbon content in iron below 0 0.05 is wrought iron. Their hardness depends on the carbon content. The higher the content, the harder it is. Cast iron is obtained when iron ore is smelted. As long as it is in a state where it has not yet solidified. Using the stirring method, the carbon in the air and water will react, thus reducing the amount of carbon in it and turning the liver into wrought iron. Alex thought that since the liver was harder, why not use it directly to make weapons? He explained again, because the hard liver is very easy to break, so wrought iron with high ductility is used. Jessica felt that with the current method, we could not make steel from cast iron because the carbon content was unknown. His goal was to make wrought iron and then use the steel casting method to obtain wrought iron. Everyone was making cast iron. He warned them to be careful not to get it on their bodies. He saw that the steel casting method appeared at the end of the Eastern Han Dynasty. After many years of improvement, there were three methods. The first type was the method of pouring raw iron into, which appeared during the Northern and Southern Dynasties. This method involved pouring raw iron into the wrought iron, waiting for it to cool, washing it, reheating it, and hammering it to form it. The second type, the method of covering raw iron, was improved during the Song Dynasty. This method involved sandwiching raw iron between two pieces of wrought iron and then heating it in a furnace. The third type, the method of pouring raw iron, was improved during the Ming Dynasty and was also known as the to strengthen method, which is exactly what he was doing now. He divided it into two steps. First, the wrought iron was poured with molten cast iron on the outside of the blast furnace. After the frame is removed, it will be put into a blast furnace to be heated. Although this is a bit more troublesome, fortunately the effect is the same. While Tan Thien's group was busy, Deep Lamb's group of women were making knife sheaths and handles. Although this task was not as physically demanding as forging steel, it was still very hard work. This process involved cutting bamboo sticks to fit the knife, then flattening them and gluing them together with fish glue. Nick had the hardest time making the fish glue, having to boil it until it was soft and then pound it on a chopping board until it became a sticky paste. There is a saying, a hero can't beat two ounces of fish glue, which shows how tiring it can be. Finally, they used fish scales to wrap the pounded fish glue and squeeze out the fish glue. He told Nick to get the steel block ready while Rana and the others got ready. When Rana hit it, everyone saw the block deform and impurities flow out. They asked why they didn't use a mold to cast the knife, because the steel itself had to be beaten to remove the impurities. Rana asked how many times it had to be beaten, and Tan Thien said a few hundred times. After Rana got his answer, she turned pale with fear. Tan Thien told her that she didn't have to finish it all at once, she could rest and then continue. He said to beat it about 150 times, because after it was beaten to a certain point, it would only produce a small amount of impurities. Beating it any further would be a waste of time and energy. The noise made the birds fly away. Tan Thien saw that the wrought iron was at a good level and told Alex to make a sword weapon following his steps. Make a hole in the iron block, then insert the steel piece into the iron piece. Next, use a hammer to beat the iron block so that it covers the steel piece, then light a fire and put it in the furnace, and then beat it out to form the blade of the knife. Tan Thien saw that Alex was very good, not unworthy of being the craftsman of the tribe, he was able to make a good blade the first time he did it. Finally, mix clay, carbon powder, and iron powder to make steel quenching mud and apply it to the blade of the sword. 
don't underestimate this mud. When the blade of the knife is exposed because it is not covered by the steel quenching mud, it will cool quickly and become hard, while the part covered with mud will cool more slowly and have better toughness. In this way, the durability of the forged blade is ensured, and the toughness of the back of the blade can act as a cushion during combat, making the blade less likely to break. This forging method of using iron to wrap steel is called the steel wrapping method. This method can ensure that the blade is sharp and hard, while the body of the knife is tough and not easy to break. Together with the steel quenching method known as clay-coated knife making, the properties of the blade and body of the knife are further enhanced. These two methods were both obtained by Tan Thien from the Encyclopedia of Technology. Alex finished it and handed it to him. He held it up and smiled. This time, the pirates would have to worry about his weapon. He gave the knife to Nick to fight Qatar, and everyone gathered around to watch. Qatar used the pirate sword that he had picked up before. Nick rushed forward to attack Qatar first. Qatar quickly dodged. Deep Lamb watched anxiously from the sidelines, seeing that it was dangerous. Tan Thien reassured them that they would know their limits. Jessica said that if they got hurt, it would be fine. She had a first aid kit and they would be fine after a while. Tan Thien and Deep Lamb were speechless. Everyone stood and watched, discussing. This was the third time they had seen the two of them fight. Let's bet on this couple. Qatar saw that Nick had chosen the wrong weapon. He was not only good at using spears, but he was also good at close combat. Nick didn't think so. Kang, Kata's sword snapped in half and the blade stuck into the ground. Everyone was surprised. Some people were happy and cheered for Nick's victory, while others exclaimed that the master's weapon was strong. Nick quickly told Qatar that if Qatar had used a spear, she would not have had a chance. Qatar did not admit it, saying that if she had also used the right weapon, he would not have been able to defeat her. In general, they were evenly matched. He held two knives in his hands, one of his own and one of the pirates, and saw that the pirate's knife was cast from cast iron and had no flexibility, so it could not compete with his knife. He heard that everyone wanted him and Nick to fight to see how he had killed the two saber-toothed tigers in the blink of an eye. He also wanted to try it out. In the past, he knew that his own strength was weak, but now that he had the talent of a cat's reaction, he could respond to a few moves and even defeat her. The most important thing was that he was very curious to see how much this talent could change him. Could it make someone who had never had any combat experience be able to fight head-on with the pirates who licked the blood on the tip of their knives? He told Nick to keep the same fighting attitude with him as she did with Qatar, which made her a little embarrassed. The elder shouted to everyone to prepare the dueling arena. He thought it was unnecessary to be so extravagant. It would be fine to do it here. Everyone advised Nick to rest for a while before fighting, and it was only then that Nick realized that she needed to rest. Her head must have been filled with bloodlust. He and Nick faced each other with short knives in their hands, and it was only then that he thought it was too late to use her as a test. In the blink of an eye, she threw a knife at Tan Thien, and when it was about to hit him in the eye, he had to activate his cat's reaction talent immediately. It seemed that Nick was using all her strength and not showing any mercy. He had originally planned not to activate his talent to test his own strength. He saw that if he hadn't activated his talent, he would have been dead by now. He quickly dodged and blocked her attack. And then he thought that if she were an adult, he would be like a child with no fighting skills. If he didn't have his talent, he would have died on the spot, let alone fight. Earlier, he had accidentally told Hawaii to do her best, and Nick was just doing what he said. Rana saw that Tan Thien was moving like a ghost, making it impossible for Nick to move, while Qatar thought that Tan Thien wanted to train Nick more, since he still hadn't been able to touch him if he kept up this high speed. Everyone cheered Nick on, telling her not to let him look down on her. At this moment, he thought, don't say anything else, I'm about to faint. Jessica cheered him on. It turned out that he had always been so strong and handsome, her two-egg hero. Deep Lamb cheered for Nick. Tan Thien thought that if he could just put all his strength into the knife, Nick might be knocked back. But to do that, he would have to practice swinging his sword thousands of times. Every day, Tan Thien used the speed of a cheetah to use the first move to attack Nick and then slid behind her. Nick also hurriedly stabbed her sword behind her back. Tan Thien didn't know how to react, so he stepped back. Qatar thought that he was an experienced warrior who didn't lean to one side and press his opponent, but instead stepped back. It was true that he was going easy on her. Rana thought so too. Tan Thien thought, I beg you two not to be so delusional. Everyone saw that their eyes couldn't keep up with the speed of the two of them, 
Tan Thien and Nick looked at each other and ran towards each other. Tan Thien had to use the speed of a cheetah and the reaction of a cat to make a final move with Nick. Everyone was surprised to see Nick lose. Her two legs were kneeling on the ground, and her sword had flown out of her hand and stuck into the ground. Nick didn't expect to lose. Everyone praised Tan Thien, saying that he was truly formidable and the strongest person in the Lara tribe. He said that it was just luck, that sometimes people should be humble and not be too arrogant. The elder Haman quickly asked him when he would hold his wedding ceremony with Nick. He, Deep Lamb, and Jessica were all surprised, their eyes wide open and their jaws about to drop. The patriarch was about to do it today, but he quickly said, wait, why would I have a wedding ceremony with Nick? What's going on? The patriarch explained that if a man in the Lara tribe challenges a woman and wins, it is considered a marriage proposal. So that's why Nick's reaction was so strange. The patriarch explained further that every girl in the Lara tribe hopes to have a husband who is stronger than her, and that Lara worships the shaman, and he is the shaman god. He implied that he could be exempt from the marriage proposal. The others didn't understand English, but Jessica and Deep Lamb did. The patriarch looked like he was saying, do you want to die? Are you saying that Nick is not lovely? He thought that Jessica and Deep Lamb were about to fight at home, and now that Nick was added, wouldn't it just add fuel to the fire? Nick saw the look on his face and said to him, since I am not qualified to be your wife, I will leave the tribe later. Her father was comforting her. Everyone also thought that if the shaman abandoned her, she would not be able to stay in the tribe, or else she would bring disaster. He didn't expect that if he refused, he would have to leave the tribe. The elder added, the moment the shaman defeated Nick, Nick became his mate. And now that the great shaman does not want to hold the wedding ceremony, it is equivalent to the great shaman abandoning Nick, who is also abandoned by the shaman god. Tan Thien didn't know what to say, but Jessica came to his rescue, saying that the shaman didn't say that he was not qualified, but that in order for him to maintain his shamanic power, he could only marry one wife every three years, and only then would the elders believe him. Tan Thien didn't know what to say. Jessica continued to lie, saying that starting from this year, he would have to wait another two years before he could marry a wife. He would marry Deep Lamb first, then her, and then Nick. She also implied that he was worried that Nick would have to wait too long, which was why he had that expression on his face. Nick smiled and asked her if she was telling the truth. Jessica implied that Nick was so lovely, how could he not like her? Tan Thien couldn't believe that things had developed like this. It wasn't right at all. Jessica even asked him again. He had no choice but to go along with Jessica's plan and figure it out later. He reluctantly said that it was true. Everyone believed him and started to leave. At this moment, he, Deep Lamb, and Jessica were standing together. Jessica wanted to be rewarded for her help. For example, she wanted him to hug her, but he saw Deep Lamb's murderous gaze behind him, so he made an excuse that he didn't want to watch her naked anymore. He quickly ran away, using the excuse that he hadn't finished drawing the map. He knew that Jessica was difficult to deal with, so running away was the best policy. Jessica also asked him about moving Nick into the cave to live with the three of them. If I were Tan Thien, I would have run away by now. Jessica is really hard to deal with. Over the next few days, Alex continued to make weapons. In addition to the two teams responsible for building and finding food, Deep Lamb organized a third team responsible for making fur clothing to protect against the cold. A few days later, Tan Thien was standing outside the entrance of the cave. He was happy to see the snow because he was from the south and had never seen snow before. He remembered his roommate, Lao Zhang, who was from the northeast. Every time he called him, he wanted to ask him to go ice skating, but he misunderstood and thought that ice skating was the name of a person. Nick was walking outside when she saw Tan Thien. She greeted him, and the two of them started talking. Nick didn't like snow because when it snowed, the animals would hide and food would be hard to find. Tan Thien had already prepared a house, food, and fur clothing. The two of them were talking happily when Jessica and Deep Lamb arrived. Reska teased them, saying, It's early in the morning and you two are already talking about love here. Aren't you afraid that the walls will fall down? Both of them said no. Nick was a little embarrassed. Reska hugged Nick because she thought she was cute. She said she was just kidding. The four of them saw the children of the tribe playing outside, making snowmen, and their spirits were lifted again. They started a new day's work. Tan Thien was sitting in his room designing when he took a sip of water and immediately spat it out because the water was too cold. He thought that maybe he should make another thermos, but he had to finish the design for the flintlock musket and the lathe. The weapons had to be at least as powerful as the pirates in order to have a chance of winning. 
However, no matter how crude the gun was, the barrel had to be flat and smooth. If it got stuck, it would explode and kill him, so he had to have a lathe. He found it too difficult. He had taken the blueprint for the lathe from an encyclopedia of technology, but some of the components in the blueprint could not be made under current conditions. He had no choice but to think of a way to modify the design and use other methods to replace the components. Now all that was left was the final step. He had worked on it until he went outside and saw how thick the snow was. Tan Thien remembered what his teacher had said. That snow and wind could make people stupid. He closed the door and went down to the kitchen. He had only been gone for half a minute, but his body was already covered in snow. When he opened the door to the kitchen, he saw a thick cloud of black smoke billowing out, making him think there was a fire. He heard someone say that Tan Thien had closed the door and that someone couldn't stand it, so he told Rana to be more generous. He saw three or four groups of people sitting around the fire. Deep Lam and Jessica were so cold that they had to light a fire in the house and were crying to him. Jessica wanted to hug him for warmth. He didn't expect it to be so cold before December. He had to make charcoal. One of the tribesmen didn't know what charcoal was, and he said that it didn't have any smoke. He explained to everyone that charcoal was made by burning wood without air, and that compared to wood, charcoal would produce more heat. Most importantly, when charcoal was burned, there would usually be no smoke, or at least very little. Everyone cheered when they heard this. He was indeed a shaman, who knew everything. Tan Thien suggested to Deep Lam and Jessica that they visit Babo and Sa Diu. At this time, Sa Diu was sleeping soundly with Babo, so it seemed that he and everyone else would have to take care of themselves. Ham Bai and Sa Diu had lived on this island for several years, and had experienced all kinds of storms and winds, and the winter here was just a normal change in climate for them. The next morning, Tan Thien gathered everyone together and divided them into two teams. One team was responsible for building the charcoal kiln, and the other team was responsible for cutting the wood in half. After everything was ready, they put the chopped wood into the kiln, closed the door, and lit a fire. When he saw that the fire was burning well, he told everyone to close the chimney. Nick asked him if closing it like that would turn the wood inside into charcoal. He explained again that the burning time varied depending on the water content of the wood, but since they had all been dried, they would probably all turn into charcoal by tomorrow. He told Alex to follow him and continue working on the new weapon. Deep Lamb was surprised to learn that he wanted to make a gun, while Alex thought he wanted to make a spear like the one from Qatar. Pan Thien wanted to make not a spear, but a fire spear, which was like a bow and arrow but ten times more powerful, which surprised Alex. She looked at Tan Thien's design and saw that the structure was not complicated, but she could not see where its destructive power came from. He quickly said that it was missing the bullets and gunpowder. He thought she knew, but Alex replied that she didn't. Alex asked again if he was sure he wanted to make this fire spear. He said yes, that in order to make the barrel of the gun smooth and straight, they would have to make a lathe. Jessica was overjoyed. We've time traveled a thousand years into the future, to the age of steam, Tan Thien. Tan Thien said that if they were already in the Iron Age, then of course they had to upgrade to a higher level. Although he had made a steam fan at first, since it used clay, it was far from being a steam engine. Deep Lamb told him to find someone with skillful hands. Ella's alone would definitely not be able to do it. Tan Thien and Jessica thought, isn't it her? Alex looked at the design and was overjoyed. Although she didn't understand many of the details, it was indeed impressive. She even praised him, saying that he was truly a master craftsman. Since Alex didn't understand everything, Tan Thien told her to take the blueprint back and study it slowly. She could make the individual parts one by one. Next morning, he and everyone else stood in front of the kiln. He told everyone to open the kiln and see how it was going. After the temperature inside had dropped, everyone waited for it to cool down before going in to retrieve it. Ten minutes later, everyone saw the charcoal come out of the kiln. Lou thought it looked like wood that hadn't been burned yet. Rana thought it was different because its surface was very smooth and shiny. Qatar thought it was very hard. He reminded everyone to burn it and see. It was important to note that charcoal needed wood to burn, and that it only needed to be heated until it glowed red. The rest of it would burn out slowly, even without a flame. A moment later, everyone was sitting next to the charcoal brazier, feeling warm in the room without any smoke. When burning charcoal indoors, everyone had to open the door a little. Otherwise, the burning charcoal would produce a kind of evil gas that, if it reached a certain concentration, would poison people to death. The successful production of charcoal made everyone in the barracks happy. Everyone moved the finished charcoal into the warehouse and prepared to start the second round of smelting. In the workshop, Alex was chiseling while Deep Lamb was drawing a design. Seeing that the two of them were concentrating, 
he put the charcoal brazier in the room and left them alone. Seeing that they were working hard, he couldn't be idle either. He called Qatar, Rana, and Aruba to go and make some small spheres. The chimney was smoking. Qatar and Aruba were in charge of heating the iron furnace. Rana was pouring molten iron into a mold. After it had cooled, Tan Thien pressed the iron sheet around a wooden handle to make a crank. They were busy all morning, but finally the three of them finished. Everyone was curious to know what Tan Thien was trying to make. He revealed to everyone that he was making bullets. He made a mold with a small groove, poured molten iron into the mold, and then poured it into a round iron tube. Then he told everyone to turn it hard. Aruba asked him again, what are we doing anyway? He had originally intended to surprise everyone, but if he didn't tell them now, this boy's nagging would probably make his ears grow calluses. After Tan Thien told them, all three were surprised that the bullets of the gun were ten times more powerful than arrows. While Rana and Aruba were rejoicing, Qatar said that now that they had guns, they could avenge the dead clansmen, which made the atmosphere start to sink. Everyone kept turning it, but he told them to stop turning it and pour it into a basin. He saw that it worked, but not many of the bullets were round and smooth enough. He encouraged everyone to keep trying, as they still had to make a few more bullets. Many days passed, and the laboratory was completed. The elder enthusiastically told everyone to bring all the equipment into the room. He saw that this room looked quite stable. Lu and the others came to report that the construction of the barracks was completely finished and asked him what to do next. He saw that everyone hadn't had a day off yet, so he told everyone to rest comfortably, sleep soundly, go sightseeing, or do whatever they liked. Now that all the work was done, there was suddenly nothing to do. Everyone was a little confused and even asked again to confirm that they hadn't misheard. After confirming, everyone was happy. Some wanted to walk around the barracks, which they hadn't done in a long time, while others wanted to sleep for a day and a night. Still others wanted to use the telescope to look at the stars in the sky. What about everyone else? I've been working hard the whole time. When I get back, I'll be busy making videos for everyone to watch. Tan Thien doesn't know how deep Lam and Elaz are doing. It will probably be a few more days before the lathe is finished, so everyone should rest and adjust their physical condition to be at their best to prepare for battle. That night, Deep Lam and Tan Thien heard the sound of wolves howling. They estimated that there were at least 20 of them not far from the barracks. Nick, Qatar, and Tan Thien ran out, and everyone prepared their weapons. Tan Thien had learned that everyone had encountered this problem before during the winter. And that as soon as winter arrived, these beasts would become unusually agitated and would even risk their lives to break into the tribe to steal food. But they usually came in groups of five or six, not like this. Rana said that this winter was much colder than usual. Jessica spoke up, saying that perhaps the weather was so cold that the wolves had no food and were so hungry that they had decided to attack the barracks en masse. Tan Thien thought that if what Jessica said was true, it would be a disaster. In addition to a few warriors, the barracks were full of elderly, women, and children. If the wolves targeted them, the consequences would be unimaginable. They couldn't just sit and wait to die. He ordered the chief of this place to assign Nick, Qatar, and a few others to follow him out to fight the wolves. Tan Thien told everyone to walk softly because they were approaching the wolves' lair. He and the others could see and hear the saber-toothed tigers growling. When everyone reached the spot with Tan Thien, they hid behind the bushes and saw the wolves and the saber-toothed tigers sizing each other up, preparing for a full-scale battle. Rana hoped that the saber-toothed tigers would die in the wolves' mouths. Tan Thien, on the other hand, thought that when two tigers fight, the fisherman benefits. Everyone else didn't understand what Tan Thien meant. Nick told everyone to look quickly, and the saber-toothed tigers and wolves on both sides began to fight. A wolf bit the tiger's leg, but the tiger's claws hit the wolf. The black wolf charged and attacked two saber-toothed tigers. It opened its mouth and let out a loud roar. You can't escape, boy. At this moment, a saber-toothed tiger was facing off against a black wolf. The saber-toothed tiger lunged at it, but the black wolf dodged it very quickly. Pakuma praised the black wolf for being very strong. As it was able to fight a saber-toothed tiger one-on-one -on -one without being at a disadvantage, Qatar, on the other hand, thought that the wolves would lose, as the difference in strength was too great. Even if there was a very powerful leader, it probably wouldn't be able to make up for it. Tan Thien thought that even he wouldn't be 100% sure of being able to shoot and kill a saber-toothed tiger. Nick noticed that the wolves behind them weren't participating in the battle. Were they protecting something? When everyone saw that the wolves were about to be defeated, Tan Thien thought, this won't do. He needed them to be evenly matched, so that he could benefit from it. Right now, one side was dominating the other, and that wasn't what they wanted to see. Tan Thien and Pakuma came to the wolves' aid, and both of their arrows hit all of the tigers. Seeing this, the wolves rallied. 
Pakuma praised Tan Thien, saying that his martial arts were already superb, and that his archery was just as good. What could withstand him? With the weather and wind conditions, it wasn't easy to hit the saber-toothed tigers in the legs, and it was even harder to avoid hitting them in a vital spot. He just smiled and said that it was okay. Tan Thien thought, I've only been able to do this since I became a VIP member. How can I compare to someone who's been playing for free like you? He relied on his centaur talent to shoot like that. He saw that the two sides were relatively evenly matched, so he stopped supporting them. Rana thought that Tan Thien was really evil. The tigers charged forward, breaking through the encirclement and heading towards the back, where the wolves were protecting their young. Nick realized that the wolves weren't participating in the battle because they were protecting the wolf cubs. Tan Thien saw that something was wrong and called for everyone to take action. The saber-toothed tiger charged forward and shouted at the wolf cubs, Do you know who my father is? Suddenly, the black wolf rushed out and stood in front of the saber-toothed tiger, and said, Why didn't your mother tell you? As the tiger charged forward, Tan Thien shot it in the leg, but it was too late. It had already bitten the black wolf's leg. When the other tigers saw this, they charged forward, but a spear thrown by Qatar pierced the neck of one of them. Tan Thien's group rushed forward to support Qatar. Qatar picked up the spear and laughed out loud. As the all-steel spear was just to his taste, he shared a little bit of knowledge with everyone, explaining that spears were divided into soft spears and hard spears according to their different shafts. Soft spears were soft and flexible, and could be thrown out or used to cushion the impact of gunfire when blocking, but they were usually very durable and required a lot of skill to craft. The wood for the shaft had to have the characteristics of being able to bend initially, but also being hard enough to block and resist completely, which was impossible to find on this island. For that reason, Tan Thien had asked Alex to make an all-steel spear for Qatar. Although it wasn't as flexible, its destructive power far exceeded that of a normal soft spear, and it was extremely well suited to Kata's fighting style. Nick also showed off his pair of short knives, which were extremely sharp, and could kill a saber-toothed tiger with just a few slashes. Rana also showed off his shield, which was a bit heavy but provided ten times more protection than a wooden shield. Pakuma asked Tan Thien if they should chase after the wolves, but after thinking for a moment, he said that they should head back soon, so as not to worry the tribe. Everyone silently began to clean up the bodies of the saber-toothed tigers. At this time, the wolves were still wary of Tan Thien's group. Everyone piled up the bodies of the tigers and then headed back. As they were leaving, they didn't understand why Nick was praising Tan Thien for being kind-hearted, and Gianna was also praising him. Pakuma said that it was because Tan Thien had rushed out to protect the wolf cubs, right? Tan Thien explained that it was only because they wanted to balance the ecosystem and the food chain that they were really kind-hearted. Qatar then concluded that everyone was asking too many questions, and that the gods would be annoyed, so everyone stopped. Tan Thien sighed and thought that letting the wolves go back to the forest would leave behind endless problems. The most correct thing to do would have been to kill the entire pack of wolves. This time, the wolves had appeared near the barracks, and there would be a next time. But he really couldn't bring himself to attack those little wolf cubs. And whether it was a blessing or a curse, he couldn't avoid it. He would just have to take it one step at a time. At this time, the black wolf watched from above as Tan Thien's group left. Tan Thien's group returned, and everyone opened the gate. Jessica and Deep Lamb ran out to greet him. Deep Lamb anxiously asked him if he was okay. He said that he was fine, and then showed her the pile of saber-toothed tigers. Jessica was happy to see them, but was immediately saddened when she saw that none of them were alive. Tan Thien was at a loss for words at this point. So, I'll give you one that's still alive. I don't know if you'll dare to take it. He told everyone that today's events should serve as a warning to everyone about the wolves and saber-toothed tigers. They originally lived on the plains on the other side, but now they had crossed over to this side of the forest. Jessica added that food was scarce on the plains and the weather was harsh, making it even harder to find food. So it wasn't surprising that they had traveled such a long distance in search of food. The weather was getting colder, and there would be more situations like this, so everyone should avoid going out for the time being. Chief Hammer agreed. Tan Thien said that they would lock down the barracks for the time being, and select a few people to take turns guarding it day and night to prevent the wild beasts from attacking. Over the next few days, everyone did nothing but eat and sleep, and sleep and eat. They couldn't leave the barracks, so they were bored out of their minds. Rana and Aruba sat around sighing and complaining about how bored they were, until Qatar spoke up and said, If you're bored, why don't we have a competition? Rana and Aruba were startled. Aha uh ha, -huh, we were just joking. That's right, how could we be bored? We'll never get bored in this life. Tan Thien heard Alex's voice and ran over to see that he had finished making the mold for the lathe. Tan Thien called Gianna, Ruba, and Qatar over and told everyone to come and help with the big project. 
Everyone started to boil the iron water and assemble the parts according to Tan Thien's instructions. After Tan Thien finished assembling it, everyone was amazed. Iraq said that the joints were very ingenious. Others said that the whole thing looked very impressive. Jessica laughed and said that producing a steam-powered lathe was definitely of epic making significance on this island. Tan Thien told Rana to light the fire. The machine started to make a noise, and he pulled the lever to start the engine. The gears began to turn. Phew. Finally, it was running successfully. Alex brought over a piece of wood and inserted it into the lathe. A moment later, after it had been processed, Alex picked up the stick. Aruba was amazed when he saw that the piece of wood had been transformed into a stick. Alex brought it to Tan Thien for inspection. Next, they would make the gun barrel. They would insert this thin piece of wood into the center of a bamboo tube, then fill it with clay, compact it, and fire it to create a mold, which could then be used to make a clay barrel. The same process could be used to make a steel barrel. They would insert the clay barrel into a bamboo tube again, leaving a cylindrical gap in the middle. They would then insert the clay barrel into the tube and pour in molten steel, which would create a smooth, round steel barrel. Then, Tan Thien changed the cutting tool on the lathe to a diamond and polished the outside. Deep Lam said that it was really extravagant to use a diamond as a cutting tool. He could have used anything. But fortunately they had discovered quite a few diamonds earlier, or else they wouldn't have had anything to grind the gun barrel with. Tan Thien began to assemble the parts of the gun. Alex and Aruba stood beside him watching him work, and asked in surprise if it was a gun. Tan Thien picked up the gun. That's right, he said. This is the secret weapon we'll use to deal with the pirates. Tan Thien thought that there was a huge difference in numbers between the tribe and the pirates. Whether or not they could turn the tide would depend on how the gun performed. He said that loading ammunition into a musket was very troublesome. You had to pour gunpowder into the barrel, use a ramrod to compact the gunpowder, insert an iron ball, and then fill the rest of the muzzle with gunpowder. That way, when the trigger was pulled, the fire from the primer would travel through the touch hole and ignite the gunpowder in the barrel, which would then fire the bullet. Tan Thien used his centaur's blessing to aim and shoot. Everyone was amazed. The system displayed a message, host has successfully crafted a musket and received 5,000 points. When he hit the bullseye, everyone cheered. It was so powerful that it could even pierce through a shield. The sound was like thunder, and its power was more than 10 times that of a bow and arrow. Some people thought it was the power of the exploding flame. Pakuma saw that the firing speed was too fast. Even if you had a shield to block the bullet, you wouldn't be able to react in time. Qatar was terrified because he couldn't see when the bullet was fired. The Patriarch was also secretly afraid. Fortunately, the British soldiers had carried guns over their shoulders when they came to his tribe. Fortunately, he had not had any conflict with them. Tan Thien raised the gun high and called on everyone to follow Alex's orders, and make as many guns as possible. Everyone shouted in unison, yes, master shaman. Time passed, and everyone was busy working. Tan Thien was sitting in the cave, looking at the system to see how many points he had. Although the rewards were generous, he didn't have enough points to buy them. The great battle of talents was about to start, so he looked to see if there was anything useful. Then, an idea came to him. He opened the mysterious item interface to see if there was anything good on sale. When he opened it, he saw that it was completely empty. It had been empty ever since he had redeemed the combination gift. He looked for something else, and saw a book called Encyclopedia of Wilderness Traps. He decided to redeem it. After all, it was better than nothing, right? The system displayed a message, host has successfully redeemed the item. The item is now downloading. Host has successfully received the item. He hoped to find something useful. His goal was to use it to deal with the pirates, because the Lara tribe's combat power was not enough to confront them directly, so they had to make the most of their geographical advantage, and turn it into the last straw that would crush the Ola pirates. He thought about the traps and decided to design and draw the ones that he thought would be effective. Alex had no difficulty making muskets, but because they needed to produce a lot of them, and the lathe for grinding the barrels was the only one they had, it took a lot of time to make them. In order to make the guns quickly, everyone worked hard and didn't want to leave the barracks. The days passed by like a machine. Jessica went to visit Tan Thien because she saw that he had been inside for half a day. Jessica teased him again, saying that she would help him with his personal needs, which embarrassed Tan Thien. He didn't mean it that way. She put her arm around his shoulder and said that she was just joking. He reminded her that once the snow melted, the pirates would definitely cross the swamp to come and find them. Instead of sitting around waiting to die, they might as well wipe them out there. 
Rikau laughed when he heard this and said, You're really something. You're as vicious as they come, but you're also very smart. He asked her how the snowshoes that Deep Lamb's group was making were coming along. Outside, Deep Lamb was letting Elu try out the snowshoes that she had made. Elu thought they were amazing, because she could stand on the snow. Katar was watching when he saw the snowshoes for the first time. Aruba even poked the snow with his finger to see if it was real. Tan Thien explained that the snowshoes increased the surface area, which distributed the weight of the body and reduced the pressure, so people wouldn't sink into the snow. These snowshoes were especially effective for winter warfare, and thanks to Deep Lamb, they had been very successful. Aruba wanted to try them out, but he sank into the snow. He cried because he thought he had broken Tan Thien's weapon. Tan Thien laughed and explained that because everyone's weight was different, each snowshoe had to be a different size. Deep Lamb called over three or four people of different weights to try them out. Aruba laughed out loud when he saw that Kata's feet sank into the snow even deeper than his own. Katar hit him for laughing at him. Tan Thien told Deep Lamb to make three or four different sizes. The next day, in addition to making guns, everyone had a new task, making snowshoes. By the middle of November, they had finally finished 150 pairs of snowshoes. Each person could take two pairs, and the rest would be kept in reserve. 76 guns were enough to equip 30 people who could go to the battlefield. He felt that it was enough, but he was worried about the ammunition. Each person would only be able to fire a few shots, just like in basic military training. So they had to practice loading the guns and getting used to the feel of shooting. The range of the muskets was not very far, so they didn't practice shooting accurately. At the end of November, Tan Thien and the others went out to fight and set up traps in the White Bone Swamp. Deep Lamb and Jessica saw him off, hoping that he would return and they could have a party. Tan Thien hugged both Jessica and Deep Lamb. After walking a short distance, he turned around and waved to everyone who was staying at the barracks. According to his calculations, the white fog in the swamp would have completely melted by the end of November and the beginning of December. When the pirates discovered this, they would definitely send people to investigate. At most, in less than 10 days, the two sides would meet again. The time for a decisive battle had come. Under Sa Diu's guidance, Tan Thien's group arrived at the White Bone Swamp. Tan Thien saw that the swamp was an independent existence on the island, because the outside was already frozen, but it was extremely hot here. Qatar said that this place was always like this, no matter the time of year. He told everyone to rest for a while. Half an hour later, they started to set up camp. In this zero-degree environment, the small fires were useless. They had to have windproof tents. After resting for a while, everyone went to cut down trees to build tents, and then they found a relatively dry place to start setting up camp. The structure was simple, they just had to build a frame and then cover it with animal skins. Tan Thien's group had a total of 30 people, and each tent could sleep 3 people, so 11 tents would be enough. By the time Tan Thien's group had finished setting up, it was already dark. Tan Thien began to explain the battle plan. He told Qatar to take 10 people to the designated location the next day to set up a pit trap. Rana had to be careful when cutting down trees the next day and she had to cut them down far away from the trap. Also, she shouldn't cut down too many trees in the same place, so as not to leave too many obvious traces. The rest of the people would follow him to set up a crossbow trap. After discussing the plan, everyone went to sleep. The next morning, the snow was still falling heavily. Tan Thien told everyone to be careful when carrying out their tasks, and that safety was paramount. If they encountered any problems, they should immediately use the signal arrows to notify him. Then, Tan Thien led everyone to a place where he had found a good spot with thick branches and leaves, suitable for setting up the crossbow trap. He gathered everyone together to give them instructions on how to set up the crossbow trap. First, they had to drive two wooden stakes into the ground, then place the crossbow horizontally on the stakes. It was important to tie the crossbow tightly to the stakes, otherwise the crossbow would shake and reduce the force of the shot, which would greatly reduce the power of the arrow. The second step was to place three wide wooden boards in the middle of the crossbow, and use a wooden stick to hold one end of the crossbow and pull the string taut. It was important to make sure that the end of the wooden stick was smooth and flat, like a trough, to ensure that the string could be released easily. The third step was to pull the thin string under the wooden board to the opposite side and tie it. It was important not to use too much force when pulling the string, as this would activate the trap. Finally, they placed the arrow on the crossbow. It was important to do this last. Tan Thien picked up a stone and held it in his hand to see if he could successfully activate the trap. He threw the stone at the string, and the thin string and wooden stick fell off the crossbow, firing four arrows at once. Two of the arrows hit the trunk of a tree. Everyone was surprised. They hadn't expected the trap to be so powerful. 
they began to split up and set the traps. The method for setting up the crossbow trap was not difficult. After watching it once and asking a few questions, the Lara tribesmen began to set the traps in the locations that Tanthine had designated. At the same time, Kata's group was trying to dig a pit, while Rana's group was cutting down trees and sharpening stakes. The trap plan was proceeding as planned. On the other side of the swamp, a group of pirates were sitting outside their tent. One of them was annoyed because he had been bitten by a mosquito. Another pirate saw this and teased him, saying that only peppers and rotten meat could attract flies, and that he must not have wiped his butt after using the toilet. The other pirate was furious and said, are you blind? These are mosquitoes. The other pirate just laughed, and then another pirate in the tent stuck his head out and shouted at the others, have you found the bones yet? Why are you barking so much? This made the three pirates run away with their tails between their legs. His name was Lavo, and he thought, why is all this bad luck happening to me? Then he went to the base of a tree to relieve himself, and then he cursed this damn place, saying that it was full of insects and that the air was so humid. Damn it. Even the blankets in the tent were wet. Suddenly, he saw the white bones that had melted and immediately called someone to go and tell the captain. At the pirate camp, Larvo's group ran back to report to the captain, who rewarded them with some gold. He ordered the crew to get ready to cross the swamp the next day. He smiled and thought that this time he would definitely get his hands on the Fountain of Youth. The next morning, everything was covered in white snow. Qatar opened the door and looked outside, then told everyone that it was safe to go out. Everyone went outside together. Aruba said that the air outside was better than inside, which was too stuffy. Rana said that even though it was stuffy, it was much warmer than in the tent. Tan Thien said that this was because snow was a poor conductor of heat. Tan Thien then began to explain to everyone that because snow itself had an insulating effect, the heat emitted by the human body would accumulate in the dark room and would not easily dissipate, so it did not feel cold in the room. In addition, because the outside temperature was extremely low, the snow would not melt due to the heat. Qatar, Aruba, and Nick all tilted their heads and felt like they were out of place. Tan Thien couldn't help but laugh, so he told everyone to go and make a fire to cook. If his prediction was correct, the pirates would be here in two days. Akuma and Pahama said to each other, do you mean that when you are sick, your body will be very hot? Rana said that it was probably not the case. Tan Thien was thinking that with the current strength of his group, confronting the pirates head on would be no different from throwing their lives away. Therefore, they had to take advantage of these days to set up a favorable position and gradually eliminate the pirates' forces, waiting until they were weakened to a certain extent before launching an attack to destroy them all. Fortunately, he had built this cellar before the winter came, otherwise the plan would not have been possible. He looked at Sa Diu and used telepathy to call Sa Diu to go and scout the surroundings for him, and then Sa Diu shot away like a gust of wind. In the swamp, the pirate crew members were walking in a group, some of them looking around nervously, afraid that the giant snake would appear. One of them said, the giant snake won't appear here, will it? The other pirate was startled and turned around to curse at him. Shut your crow's mouth. The pirates saw the border and were happy not to see the giant snake. Sure enough, as their captain had said, when the white bones melted, the giant snake was also banished to another world. They shouted, long live the captain. But they did not know that Sa Diu had flown over and observed everything. He told all his subordinates to continue moving forward and to make sure they found a dry place to set up camp before sunset. Tan Thien and the others were sitting in the cellar and knew that the pirates had crossed the swamp safely without encountering the giant snake. Tan Thien guessed that the giant snake must have gone into hibernation. Tan Thien had thought that the pirates would encounter the giant snake and suffer serious losses, or even be wiped out. But now it seemed that he would have to abandon that thought. He said with a cold face, it's good that we didn't encounter the giant snake. We can use our own hands to avenge our people. He drew a map for everyone to see. He pointed out the location of the pirates and the places where he had set traps. He told everyone that they would use the cover of night to quietly go there and try to kill the enemy. Once they ran out of bullets, they had to immediately retreat to the nearest trap. The goal was to kill as many enemies as possible in the shortest possible time, and to wear down the enemy's strength. They were absolutely not to engage in combat. The pirates had just arrived and their defenses were sure to be tight, so they had to rest well. They would attack first thing in the morning. At this time, in the pirate camp, a few groups of people guarding the perimeter of the camp wanted to talk to the captain about reducing the number of guards, but no one had the guts to talk to the captain. They were even offering 100 gold to anyone who had the guts to go and talk to him. Tan Thien's group was a short distance from the pirate camp. Rana reported to him that the guards could be seen from about 30 people, but within range there were quite a few trees that blocked the view, making it difficult to succeed. Tan Thien asked Rana if he was worried. Rana said he was not worried, it was just that this battle was important. 
Rana saw that Tan Thien was a little nervous and thought that this kind of battle was probably Tan Thien's first time participating. But then he saw Tan Thien holding a bomb in his hand and took back his previous thought, praising him as a great envoy who was fearless and could strike wherever he wanted, and that he himself did not need to use his brain. Tan Thien praised Rana for his eloquence and turned to tell everyone to prepare to listen to his orders. At this time, the guards were still discussing the bet. One of them saw a few bright flames and quickly called the other two to look. Before they could figure out what it was, a bamboo tube flew out of nowhere into their tent and exploded. The other pirates in the tent heard the explosion and ran out, some asking what was going on, others thinking it was thunder and lightning. They shouted that there was a fire and to put it out quickly. One of them was shouting for everyone to calm down when he came into Tan Thien's sights. He thought that if he did not die, he would die so he decided to shoot the pirate who was shouting at the other pirates. There was no ghost, no water, but he used snow, which hit him in the chest. He was still wondering what had happened when he fell to the ground. He shouted for his subordinates to flee quickly, but it was too late. Another one was shot. One of them was holding a sword and did not understand what was going on. He asked the other one what was wrong. He thought it was a curse from the devil, and rushed to tell the captain, but was also shot. He crawled over trembling and begged for help. The one with the claws looked at him with cold eyes and killed him, telling the captain, it was not a punishment or a curse, but death by iron ball. The captain held the iron ball and deduced that, his crew members who had died had all fallen to the east, which meant that the enemy was to the west. The patriarch saw that the pirates were in chaos after the explosion, like sitting ducks. Now was the chance to cut off their forces. Tan Thien told everyone that after they had fired their guns, they should not reload them, but instead load their bows and arrows. Qatar discovered something and told Tan Thien that he saw the captain running over here with two women in his hands, laughing and talking as they ran. These cowards have come, so leave your lives and the fountain of youth to me. On the patriarch Lara's side, when he saw a claw and several others running towards him, he shouted to everyone, we've been discovered. The claw man told the pirates that they had seen it, it was not a curse from the heavens or anything, but the natives who were playing tricks. The captain ordered that for every native killed, they would be rewarded with 1000 gold, which made them even more excited and they shouted to kill together. Han Thien saw that they were indeed a bunch of people who would risk their lives for money, but compared to them, the captain was the most dangerous. When he charged at Tan Thien's group, he was like a tiger among sheep. Tan Thien ordered everyone to retreat according to plan, while Qatar and he went to support them. He thought that the boss would be in the biggest tent, so he threw a bomb in there, but it seemed that he had been prepared. He was also a careful and cunning man. Then the two of them rushed in and started fighting. The tribesmen rushed out from behind the bushes and shot arrows at the pirates, catching them off guard. Pakuma told everyone to aim for the enemy's legs, while the patriarch called for the virus of Europe. The three of them led a group of tribesmen to the vicinity of the trap and prepared to ambush them. The others stayed with him to support Tan Thien and Qatar. On this side, the captain was fighting Tan Thien and Qatar. Tan Thien had thought that Qatar was already not human, but now this captain was really strong fighting two against one without losing the upper hand. He told Qatar to cover him. Qatar told him to rest assured and leave it to him, and then charged at the captain. When he saw Tan Thien running away, he smiled. He still thought that Qatar was sacrificing himself for his comrades to escape, which was a gesture that people would praise. As he dodged, he glanced and saw Tan Thien running past on the left. He said, not bad, hurry up. Tan Thien jumped up and slashed at him. The captain glanced at him, smiled, and said to Tan Thien, I've seen a lot of this kind of sneak attack. Qatar shouted, what are you looking at? He rushed up and thrust his spear at him, while Tan Thien also slashed down from above. He turned around with his axe to block Qatar's spear, knocking it away towards Tan Thien, who was caught off guard and had to use his sword to block Qatar's spear, which sent him flying into a tree. He raised his finger and beckoned to the two of them, saying, do you have any more tricks? It's best to use them all now, or you won't have another chance. Tan Thien realized that it was no wonder that the pirates were so afraid of this captain, mountain opener, unless he really wasn't human. Suddenly, a flare exploded on the other side, drawing his attention to where the claw was. He saw a flare bomb coming and shouted to the pirates to protect their eyes, but it was too late. One of them shouted, my eyes, I can't see, I'm blind. The patriarch called out to Pakuma and Pahama that the virus had gone too far and they should start to retreat. The claw shouted to the pirates, don't let them escape. The captain thought that this was the direction the natives had gone. Qatar and Tan Thien saw that he was distracted and looked at each other, then both of them ran away. The captain saw this and chased after them, laughing proudly. It's very impolite to run away without saying goodbye. 
Tan Thien saw him chasing after him and smiled, then gave him a flare bomb as an apology, but he had already jumped away, which surprised him and Qatar a little. He snorted and said, such a small trick, how can it work on me, the captain? He was about to crow some more, when suddenly two arrows flew towards him and he had to dodge them. Tan Thien immediately rushed forward, and as he ran, Tan Thien turned his head to look at him and said with a smile, that's the second part of the ceremony. I hope you enjoyed it, big brother. Which made him furious and his face darkened as if he had lost his food stamps. Tan Thien's group was retreating, but the pirates were still chasing them closely. Pakuma immediately told Tan Thien that the pirates were chasing them, and he smiled because everything was developing according to plan. He told everyone to keep a certain distance from them, so that they would not be able to catch up, but also not too far behind. The captain shouted to the pirates to hurry up and not lose sight of them. At this time, Nick's group was hiding and saw several torches approaching them. Nick told everyone to get ready. Tan Thien told everyone to follow the plan, paying attention to safety because there were too many pirates. Once the trap was triggered, the pirates behind would become alert and the trap behind would be less effective because they had to disperse to catch more. Seeing Tan Thien's group disperse, the captain ordered them to split up and chase after them. They must capture all of them. Tan Thien saw that the captain was chasing after him, and he knew that he was the top target to be eliminated. But that was also good. This guy's fighting strength was too terrifying. No one was his match in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Fortunately he had the gifted speed of a cheetah and could completely shake him off, but if someone else was targeted by him, then they would be unlucky. Han Thien saw the crossbow trap, his feet stepped over it, then he turned around with his sword in hand to face him. He smiled and said, why aren't you running anymore? The cat and mouse game should be over. Then his foot touched the wire, activating a series of arrows that shot towards him. A figure was pierced by a pile of arrows. A pirate had been caught in the trap. When they realized there was a trap, it was too late. One of them died on the spot. Qatar was standing behind the trap, looking back at the group of pirates as if to say, come over here with me, bro. The pirates wanted to use Qatar's head as a soccer ball, but life is not like a dream. As soon as those guys ran over, they fell into the pit and almost went to hell. Seeing this, Qatar encouraged them to take their time. One of the pirates fell into the pit, but was saved by the ancestors who dislocated his hip joint. As he was crawling back up, he met Pokeyuma, who was pointing an arrow at his head and asking, Are you going to jump down yourself or wait for me to help you? And so the guy went down with his legs cold. The captain on this side, who had not lost a single hair on his body, guessed that Tan Thien's group was running not to increase their chances of survival, but to disperse their forces, gradually defeating the pirates. He stood still. Tan Thien was hiding behind a tree, observing the ten or so arrows from the traps. They couldn't even cut a single hair on him, let alone injure him. I wonder what kind of martial art this guy is practicing. I suspect it might be the great universe. He hasn't practiced the nine swords of Dugu, so he's out of options. He can only lure him to the ambush of the tribe and work together to overwhelm him with numbers. Suddenly, he took out a conch. He knew that before he got here, Tan Thien's group had already set up all kinds of traps, and that ambush. More than 50 crew members had died, and it would be very disadvantageous for his team to continue like this. He didn't know how many more traps had been set up, so he decided to retreat for the time being. He blew the conch to retreat. Tan Thien saw the captain turn away and knew that the pirates could communicate with each other through the conch. He had originally wanted to lead them through the forest full of traps and wait for them to weaken before gradually approaching the final ambush point. But he didn't expect the old captain to be so cautious and to leave immediately when he felt that the situation was not good. He had to go back and think of a long-term plan. At this time, Nick's group was hiding when they saw a figure running towards them. Everyone was about to attack when the patriarch spoke up. It's me. He told everyone that there were no pirates chasing them from behind. He recounted how the pirates had retreated when they heard the captain's conch, and did not engage in battle anymore. Tan Thien's group had returned and met up with everyone. On the pirates' side, there were many wounded, and some members went to Sirius to beg for help, but he cursed them. If you don't want to go and visit your ancestors, then shut up and save your energy. Suddenly, the captain came over. He asked how his beloved crew members were doing. The doctor was a little scared and reported to the captain that most of the injuries were very serious. Some of them could be saved, but they would definitely have sequelae, and it was uncertain whether they would survive the winter. The captain was silent for a moment, then his face turned cold and he said viciously to Sirius, you must use all your strength to save all the injured crew members. He emphasized the word save very heavily. Sirius said to the captain that some of the crew members could not be saved. The captain glared at him coldly and said, didn't you hear me? Save them all. I think this captain is too cruel. 
What the hell? He's like a dog that bites the hand that feeds it. He ordered Larvo and some of the others to stay and help Sirius, while the others followed him back to the camp. The pirate was furious. Why did he have to do it again? He glanced at the pirate lying on the ground, who was still praising his captain for being so kind and treating him like family. When Larvo heard what the other guy said, he thought, you're still too young and naive. At this moment, Sirius covered the other guy's mouth and stabbed him in the chest. The other guy didn't understand why he had been sent to the death list. His tears flowed out. Larvo told the other pirates that what they had seen today, they were not to gossip about it to anyone. Sirius was holding a knife in his hand, a little scared. He thought that if he got injured, he would be liquidated like this. The natives had burned down the granary before, and a lot of the food that had been stored for the winter had been destroyed. Although they had sent people to collect food afterwards, they had only gotten very little. By the time winter came, the food they had prepared would only be just enough. Now, even if this injured crew member could be saved, he would lose his ability to work and fight, and would become a burden to the entire group. The captain was truly a cold-blooded monster. In the secret room, Tan Thien shivered slightly and took a sip of water as he listened to everyone's reports. Everyone began to speak. Each group had killed an average of seven or eight people, for a total of nearly 80 people, nearly half of the pirates. Someone said, it's a pity that the pirates were too cautious. As soon as they saw something wrong, they retreated immediately. Otherwise, we could have killed more of them. Now that they know that the forest is full of traps, they will be more careful. It will be too difficult to carry out that plan again. Tan Thien said again, our goal is not to catch them all in one net, but to constantly weaken their forces. Our next plan will remain the same. We will still use guerrilla warfare as our main method. As long as they dare to chase us, we will lure them towards the traps. Everyone looked at Tan Thien in silence. Sensing that something was wrong, Nick asked Tan Thien if he was okay. He said that he was just a little tired. Tan Thien put on his cloak and told everyone to rest and get some sleep. They would see what they could do tomorrow. He closed his eyes and rested. Nick was about to talk to him again when her father pulled her shoulder and shook his head, stopping her. He was telling her not to disturb Tan Thien. At the pirate camp, after sending away all the injured pirates to go and look at naked chickens, they began to deal with the bodies. One of them shouted, remember to throw them far away and bury them in the snow. Don't attract any wild animals. Hey, new guy, stop puking. Come over here and help out. What's wrong with your brain? If you can't carry them, then drag them. There's an announcement from the captain. Everyone who survives tonight will be rewarded with 100 gold coins. The others cheered when they heard this and shouted the captain's name. Dream returned to the captain's tent. Is it really necessary to give these wastes so much money? The captain said. So many crew members have died this time, so they are naturally afraid. We have to give them some encouragement. And if we run out of gold, we can just go and rob some more. The important thing is to capture the spring and get that old man. He told Dream to tell the pirates to strengthen their defenses tonight. Early tomorrow morning, they would head towards the snowfield. Green was surprised. Why were they going to the snowfield? The captain held the bullet in his hand and asked. Have you ever thought about what kind of weapon killed our crew members? Dream admitted that they had never seen this kind of weapon before. But he was sure that the weapon's range was not very far. Otherwise the natives would not have come so close to the camp. The captain agreed with this idea. If they switched to using bows and arrows, then that magical weapon might not be able to be used. It was also possible that it was a trap and that they were trying to lure them in. No matter what, the snowfield was vast and white, with no obstacles to visibility. If they wanted to ambush them, it would be impossible. At this moment, Tan Thien was sleeping when he had a nightmare. Voices echoed in his ears. You killed people. You're a butcher. Sweat poured down his face. No, I'm not. The voice still echoed. You shot me to death. He shouted, if I hadn't shot you, I would have been the one to die. He opened his eyes wide and saw a bloody skeleton crawling towards him telling him to go to hell with him. He casually reached out his loving hand and slapped the skeleton's face. Pop. When he looked again, he realized that he had slapped Aruba instead. He was also confused as to why he had slapped Aruba. Qatar said, I told you not to disturb the great shaman, but you wouldn't listen. Aruba cried and said, I saw the shaman muttering to himself over there, so I was curious. Akuma said, that's the shaman's language. He's talking to the shaman god. Tan Thien apologized to Aruba, saying that he didn't do it on purpose. He climbed out of the dugout and saw that several people were gathered outside. They walked to an open space, where smoke was still rising from the ground. Qatar saw that the footprints they had left were not long ago. Nick thought that they seemed to be heading back to the plains. The patriarch was worried because the plains were open and there were no traps. If they left the forest, they would be out of options. Tan Thien saw that the footprints were in a straight line. 
so they must not have been in a hurry to leave. If they really wanted to escape, they would have had time to cover their tracks. These footprints seem to have been left on purpose. He told Pakuma and Pahama to follow him, while the others waited there. Under Sa Diu's guidance, the three of them climbed up a tree to observe the pirates' movements. They were moving in a tight formation. He told Pakuma and Pahama to go and scout them out to see how they would react. If they could lure them out successfully, they would immediately go to the nearest trap. He would be there to support them. Pakuma and Pahama were both agile and skilled archers who could kill people from a hundred meters away. Even if the pirates discovered them, there was no need to worry about them being in danger. Tan Thien was observing the captain when he sensed something and glanced over. He told Cream, there's a little mouse following us. I swear, this part is so ridiculous. The other side had to use binoculars to see them, but this side could see them with a glance. They must have the eyes of an owl and the nose of a dog. Dream asked where they were, but the captain said he wasn't sure where they were, but he could sense them. He guessed that Tan Thien's side would appear soon. Very quickly, the pirates saw Pakuma and Pahama holding bows. They had four arrows on their bows and they fired them at the pirates. If Huang Zhang were alive today, he would have to call them his elders. They were about to charge forward when the captain ordered them to turn back, raise their defenses, maintain their formation, and continue moving forward. From now on, no one was to leave the formation without his orders, no matter what happened. The pirates continued to move forward. Tan Thien observed from the tree that the pirates had not fallen for his plan. It seemed that they had discovered his intentions. No matter how he tried to lure them, it would be useless. In that case, he had to quickly move to the snow-capped mountain on the other side of the plain and make new arrangements. After moving away from the forest, the pirates were in an open area surrounded by snow. Green did not expect there to be such a large snowfield on the island. The captain sat there laughing smugly. This is going to be a fun hunt. On the other side, Tan Thien's group had already crossed to the other side of the forest. Pakuma saw that the pirates had indeed arrived, but they were much slower than their group. Tan Thien said that they must be carrying a lot of goods, so they would naturally be much slower than them. Vu asked Tan Thien if it would be okay to light a fire to cook, since it would be so obvious. Tan Thien smiled and said, don't worry. They're like birds that are afraid of every branch. Even if they see us, they won't dare to do anything rash. In their eyes, the surrounding forest is full of traps. We're just luring them in by doing this. The patriarch is worried that the snowfield is too open and there is no place to hide. If the pirates hide like turtles, we won't be able to do anything about it. Tan Thien laughs out loud. If their food is endless or if they have trained in the art of breathing air to fill their stomachs, then they can survive. Tan Thien draws a diagram. The pirates are hiding in the center of the snowfield. It looks safe, but it's not. When their food runs out, they will have to send out a small team to hunt in the mountains. All we have to do is hide in the dense forest around them, look down from above, and wait for them to come to us. Night falls. Someone tells the guards to be vigilant. Then Green tells the captain that after checking the food supplies, there is only enough for one month. He orders the crew to rest well during this time. Green asks, rest? Do nothing? What do you want to do? If it's not as we expected, the forest will be full of traps. If we go in there, we'll be wiped out, and the deadly fog could appear again at any time. It's probably impossible to return to the camp. Dream is worried, so the only way is to fight to the death? The captain smiles slyly. He knows that Tan Thien's group knows their situation, so they are not fighting recklessly but are ambushing in the forest, preparing to let him die of exhaustion. But if you want the fish to take the bait, you have to offer a big enough bait. Otherwise, there's no chance. At the camp, today is a beautiful day. The sun is shining and Jessica and Deep Lamb are outside. Deep Lamb is worried about Tan Thien. Tan Thien's group has been gone for half a month and there has been no news. She is thinking when she is hit in the head with a snowball. When she turns around, she sees Jessica, Elu, and the children holding snowballs. Jessica invites her to play snowball fight with her, but she is not in the mood. Jessica sees her like this and goes to comfort Deep Lamb. Okay, don't worry too much. Let's go play. Deep Lamb asks Jessica if she is not worried about Tan Thien's group, but Jessica laughs and says, Why should I be worried? Don't you believe in Tan Thien? Deep Lamb smiles and says, I do. At Tan Thien's group, Aruba makes a snowman and asks if it looks like him. Rana says yes, it does. Katara is annoyed. He knocks the snowman's head off with one hand and scolds Aruba, you're too relaxed. As a warrior, you must be vigilant. Aruba points to the patriarch and says, the patriarch is also making one. This makes Katar very angry. The old patriarch even invites everyone to play with the group of people. He just feels that it is too embarrassing to have a patriarch like this. Rana wonders why the atmosphere is so relaxed. Tan Thien says, the pirates have not made any moves for a week, making everyone let down their guard. At this moment, Pakuma shouts, there's movement from the pirates. At the pirates' camp, 
a man announces that the hunting team will be rewarded with 20 gold, regardless of whether they bring back food or not. Those who want to go fight for it are eager to go. The pirate says that these people have lived too comfortably for too long. The doctor tells them not to be so smug. If these people don't go, we're afraid we'll be the ones going. Jim comes to tell the captain that there are four hunting teams going out. He just wonders what Tan Thien's group will do. The captain, who is lying on a chair, says that if they don't move, he can replenish his supplies. Fishing is all about patience. Don't be in a hurry. Tan Thien observes that there are four groups moving. Excellent. There are 15 people in each group. We can just swallow them up quietly. He tells his tribe to prepare for battle. At this moment, in the forest, a group of pirates is searching for food. They are excited because they have been promised a reward of 20 gold for each prey they catch, regardless of its size. The captain is indeed generous. I wonder why the old crew members didn't fight for this fat piece of meat. One of the pirates says that the others have been on the ship for a long time and have accumulated a lot of wealth, so how could they care about a little bit of gold? He is interrupted by a gunshot to the neck. Tan Thien's group has surrounded them. Seeing that Tan Thien's group is larger, they try to flee. One of them tries to take a prisoner and blow a whistle to inform the captain, but he is killed by Nick. Tan Thien orders everyone to fight quickly and not let them blow the whistle. Qatar rushes in and kills two of them. The Patriarch flies up and uses his Dragon Fury kick. The virus takes the lead and attacks. Pakuma and Pahama shoot arrows and kill two more. In a flash, their group has finished off the pirates. Qatar is digging a hole when Aruba stands next to him and says, I hope more pirates will come. Qatar says that if there are more, they won't be able to kill them all. If even one pirate escapes, our position will be exposed. Rana says that if their comrades don't return after a long time, the pirates will find out anyway. Tan Thien says that it doesn't matter if they find out. By then, we will have gone into hiding. I think they are almost out of food. The fact that four hunting teams have gone up the mountain to find food is proof of this. They only have two choices. One is to not enter the forest or go up the mountain, and to return the way they came. Two is to risk their lives and break through the encirclement. No matter which option they choose, we will still use the original guerrilla tactics, relying on traps to ambush them and continuously consume them. Tan Thien wants to eliminate the other three teams of pirates, so that even if they fight head on, they will not have to be afraid. Suddenly, the sound of a bugle horn is heard. Everyone is shocked. Where did the sound of the bugle horn come from? Everyone thinks that their group has been discovered. A tribe member says that there is another bugle horn sound. Two bugle horn sounds from the two mountains next to us. Tan Thien's mind races and he immediately calls Sa Diu to investigate. It turns out that these four hunting teams are bait used by the enemy to determine the location of his group. At this moment, on the pirate side, the captain has heard the bugle calls of the three teams. The fish have taken the bait. He orders Dream to play the music for this feast of ours. A group of pirates, each holding a large bugle horn like a neighborhood loudspeaker. Dream shouts to start, and the whole group starts to take a deep breath and blow their horns. On Tan Thien's side, he knows that this is a trap and calls everyone to leave quickly. Their position has been exposed. Then, suddenly, the bugles blare and everyone covers their ears, but their ears still hurt. It feels like their heads are about to split open. Tan Thien finds the sound of the bugles to be too loud, and even covering his ears doesn't help. He glances over and sees the ground shaking. He knows that something is wrong and shouts, everyone, get out of here, go, go, go. The ground shakes with each blast. Tan Thien is horrified to see an avalanche. A tribesman sees the avalanche and rushes towards Tan Thien, shouting, quick, protect the great shaman. For Tan Thien, time seems to slow down. Numbers start to flash through his mind. The initial speed of the avalanche is 23.10 km per second. As the snow continues to fall, the speed increases rapidly, reaching 97 km per second. This is faster than a Category 17 hurricane. Even if they could run at the speed of a cheetah, they would not be able to escape, let alone the others who are running. He has to think of something else. Tan Thien has an idea. He turns and points to a tree nearby. With all his strength, he grabs an axe and chops at the base of the tree. He shouts at everyone to climb the tree quickly. The avalanche is already upon them. A tribesman is desperately reaching out for someone above to pull him up. The avalanche roars towards them, sweeping away everything in its path. Tan Thien's group is on a tree trunk. The avalanche sweeps over the tree that Tan Thien's group is holding onto. He tells everyone to hold on tight. Just as he had predicted, under the impact of the avalanche, the tree trunk falls towards the side that is missing. It successfully lands on the surface of the avalanche. As the tree trunk is still drifting with the avalanche, Nick tells him to look behind him. Behind him is a forest. If they rush into it, they might all die. For now, they can only hold on. Tan Thien tells everyone to be careful. 
Next, everyone will be steady and careful not to be hit. The avalanche continues to roar down, throwing objects high into the air when it encounters obstacles. Tan Thien sees a pile of snow about to fall on his group and quickly tells everyone to lie down and protect their heads. Elsewhere, the captain is watching the avalanche. He smiles and strokes his beard. No matter how many times he sees this scene, it is still beautiful. One cannot help but marvel at the power of Mother Nature. Damn it, that crazy bastard. At this moment, several hunting teams who had gone out to find food returned to report to him. He says, you've worked hard. This is your reward. The pirates then thank him. Now he can rest assured and collect food for the feast. Tonight, on the other side of the avalanche, Tan Thien's group has just escaped death. Aruba is about to run when Tan Thien tells him not to move around. Before he knows what's happening, he sinks into the snow, which is up to his head. Tan Thien reminds everyone that the snow after an avalanche is very soft and unstable, so they must be careful. Qatar pulls Aruba out of the snow pit and calls him an idiot. He tells everyone to check their bodies quickly to see if anyone is injured. Several groups report that they are all safe. The other groups say that someone in their group is injured. On this side, someone is in a coma. Tan Thien thinks that it is impossible to be safe and sound after such a large avalanche. The situation is now better than expected. Suddenly, Pakuma tells him that Elu is missing. Tan Thien thinks that he must have been swept away by the avalanche and that he must be found quickly. Then Pakuma informs him that the pirate group is heading this way. He thinks quickly, they must have planned to take advantage of the avalanche from the beginning. He tells the patriarch to lead the way and leave this place immediately. He, Qatar, and Nick will stay behind to find Elu. Tan Thien thinks that the snow around the avalanche must be two meters thick. Fortunately, they have snowboards, but the pirates were born in northern Europe, where snow and ice are present all year round. It is not surprising that they know how to snowboard. They have to find Elu quickly. At this moment, Nick discovers the wolves. She rushes forward to block them and shouts to Tan Thien to be careful. The two of them see that the pack of wolves is led by a black wolf. They are agitated. The pack of wolves stares at Tan Thien's group. Everyone picks up their weapons and prepares to fight. Tan Thien sees that this is the pack of black wolves from before. He is thinking, oh no, why is there more bad luck on top of bad luck? When he suddenly sees the white wolf dragging a person, he takes a closer look and sees that it is Elu. Nick and Katar see this and think that the wolves want to kill Elu, so they charge forward to save him. Nick tells Katar to charge with him. Katar says to leave the black wolf to him, but Tan Thien tells them both to stop and do nothing. The two sides stare at each other for a while, and then Tan Thien sees that the wolves are just sitting there. He is wondering what to do now. The black wolf stares at Tan Thien. At this moment, the pirates are using spears to stab the snow to search for the bodies of Tan Thien's group because they think that Tan Thien's group was buried by the avalanche. One of them curses, the snow is so thick, their bodies must be buried somewhere. How long will it take to find them? Another one curses, shut up and keep looking. If we find them sooner, we can go home sooner. I don't want to spend the night here. At this moment, a pirate rushes over to report to the captain that there seems to be blood on the other side. After going over to investigate, the captain rewards the pirate with a few gold coins, making the pirate as happy as a father with a new baby. He sees other footprints in the snow and knows that they were left by the wolves. Dream says that the wolves must have discovered the bodies of the natives and then carried them away. The captain frowns and thinks for a moment, then orders them to follow the wolves. On the other side, the wolves are pulling Tan Thien's group on a wooden cart. I keep thinking about this part, but I can't figure out where the cart came from. I don't remember them making a cart. Qatar sits on the cart and asks Tan Thien how Elu is doing. He says that fortunately, although Elu has many injuries, they are all superficial. His life is not in danger, and he will wake up on his own after resting for a while. The patriarch is relieved to hear this. Nick praises Tan Thien, saying that he is not unworthy of being a great shaman who can summon a pack of wolves to help him. Tan Thien says that this is not his credit but that the wolves have come to repay him. He thinks that they are lucky to have the wolves help. Otherwise not only would Elu have died, but his entire group would have been surrounded by pirates. Rana says that this is also thanks to Tan Thien's kindness. Nick says that if Tan Thien had not helped the wolves and let them go before, they would not be here today. After walking for a while, they return to their shelter. The injured tribesmen are still unconscious. The patriarch reports that including Elu, a total of five members have lost their ability to fight. They now have only 27 people left. Atar says sadly that he did not expect them to be as unlucky as black dogs. Tan Thien explains that, there are no black dogs here, only black wolves. The avalanche was caused by the pirates. Qatar exclaims in shock, could it be that the pirates borrowed the power of the great earth spirit? Tan Thien says that it was not caused by sound. If the sound was loud enough, 
it would cause the snow on the top of the mountain to fall, which would then lead to a chain reaction that would cause a large area of snow to collapse, eventually forming an avalanche. Aruba wonders why the pirates knew which mountain they were hiding on, since there were so many mountains. He explains that it was still the sound. Does everyone remember that there were three horn signals before the avalanche? Rana understands and says that the other four groups of pirates were decoys. The other four groups were tasked with blowing the horn once every so often. If any group did not blow the horn signal within the specified time, it meant that they had encountered us, and thus our location could be determined. Pakuma and Pahama say that it is no wonder that each group had only 15 people. It turns out that everything had been calculated. With this number, the entire group must take action in order to destroy them. To ensure that all of Tan Thien's groups are together, they must be in one place so that they can be caught in one net. Nick finds the enemy to be terrifying, using their own comrades as bait. The Patriarch is worried about whether the group's next plan will be successful, because the enemy can guess their actions and come up with corresponding countermeasures. Tan Thien glances at the wolves beside him and says, that was before, but now it's different. He thinks that no one would be on guard against the dead. As night falls, the pirates continue to follow the trail, but a section of it has been scattered. Dream says that if they continue to search for each person individually, it will take a lot of time. He is afraid that the longer it takes, the more natives will be eaten by the wolves. If that happens, the information about the Fountain of Youth will be lost. The captain orders everyone to split up and search. If they find a body, they will be rewarded with 200 gold coins. If they find the special young man, they will be rewarded with 1000 gold coins. The pirates are as excited as if they had been injected with chicken blood, and they rush off to search. As it starts to get dark, another group of pirates is searching for them. They are talking to each other. One of them says happily that if they can just find the bodies of all the natives, they will each get 200 gold coins. Another one says, you idiot. The most valuable thing is the fountain of youth that the natives have. If we can find it, we'll be rich. Suddenly, one of them sees something and calls out to the others to look. They see a group of wolves dragging a native. They immediately charge forward. One of them says, I want both the money and the fountain of youth. Just as they are getting excited, the five pirates running in front fall into a pit. They realize too late that they have fallen into a trap. Three of them are lucky enough to escape with their lives, but before they can recover their senses, they see the native standing up with the wolves. They are surprised to see that the native is still alive. Knowing that this is a trap, they shout out, be careful, there must be an ambush nearby. One of them urges the pirate with the horn to blow it and alert the others. Then, two members of Tan Thien's group who have been hiding come out with shields and push the remaining pirates into the pit of spikes, sending them to meet their maker. Route 1, mission accomplished. Earlier, when they met the wolves on the snowy mountain, they discussed the plan. Rana asked if they were worried that the pirates would be suspicious if they were divided into so many routes. Tan Thien said that the pirates would be too eager to find the Fountain of Youth to be suspicious. Tan Thien asks Qatar how he felt during the avalanche. Qatar says that if it weren't for Tan Thien, the entire group would have been frozen to death. Tan Thien agrees and says that the pirates will think the same way. In their eyes, Tan Thien's group is already dead, and there are wolf tracks left behind, so everyone will think that their bodies have been carried away. The pirates will never think that there is still a trap. Tan Thien draws the roots for everyone. Seeing that the enemy's path of movement is flexible, he plans to use the sound of Sa Diu's voice as a signal. If Sa Diu calls out once, it means that the pirates are dividing into groups to search. If he calls out twice, it means that the plan has failed. They must retreat immediately and not wait for a later opportunity. According to the routes that Tan Thien has set up, the pirates will probably divide into 12 groups, each with about 7 or 8 people. Of these, there will be 4 short routes, 4 medium routes, and 4 long routes. Tan Thien's group will be divided into 4 teams that will lie in ambush at the end of the short routes and first deal with the 4 search groups of the pirates. Then, they will use the wolves' speed advantage to run to the end of the medium routes and carry out an ambush, dealing with the next group, and finally, the long routes. Although the total number of Tan Thien's groups is not equal to that of the pirates, they have the advantage in local areas, so they can use their smaller numbers to defeat their larger numbers. It is important to note that the key to the plan lies in the running time. Throughout the entire process, they must not allow the pirates to blow their horns to communicate. Even if they cannot launch a surprise attack, they must reduce the number of pirates to a minimum. Throughout the entire process, Tan Thien will keep a distance to oversee the situation and send out messages at any time. Adjusting the strategy, he asks everyone if they have confidence. Everyone shouts out, yes. 
Route 2, led by Renana, has successfully ambushed the pirates and is preparing to move to Route 2. He is worried about how the others are doing. On Route 3, led by Nick, a pirate is about to kill two wolves when Nick stabs him through the heart from behind. His fellow pirates are all pushed into a pit of spikes. He turns around and sees the natives attacking, and he is surprised to see that they are still alive. On Route 4, led by Pakuma and Pahama, countless arrows are fired, hitting several pirates. Two of them are lucky enough to survive and shout, run, but they are also shot dead. Until the end, he does not understand what is going on. Didn't all the natives die? On this side, Tan Thien has learned that the plan has been a great success. He thinks that the first stage has gone smoothly. The pirates on the short routes have all been killed, and everyone is moving to the medium routes. Whether the plan can continue to go smoothly or not, the old enemy has also arrived. On Route 4, the captain is leading a group of pirates in search. At the end of Route 4, Qatar asks Tan Thien, are we going to wait here for the pirates to come to us? He says that according to the news from Sa Diu, the pirate captain is taking this route. Tan Thien asks Qatar, you and the captain have had some martial arts exchanges. You must know something about him. Do you think our traps will work on him? Qatar thinks for a moment and says, I don't think so. He will be able to see our traps as soon as he looks at them, and even if he falls into them, he won't be hurt. Tan Thien agrees with Qatar's thinking. Just then, Tan Thien stands up with his sword in hand and says, Our guests have arrived. Qatar also says, You've come to visit my house. I don't have any chickens, but I do have some ducks. But it's a pity that the fence is too wide and the ducks are too few to catch. Because they are moving so fast, if they choose the long route, we will be better prepared. Qatar takes the opportunity to remind Tan Thien that if they are not able to fight later, he should find a way to run first, and he will try to buy them some time. Tan Thien reassures him, saying, we will be the victors. He knows that the cheetah's speed consumes a lot of energy. After a battle, even if they want to run, they will not be able to use their gifted abilities anymore. If they have chosen to fight head on, then they will fight to the end. The pirate group has already seen Qatar and Tan Thien. When the captain sees the two of them, he frowns and thinks, how did they survive the avalanche? Or were these two not on the mountain that day at all? Tan Thien points his finger at the ground, signaling that there is a gift for him. Please, have some. They all fall into the pit. The captain reacts quickly, stepping on one of his men to jump out of the pit. Tan Thien and Qatar were right to guess that the trap would not work on him. He narrows his eyes and thinks, they are deliberately waiting for the natives who are not dead yet. They want to divide all of my forces. Although the lives of the crew members are not worth much, they are still needed to sail the ship. The captain tries to take out his signal horn to blow it. Tan Thien and Qatar see this and quickly attack him to stop him from carrying out his plan. Tan Thien says, you still want to blow your horn at this point? You're underestimating us. The captain thinks that he must defeat these two men before he can have a chance to inform his men. He swings his axe hard, pushing Qatar and Tan Thien back. Then, with two axes in his hands, he charges towards them, saying as he runs, in that case, I'll send you two on your way first. Tan Thien talks to stall for time waiting for the tribesmen from the other areas to come to their aid. Then, everything will be fine. He replies, I don't talk to dead men. On Route 3, Nick is fighting Cream. He has already been wounded several times. He still can't believe that Tan Thien's group was able to survive such a large avalanche. When he sees his comrades being killed, he realizes that the situation is not good. If he continues like this, he will be surrounded. He has to run away and gather the others immediately. He attacks Nick with all his might and then turns and runs away. Nick immediately gives chase. At this moment, on Route 4, Tan Thien is fighting the captain. The captain's axe is very powerful. Even though Tan Thien is able to block it, he is still hit in the shoulder. Qatar sees this and immediately rushes to Tan Thien's aid. The captain jumps back. He smiles and assesses Tan Thien. It is clear that he has great skill and combat speed. Logically speaking, he is a powerful warrior who has been trained in real combat for many years. However, judging from the strength of his sword, Tan Thien's strength is not even equal to that of a woman. The two of them attack him, but he easily fends them off. Suddenly, he smiles sinisterly and turns his back on Qatar, charging towards Tan Thien. Tan Thien is surprised. Why is he ignoring Kata's attack to attack him? Does he not want to live? The captain swings his two axes down on Tan Thien with great force. The attack is too powerful. Tan Thien is unable to withstand his great strength and is slammed into the ground. Blood spurts from his mouth. Qatar immediately charges forward and stabs him with his spear, shouting, go down and keep the worms company. He glances back and sees this, and immediately dodges. The spear only pierces Kata's hand. Unexpectedly, he is able to avoid a fatal wound in that situation. 
Blood trickles from his mouth. He looks at Qatar and smiles sinisterly. Qatar sees this and uses all his strength to stab harder. The tip of the spear pierces the captain's arm, but he suddenly grabs Qatar's hand and raises his axe to strike Qatar. Qatar tries to stab harder, but is struck in the shoulder. He falls to his knees, gritting his teeth and clutching his wounded shoulder. The captain says, it seems that I have won. He takes his axe in one hand and runs towards Tan Thien. Tan Thien knows that the captain intends to attack the weakest person in order to make a breakthrough in this battle. Tan Thien tries to stand up and hold his sword, but his body is trembling from his many injuries. He shouts, the game is over. Tan Thien cries out, if you don't come and help, I'm afraid that next year on this day, the grass on your and Kata's graves will be a meter tall. Then the black wolf charges out and attacks. He is caught off guard and is attacked before he can react. Tan Thien rushes forward and grabs him around the stomach, shouting to Qatar. He's trying to attack Tan Thien with his axe. Qatar rushes forward and grabs the arm holding the axe. Tan Thien shouts, Black Wolf, now's your chance to bite off his arm. He screams in terror. Just then, Dream, who is being chased by Nick, runs towards Tan Thien. Nick is chasing after him, shouting, be careful, but it's too late, he has already struck the black wolf once, Nick rushes forward and stabs Cream in the back, the captain shouts, brother, his eyes are bloodshot, he throws Tan Thien and Katara aside and rushes to his brother's side, he holds Cream in his arms, his face filled with anguish, his brother only has time to raise his hand and say two words, brother, brother, then he closes his eyes and dies, the captain's face is now dark with anger, he is speechless, he lays his brother down and stands up, Tan Thien and Qatar, trembling, walk over to Nick and ask her how she got here, have you finished dealing with the pirates in the other areas, Nick says that they have probably finished, only this one abandoned his comrades while they were fighting, so I chased him here, the captain's eyes are now burning red, he roars that he wants to use the bones of all three of them to make a coffin to bury his brother in, Tan Thien says that the situation has become a bit unstable. They all charge forward. He knees Nick in the face, causing her to spit out blood. He punches Tan Thien in the face, causing him to spit out blood as well. He kicks Qatar in the face, causing him to spit out blood as well. All three of them are now lying on the ground, wounded. He calmly picks up his axe and walks towards them. Tan Thien never expected him to be so powerful. What's the point of playing around anymore? The three of them stand up. Qatar tells Nick to cover Tan Thien while he runs ahead. Nick also tells Tan Thien that they should run. He tells them that he will run, but before he does, he must destroy the enemy. He suddenly sees Sa Diu in the sky, and a plan to buy more time pops into his head. The captain smiles and says, it's good that you're standing up, because I'm not finished playing yet. Tan Thien says, before we fight, can we negotiate a little? Look, we're all badly injured. There are a lot of bacteria in this forest. If we get infected, it will be difficult to treat. Why don't we bandage our wounds and then continue fighting? What do you think, big brother? The captain knows that Tan Thien is stalling for time, but he doesn't care. Just as Sa Diu is about to charge at him, he dodges its head very quickly, causing Sa Diu to crash headfirst into the snow. I'm telling you, I've heard that eagles are as fast as the wind, but this eagle is incredibly slow. He must cut off every piece of flesh and blood until he is dry in order to make up for the damage to his heart. Members of his tribe begin to run over to help. Tan Thien hears the sound of his tribesmen calling out to him for support. He smiles and says, I'm afraid you'll have to wait until you're reincarnated to fulfill that wish. Because you're facing more than 20 warriors and 30 wild wolves. Tan Thien continues to taunt him. I can blow my horn and call for more people to fight fairly. This makes him furious, but there's nothing he can do. He says that his greatest achievement was killing many white people, especially those who were formal and polite. He angrily crushes the signal horn when he sees how cunning Tan Thien is. It makes him sick. He knows that Tan Thien's people have gathered here, which means that all of his own men have been killed. Blowing his horn would be useless. Tan Thien adds a few more sentences, making him tremble. He says that he wants Tan Thien to answer one question before he charges forward to strike him. Rana immediately holds up his shield to block the blow. Tan Thien continues to taunt him, saying, it's not very friendly of you to attack without saying hello first. If I hadn't been paying attention, I would be dead by now. The captain's eyes are now bloodshot as he laughs and insults Tan Thien. Your brain is full of water. This is a battlefield. More than 20 people are surrounding and attacking him alone. That's what's not friendly. Tan Thien uses the captain's own words to insult him back. Is your brain full of water? This is a battlefield. A moment later, several tribesmen and wolves are wounded in the fighting. The captain is also hit by two arrows. He had noticed earlier that Tan Thien and the other natives were different. He could even speak their language. He asks if it's because of the power of the spring. 
Tan Thien laughs and says, I'm very good, but I'm sorry, that's not it. The captain is furious. He grabs his axe and is about to kill Tan Thien when he is suddenly struck by a barrage of arrows. He still manages to utter the words, you will go to the 18 levels of hell. You damn liar. Man, I think the captain will be the one going to hell. He's as evil as a beast, telling other people to go to hell. As night falls, everyone starts a fire to warm themselves and rest after a bloody and exhausting battle. Aruba shouts Ridasno, the shaman is awake. But Katar scolds him. Keep your voice down. Don't disturb the shaman. Rana goes over to Tan Thien and asks him how he's feeling. Tan Thien asks how long he's been unconscious. Nick says that it's been a day and a night. Tan Thien feels like it's only been a few hours. He can feel the after effects of using his gift too much. Pakuma tells him that he shouldn't move too much or his wounds will reopen. Tan Thien sees that everyone is tired from taking care of him, so he tells them to go and rest. Nick doesn't want to, but Tan Thien tells him to leave him alone. Everyone else doesn't know what to say, so they leave. The chief tells everyone not to bother Tan Thien, but to call them if he needs anything. Everyone is gathering wood to build a pyre to send off those who died fighting the pirates. Tan Thien sits at the foot of a tree, thinking about what has happened. The battle was terrible, and many people died. Tan Thien suddenly gasps in pain as his wounds start to bleed again. He feels very heavy. He hears someone say, are you putting the wolves' bodies on the pyre too? Yes, they were brave warriors too. Tan Thien senses someone in the tree. He asks Pakuma who the three people who died were. Pakuma jumps down next to Tan Thien. It turns out that Tan Thien knew he was there. Pakuma pretends that he came because the view is beautiful and quiet. Tan Thien says that it's night, so everywhere is quiet. Pakuma doesn't know what to say and just laughs. Tan Thien asks Pakuma about his wounds. Pakuma says that it will probably take some time to recover. Tan Thien says that it's good that he's alive. Pakuma tells him about the tribesmen who died. Bao he hugged two pirates and jumped into a pit to his death. When they entered the second phase, their physical strength was halved. Even with the traps, it was still very difficult to fight. Utu was in Pakuma's team. He risked his life to hug a pirate so that his teammates could kill the enemy. In Chalia, when a group of pirates were too careful and discovered the traps, he risked his own life to activate them. After the battle, everyone was too badly injured to carry their bodies back. They were only able to bring them back the next morning. Because it had been a day and a night, they were covered in snow. Luckily, the wolves helped them find the bodies. After the wolves helped them find the bodies, they left, led by the black wolf. Tan Thien smiles and says that they were all heroic warriors. One of the tribesmen calls Tan Thien over to perform the farewell ceremony. Pakuma tries to help Tan Thien, but Tan Thien doesn't want him to. He can walk by himself. Tan Thien walks up to the pyre. All of the tribesmen are waiting there. The chief hands Tan Thien a torch. He takes the torch and walks to the pyre. He lights the torch and the flames burst into life. Elsewhere, the wolves are on top of a mountain, watching the fire. They howl to bid farewell to their comrades. After the memorial, everyone dances and cheers. They have finally defeated the pirates with only a few losses. Tan Thien is bewildered. He was just feeling sad at the memorial. But how can everyone be so happy so quickly? The chief puts his hand on Tan Thien's shoulder and says, Is this the first time you've seen your comrades die? In your place, you would call it sacrifice, right? But in the Lara tribe, we don't have that expression. Because those tribesmen have only become stars. He takes Tan Thien's hand and raises it to the sky. As long as we hold the starlight in our hands, they will always be with us. Both of them put their hands on their hearts and remember those who have died. Meanwhile, back at the camp, deep lamb. Jessica and Alex are eating dinner. Alex is amazed to hear about cars. She can't imagine what they look like. Suddenly, deep lamb stops eating. She feels something. She turns to look out the window. Jessica puts her hand on Deep Lamb's shoulder and says that she will go with her to meet Tan Thien's group. You feel it too, right? Everyone gathers at the entrance to the camp to wait. Then they see Tan Thien and the others returning. Lou and the other children run out to greet Tan Thien and the others, along with Deep Lamb. They are all smiling. After all their efforts, Tan Thien's group has finally made it home. Everyone helps to change the bandages of the wounded. Inside the cave, Jessica is changing Tan Thien's bandages while Deep Lamb prepares hot water. Tan Thien says that he hasn't had a bath in days and he must smell bad. Jessica says that it's okay. Jessica warns Tan Thien about the bandages. Some of them have stuck to his wounds and it will be painful to remove them. He grits his teeth and bears the pain. Sweat is pouring down his face. Jessica asks Deep Lamb to bring a hot towel so that she can put it on the bandages. The moisture and heat will soften the blood and make them easier to remove. Tan Thien tells Jessica to let him know when she is about to remove the last bandage so that he can prepare himself. She counts to one and then pulls it off, making him cry out in pain. 
Jessica says that it's better to get it over with quickly. Deep Lamb looks at him with concern. He feels like he's about to faint. Jessica holds up the bandages and says that they can still be used after they have been boiled in water to disinfect them and then washed. Deep Lamb uses a warm towel to wipe Tan Thien's body. He is relieved that Deep Lamb is doing it gently. If Jessica had done it, he might have died from the pain instead of in the battle with the pirates. Deep Lamb asks Tan Thien if his wounds are painful. He reassures her that he's fine and then lies down to rest. Deep Lamb and Jessica go outside. Jessica notices that something is wrong with Deep Lamb and calls out to her. Suddenly, Deep Lamb hugs Jessica and starts to cry. It's good. He's back. It's really good. Two days later, at the altar beneath an ancient tree, there is a pile of bones. Everyone, don't be silent. Tan Thien picks up an urn and throws it into the pile of bones. Everyone closes their eyes and places their hands on their hearts to remember the brave warriors who died in the battle and have now returned home. They have returned to the great spirit of the earth. Everyone leaves. Tan Thien remains standing there, looking up at the sky. He feels like a long time has passed. At that moment, Deep Lamb and Jessica come over to talk to him. Deep Lamb asks him if he feels a bit unreal. Tan Thien smiles and says that it's like he's woken up from a long dream. Then he laughs happily. Now that we have some time, we can start preparing to build the boat, he says. But Jessica says, not necessarily. A few days ago, Alex saw a pack of wolves near the camp. The black wolf was leading them. Tan Thien is surprised to hear that the wolves have followed them here. Deep Lamb and Jessica are both surprised when Tan Thien calls the wolves them. He explains, and after a minute, Deep Lamb breathes a sigh of relief. Jessica's eyes light up and she wants to go and see them. The black wolf must be really cool. As Tan Thien had predicted, after dealing with the pirates, they were able to build the boat in the camp without worry. Now they had everything they needed, and there was no danger from outside. However, because the main labor force was injured and the winter was so harsh, productivity was low, so they decided to wait until after winter to start. Everyone could only sit inside and sigh, looking out the window at the snow falling. In the time that followed, Tan Thien recuperated from his injuries. Every day, he just ate and slept, and slept and ate. This was the most relaxed time that Tan Thien had had since coming to the island. He lay in the cave and watched the children playing happily in the snow. He thought that it would be good if this peace could last forever. The snowstorm continued until one night. Jessica and Deep Lamb were returning to the cave. Jessica reassured Deep Lamb that she didn't need to worry. Because the camp was now surrounded by a wall and even if the wolves attacked, they would have nothing to fear. Deep Lamb says that it could be the pack of wolves that Tan Thien told them about. Deep Lamb is worried about Tan Thien. Apart from mealtimes, Tan Thien has been staying in the cave by himself. I'm worried that our main character might be suffering from postpartum depression. I mean, post-homicide depression. Jessica agrees. After the battle with the pirates, Tan Thien has become more withdrawn. She's afraid that he might be traumatized. The two of them are about to go and talk to Tan Thien when they see him open the door of the cave and come out. Deep Lamb is happy to see that Tan Thien is willing to go outside. She thinks that he's starting to feel better, but then he says, I'm going out for a while. Deep Lamb asks if it's too late to go out, and if it's because of the wolves. She offers to tell Nick and the others to go with him, but he says no. He'll take Babo with him. And with that, he walks away. Deep Lamb is about to call out to him, but Jessica tells her to leave him alone. The wind and snow are fierce outside. Tan Thien rides Babo deeper into the forest. The wind is getting stronger. Suddenly, he realizes that someone is following him. He knows that Deep Lamb is worried about him and has sent someone to follow him. When they reach the edge of the forest, Tan Thien hears Babo growling. He tells him to relax and not to worry. He opens the system and sees a new island owner quest. Defeat the pirates and become the master of the island. Reward. 15,000 points for killing the pirates. Tan Thien clicks on the mysterious item icon. Slave seal. 12,000 points. It's a bit expensive, but he thinks that if he can tame the black wolf, he will have a whole pack of wolves, and together with the Lara tribe, he will be able to go anywhere on the island. He used to fight alongside the black wolf, so maybe he can skip the taming step. He looks back into the forest and sees a bunch of green eyes staring at him. He feels his fear of the dead returning. Not just him, anyone would be scared if they saw this. They might even pee their pants. A black wolf and four white wolves emerge from the forest. Babo growls at the black wolf, as if to say, what are you looking looking at. The black wolf replies, I'm looking at you, what's it to you? Tan Thien tells Babo to relax, they're all family. He cuts the rope tying up the wild boar and gives it to them. He says to the black wolf, this is a thank you gift for fighting with us last time. The black wolf howls, as if to say, thanks, man. Who knows what it's saying, but it accepts the gift. Okay, goat. Tan Thien tries to use the slave seal to tame it, 
because he can see that the black wolf is very intelligent. He realizes that he can't understand the black wolf's language. Fortunately, he has the slave seal, which will make it easier to communicate. But then the system displays a message. The black wolf has not yet been tamed and cannot use the slave seal. This is really bad luck. The black wolf helped him, so he can't use underhanded tactics to tame it. He'll have to wait and see how things develop. But it's a pity that it costs too much to exchange for the slave seal. Tan Thien sits down and talks to the black wolf. This time he came to ask for its help. He will pay them handsomely. The men who are following him to protect him stand behind him, wondering what he is saying to the black wolf. Rana says that if they want to know, they should ask Tan Thien directly. He will probably answer them. Suddenly, Tan Thien appears behind them and says that he is planning to go to the pirates' camp to take all their supplies, so he is asking the wolves for help. The two young men, Aruba and Rana, are still unaware that Tan Thien is standing behind them, and they say excitedly, that's right, the pirates have a lot of people, so they must have a lot of supplies. It will be much easier to get there if we have the wolves' help. Only Nick stands there without saying anything. At this point, the two young men, Rana and Aruba, finally realize that Tan Thien has been there for a while. Tan Thien asks them what they are doing here. Aruba blames Rana, saying that he called me, and Rana blames Nick, saying that Nick told me to do it. Nick doesn't know what to say, but Tan Thien says it's okay. If they've already met, they might as well go back together. Tan Thien arranges to meet the wolves in three days. In the meantime, he needs to prepare sleds to transport the supplies. That night, he tells everyone his plan and assigns them their tasks. For the next two days, the camp is busy again. Everyone works together to prepare sleds and tow ropes. For the people who stayed at the camp, like Deep Lamb, this is very exciting. When Tan Thien's group went out to fight, they could only stay at the camp. Now that they can help, they feel much better. There are about 30 wolves in the pack. If they put 4 wolves in each sled, they will need to make 8 sleds. This is not a lot of work, and Tan Thien's group finishes making the sleds in just 2 days. 3 days later, Tan Thien makes a whistle. He blows it and a loud sound echoes through the camp. Elu and the other children, along with Alex, come to the window and ask, What's that thing in your hand that makes such a loud, sharp sound? He asks if the tribe doesn't have any bone whistles or flutes, and the young men shake their heads like rattles. He didn't think that the Lara tribe was so much more backward than he had imagined. He explains that a whistle is made of bamboo. It's very simple to make. Just take a bamboo tube, cut a small hole in it at an angle, find a branch with a solid core, cut a slanted end on it, and insert the slanted end into the hole, leaving a small gap. That's it, you have a whistle. The physics behind it is this, when you blow air into the whistle, the air flows from the hole into the narrowing gap. This increases the speed of the air, which creates the sound. Deep Lamb comes to call him because the wolves have arrived. Jessica sees the black wolf and is smitten. She says it's very cool. The tribesmen start to tie the wolves to the sleds. Deep Lamb is surprised because it's the first time she's seen a completely black wolf. Jessica explains that, genetically, black wolves are a special color mutation that occurs when gray wolves and domestic dogs interbreed. The wolf-dog hybrid can then pass on the black color gene to the wolf population. When she hears domestic dogs, Deep Lamb wonders if there are other people on the island. Jessica says that she doesn't know. Maybe it's just a natural genetic mutation. Deep Lamb thinks that's possible. On an island like this, it wouldn't be surprising to find golden wolves, red wolves, or even purple wolves. At this moment, Tan Thien is holding the rope to tie up the black wolf. The wolf kicks him in the head with its paw. He's very angry, but there's nothing he can do. Fortunately, this island doesn't have any lemongrass or sassafras, or else tonight there would be a lot of lemongrass soup and meat dishes. That would be too much of a hassle. The black wolf is walking along when it's surprised to see the children running towards it with their eyes sparkling. They hold out a wreath of flowers and make it wear it. Babbo also comes over to tease it. I'm so happy, my little wolf princess. The black wolf is very annoyed, but the children are laughing happily. Tan Thien is checking the sleds when Deep Lamb and Jessica come over and ask him how long he'll be gone this time. He says that with the wolves' help, they should be back in two days at the most. Jessica tells him to be careful on the way. Then the group sets off. Aruba is riding on a sled for the first time, and he's so happy that he keeps laughing and talking, which annoys Qatar. He tells Aruba to be quiet. Rana says that if Aruba were quiet, he wouldn't be Aruba. Nick sees that Tan Thien is worried about something. 
Tan Thien is seeing visions of the pirates he killed. The captain appears and tells him that he will go to hell for killing people. He says, if you drop your weapon, you can become a Buddha. He gives the captain the finger. The captain is furious, but there's nothing he can do. He disappears. Nick sees Tan Thien acting strangely and asks him if he's okay. Tan Thien snaps back to reality. He asks Nick why he asked that. Nick says that he looks tired. Tan Thien says that he's probably just not fully rested yet. Just then, they reach the swamp. Tan Thien says, I remember people saying that the white fog only clears when the seasons change. Is that true for winter too? Qatar says that it is true for winter as well. The longest it has ever lasted is three days. This is the first time it has lasted this long. Aruba says that the fog has been gone for 10 days now. Normally, it should have reappeared by now. Nick says that maybe there's a pattern that they don't know about. Maybe every few years, there's a day that lasts longer than usual. Tan Thien thinks that it's possible, but it's not something to worry about. The important thing is to reach the pirate camp before sunset. He tells everyone to hurry up if they don't want to sleep outside. They didn't bring much with them, and they can't reach the pirate camp in one day. Especially in winter, the snow is thick and makes it difficult to walk. But with the help of the wolves, they make better progress and arrive sooner than expected. They arrive in the afternoon. Instead of resting, they quickly set up their own tents. They don't use the pirates' tents because the Lara tribe hates everything to do with pirates. He tells everyone to look for supplies and to organize them instead of leaving them in a pile. Everyone starts to search. Tan Thien thinks that the captain, being a cautious man, would be in the least conspicuous place. But after the attack, he must have changed his mind and made his tent the most suspicious one, like this large tent. He goes into the tent and sees a wooden chest and a table and chairs. Tan Thien smiles slyly. The captain thinks he's on the first floor, but he's already on the fifth floor. When he opens the wooden chest, he sees that it's full of treasure, but he doesn't need this junk because he can get a lot of it at the stream. It's true that even large diamonds can be used to sharpen gun barrels. As he's searching, he finds some papers. He thinks that they might be a treasure map. When he picks them up and reads them, he sees that they're the captain's diary. In the diary, the captain complains that his father follows a cowardly leader who only robs in Russia. He's tired of being poor and wants to kill the leader and become the captain of the ship. He wants to go west, but he needs a strong ship and a crew. In the diary, he also mentions that he has a younger brother, but he hates him because he's so ugly. He's afraid that if others find out, they'll laugh at him. He also writes about a month-long journey. Although he didn't reach the wealthy lands in the west, he encountered a strange, large ship. He guessed that it was from the west because the people on it looked different, with fair skin. Unfortunately, he burned the ship during the battle, but he believes that if he continues to sail west, he will definitely find another large ship. Tan Thien recalls that history records that the V-Kin pirates first invaded the west at the end of the 8th century AD. From the contents of the diary, he knows that this captain is from that period. Tan Thien continues to read the diary. The captain writes that while he was sailing, he encountered a ghost ship and accidentally obtained a map to the hidden spring of eternal youth. He was sure that the gods were blessing him, which is why he was so lucky. The spring of eternal youth can grant people eternal life, as the legends say. He must have it. The journey south was long, but fortunately he had prepared well before setting out. In one month, he lost 100 crew members. According to the map, there was still a long way to go before reaching the island. He had become accustomed to hearing the sound of screams every day. He felt itchy when he didn't hear it. If he doesn't hear it for a long time, he'll probably find an excuse to kill a few crew members. During a storm, his fleet encountered the sea monster Leviathan. The Leviathan damaged his ships and killed half of his crew. But he was excited because it was a test before he could reach the spring of eternal youth. After passing the test, he arrived at the island half a month earlier than expected. The island seemed to have fallen from the sky. He thought it was a magical island. Only an island like this could have the spring of eternal youth. He had been on the island for a while and had been searching and interrogating the natives, but because of the language barrier, he couldn't find out anything. He tried to communicate through pictures, but the natives were very tight-lipped. Even after he killed a few of them, they still didn't reveal any information. He thought that the natives were lying to him because he had found the ring of the gods shortly after arriving on the island. When Tan Thien read this, he realized that the captain had also encountered a storm and had ended up on the island. Just like everyone else, Tan Thien thought about the ring, but what caught his attention was that the ring the captain mentioned was the ring of the gods. He continued to read the diary. Although the ring was cracked, it was still very beautiful. The ring seemed to be able to sense the wearer's emotions and emitted a dazzling light. Among them are the symbols of the divine realm. 
When Tan Thien reads this, he sees the symbols that the captain recorded. He must find the ring quickly. Perhaps he is about to uncover the greatest mystery hidden on this island. Tan Thien's group worked all night, turning the pirate camp upside down. They took everything they could find, even the tents. They even stripped the animal skins off the tents, leaving only the bare frames. Before they left, they set fire to the camp. They had found more than Tan Thien had expected. Since there was no more room on the sled, they had to help the wolves pull it. Fortunately, the sled was fast, and although they didn't travel as quickly as they had on the way there, they didn't go much slower either. Two days later, they returned safely to the camp. After completing their mission, the wolves left, even though Tan Thien invited them to stay. They took the reward that Tan Thien had promised and left the camp. Tan Thien checked the spoils of war and found goat meat and barley wine. These were two things that were not available on the island, so Tan Thien, Deep Lam, and Jessica were overjoyed. Aruba, Pakuma, and Qatar brought over two large sacks and asked where they should put them. Tan Thien didn't know what was inside, so he opened them and saw that they were full of wheat. Jessica, Tan Thien, and Deep Lam were overjoyed. Tan Thien realized that this was the greatest treasure of all. Jessica could already smell the bread. The three young men, Aruba, Pakuma, and Qatar, didn't understand why the other three were so happy. Can you eat it? Aruba asked. What is this? Pakuma asked. Tan Thien explained that people in the desert had probably never seen this before. It was a type of plant that could be eaten. Before he could finish speaking, Aruba threw a handful into his mouth and immediately spat it out. Pakuma and Qatar were frightened. Tan Thien laughed and said, I didn't even finish speaking. You have to remove the husk and cook it before you can eat it. How could you swallow it like that? But most importantly, wheat could be replanted. As long as it was cultivated properly, they would never have to worry about food again. In the cave, Tan Thien, Jessica, and Deep Lamb were discussing the ring. Jessica asked if it was the ring mentioned in the diary. Deep Lamb thought the ring was very beautiful and felt very scientific. Tan Thien activated the ring and told Jessica and Deep Lamb not to be alarmed when they saw it. He opened it and a hologram appeared. He said that the ring contained scientific knowledge beyond their imagination. Jessica thought it was amazing. Deep Lamb thought it was a 3D hologram. Tan Thien said that it was a real-time projection of information. Using the principles of diffraction and interference to record and reproduce real three-dimensional images of objects, which was far beyond the kind of 3D images he had ever seen. The technology in the ring was far beyond his and Deep Lamb's time. In the cave, they were looking at the projection, and Deep Lamb thought it was a pity that the screen was full of incomprehensible characters. Otherwise, they might have been able to gather some information. Jessica thought to herself that 21st century science and technology were so advanced. She wanted to see that era with her own eyes. Tan Thien saw that the screen could be flipped through, and there were several other pages. However, because the ring was damaged, most of the pages were encrypted, but some parts were intact. He clicked on the intact part of the page, and a three-dimensional map appeared on the table. Jessica asked if this was the shape of the island. Deep Lamb thought the shape of the island looked familiar. Tan Thien said. The reason Deep Lamb finds it familiar is because the shape of this island is very similar to our Taiwan island. Tan Thien thought it was just a coincidence because the terrain here was different from Taiwan, and the island was not as big either. But he accidentally discovered the zoom and locate function. After he zoomed in, he discovered a path. Jessica asked if this was a guide, but Tan Thien didn't know either. But he knew that the opposite peninsula was hiding some kind of secret. He zoomed in on the map and an architectural complex appeared, which surprised Jessica and Deep Lamb. Jessica asked where it was. Deep Lamb said that there was such a large architectural complex on the opposite peninsula? Tan Thien didn't know either, but from the map, it seemed that these buildings were located on the peninsula where Nick's group had been before. But unfortunately, he had never seen it. Jessica told him to find Nick's group and ask them, since they had lived there for a long time anyway. When Nick's group arrived, everyone was surprised and thought it was a divine relic that could float in the air. Chief Nick and Aruba had never seen a house like this. A tribesman who was observing said, according to this location, it seems to be at the sky pit. Aruba agreed that it was indeed there. Qatar remembered that there were no houses around the sky pit. Tan Thien asked what the sky pit was, and Pakuma and Pahama explained that it was a large pit that ran through the island. Tan Thien decided that after the winter, he would go to the site to see for himself. Half a month had passed since Tan Thien's group returned from the pirate camp. During this time, Tan Thien's group rested and recuperated. The days passed comfortably and pleasantly. The island's environment was good for rest and recovery, so Tan Thien's group's injuries healed very quickly. Perhaps in another month, they would be fully recovered. Tan Thien could hardly believe it. Such a serious injury should have taken half a year to heal, 
but now it was almost healed. This was indeed good news, especially for Tan Thien, who was restless as soon as his injuries were half healed. He started running around everywhere. He ran to the fallow land and wanted to make some nitrate. When he was free, he often went into the forest to find the pack of black wolves, flattering and coaxing them to win their favor. He said to the black wolf that he had known it for a long time but still didn't know its name. He would give it a name. Your whole body is black, but you have a little white fur around your eyes. I'll call you white eye. Isn't that majestic? The black wolf was speechless. On the other side, deep lamb was speechless. No matter what name you give it, it's as ugly as sin. Tan Thien, you're really a waste at naming things. But I don't know if it was because Tan Thien's teasing and joking had an effect, or because of some other reason, but the number of times the wolf pack visited the camp increased. At first, they only operated near the camp. Then, after half a month, the wolf pack gradually approached the camp. As a result, they met the children Abby and Elu, and then everyone knew what happened. Two months later, the black wolf was now a mount for the children and Babo. It had also gradually become accustomed to life in the camp. Tan Thien asked Alex to make a millstone to grind the rice into flour. Deep Lamb was grinding the flour when Jessica found that the flour ground by hand felt a bit coarse, so Deep Lamb had to do it several times before the flour was fine enough to make noodles. At this time, Tan Thien, Nick, and Rana had just returned from going out. Tan Thien asked if the flour was ready. Deep Lamb said it would be ready before noon. He smiled and said, then hurry up. Tonight, we'll eat dumplings for everyone to enjoy. Iraq saw that Tan Thien was in a good mood today. He had rarely smiled since he had dealt with the pirates. Jessica said with a smile that it must be because of the party today. That night, everyone lit a big bonfire and started dancing around it. Tan Thien brought out some tubes tied together. A tribesman who didn't know what it was asked what was inside. Jessica exclaimed, is it fireworks? Deep Lamb was also surprised. Deep Lamb walked up to Tan Thien with tears in his eyes and said, today is the 30th of the 12th lunar month. Time flies so fast. Tan Thien said, yes, tonight is the 30th of the 12th lunar month. Every day that passed, he counted it down. Deep Lamb missed home. He wondered how his parents were doing. He comforted her, telling her not to think too much. They were definitely living much better than them. Maybe they were having a lively New Year's Eve dinner right now. Tan Thien lit the fireworks. Everyone looked up at the sky when they heard the sound of the explosion. It was beautiful. Ahama thought that flowers were blooming in the sky. Alex wondered how it was done. Elu was surprised. Aruba thought it was beautiful. The chief thought that the tribesmen who had sacrificed themselves would also see it. Tan Thien smiled and said to Jessica and Deep Lamb. Can this be considered a surprise? Jessica thought that Tan Thien was amazing for making such beautiful fireworks. Deep Lamb only now knew how to make fireworks. For the past few days, he had been acting mysterious, and she didn't know what he was doing. He explained that making fireworks was not difficult. All he had to do was wrap the gunpowder he had prepared in paper. The difficult part was creating the shape and color. When launching, it was a bit troublesome. The color was the reaction of the flame. By using some metals or their substances, he could make the flame colored and create light particles. In addition, he added carbon powder. Phosphorus powder and iron powder could also create small lightning bolts and small bright stars in the light particles. Deep Lamb didn't know what light particles were, so Tan Thien explained that they were the black pellets in the fireworks. The colors we saw came from them. There were many ways to create them. He created them by mixing starch and the gunpowder he had prepared. The shape of the fireworks depended on the arrangement and combination of the light particles. If they were arranged in a circle, the fireworks would be round. If they were arranged in a star shape, the fireworks would be a star. Unfortunately, the resources on the island were scarce, so he used salt to make sodium powder for the yellow fireworks. While he was explaining, Deep Lamb saw that he had many wounds on his hands. She was moved and hugged him, saying that he had worked hard to make the fireworks and had injured his hands. He held Deep Lamb's hand and watched the fireworks with Jessica. It was worth the effort. Everyone raised their glasses to celebrate the new year. The party began. Everyone sat at the table and started eating. Elu and Elaz served dumplings and wine. Aruba ate the dumplings and found them delicious. Rana told him not to talk while eating, or his saliva would fly everywhere. Akuma was sipping his wine and found that the two wines, malt wine and grape wine, were different. The elder and Elu felt that it had been a long time since everyone in the tribe had been so happy. It was all thanks to Tan Thien. Tan Thien was a little drunk now. He held a glass in one hand and put the other arm around Kata's shoulder, saying, Why do you always have that expression on your face? Where I come from, with that figure, you just need to smile and the girls will come running. Kata's expression was still as stiff as ever. The chief came over and asked him why he wasn't drinking. Have some malt wine. 
It's delicious. The pirates have been wiped out. There's no need to be so vigilant. After a while, a history teacher and a biology teacher finally persuaded Qatar to drink. He said he would only have one glass. Nick saw this scene and felt that Tan Thien was a little different from usual today. He also saw that everyone who was drunk was true to themselves. He he. Deep Lam and Jessica were both surprised and wondered if something was wrong with Tan Thien. Jessica thought that he was probably just expressing his true feelings. As the night wore on, the moon rose higher and higher. Some people were already drunk and lying on the table. Nick had to stop the chief when he tried to drink more, saying that he was not drunk yet and wanted to have a few more drinks. I think it's true that everyone says they're sober when they're drunk. In the cave, Tan Thien was drunk. Deep Lam and Jessica helped him to bed. They both thought that it was because of their carelessness that he had become like this. Jessica ran to the kitchen to make ginger soup to sober him up. She asked Deep Lam to stay and take care of Tan Thien. Deep Lam wrung out a warm towel and wiped his body. While she was wiping him, he opened his eyes and saw Deep Lam. Deep Lam saw that he was awake and asked him if he was still dizzy. He smiled and said that if the guys in his dormitory knew that he was being taken care of by the campus bell, they would definitely admire him to death. He sat up and held his head, groaning. Deep Lam asked him worriedly if he was okay. He shook his head and said that he was fine, it was just that the alcohol had gone to his head. Deep Lam said that Jessica was making ginger soup and that she would go and see if it was ready. She turned around and was about to run when he quickly grabbed her hand and pulled her to sit on his lap. Deep Lam was so surprised that she didn't know what to say. Tan Thien suddenly burst into tears. He told Deep Lam that he had killed someone, that he was a bad person. When Deep Lam heard this, she couldn't help but tremble, but she quickly calmed down. She had always seen Tan Thien's strange behavior during this time. Although he didn't say anything, she knew what the reason was. That was why, when he brought Nick back, she had guessed that something like this would happen. Seeing him cry, she couldn't help but feel heartbroken. She and he had always lived in a society ruled by law. Before coming to the island, the thought of killing had never crossed their minds. Part of the reason was that they obeyed the law, but basically, they were both kind-hearted people. But that thought, which had never occurred to him before, was now a reality. For Tan Thien, it was nothing less than a collapse. That was why Tan Thien had been tormented by his conscience all this time. Fortunately, Tan Thien was strong enough not to collapse. Deep Lam comforted him, saying that he was not a bad person. He had killed the pirates, so he was a hero. He was just trying to protect everyone, but on this island, if you didn't protect yourself, it would be difficult to survive, so he had to do it. She couldn't help him, especially when Tan Thien had to endure this torment to protect everyone. She suddenly kissed him. Tan Thien was like paralyzed at this moment, frozen in place. Then he became embarrassed and blushed. Just then, Jessica brought the ginger soup. Seeing the two of them sitting on the bed, she thought, what did they do while I was away? Deep Lam pushed Jessica away in embarrassment, saying that Tan Thien wanted to rest in peace, and then pulled Jessica out. Tan Thien sat up and sighed. At this moment, a voice echoed in Tan Thien's mind. The hero who killed the dragon was still bound by the dragon's soul. Under the kiss of the goddess, he finally escaped from the prison and left behind a legend. It's really disgusting. At this moment, the figure of the captain appeared again. He continued to say, You must think that you're right to kill people, don't you? Don't you feel like you're lying to yourself? Perhaps at first Tan Thien would have thought so. But when Deep Lam reminded him, he realized that compared to having blood on his hands, he was more afraid of losing his loved ones. The captain's end was retribution. It was just that he was only an illusion, not real. Then he shouted, get out of my head. With Deep Lam's encouragement, Tan Thien no longer felt guilty. He could now look directly at what he had done. He became cheerful and lively again. Jessica was also surprised. Why had Tan Thien regained his spirit so quickly? After Tan Thien had sorted out his mood, he was no longer depressed. He decided to start designing a sailboat for the trip. During this time, Tan Thien took some time to go to the swamp. The result was that after two months, the white fog still had not returned. After some consideration, he decided to kill the Titanoboa snake. Since the ring had only pointed to the opposite peninsula, Tan Thien decided to go to the opposite peninsula to see how to get there, just like he had done before when he went by boat. But now that the fog had cleared, it was the safest choice to cross directly. As for the Titanoboa, Tan Thien didn't take it seriously at all now. With so many tribesmen and a few bows and arrows, he was confident that he could kill it without any casualties. The preparation time passed very quickly, and it was soon early spring. The wolves were still very proud and not easy to tame. 
After the winter, White Eye led the wolves away from the camp. Although Tan Thien was reluctant to do so, there was no other way. Moreover, he believed that after spending so much time with the wolves, they had already become friends. It didn't make much difference whether the wolves were in the camp or not. In the swampy wooden house, it was raining heavily. Aruba sighed in boredom that she couldn't go out to play because of the rain. Qatar said, If you're bored, go find out what happened to the Titanoboa. Aruba panicked and cried, I'm not bored. I don't dare to be bored. Nick saw that this was the seventh day of waiting. Yi Lin said that the Titanoboa's hibernation was longer than expected. Then Tan Thien looked out the window and said, Fortunately, we built this wooden house. We don't have to worry about getting wet in the rain. Jessica felt like her soul was about to leave her body as she waited so long to see the Titanoboa. Then suddenly, Sa Diu told him that the snake had appeared. The crocodiles were crawling in the swamp when the Titanoboa suddenly rushed out and grabbed one, then quickly glided away into the forest. Some tribesmen who were passing by were eating the crocodile they had just hunted when they realized that Tan Thien had been standing next to it for some time. Tan Thien raised his hand and greeted him, Hello, Modium Faker. Long time no see. Tan Thien said, Brother, do you still remember me? I'm the son of your mother's sister, the son of your father's brother, the nephew of your aunt, and the uncle of your brother. Then the Titanoboa opened its mouth as wide as the Fong Naja cave. K Bang yelled, I've been putting up with you for a long time, remember? Seeing this, Tan Thien knew that his brother had missed him very much. At this moment, everyone ran out, holding bottles of wine in their hands, which they lit on fire and threw at it. The fire quickly spread. The Titanoboa opened its mouth to the sky and let out a loud cry. By this time, everyone was holding bows and arrows. Tan Thien told everyone to shoot it with arrows. It roared and tried to find a way to escape. The chief shouted that it was trying to escape. Tan Thien called out to the two brothers, Pakuma and Pohama. The two of them stood face to face with the Titanoboa without a trace of fear. Together, they drew their bows and shot two arrows that pierced its eyes. Tan Thien called on everyone to charge forward and not give it a chance to rest. After a while of fighting, the group managed to defeat the giant snake. The system displayed a message. Host has killed the Titanoboa and received 3000 bonus points. Everyone was happy to have killed the Titanoboa. Tan Thien was puzzled. He remembered that he had received 5000 points when he had run away from it before. Was it because others had helped him, so the difficulty of the task had decreased, resulting in fewer points? Yi Lin finally saw the Titanoboa. Jessica covered her head because the snake was burnt to a crisp. She couldn't study it carefully. Ruba came close to smell it. It smelled so good. She wondered what it would taste like. Katar grabbed her head and told her to wipe away her drool. This snake had eaten many tribesmen, which made Aruba sweat. Tan Thien and the others mourned the tribesmen who had been killed by this snake. The snake's body became a feast for the crocodiles. The Titanoboa was a nightmare beast on the deserted island, but Tan Thien's group had easily killed it in half an hour. This was within Tan Thien's expectations. With their current manpower and resources, it was too easy for them to deal with the Titanoboa. After killing the Titanoboa, Tan Thien's group did not rest. Instead, they continued to go deeper into the swamp. He decided to take the opportunity to take Jessica's plane back. If there was any treasure on this island, Jessica's plane was definitely one of them. Because there was only one plane on the entire deserted island. Whether it could fly or not was unknown. But the equipment and materials used to build it were worth the effort. Nick asked, is this the king of all planes? Pahama thought it looked very much like a bird. Jessica checked the plane and found that the propeller and wings were damaged to varying degrees. The fuel in the fuel fuel tank had also leaked out. Fortunately, the motor was not damaged, but in its current condition, it could not fly. Tan Thien said to take it back first. During World War II, the bomber planes that were newly built by England were made of wood. Perhaps wood could be used to repair it. Beside them, the young man Aruba was straining his buttocks and hips, trying to lift the wing of the plane, but to no avail. The three of them tried to lift it together, but they couldn't. Aruba shouted and asked Qatar if he was using his strength. Pakuma came over and said that it was impossible to put the plane on the truck. Tan Thien knew that it was impossible, of course. How could such a big plane be lifted by human strength? After a while, Qatar managed to lift it up. Yi Lin was surprised to see that he could lift such a heavy plane. Jessica felt that the physical fitness of the Lara tribe far exceeded that of ordinary people. 
Tan Thien wondered if they had been injected with something. Suddenly, the wing of the plane snapped in half. By noon, Tan Thien had made a lifting device. Nick was puzzled and asked Tan Thien what it was. Tan Thien explained that it was a simple overhead crane made from a set of pulleys. It could help lift the plane with the least amount of effort. Everyone was surprised and couldn't believe it. Tan Thien explained the principle of the overhead crane saying that it could lift such a heavy plane with just a few wheels. The set of pulleys borrowed the principle of the lever. Each movable pulley could save half the effort of the person pulling. That is to say, three movable pulleys could save 56% of the effort. To put it simply, it meant that the pulling force was increased by six times. Tan Thien's explanation left everyone feeling confused. They all looked at each other with puzzled expressions. Katar exclaimed, so that's how it is. Brothers, let's try it. Behind them, Yi Lin and Jessica were also speechless. If they had understood, they would have used their heads instead of their feet. Everyone started to work. Qatar led the way and shouted, one, two, three, and the plane was pulled up. Everyone was surprised to see this. Rana felt that it was too easy. Aruba felt that he didn't need to use much strength. Everyone put the plane on the truck. Tan Thien said that everyone should take the plane back first. He would go to the sky pit with Kata's group to check out the situation. Yi Lin reminded him to be careful. According to the map, the sky pit was about a day's journey from the swamp. If they traveled at their normal speed, they wouldn't be able to reach the sky pit, let alone get out of the swamp. So after separating from Yi Lin's group, Tan Thien's group increased their speed. After all, the swamp was full of danger. It was not safe to spend the night there. Earlier than expected, before dark, Tan Thien's group had left the swamp and returned to the place where the tribe had lived before. Because it had not been used for a long time, there was a lot of dust. Although there were thatched houses, Tan Thien's group still set up tents to rest. The next day, as Tan Thien's group was passing through the forest, he felt like he could hear the sound of waves eroding the shore. Nick told him that the sky pit was ahead. Everyone walked out of the forest and saw a huge pit in front of them, surrounded by a forest. Rana said that he had been here a few times, but every time he came, he felt very small. Tan Thien felt that this was a magnificent sight, worthy of the name Sky Pit. Suddenly, the ring on his hand lit up and an arrow appeared, pointing in a direction. Tan Thien saw from the map that their current location was in front of an architectural complex. However, there was no sign of a building anywhere around them, but the arrow pointed towards the sea. Tan Thien turned and asked everyone if anyone knew what was at the bottom of the sky pit. Nick asked Tan Thien if he wanted to go down. He also wanted to go down, but the cliff was steep and slippery. Even if he wanted to go down, he couldn't. Atar told Tan Thien that it was best not to go down. It was very dangerous. The water may look calm, but it was actually an underground spring. Tan Thien was surprised and asked Qatar if he had been down there before. Aruba told him that all the warriors of the tribe had been down there. Nick said that it was a challenge given to everyone by the Earth Spirit. Tan Thien didn't know what the Earth Spirit was, so Qatar explained that every piece of land had its own Earth Spirit. If a tribe wanted to survive on that land, its warriors had to pass the challenge and receive the recognition of the Earth Spirit. When the Sky Pit was discovered, the Patriarch received a call and passed on the content of the challenge. After Tan Thien heard the explanation, he was speechless. Qatar added that in order to prove that the tribe had the strength and courage to live on the deserted island, they had to find a stone with a symbol that the Patriarch had thrown into the bottom of the sea. They had to jump down in one breath and find it first. When they came up, Nick said excitedly that although it was dangerous, everyone had succeeded in the end. Tan Thien was also tired of this team. He asked how deep the sky pit was and if they had seen anything strange down there, like a house. Everyone said that they were only focused on finding the stone and didn't pay attention to their surroundings. Rana said that Tan Thien could ask Ilu or Aruba when he got back. Pakuma and Pahama said that they had also participated. Tan Thien felt that this was the only way. With the experience of crossing the swamp once, on the way back, they didn't go through the swamp again. Instead, they used the map on the ring to find the easiest way back. Although the route was longer, the speed was much faster. Tan Thien and the other four returned to the camp at noon the next day. After receiving the news from the radio, Yi Lin's group had been waiting for a long time. After returning to the camp, Tan Thien didn't rest immediately. Instead, he called a few people to go to the kitchen with him to ask about the sky pit. After everyone gathered, Tan Thien heard them say that they hadn't seen any special architecture at the bottom of the sky pit, but the environment there was special. Pahama said that compared to other places, the sky pit was very clean. There was almost no vegetation. Vidu added that there was a deeper black hole at the bottom of the sky pit. Tan Thien asked Ilu what that hole was like. Virus said that it was a huge black hole that was so deep that you couldn't see 
see the bottom. Even sunlight couldn't reach it. Tan Thien first thought of the sky pit, then of the black hole. The ring was pointing to the bottom of the black hole, so he had to go down there to find out. Tan Thien turned to ask Aruba if he had found anything, but Aruba was laughing so hard that he couldn't speak. Rana said. Young master was the first one to come up to the surface. Qatar said that Aruba could only dive for three minutes. Tan Thien was shocked by these superhumans. Isn't three minutes long enough? Well, we can't treat these guys like normal people. But this also reminds us that if we want to dive down, we have to be fully prepared. From the day Tan Thien decided to go down to the sky pit, he had been busy making oxygen tanks to prepare for diving. He drew out the oxygen tank and prepared to make a mold. Making an oxygen tank was not difficult. He just needed to pour molten iron into the mold and build it into a shape. Making the one-way valve in the tank was relatively difficult. Although there were not many components, they were extremely delicate. The accuracy of the mold was also very high. Otherwise, the components would not fit together properly after being removed from the mold. But the most troublesome part was making the air pump. For this delicate part, Tan Thien had to ask Alex for help. When the air pump was made, everyone gathered to watch Aruba pump air into the tank. As Aruba worked, he said, this is very light. I can make that air pump all by myself. Tan Thien gave him a thumbs up. I'm counting on you, Aruba. Do your best. Fortunately, making the air pump was not like making the oxygen tank. He only needed to make two or three, which reduced the workload a lot. Elaz came to tell Tan Thien that he had made the spring, and Tan Thien was overjoyed. The system displayed, host has successfully made an oxygen tank. Reward, 500 points. Host has successfully made an air pump. Reward, 500 points. Then Jessica told Tan Thien that as the air pressure in the tank increased, it would become more difficult to pump air. Yi Lin said that the body of the tank would also become hotter and hotter. Tan Thien said with a smile that he had known this in advance, so he had put the oxygen tank in a basin of cold water to reduce the temperature of the body of the tank and cool the air so that he could pump more air in. But unfortunately, human strength was limited. At most, the air pumped in could only sustain 10 minutes of breathing. Aruba was still pumping at this time. He was sweating profusely and his eyes were about to fall out. He opened his mouth wide and breathed like an ox, thinking, why am I getting weaker and weaker? Rana also came to help Aruba, but the result was the same. It became heavier and heavier. The two of them couldn't press it down. Aruba asked Rana if she was using her strength. Rana said that she was already trying her best. Then Qatar and the Patriarch also jumped in to help, but after a while, they also collapsed. Tan Thien told this group to rest for a while and switch to another group. Yi Lin saw this scene and asked, is it really that tiring? My goodness, you should try pumping it yourself and see. Even a superhuman like Qatar is exhausted. It took Tan Thien five days to make the diving equipment. After everything was ready, he took everyone to the sky pit. The physical strength of ordinary tribesmen was not comparable to that of Qatar. This time, it took Tan Thien two full days to reach the sky pit. Yi Lin and Jessica were very surprised when they first saw the sky pit. It shocked them both. On the second day after arriving at the sky pit, they collected wood to build a large boat at the bottom of the sky pit in preparation for diving. Everyone worked together to speed up the work. Three days later, Tan Thien's group had finished building the boat and brought it down to the bottom of the sky pit. His group was standing on the boat and preparing to dive. Everyone was fully equipped with oxygen tanks, diving masks. Yi Lin reminded everyone to pay attention to safety. Tan Thien gave a thumbs up to signal that he was okay. Tan Thien's group jumped into the water, while Yi Lin and Jessica stayed on the boat. Jessica sighed and felt sad because she hadn't been diving for a long time. Yi Lin said to Jessica with a smile, it's not bad to watch the scenery on the boat. It feels like the center of the world in the sky pit. So Jessica smiled and felt less sad. After diving down, Tan Thien's group reached the bottom of the sky pit. Tan Thien thought that it would be very deep, but he didn't expect to see the bottom so soon. It was no more than 30 meters deep. Suddenly, the ring lit up. Tan Thien saw the arrow pointing and thought that if it was not beyond his expectations, the arrow was pointing to the location of the black hole. His group moved in the direction indicated by the ring. The more they walked, the more Tan Thien realized that the seabed was really clean. There was not even a single fish. However, there were many dead corals around. This place must have been inhabited by some fish species, but something must have happened to turn it into this. Lost in thought, Tan Thien didn't notice when Kata swam over and grabbed his shoulder, signaling him to stop. The three of them saw a very large black hole in front of them. Tan Thien saw that the black hole had no bottom and wondered if this hole went straight down to hell. Qatar signaled to Tan Thien to ask if they should continue going down. Tan Thien thought that since they had come this far, they should of course go down. They couldn't go back empty-handed. The three of them continued to move down the black hole. 
The deeper they went, the greater the water pressure became. It was dark all around. At this moment, Tan Thien suddenly realized that he saw a structure. Katar wondered if this was where the gods lived in the water. Rana thought it was a miracle. Tan Thien knew that this was the architectural complex shown on the map. Tan Thien found the entrance. He signaled for Katar and Rana to go there. He felt that the water pressure was decreasing as he approached the structure. His group reached the door. The three of them stopped in front of the door. Tan Thien knew that they had arrived at the right place, but the door was closed. It seemed that they could not enter. Suddenly, the ring emitted a light that shone directly at the gate. At this moment, a figure appeared outside Tan Thien's group somewhere in the structure. The gate opened. The three of them watched. Tan Thien didn't know what this was. Rana signaled to Tan Thien to ask if they should go in, but Tan Thien crossed his two fingers to say no. He felt that this structure was too large. If they wanted to search the entire structure, it would take at least half an hour. They didn't have enough oxygen. Moreover, he didn't know what the situation inside the structure was like or if it was dangerous. So he decided to go back first and make plans later. Inside the structure, someone saw Tan Thien's three men swimming away and cursed them. They had come all this way and the door had opened, but they didn't go in. They didn't have any spirit of adventure at all. He pressed the button and said, come in here, all of you. Tan Thien's three men were swimming up when they felt something. Suddenly, all three of them were sucked into the structure by a whirlpool. When they entered, all three of them came up to the surface of the water, panting like dogs running in the summer. Katar asked Tan Thien if he was okay, and he said he was. Rana swam over to Tan Thien, and all three of them were surprised to see the sky. Katar didn't understand and asked the group where they were. Had they reached the surface of the water? Tan Thien explained that it was not clouds and that the sky was fake. It was just a computer-generated scene. If it was not beyond his expectations, then they had entered the structure. Rana found it too miraculous and asked Tan Thien what to do next. Tan Thien said, Now that we have lost our way, it is impossible to swim back the same way. But fortunately, we have the ring to guide us, so we can only follow it. He told Katar and Rana to tighten the caps of their oxygen tanks. They might still need them when they returned. The three of them had been swimming for half an hour without seeing land. Rana was afraid that the people above would be worried if they didn't return. Katar began to feel hungry. Rana said it was a pity that this place was as clean as the outside. If there were fish, it would be great. Any kind of fish would do. Tan Thien realized that swimming for so long consumed a lot of energy. In addition, he had to maintain his body temperature. The energy consumption was much greater than usual. He had to find a place to stop quickly. Suddenly, Rana screamed. Everyone looked over and saw the fins of a shark swimming towards the three of them. Tan Thien cursed Rana, saying that her mouth was more sacred than a temple. The fish had arrived, but it was not yet known who would eat whom. Inside the structure, a message appeared on the screen. Defense system damaged. Cannot be activated. He said that so many years had passed, but the sharks in the laboratory had not died. Could the experiment have been a success? Now that the defense system was broken, he could only sit and watch what fate had in store for the three of them. I'm telling you, this guy. He sucked them in and then played the game of catch and release. He didn't care about them at all. This guy deserves to be shot. One bullet is probably too little. At this moment, Tan Thien's system announced, Megalodon Shark. Average length, 14 meters. Weight, 40 tons. One of the largest predators in history. Maximum bite force, 20 tons. The bite force in its mouth is greater than that of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. It lived from the end of the Miocene epoch, 1. 5 million years ago, to the beginning of the Pliocene epoch, 2.6 million years ago. It was a top-level predator. Tan Thien panicked and said, what the hell? Why is there a megalodon? He took the end of his oxygen hose and sprayed it at the shark, shouting at it to go away. He told Rana and Katar to hold on to him as he continued to swim. Tan Thien still held the hose and sprayed air at the shark. He realized that this wouldn't work. The oxygen in the tank would run out sooner or later. He had to think of something else. Katar told him to look over there quickly. Two more sharks were swimming towards them. He felt that this time, he would probably be saying goodbye to his ancestors. Tan Thien immediately told the other two to do as he did. He hugged the oxygen tank, opened the valve as wide as possible, hugged the oxygen tank tightly, and relied on the buoyancy of the oxygen tank to swim faster. Here's a little tip for you guys in case you ever find yourself in this situation. If you're attacked by a shark and can't escape, try to poop and pee as much as you can. Even though it won't help you escape death, it will make the shark's meal less appetizing. 
Hihi, Han Thien, Qatar, and Rana all hugged their oxygen tanks and clenched their buttocks and glutes to escape. Rana spotted something and called out to Tan Thien. He looked over and saw a glass window. He told everyone to dive down and see if there was an exit. If there was no way out, they would use their oxygen tanks to smash it. The three of them dived down and saw a crack in the glass. Qatar and Rana looked at him to see what to do next. He took his oxygen tank and smashed it to make it big enough to fit through. As the two sharks were about to charge, Qatar pulled Rana over to the other side. Just in time, the shark charged forward and hit the glass. The hole caused by the sharp glass cut into it, and it struggled as it got stuck. Qatar pulled out his dagger and prepared to fight. Tan Thien signaled him not to do anything. Rana patted his shoulder and pointed to the trapped shark. The shark behind it had already eaten it, and its bones were falling out. Tan Thien realized that this place was not safe and that they had to leave quickly. If it was a laboratory, then there must be an exit. Tan Thien signaled the other two to move quickly and continue swimming. Then, they came across a closed door. They tried to pull it open, but it wouldn't budge. At this moment, the two sharks had managed to get through the glass barrier. Tan Thien noticed that there was a green square and a red square next to the door. He wondered if this was the key to opening the door. He scanned the ring over the red square, and it turned green. The door opened, and everyone quickly pulled it open and went through. Rana went first, then Tan Thien. Qatar hadn't had time to move when Tan Thien shouted at him to give him his hand. He had just pulled Qatar through when the shark lunged forward. Tan Thien shouted, close the door quickly, don't let it in. Fortunately, the door opened outward. If it had opened inward, the three of them would not have been able to stop the shark. But holding on like this was not the way to go. If the other shark swam over, they would be in big trouble. Suddenly, there was a loud bang, and the trapped shark was hit by the door. It bled profusely. It turned out that the other shark had rammed into the door, causing it to clamp down on the other shark even more tightly. Tan Thien thought to himself, oh, so it's its teammate pig. Tan Thien pulled out his dagger. He didn't know whether to call it a shark or a stupid fish. After a while, the fish died. The three of them had stabbed it many times, and the door had clamped down on it. Rana asked Tan Thien if it was dead. He said that it was deader than dead. Just then, the other shark rammed into the door. Rana said that there was one last one. What should they do now? Tan Thien and Qatar pulled out their daggers. Rana asked them what they were going to do. Tan Thien pushed the door open, letting the carcass of the trapped shark float out, and then quickly closed the door again. The mysterious man was watching Tan Thien's group. He folded his arms and said, The experiment on the sharks was a success, but the intelligence of the captive sharks seems to be low. But fortunately, the humans are fine. As long as they can get through the black tortoise gate, they can continue to provide support for Tan Thien's group. Tan Thien's group and Rana were exhausted. They hoped they wouldn't encounter any more big fish like this. Tan Thien said, don't worry. Sharks are very sensitive to the smell of blood. If there are any nearby, they're sure to appear soon. He told the other two to keep moving. Even though they had killed the sharks, they still had to find a way to get out. After hearing Tan Thien's words, Qatar and Rana sighed with relief. Although they had managed to kill the sharks using the narrow gap, they had used up a lot of their energy. If they encountered any more sharks, they wouldn't have the strength to fight them. Fortunately, that situation did not occur. After being in the water for so long, Tan Thien's group began to feel very cold. To avoid that, they piled up all the floating objects around them and decided to make a simple wooden raft. After another half an hour, the three of them finally finished making the raft. However, because of the limited materials, the wooden raft was not very sturdy. It could fall apart at any moment. It was better than nothing. After a long time, they finally sighed in relief. As they continued on their way, Tan Thien's group followed the instructions on the ring and continued to go deeper. However, this structure was so large that it was hard to imagine. After an hour, the surrounding environment had basically not changed. During this time, Tan Thien wanted to go through the large iron door several times to see if there was any useful information, but in the end, he suppressed that feeling. If they encountered something like a shark again, they would all be in trouble. Tan Thien saw the ring light up, and before he knew what was happening, the raft suddenly flew up. All three of them were shocked and didn't know what was going on. Rana thought it was a new spell that Tan Thien had cast. Tan Thien didn't know what was going on either, but the raft was moving very fast. Tan Thien shouted that this had nothing to do with him. The raft was moving too fast. Tan Thien told everyone to hold on tight so that they wouldn't be thrown off. A closed door appeared in front of them. Tan Thien shouted, we're going to crash. Then, suddenly, the door opened and someone appeared inside. The group flew through the door, and the raft broke apart. All three of them fell to the ground. 
Tan Thien was very worried when he saw that the ring was broken. He thought that the fall had caused the ring to break, but the strange man explained that the energy in the ring had run out, so of course it would break. Rana thought that this was an enemy. Katar was terrified because he didn't know when the man had appeared next to him. The two of them were on guard and ready to fight. When Tan Thien saw the man, he knew that there were people here. He thought he had been mistaken earlier. The man created three chairs and said, sit down. Don't waste time. There's not much energy left. He turned away and did something on the holographic screen. After a while, he turned back and saw that the three of them were still standing there looking at him. He asked, why are you still standing there? Sit down. Tan Thien didn't know what was going on. The man said, I forgot that there are two foreign friends. He snapped his fingers to activate the language translation and then said, can you understand me now? The three young people, Rana, Katar, and Tan Thien, all had the same question. Who am I? Where is this? The man turned his back, filled with disappointment. Tan Thien asked him what was wrong, where this place was, and how to get out of it. The man opened a drawer and took out a few packages of instant noodles, the kind that are spicy and sour. Then he shouted at Tan Thien to shut up. He was in no mood to answer. Look for yourself. He pointed his finger, and a TV appeared in the air. Tan Thien was surprised to see that it was a black and white TV. The TV started to show the man in the laboratory. Everyone was starting to evacuate and save the data. By now, the energy could no longer be controlled. The man calmly walked over to a chair and sat down. He thought that even though there was a continuous data storage system, it wouldn't hurt to save a little more data. He started to speak. Recording time. New Era Year 336, Solar Day 26. Recording location. Island Number 2, Wufang Kilin Pavilion Laboratory. Recorder. Deputy Director of Wufang Laboratory, Si Jungfeng. All three of them turned to look at him. Rana thought, how could such a big person fit into something so small? Tan Thien thought, why is the person in the picture so different from him in terms of personality? I wonder if it's really the same person. He was so happy to have finally hidden a few packages of instant noodles that he wouldn't share them with them. Tan Thien was speechless. He said, thank you, but I don't eat that. The TV was showing him talking. He said that he didn't know if people from the future or the past would see this recording, but they would be very curious about what was happening in the laboratory. Tan Thien looked up at the screen to watch what happened next. It started when the Earth reached the first level of civilization and began to exploit resources on a large scale. However, the problem of resource shortages was still not solved. 156 years later, the Earth was moving towards the second level of civilization. The Earth was once again facing a resource crisis. Everyone must be wondering that when civilization reaches the first level, they can freely travel in the solar system to exploit resources on nearby planets. So why are they still facing a resource crisis? This issue will not be discussed further here. Just know that this laboratory was opened due to the lack of energy on Earth. Han Thien cursed. He was just getting interested when the man stopped talking. Before explaining the research of the laboratory, he had to make it clear that this island was man-made. When the project team was established, it coincided with the 100th anniversary of Taiwan Island, so it was built according to the outline of Taiwan Island. It was only then that Tan Thien realized why this island looked so much like Taiwan Island. He didn't know when the 336 era that Tu Jungfeng mentioned was, but he really wanted to see it with his own eyes. Speaking of the laboratory, the main research project of the laboratory is a perennial proposition in the scientific community. Time. Time is an insurmountable order in three-dimensional space. Only an advanced civilization can control it. However, because we know this order in advance, we can use it as a breakthrough to solve the problem of energy shortage on the Earth. As for the research on time, I hope that all those who have this data will be as well prepared as possible, at least reaching the third level of civilization before making contact. As for the reason, the consequences of crossing the boundary can be seen on the scene screen. Here, he also said some nonsense. Why not forbid you from researching? Because of curiosity and rebellious psychology, if you don't let me do it, I'll want to do it even more. Tan Thien thought, oh, man, I didn't ask you. You don't need to explain. While he was still bragging, he suddenly ate an invisible foot in the face. An old man wearing glasses stood up and cursed. What time is it now? Everyone else has already run away, but you're still here bragging. The other old man rubbed his face and said, how the hell can we run? The whole island has been affected by the chaos of time. Where can we run now? Teleport? The bespectacled old man also said that it seemed to be true. It was useless to run. Tan Thien now felt that these two old men were really not normal at all. At this moment, old Wu Fang shouted, I forgot something. I've been entering the password wrong. I don't know if I remembered it wrong. 
Tan Thien wondered if the incident in the laboratory had been caused by him. When he continued watching TV, he saw the two old men sitting down to drink tea. Old Wu Fang wanted to leave a video for future people so that they could use it if they found the laboratory. Everyone quickly evacuated. Seeing the two old men sitting down to drink tea and chat, they knew that these two old men were the grandfathers of the madmen. It was too normal for madmen to be mad. The two of them started recording a video again. The bespectacled old man introduced himself as Professor Zhang Shui Lin. Then he pursed his lips and sent out a heart, wanting the viewers to donate to him. I just wanted to punch him. I'm still not getting any donations for my video. What do you want? Tan Thien was also speechless. With a director and a deputy director like this, how did the laboratory function when it was headed by two young men? Tan Thien watched and learned that the energy contained in the celestial clock would explode soon. The river of time that would be created would cover the entire island. Everything on the island would jump forward 200 years immediately. Due to the large energy of the time stream, a space-time storm will be caused. At that time, Peninsula Number 2 will disappear into the cracks of time and space. Because the crack in time and space is unstable, Peninsula Number 2 will appear irregularly in different places in different time and space. Just like the yacht that disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle will suddenly appear in the Pacific Ocean. If anyone is lucky enough to see this island, and even luckier to reach the laboratory and see the video. The laboratory has an escape pod that can escape from the laboratory at a speed of 500 km per hour. It is not affected by inertia, but it cannot escape the time storm, so the two of them do not need to run. They just sit and wait for death. The two of them felt that death was not so bad, because the human body could not withstand the influence of time for 200 years, but consciousness could. The two professors were talking to each other about transmitting consciousness. Professor Lin said that they only needed to transfer the consciousness of the two of them to the cloud in the form of data. If the equipment was not damaged, then not to mention 200 years, even 2000 years would be fine. The two young men stood up and laughed happily. Oh, I almost forgot. That's another way. Tan Thien had to doubt his life. Are these two guys really scientists, or are they more like comedians? Then the two men shook hands and set to work, one installing emergency software and the other in charge of consciousness transmission. After the three of them finished watching and sat down on the chair looking over, Mr. Nu Fuang had already entered the correct code. It turned out he initiated Mr. Lam's consciousness from the consciousness transmission system, which manifested in a form just like his previous self. All three were astonished when a person appeared in midair. Rana saw the whole body emitting light and thought it was a deity. Tan Thien was amazed that this was a technique where after transmitting consciousness to the cloud, it was once again downloaded into an entity. How many years ahead of the 21st century is this technology? Just as he appeared, Mr. Lam flew into combat immediately. Scolding Mr. Nu Fuang for not transferring the data, Mr. Nu Fuang held his head and cried out that he had forgotten because he hadn't used his brain for many years. Then the two made two bowls of spicy sour hao hao noodles and sat talking with Tan Thien's group. Knowing that Tan Thien and the others had arrived on Peninsula No. 2 after encountering a storm. But it was nothing strange as Peninsula No. 2 in the time-space rift could suddenly appear in different locations. Tan Thien asked if there was any way to return to the old world, only to learn that there wasn't, so they shouldn't dream about it anymore, leaving Tan Thien frozen in shock. Mr. Fong said that even if they didn't have a way, it didn't mean that Tan Thien's group couldn't go back. He raised his hand and a ring appeared. Then he handed it to Tan Thien. Tan Thien took the ring and examined it in his hand, not knowing what it was. Mr. Lin said that the ring contained the laboratory's digital data, which was the key for his group to return to the original world. He added that when their project team was established, it belonged to the entire hometown plan, and in that plan there was a project called Biosphere 3. The English name is Biosphiba. Mr. Lin said that Tan Thien must have guessed the content of the research. Tan Thien recalled that in his biology class in junior high school, there was a section introducing Biosphere 2. Biosphere 2 is a miniature artificial ecological cycle system built in the desert north of Tucson, Arizona, USA. In order to distinguish it from Biosphere 1, which is the Earth itself, it was named as such. It was initiated by former American football player John Fox Allen and built by Edward Bass and others. The purpose was to understand how the Earth works and to study the simulated conditions of the Earth's ecological environment. Simply put, it was to prepare for emigration to other planets. Unfortunately, after two years of maintaining Biosphere 2, the ecosystem inside it began to collapse. The oxygen content in the air dropped sharply, the seawater became acidified, and the vegetation became desertified. Even the lives of the researchers were threatened. At that time, Biosphere 2 declared its failure. 
At that time, it sounded the alarm bell for protecting the ecological environment on a global scale. It also always reminds future generations. After thinking for a while, Tanthine said, if I'm not mistaken, Biosphere 3 must be a continuation or a further development of Biosphere 2, right? Mr. Lin sighed and said, although it's not appropriate to visualize it, it's true in that sense. Mr. Lin added that the purpose of the hometown plan was to extend the needs of mankind. All the projects were an organic whole, and Peninsula No. 2 was to serve Biosphere No. 3. Tan Thien asked, is Biosphere No. 3 similar to Peninsula No. 2? Are they both in this time-space rift? Mr. Lin said, that's right. And Biosphere 3 has also built a laboratory similar to Peninsula 2. Peninsula 2 is only responsible for producing the research results, while Biosphere 3 is responsible for implementing the practical application of the research results. Old Wu Fang laughed and said, Peninsula 2 produces the raw materials, while Biosphere 3 is the processing workshop that produces the goods. If there is a problem with the raw materials, then the processing workshop will not be able to escape. Tan Thien thought that he was laughing at him when he saw him laughing. Are you laughing at the pain of others? Mr. Lin immediately kicked old Wu Fang away. He told him not to listen to the madman's nonsense because Biosphere 3 had a stronger and more complete laboratory. Even if it was damaged, it would not be as serious as this side, so there was a chance to use the data of this incident to calculate backwards to return to the old time and space. As for the method to find Biosphere 3, the ring would guide him. Tan Thien looked at the ring in his hand and thought that there was finally hope. He asked Mr. Lin why the two of them didn't go with his group. He was told that even if they wanted to, they couldn't because their bodies had become data and had become a part of the laboratory, so they couldn't leave. Mr. Lin was afraid that Tan Thien wouldn't believe him, so he took a knife and stabbed old Wu Fang in the buttocks to prove his point. Tan Thien could only feel bitter when he met these two virtual Canadian youths. He said to the two of them, Aren't you afraid that I will plot to seize the valuable experimental data that you have given me? Tan Thien felt that although the two of them didn't say anything, he could sense a deep sense of mockery. Mr. Lin laughed and said that if Tan Thien had that ability, he should just go ahead and do it. All he needed to do was to promote the progress of civilization. Mr. Fong said that the data had been given, so they should hurry up and leave before they all died. Because of the accident last time, the energy was empty, but the two of them had spent a lot of effort to keep the laboratory running and move it to the waiting room. When Tan Thien's group arrived, it was only operated once more. In another hour, the laboratory's energy would be exhausted. The laboratory would collapse and the two of them would disappear with it. Tan Thien was horrified when he learned that there was only an hour left. Mr. Lin told Tan Thien to calm down and not to worry. In time, everything would be fine. Mr. Lin opened the escape pod. In less than half a minute, they would be out. Tan Thien felt that this was strange. It didn't look like an escape pod. He wondered if the two old men would seize his body when he lay in it. Then a pistol was pointed at Tan Thien's head. Old Wu Fang held the gun and said with dangerous eyes, you know too much. Old Lin flew in and punched and cursed. When did you arrive, old man? You can still joke at a time like this. Mr. Fong said that Tan Thien's face of disbelief made him angry. Tan Thien also sighed at this moment. What kind of professors were these two? If he had met them under normal circumstances, he would have thought that they had escaped from prison. Mr. Lin waved his hand and said that it was a good thing to be vigilant, as it would help him live longer. He and Wu Fang had absolute authority in the laboratory. If they wanted to harm people, they would have done so already. There was no need to resort to such roundabout tactics. Tan Thien felt that he was judging a gentleman's heart with the heart of a petty person. Then Tan Thien approached the escape pod and asked the two of them if there was anything else they needed help with. Mr. Lin said that as long as he could find Biosphere 3, taking all the data related to the laboratory out would be the greatest help. Old Wu Fang asked him if there was anything else he wanted to ask. If not, then he should hurry up and leave. Don't just stand there. Tan Thien smiled and asked for something like a cannon or a high-tech gun for self-defense. If possible, it would be even better to give him a boat to travel far away because it was unknown when the three of them would be able to leave the island. Old Wu Fang exposed him. Three people? Don't tell me that you didn't notice that all the dozens of life forms on Peninsula No. 2 are apes. Mr. Lin said that Tan Thien shouldn't hope anymore. Everything in the laboratory had been destroyed. When the energy is exhausted, everything will turn to dust. The energy inside the ring he gave you is enough to sustain it for 100 years without breaking. He also informed Tan Thien that Peninsula No. 2, as well as the laboratory, needed energy to maintain. Once the laboratory collapsed, Peninsula No. 2 would also collapse. According to his prediction, the collapse process could last for two years, divided into three stages. In the first stage, the fog in the swamp would disappear, 
In the second stage, the dormant volcano would gradually awaken, but in the third stage, the volcano would erupt, and the entire peninsula would be buried in lava. Therefore, his group had to find a way to build a boat and leave before the final stage arrived. Tan Thien was worried because the fog had dissipated four months ago, so there was only one year left. His group had to hurry. Tan Thien stood at attention, saluted, and bid farewell to the two seniors. Mr. Fong told him to hurry up and leave so that he could go and eat some spicy Hao Hao instant noodles. Everything was ready. A ray of light shone from the laboratory as Tan Thien's group entered the escape pod. The two of them hoped that they had not chosen the wrong person, because there was no one else to choose from now. Mr. Zhang thought that Tan Thien was quite polite, so he also respected him. At this point, the two of them had done their best. Mr. Lin didn't understand why Mr. Wu Fang liked to eat noodles, so Mr. Fong said that Hao Hao instant noodles were spicy and sour. If you add beef to it and eat it, you will only get a sore armpit. Mr. Fong would try it to see if it was as delicious as he said. While waiting for the collapse, Mr. Wu Fang regretted that after seeing the results, an accident occurred, so he was not reconciled to the fact that the project was absolutely confidential. Even the internal staff who were not part of the plan did not know anything about it, so there was no honor. Mr. Lin also comforted him that in history, there were many people who watered and fertilized the tree of science, but in the end, there were few who were lucky enough to reap the fruits. Mr. Fong only regretted that he could not complete his work in person. The clock rang, and the two of them opened the bowl of noodles. Mr. Wu Fang ate very deliciously. Seeing that Mr. Lin was holding the bowl without eating, he urged Mr. Lin to have a bite too. While the two of them were eating, the laboratory announced that the energy was exhausted and that the laboratory was about to collapse. The staff should leave immediately. While eating, Mr. Wu Fang suddenly remembered his grandson. He wondered if Zheng Hao and Jia Lin had gotten married yet? Mr. Lin said that they were probably already married. It was a pity that the two of them would not be able to see it. Suddenly, Mr. Wu Fang said that he wanted to go to the toilet, but Mr. Lin scolded him and told him to hold it in. The escape pod was launched. Tan Thien's group had traveled a short distance when Tan Thien saw that the escape pod was starting to rot and break apart. Tan Thien's group had reached the surface of the water. Everyone on the boat spotted them. Jessica was worried because everyone had been down there for so long. She thought that something had happened to them and was about to send someone down to check. As soon as Tan Thien swam in, he shouted for everyone to get to shore immediately. The laboratory exploded and began to collapse. The explosion caused the water to churn and create a huge whirlpool. Everyone on the boat watched. Jessica asked Tan Thien what had happened down there because they had been down there for so long. She had been about to send someone down to look for them because it had been almost 20 minutes. Tan Thien was surprised because it had only been 20 minutes. He thought about the difference in the flow of time in the laboratory and outside. So much time had passed inside, but only 20 minutes had passed outside. He turned away and called for everyone to leave. They didn't have much time left. On this trip to the bottom of the sea, Tan Thien had reaped a rich harvest. Not only had he clarified the existence of this island, but he had also gained a better understanding of the current situation. The news was so overwhelming that Tan Thien spent half a day organizing his thoughts before he could find the right words to tell everyone what he had heard and seen. But no matter how simply and understandably Tan Thien explained it, concepts like artificial islands and space-time rifts were too difficult for the tribe to understand. After listening to him, they finally understood one thing. They had to build a boat and leave within a year. As for the rest, they would just follow Tan Thien's lead. It was too urgent to build a large boat within a year. On the second day after returning to the camp, Tan Thien led everyone to start collecting wood to build the boat. Camphor wood that had been dried in the sun for thousands of years and soaked in water for 10,000 years. It was important to note that not all types of wood could be used to build boats. In ancient times, camphor wood was the best material for building boats because it was very flexible and resistant to water. It would not deform after being soaked in seawater for a long time which would lead to the hull of the boat breaking apart. There were no camphor trees on peninsula number two. Tan Thien had no choice but to choose the second best option. There was a large forest of fir trees in the plains area, which could also be considered a top-grade material for building boats. It was unknown how long this fir forest had been growing, but each tree was so large that it would take several people to hug it. It completely met the requirements for building a boat, saving a lot of time in selecting the materials. In just half a month, everyone had collected enough wood. However, before building the boat, these trees needed to be processed further. 
The wood used to build the boat had to be dried in the shade for four to five years to completely remove the moisture from it. But Tan Thien's group didn't have much time left, so they had to use external force to artificially boil the wood in water. Elaz didn't understand. He asked why they didn't just dry the wood in the sun. Why did they have to boil it in water? Tan Thien explained to him that moisture in wood is divided into two types. One is bound water that exists between the cellulose and cell walls, and the other is free water that exists in the cell gaps and cell cavities. These two types are separated by a wall. If the wood is directly exposed to the sun, the free water will be lost first, which will cause local shrinkage and generate stress, leading to cracks in the wood. However, if the wood is boiled in salt water, this situation will be resolved and the internal stress will be reduced. In addition, boiling can also remove the lipids in the wood and reduce the density of the wood, making it less prone to deformation. Because of these two points, wood that has been boiled in salt water is much less likely to crack. But even so, the wood cannot be exposed directly to sunlight. Next, they had to build a greenhouse with a glass roof. Alex didn't understand what frosted glass was, so Tan Thien told him that they had to use sand to polish the glass so that it had a low light transmittance. Using this type of glass could make the afternoon sun more moderate, further reducing the cracking rate of the wood. Alex didn't expect that even drying the wood would require so much thought. Tan Thien said that even with this method, the wood would have to be dried for at least a month. During this time, he would plant wheat and dredge the dock. In the forest, there was a place where roses grew in abundance. To introduce them briefly, roses are known as the queen of flowers. They are also called moon roses. They are a type of low, evergreen or semi-evergreen shrub that blooms all year round. Their flowers can be used to extract fragrant essential oils or as medicine. Tan Thien knew that although it was the flowering season, it was really lucky to be able to find so many of them so easily. Ilu and the children were wearing flower crowns and showing them to him, asking him if they were pretty. Ilu saw that he had picked so many flowers and guessed that he wanted to give them to Sister Yi Lin and Jessica. He said that was a good idea and that he would think about it. When he returned, he saw that everyone was working hard, so he told them to rest for a while. Everyone dispersed to rest. Aruba complained that he was so tired from working so hard recently that he was about to die. Rana agreed that everyone felt the same way. Elaz didn't know what Tan Thien was doing, but Yi Lin thought, he must be adjusting the pH value. Elaz didn't know what pH value was, so Tan Thien explained it to him. In nature, everything is divided into two properties, acid and alkaline. The same is true for soil. The anthocyanins in rose petals will show different colors when they encounter alkali and acid. Taking advantage of this, we can create an indicator to test the acidity and alkalinity of soil. Nick was surprised to see that the color of the rose petals began to fade. By heating them, he could also extract the anthocyanins from the roses. When the color of the rose petals had completely disappeared, the pH indicator was considered complete. The filtrate from the filtered soil could be poured into the filtrate and the pH indicator could be added to the soil filtrate and the flask could be shaken. Everyone was surprised when the liquid began to turn blue. Alex didn't understand what this change meant, so Tan Thien explained it to him. This change proves that the land we are reclaiming is alkaline. Different types of soil have different properties, so the plants that can grow on them are also different. The wheat that we are preparing to plant prefers slightly alkaline soil. If it is planted in soil that is too acidic or too alkaline, its growth will be restricted or it may even be unable to grow. Rana panicked and said, doesn't that mean that all our hard work will be in vain? Tan Thien said that it didn't have to be that way. This land is indeed alkaline, but that doesn't mean that wheat cannot be planted. We just need to improve the pH value of the soil to make it suitable. Alex wondered how to improve it, and Tan Thien explained that the simplest way was to add an appropriate amount of sulfur to the soil. Sulfur is acidic, and when mixed with alkaline soil, it will undergo a neutralization reaction, causing the soil to become slightly alkaline, which is suitable for wheat growth. Everyone split up to do the work. Aruba was happy that they were finally finished and could start planting wheat. Tan Thien said that it wasn't done yet. The soil needed some time to change, and the wheat also needed to be exposed to the sun to wake it up from its dormant period before it could be planted. It would be at least three days before they could start planting. Aruba found it strange. Rana noticed that it was rare for Aruba to take the initiative to work. Qatar said that he must want to eat dumplings because there wasn't much wheat flour left. Pakuma laughed and said that Aruba was still Aruba after all. As the afternoon wore on, Yi Lin wondered how much wheat they could grow on the 100 acres of land. Tan Thien guessed that it would be about 400 kilograms per acre, but that was for improved seeds. The pirate wheat would probably yield much less, maybe about half. Jessica said that if that was the case, they would get 20 tons in a year. That's enough food for the camp for a year. 
Just as Tan Thien had said before planting the wheat, the dormant seeds had to be awakened, so the next day after the fields had been treated, everyone in the camp was out drying the wheat. The wheat had to be dried for at least two or three days. During this time, they didn't just sit around and wait. They went to the beach and started preparing to build the dock that the boat would need. Three days later, everyone spent a day soaking the dried wheat in water. Once the grains had absorbed enough water, they were removed and placed in a shady spot. After being dried and soaked, the seeds had awakened from their sleep, so early the next morning everyone went down to the fields and began planting the wheat. 100 acres of land is equal to 10 football fields. The amount of work involved was huge, and it was obvious that it couldn't be completed in a single day. But it had to be done, no matter what. The entire Lara tribe worked until 9 p.m. before finally finishing planting all the wheat. It was a matter of necessity, as they had less than a year to complete the task. They had to give it their all. Han Thien encouraged everyone. He knew that they were all very tired, but he asked them to persevere because the situation was so urgent. From now on, each person would have their own tasks. Alex would use the existing lathe to machine the parts for a level 1 lathe, which would be upgraded to be able to machine larger pieces of wood. Tan Thien would give her the blueprints later. Jessica was in charge of transporting the wood. Although the road was shorter, the terrain was difficult to navigate and required too much manpower, so it had to be transported by sea. All they had to do was load the wood onto the boat and the wind would take care of the rest. There was a swamp between the plains and the coast, so for safety reasons, Pakuma and Pahama were in charge of escorting them. Finally, Yi Lin was in charge of logistics, fetching water, watering the crops, feeding the animals, and so on. Everything was left to her. Nick was in charge of security and protecting the camp. He had already assigned everyone else who hadn't been named to a task. He would hand out papers so that everyone could confirm their tasks, and then he would go back to rest. After everyone had confirmed their tasks, they all started to get busy, like spinning tops. Alex hammered away at the iron. Rana and Aruba worked hard to move the bricks, and Pakuma and Pahama's group transported the wood. Even the children, like Elu, weren't idle. Under Yi Lin's leadership, they had to go and pump water to irrigate the fields. Nick was surprised to see the elders at the water pump. They said that they had already fed the wild pigs and the guinea fowl. Now that the Magra group was in charge of taking care of them, they had come to see if they could help. Yi Lin felt embarrassed because the three elders were old and not in good health. She didn't want them to do such hard work, so she refused. The elders knew that Tan Thien and Yi Lin were just being considerate and giving them light work to do but they felt embarrassed to be pushed aside and left idle all day while everyone else was busy. Even though they couldn't do heavy work, they could still pump water. Yi Lin saw that the children and Elu were tired, so she let the three elders try it out for a while. The three elders smiled and told Yi Lin not to worry, they would definitely complete the task. They took off their robes and revealed their muscular bodies. Their chests and abs were like those of Lida and Pham Van Mok. Their bodies were covered in scars, like those of the warriors in the tribe. Even Yi Lin was taken aback. They started pumping water, and the water flowed out in a torrent. They told each other to put in a little more effort and finish before the afternoon. Yi Lin and the children who were standing outside were stunned. Yi Lin couldn't believe that these were men who were over 50 years old. Ilu was also very surprised. She had never known that the elders were so formidable. Nick happily told her that his father had said that when they were young, the elders had been the most powerful warriors in the tribe. Every morning, they would wake up to the sound of the rooster crowing and go to work. They wouldn't stop until the stars were out and they could eat their dinner. Yi Lin, Ilu, and some others brought dinner to the beach for those who had gone out to sea. Since there was no wind on the sea, Jessica had to row the boat herself. She hoped to reach the beach before sunset. Time flew by as they worked tirelessly. They had already built a warehouse next to the port. At some point, Alex had finished upgrading the lathe. Jessica's group had transported all the wood from the plains to the beach and had also joined in the work of building the boat. When everyone finally came to their senses, it was already summer. Yi Lin called everyone to eat ice cream while they were resting. Aruba was so hot that he didn't want to move at all. Suddenly, he stood up and was about to take off his pants to cool down. Just as he pulled them down, Yi Lin and Tan Thien were shocked. Oh, shit. Qatar flew over and kicked him hard for being so impolite. He apologized, saying that he was so hot that he had acted without thinking. Yi Lin ate her ice cream and said to Tan Thien that it was so hot that even with a fan, she couldn't stop sweating. He said that even though they avoided the hottest part of the day, the summer was so harsh that even with mud on their bodies, many people still got sunburned. 
Moreover, their clothes were made of animal skins, which were heavy, uncomfortable, and didn't absorb sweat. That's why he had to complete the one-year goal. Jessica noticed that the map of island number two seemed different from before. It had more details. He said that this was the upgraded version. He had recently discovered that the new map could be used to search for the names of plants on the island. He looked for the hemp plant. The next morning, he took everyone to look for it. It must be nearby. Everyone searched carefully. Pahama raised her hand and said that she had found it. She introduced it to everyone. The hemp plant belongs to the genus QT. It is a shrub and one of the most important fiber crops. The protein content in its leaves is high, making it a nutritious food. Its roots contain medicinal ingredients such as axiterologenic acid, caffeic acid, protocatic acid, quinic acid, optiogen and rolin. It also contains cholesterol oil and some polypeptides that can moisturize and heal sores, etc. The hemp stalk can be used as a raw material for paper production or as a fiberboard for various purposes such as interior filling and wall panels. Pan Thien was overjoyed when he saw so many of them. He told everyone to try to cut down all the hemp plants before the sun went down. Three days later, Aruba was wearing a pair of pants made from hemp. He found them to be so cool. He was standing there shaking his butt and dancing when Qatar flew over and punched him for being lazy and not helping everyone else. Tan Thien glanced at them, because he found this scene quite familiar. Oh well, let them be. Although hemp is not a food, in Chinese history it was like a staple food and occupied a relatively important historical position. The reason for this is none other than the fact that hemp can be made into cloth. Hemp is related to one of the four necessities of human life, clothing. He had found so many hemp plants because he wanted to make clothes for the people in the tribe. Compared to cotton, hemp is less heat resistant but more breathable. In the hot summer, hemp fabric is the best choice for making clothes. However, turning hemp into fabric is not a simple matter. The first step is to remove the layers of hemp veins in the green bark on the stem of the plant, then dry them, twist them into long fibers by hand, and tie them into coils. Next, each coil of fiber is placed on a bamboo frame and rice milk is spread evenly over it to make the rough fibers smooth. Next, a comb-like knot is used to align the fibers, and then they can be put on the spinning wheel. Tan Thien asked Alex to make a spinning wheel, and she didn't expect her to do it so quickly. The system displayed. Host successfully created a spinning wheel and received 1,000 points. Tan Thien asked Yi Lin to weave the cloth, and she found it even simpler than she had imagined. Tan Thien felt that it had been the right decision to entrust Yi Lin with the task. Ilu and Nick were amazed to see the threads being woven together little by little. Nick picked it up and found it very light. Ilu thought that it would be very comfortable to wear as clothes. Jessica saw that Ilu and Nick were very happy, so she smiled too. But she was worried that at the current speed, it would take a long time to produce enough fabric for everyone to make clothes. Tan Thien assigned this task to Jessica's group of skilled students. The speed of cloth production would be much faster in the future. Yi Lin regretted that there was no dye to dye the fabric, otherwise she could have made colored clothes. Jessica agreed with Yi Lin. Tan Thien just smiled. He knew that these women would want to look beautiful. The obsession of women with clothes really knows no bounds. Tan Thien pointed behind him and said, You want the moon after getting the elephant? Here you go. He pointed to a pile of colorful glass jars behind him. Jessica saw a jar of green water and asked what it was. Tan Thien said it was indigo leaves, the raw material for making indigo. It is also a natural indigo dye. Yi Lin wondered why it was green. Tan Thien explained that getting indigo water was not as simple as just soaking it in water. Usually, the indigo leaves had to be soaked in water for seven days. After the lutein in them had been extracted, limestone was added and stirred to turn it into indigo. Ilu raised her hand and said that she already knew this. Tan Thien had previously said that lutein would turn blue when it met an alkali. He smiled and patted Ilu on the head, praising her for studying seriously. When the water in the dying vat turned blue, it was left to settle for a while. Finally, the sediment could be collected and used to dye the indigo. Yi Lin saw so many glass jars and asked if they were all used to make dyes. Tan Thien said that was right. When he had gone to the hemp plants, he had already thought about the problem of dyeing. However, because time was short, he had collected a little on the way. After the cudweed was cooked, it could be used to make a red dye. The clothes were soaked in it and then removed and put into a solution of sodium hydroxide to bleach them. This was repeated seven or eight times to successfully dye them. The gentian had to be soaked in alcohol for 24 hours before it could be used to make a purple dye. Sodium hydroxide was also used to bleach it. The flowers and fruits of the safflower could be directly crushed and soaked in water for three hours to obtain a yellow dye. Salt water could be used to bleach it. Yi Lin and Jessica were overjoyed and clasped each other's hands because they now had many different dyes. 
Tan Thien saw that the two women were happy and added, Red, yellow, and blue are the three primary colors. As long as they are mixed in the right proportions, any color can be obtained. Although the task of building the boat was urgent, the more preparation was done, the faster the work would be. In the hot summer days, it was extremely important to wear absorbent clothes. Hemp fabric not only helped people avoid sunburn while working, but it could also reduce the discomfort caused by the heat and improve work efficiency. Everyone started to be measured for their clothes. Tan Thien was praised by Jessica for his good body. Tan Thien laughed and said that it was okay. Moreover, in the past few days, they had all been working at a high intensity, and even though the physical quality of the Lara tribe was stronger than that of ordinary people, they could not bear it. Now that they had switched to lighter work, it was like a suitable rest. However, it was worth mentioning that Yi Lin was very happy to design clothes and designed many different styles. Week later, Tan Thien was wearing a blue pullover. He felt that the custom-made clothes were really good and fit him very well. Yi Lin was standing outside calling him. She asked if he had finished dressing and to come out and show her. He lifted the curtain and went out, praising her for looking very beautiful. He saw her wearing a yellow crop top and shorts, which looked very sweet. He praised Yi Lin for being very beautiful, which made Yi Lin blush and ask why Tan Thien was asking her that. Then she said anxiously that there was some excess thread in the clothes and that this part was a bit tight and needed to be widened. He felt that under the current conditions, being able to make clothes like this was already very good. At this time, Jessica came out wearing a red chung sam. She called out to Yi Lin that the chest area seemed to be a bit tight. The two of them turned around and saw that Jessica looked very beautiful. Yi Lin praised Jessica's figure, saying that she looked very good in a chung sam. Tan Thien laughed and gave her a thumbs up, saying that she looked great. As he was laughing, his nose started to bleed. I'm telling you, seeing something so delicious, I could puke up a liter of blood. Yi Lin kicked him out and told him to go away. This was a topic for women. Jessica asked Yi Lin if Tan Thien would bleed to death if she wore fishnet stockings. Everyone went out to show off their clothes to each other. Aruba asked Pakuma if they looked good, and he replied that they looked very good. Tan Thien saw Nick and waved for him to come over. Tan Thien was surprised to see Nick wearing a student-style outfit and Ilu wearing an orange dress. He asked, Hey, Nick and Ilu, do your new clothes fit? Aruba came over from somewhere and happily praised the clothes made from hemp fabric, saying that they were very cool and comfortable. Tan Thien was talking to Nick, but Nick didn't say much. He just said, Yeah, I like them. I'm very happy. At this time, Yi Lin and Jessica came out and asked everyone to try out their clothes. If there were any areas that didn't fit, they could be altered. Then, for a while, the whole village came out to socialize and compliment each other in all sorts of ways. You're so cute. You're so beautiful. Your clothes are so cool. You look like an angel. Tan Thien saw that everyone was happy, and he smiled happily as well. He thought about the four criteria of food, clothing, housing, and transportation. He had already completed three of them, and now only transportation remained. The matter of clothing was finally settled. In the following days, they continued to follow the plan to build the boat. Yi Lin was in charge of leading a team to collect the food needed for the trip. Everyone had their own task, and the progress was orderly. Just like that, half a year passed quickly. Suddenly, one night, there was a thick cloud of dust on the horizon. A group of something was moving very quickly towards the forest. As they got closer, they saw that it was a group of beasts of all kinds moving towards the forest. Wolves were also running behind them. Among them, the wolves that were running quickly towards the camp were seen by Virus. He knew that they were the White Eye Group, and he thought that they had come to find Tan Thien. He immediately ordered Aruba to go and call Tan Thien while he went to open the door. Tan Thien was sleeping when he heard the noise and woke up. He didn't know what had happened. Jessica and Yi Lin were also awakened by the noise and went out to ask Tan Thien if he had heard anything. Jessica felt that she could hear the White Eye's call. Tan Thien immediately replied that it was not the same. It was the voice of the White Eye. He told the two of them to change their clothes quickly. Something must have happened. Everyone in the camp quickly ran out to ask if it was a beast attack. Aruba ran over to report that the White Eye Wolf Pack had arrived at the camp. In the middle of the night, Tan Thien and everyone ran out of the camp. Tan Thien used telepathy to ask Babo what the White Eye was saying. He learned that there was a tremor and it was very hot. When Tan Thien heard about the tremor and the heat, he wondered if the volcano was starting to erupt. He called for the patriarch, Ilu, and Aruba to immediately lead the elderly and children of the tribe to the beach with torches. Katar and the Pakuma brothers led a group of people to the kitchen to collect all the food and water. The remaining people immediately went to get as many towels and blankets as possible. The volcano was about to erupt. Everyone had to evacuate quickly. 
A moment later, everyone had run to the beach where the wooden boat that had been built earlier to cross to this side of the island was located. Everyone pulled up the anchor and pushed the boat away from the sandy shore. Tan Thien thought to himself that it was really fortunate. He had never expected that the boats that had been built earlier to escape would be useful at this moment. Previously, Xu Zhengfeng had said in the laboratory that the volcano would wake up again in the second stage, but he did not say anything specific about the situation, so now no one knew how powerful the eruption would be. But now that they had boats, they did not have to worry about being harmed by the lava. As the boats moved away from the shore, there was a deafening explosion. A beam of light appeared at the mouth of the volcano as it began to erupt. Tan Thien told everyone to quickly cover their mouths and noses with wet towels. At this time, the aftershocks of the explosion had reached everyone's boats, causing them to shake violently. On the boat, Jessica and Yi Lin were also unable to stand due to the aftershocks. Babo and the wolves were huddled together in the corner of the boat in fear. Aruba hugged Qatar and screamed, the earth spirit is angry. We're going to visit our ancestors soon. Qatar cursed at him, but Aruba didn't fight back and was punched. After a while, everything stabilized. The mountain was still glowing red and billowing smoke, and there was a lot of dust in the air. Tan Thien covered his face and went into the boat to ask everyone if they were okay. After each group reported that they were okay, he looked around. He saw that even the shore had been affected by the volcano, and perhaps the entire island was covered in a thick layer of dust. Yi Lin was worried that the island would be swallowed by lava but Jessica reassured her that it probably wouldn't come to that. From the looks of it, the eruption wasn't very large in scale. Tan Thien was also worried, but no matter what, they only had half a year left. They had to quickly finish building the boat and leave before the island collapsed. A quiet night passed and dawn arrived. Yi Lin fell asleep on Tan Thien's shoulder. He opened his eyes and yawned, which woke Yi Lin up. She saw Jessica holding the baby in her arms and standing at the front of the boat. She asked, has the volcano stopped erupting? Jessica said that it seemed to have stopped. Tan Thien knew that lava had a temperature of 700 to 1200 degrees Celsius. Even the lowest temperature was enough to burn down the forest. But the forest was not burning, so the camp must be safe as well. He called for everyone to return to the camp. On their way back, they passed through the forest, which was covered in volcanic ash. Everyone had to cover their noses with their hands. After returning to the camp, the children were overjoyed to see that the camp was still there. After spending a night on the boat, everyone was exhausted. However, no one went back to their rooms to rest. Instead, they all gathered in the kitchen because they were afraid that the volcano would erupt again. It was also to find a small sense of security. In order to relieve the worries of the tribe and to reassure themselves, Tan Thien and Qatar decided to go to the plains to explore and find out. Before setting off, Tan Thien had thought that they might be hindered by lava on the way. But in reality, the power of this volcanic eruption was much smaller than he had expected. Although the volcano had spewed lava all over the island, the area covered by the lava did not reach even 13 of the plains, so they were able to reach it very easily. Tan Thien saw that the crater was no longer spewing lava, and it seemed that what Xu Zhengfeng had said was true. The second volcanic eruption would probably occur in about half a year. After determining the time of the next volcanic eruption, everyone finally felt at ease and continued to build the boat. It is worth mentioning that because the plains were covered in lava, the wolves had no place to hunt, so they moved to the forest near the camp. Because they were so close, the white eye often led the wolves around the camp, helping out with small tasks in exchange for food. Half a year later, winter had arrived, and snow covered the ground everywhere. Tan Thien stretched his shoulders. He had been on this island for two years already. After Jessica and Yi Lin came out laughing, everyone got up early because they were all looking forward to the new year. Tan Thien did not expect that they would finish building the boat two months ahead of schedule, but because of this, they were now able to prepare for the new year in a relaxed manner. Everyone had prepared their belongings and put them on the sled. Tan Thien saw Jessica, Yi Lin, Ilu, and Nick laughing and chatting together. He was curious and went over to see what was going on. He saw that the white eye had a red bow around its neck and flowers in its ears. He told everyone that it looked very unusual, but everyone else thought it was very cute. The gentle and elegant white eye was shivering with anger, but it knew that if it argued with these people, it would only make things worse. Even Tan Thien couldn't help it, so he could only apologize to his brother. The wolves pulling the sleds all had bows around their necks. Everyone was on the sleds, and Tan Thien gave the order to set off. A moment later, they arrived at the beach. When they reached the beach, it was almost dark, so he told everyone to quickly prepare to start the party. Everyone prepared the banquet tables with plenty of food, and they lit bonfires around them. 
Then, everyone set off fireworks. Tan Thien told everyone to adjust the fireworks because they were off target. Rana found it difficult to control them because there were so many people. Qatar did not know what the significance was of so many people setting off fireworks. The patriarch repeated Tan Thien's words, saying that it was more fun when everyone did it together. After a while, they finally managed to light the fireworks, which shot up into the sky and exploded in a beautiful display of light. Everyone watched the fireworks and cheered, and then they raised their glasses to toast the new year. Everyone partied all night long, and everyone got drunk except for Qatar. Tan Thien suddenly woke up and felt something strange. Suddenly, three people pressed down on him. If this continued, his arms would be wasted. He put everyone down and went out to look at the finished boat. Suddenly, Yi Lin, Jessica, and Nick came over. Jessica asked if the boat had a name yet, and Tan Thien asked the three of them if they thought the name Fierce Dragon or Zhao Dragon was better. Yi Lin said that it sounded too ordinary. Tan Thien closed his eyes and thought, and his mind started to race. Just then, the sun began to rise. He had a flash of inspiration and came up with the name Dawnbreaker, so he named the boat Dawnbreaker. Let me explain something to you guys. Dawn here means the time when it is both dark and light, at the break of dawn. Dawnbreaker means the time when the sky is just starting to get light. If it were up to me, I would have given it a classic pirate name, like the Flying Dutchman, to make it sound really cool. The snow had already covered the entire mountain, but it could not extinguish the volcano. It was still emitting heat, just waiting to erupt again and destroy everything. According to tradition, for several days after the new year, people would not work. Also according to this tradition, people would no longer be busy, but would instead disperse to explore the island where they had lived for the past two years but had never really taken the time to look at closely. They would enjoy the rare leisure time. Tan Thien and the others played in the snow, while Yi Lin painted a picture of the island scenery. In reality, even if they wanted to be busy, they couldn't be. After two years of preparing for battle, they had everything ready, so there was nothing left to worry about. All that remained was to wait for the right weather and then set sail. If there was anything left to do, it was just to tell the White Eye about the island's impending collapse. The White Eye did not doubt this story, and it also accepted Tan Thien's invitation to take its entire pack on the boat and leave the island. But perhaps because they were used to being busy, when they had a few days off, they felt a little uncomfortable, so they started looking for things to do. Tan Thien took people to the treasure spring to dive for more minerals. He told everyone to try their best to find gold, diamonds, or anything else. The key point was platinum, no matter how small. Because as long as they had platinum, they would not be afraid of any danger on their sea route. Although it was not a very important matter, having something to do at least made everyone feel more secure. Jessica did not expect the wheat yield to be so low, only 15 tons in total, which was less than expected. Tan Thien thought it was enough, because if they added fruit, vegetables, and meat, everyone would not have to worry about food for the next year. Time passed very quickly, and the day of departure arrived. Jessica looked up at the sky and observed that there were only a few clouds in the sky full of stars. Tomorrow would probably be a beautiful day with strong winds. At this moment, Tan Thien was in the cave. He was sitting there watching the screen projected on the ring when Jessica suddenly appeared and asked him what he was watching. Tan Thien told her that he was watching some materials related to island number two in his spare time. She asked him if he had made any progress, and he pointed to a mailbox and said, I don't know if this counts as progress. Jessica looked and saw that it was an experimental log. Tan Thien said, this is a speculation about the space-time rift left by Xu Zhengfeng and Zhang Shalan. Before transferring their consciousness, the two of them made some speculations. The first speculation was that the difference in magnetic fields between island number two and the space-time rift caused the heteromorphism. The repulsion between them will occur. This phenomenon will change over time and cycle, and when it reaches its peak, island number two will be ejected from the space-time rift and appear in any time and space, but this is only temporary. The second speculation is that when island number two is ejected from the space-time rift, its magnetic field and the space-time rift will collide more violently, forming a storm and electromagnetic cloud. Peninsula number two will be quickly pulled back by the space-time rift with nearby electromagnetic waves. During this process, if any creature comes near, it will be drawn into the space-time rift along with peninsula number two. Jessica speculates that the storm they encountered before arriving at second rain was this so-called electromagnetic cloud. Tan Thien added that the wounds healed faster than normal. He also knew the reason. The electromagnetic energy generated by the collision could have an effect on everything on the island, such as turning day into night and night into day. 
physical fitness could mutate and become stronger, and the rate of cell recovery was several times faster than normal. Jessica and Tan Thien had a basic understanding of everything, like the coconut crab that Tan Thien had encountered before. Instead of eating at night, it worked during the day. Sa Diao and Ba Bo had developed beyond the physical form of their species. The strength of the Lara tribe is probably also due to the influence of energy. Jessica did not know if these abilities would still exist after they left the island, and Tan Thien did not know either. They would only know once they left. Yi Lin opened the door and told Tan Thien that she had already informed everyone that they would be leaving tomorrow. However, everyone was not as happy as they had imagined. On the contrary, they seemed a little sad. At this moment, in another part of the camp, Alex and Pahama saw Nick sitting on the roof. Alex told Pahama that she knew Nick would be here. Nick told the two of them that he had wanted to escape from the island before, but now he was a little reluctant. Pahama said that it was probably not just Nick, but many people felt the same way. On the other side, the Qatar Aruba group, Rana and Pakuma were also lying under the tree looking at the sky. Rana said that it was really time to go, and Aruba said, why are Kata's eyes red? Did sand get in your eyes? Qatar was hit in the chest and coughed up phlegm. Early the next morning, on a clear day, everyone gathered on the boat. Tan Thien shouted, let's set sail. The sails were raised to catch the wind. The boat cut through the waves and sailed away, getting further and further away from the island. At this moment, everyone stood there looking back at the island, reminiscing about the past. Yi Lin felt that the past two years had passed by quickly, from waiting for rescue to having to rely on themselves to survive. Now that they were leaving, she felt a little reluctant. Jessica felt that it was a bit too early to say goodbye, as they still had to pass the final hurdle. Nick encouraged them, saying that the sea god would definitely bless them. Tan Thien saw that everyone was a little worried, so he encouraged them to relax, saying that they would cross the bridge when they came to it. He then told everyone to prepare to welcome their upcoming guest. The boat gradually sailed out to sea. On the moving boat, Qatar and Rana were cutting open the pig's belly. Tan Thien handed them a bomb and told them to put it in the pig's belly and then place the pig's body on a wooden raft with a rope attached. Rana was worried that the bomb might explode before they could lure the sea monster, but Tan Thien explained. Don't worry, I've put four bombs in there, plus an extra fuse, so it won't explode that quickly. Tan Thien said, when a friend comes to visit, you offer them chicken or duck, but now we're offering them a whole pig. Now all we have to do is wait for the guest to arrive. Rana asked what would happen if the guest didn't come, and Tan Thien said, if the boat reaches the end of the bridge, it will naturally straighten out. If not, then we'll lose this round and come up with another plan. And if we lose badly, we'll just find something else to play with. Don't worry. Tan Thien turned around and called out to Pakuma and Pahama, assigning them the task of keeping watch. The two of them were still observing every movement on the sea, looking at the raft with the pig's body on it. Nothing unusual had happened yet. At this moment, at the bottom of the sea, the monster was moving closer to the raft with the pig's body on it. The surface of the sea was still calm. The boat was moving slowly. Yi Lin, Jessica, and Tan Thien were in the wheelhouse. Yi Lin was surprised to see that Jessica was very good at driving the boat. Jessica said that she had gone fishing with her father on the sea since she was nine years old, so she had learned by listening and watching. Tan Thien exclaimed that it was the simple and unadorned life of the rich. He remembered that when he was nine years old, he was still shooting birds with a slingshot. Suddenly, an announcement came over the loudspeaker that they had reached the location that Tan Thien had mentioned. The boat had entered an area of thunderstorms. The three of them went out to look at the scene. Tan Thien saw this scene and remembered the day of the accident. Yi Lin asked if this was the electromagnetic storm. Jessica said that they would only truly leave island number two after they passed through this place. Tan Thien ordered everyone to return to their positions. We have to get through this. Jessica, you're in charge of driving the boat. The group in charge of pulling the sails, the group in charge of rowing the boat, followed Yi Lin's orders. Alex was in charge of adding firewood, and when necessary, he would use the motor paddle. The Qatar group was in charge of the crossbow. At this moment, Pakuma shouted to Tan Thien, Leviathan is here. From behind, a sea monster appeared and was charging towards the raft with the pig's body on it. Tan Thien observed through the binoculars and finally understood why the pirate group had been defeated so badly. Looking at the size of the pirate ship, it was not even enough to fit between its teeth. Rana thought it was very intelligent, only appearing when Tan Thien's group was at their most vulnerable. 
Qatar said, such a large creature is truly the spirit of the ocean. Aruba prayed to heaven and Buddha not to encounter Leviathan. Tan Thien took out a bow and arrow with a fiery tip. He absolutely could not let it get close. The arrow hit its target and ignited the fuse. He reminded everyone to pay attention and wait for it to take the bait before pressing the trigger. It was moving quickly towards the pig. It lunged forward and bit down on the pig, shattering the wooden raft. Let me introduce you to the Tylosaurus, also known as the Sea Dragon. Its scientific name is Osasaurida. It lived from about 82 to 66 million years ago during the Combatian and Marian stages of the late Cretaceous period. It has a huge head, powerful jaws, and sharp teeth. Its appearance is similar to that of a crocodile with webbed feet. Its body can reach a length of 17 meters. It was the largest and most powerful predator in the Mesozoic Ocean. It is known as the T-Rex of the ocean. A series of arrows were fired. Two of them hit the Tylosaurus. Everyone shouted to quickly string the bow and load the arrow. But the Tylosaurus had already dived away. It dived down and began to swim closer to the boat. Everyone fired a few more arrows, but they missed. Pahama reported to Tan Thien that it had sunk into the sea, so they could not attack it effectively anymore. What should we do? Katar exclaimed. It's chasing us again. Tan Thien told Jessica through the wooden speaking tube to start the paddle wheel. Jessica heard this and relayed the message to Alex to start the paddle wheel. Alex was adding more firewood to the furnace. At this moment, outside, the Leviathan was charging forward, opening its mouth to attack the boat. Aruba was terrified when he saw this scene. He thought they were doomed. Tan Thien calmly shouted for everyone to fire. Just then, the paddle wheel started working. The Leviathan missed its attack. Seeing that its prey had escaped, it dived down to chase after it. The Patriarch exclaimed, Oh no, its speed hasn't decreased at all. Tan Thien immediately called Jessica to tell Yi Lin's group to start rowing immediately. Suddenly, there was a loud explosion. A column of water shot up high in the middle of the sea. Everyone wondered what had happened. Aruba said he had heard a loud noise, while Pahama thought the bomb had worked. Everyone saw a patch of blood spreading on the surface of the water, along with a pile of minced meat. Aruba could not believe that they had killed the Leviathan. Rana felt that it was too unreal. Tan Thien said that with so many bombs exploding inside its body, it was not surprising. He estimated that the Leviathan's speed was slower than it actually was. Fortunately, they had managed to overcome the danger. Otherwise, they would have wasted a trump card. Jessica asked Tan Thien and the others how they were doing. She had heard the explosion. Had they finished off the Leviathan? Tan Thien told her that if she wanted, she could go to the stern of the boat to see the Leviathan's true appearance, which was a Tylosaurus. Jessica was delighted to hear Tan Thien's words. She asked Tan Thien to take over the helm so that she could go and have a look. Suddenly, Jessica looked ahead and saw that the waves were rolling high like a tsunami. She shouted to everyone that there was no time left. Everyone quickly returned to the cabin. We're in big trouble. Everyone shouted to each other to run quickly. Tan Thien told everyone to go down and help Yi Lin. The boat continued to bob up and down in the storm. The high waves were about to hit the boat. Someone shouted, it's coming. Tan Thien ordered them to maintain the speed of the paddle wheel. Yi Lin's group prepared to row the boat. In the lower cabin, the doors were opened and the oars were brought out. Everyone rowed together in time with Yi Lin's whistle, giving it their all. The boat began to climb the wave. Tan Thien and Yi Lin felt that this scene was truly magnificent. The boat continued to charge towards the towering wave. Everyone shouted to each other to sit tight. We're about to ride the wave. Tan Thien felt that when Sun Wukong faced the Buddha's palm, he must have felt the same way. The boat sped up. Jessica had pushed the paddle wheel to its maximum capacity. The boat was slowly climbing the wave. Tan Thien and Jessica saw that they were about to succeed. They were about to reach the top of the wave. All the units were working hard to increase the boat's speed. At this moment, the boat had climbed to the top and overcome the fierce wave. Tan Thien said, we're safe. This event was a hundred times more exciting than riding a roller coaster. Nick found it incredibly magnificent. Ruba thought that the boat was going to capsize and almost wet his pants. Yi Lin, who was seasick and seeing stars, asked Tan Thien. We've passed the magnetic field of island number two, right? He said yes. We've passed the red earth continent. Now let's go find the one piece. Jessica said, the scenery is beautiful, but don't forget to come back before you get too cold. The boat was gradually moving out of the magnetic storm area of island number two. The next day, the sky was clear and the sea was calm. Tan Thien was changing his clothes in his room. Rana told Aruba to go and change his clothes quickly, instead of lying on Tan Thien's bed soaking wet. Aruba didn't care. Finally, he could rest. Tan Thien was thinking about what to eat. 
He decided to go and find something to put in his mouth. Food is what sustains life. As soon as he turned around, he saw Babo, saw Dio, and the wolves lying face down. He didn't know what had happened. Maybe it was seasickness, because these land animals had never experienced the rolling of the sea before. When they saw Tan Thien open the door, the whole group was overjoyed. Their eyes lit up and they rushed outside. It was then that he realized that they had just been suffocating for too long. There was no need to worry about these buffoons. In the dining room, there were already several delicious dishes on the table. Yi Lin was holding a plate of food and asked where Tan Thien was. Nick told him that he was inspecting the hull and would be back soon. At this moment, Tan Thien opened the door and asked, what's so delicious today? I could smell it from the stairs. Jessica told him to look. This mobile temple was very effective. As soon as you mentioned it, it would appear. I don't know if it was because they were happy to have left island number two safely, or simply because they were hungry, but everyone ate the first meal on the ship very happily. But happiness could not overcome fatigue. After eating, everyone felt exhausted. One by one, they returned to their rooms to rest. Tan Thien went back to his room and opened the system to check his points. The system announced that the host had killed the Tylosaurus and was rewarded with 5,000 points. The host had built a ship and was rewarded with 3,000 points. Total points, 18,000. Tan Thien saw that this was enough to exchange for an emergency talent. When there was danger, he would have another trump card. In the girls' room, Yi Lin told Jessica that she couldn't sleep because she wasn't used to it. Jessica teased her, asking if it was because she wasn't sharing a room with Tan Thien. Nick also wanted to share a room with Tan Thien. Some people couldn't sleep for various reasons, but the person in charge of the night watch didn't need to be mentioned. There were also the little ones who had just been released outside. They didn't sleep at night and howled all night long. The next day, the sun rose. Pakuma told everyone that it was morning and to wake up and watch the sunrise. Everyone went out. Nick stretched happily. Jessica was still sleepy and yawning. Tan Thien's eyes were dark because the ship kept rocking whenever it hit a big wave, and he couldn't sleep peacefully. The group stood and watched the sunrise. It was beautiful. This was a scene that could only be seen on the sea. After a while, the ship set sail and continued on its journey. It was as if yesterday's events had never happened. The next day, the sea was calm and the wind was gentle. Everyone enjoyed the beautiful scenery as if they were on a cruise ship. The patriarch boasted to everyone that he had caught a big fish. Qatar was a little annoyed because he had only caught a small fish. The elder was watering the plants. The weather was very good for the next half month. The ship sailed smoothly until it encountered a thick fog on the sea. Tan Thien opened the map on his ring and saw that there were three areas. Area D1, a tropical monsoon mountain area. Area C2, a tropical monsoon rainforest area. Area A1, a temperate monsoon plain area. The three of them looked at the map. Yi Lin asked if this was the complete map of the third volume. Jessica felt that island number three was much more primitive than island number two. Tan Thien explained that based on the information in the ring, the third volume was not an island, but a continent. It included all kinds of terrain and climates in the world. Jessica couldn't believe that an artificial continent could be built. Yi Lin saw that it also included climate and terrain. How was that possible? Tan Thien added. This complete map was not as simple as it looked. Just click on it and you can switch to a detailed map of that area. Tan Thien clicked on an area and a map opened up. Jessica saw that it was a plane. The prefix of each area marked the climate of that area and the characteristics of the terrain. Tan Thien agreed with this. Just then, Nick ran over and told Tan Thien that there was a lot of fog outside. Tan Thien was going to check it out when he heard people say that the fog was too thick. They could hardly see the sea anymore. They wondered if they would get lost. Jessica and Yi Lin also came to see. Yi Lin didn't understand why the weather was so clear and suddenly there was such a thick fog. Jessica said that the weather at sea was very changeable. It was normal to have sunshine one second and a storm the next. But fog usually appeared in coastal areas from April to July, when the seasons changed. Now that we are far out at sea, it is the first time I have seen such a thick fog. Tan Thien was worried that the thick fog would affect the group's course. Jessica said that according to statistics, 80% of accidents at sea were caused by fog. But in this world, there was no need to worry about colliding with other ships. As a precaution, they lit the fog lights. They slowed down and everything should be fine. Tan Thien called Pahama to light the signal lamp and then went downstairs. The fog was so thick and dense that there was no need for a lookout. The lights were lit. Nick was surprised to see that the lights had turned yellow. Jessica explained. Those are fog lights. The glass of the lights has been dyed yellow. 
The yellow light can travel very far even in thick fog. It indicates the location of the ship to avoid collisions with other ships. Tan Thien told everyone to go back to the cabin first. Wait until the fog clears before coming out. He thought that the fog was formed by countless tiny water droplets that were very easy to contain bacteria. It would be better to stay in the cabin now. As he was thinking, he turned and saw the leopard sleeping soundly. He grabbed the leopard by the ear and dragged it away. The fog was so thick that it seemed like it would not clear up anytime soon. As soon as he entered, Tan Thien was surprised to see everyone gathered together. He wondered what was going on. Yi Lin said that Jessica was telling everyone a ghost story. Tan Thien was speechless. How could she be in the mood to tell a ghost story at a time like this? She was really too free. Jessica told a story about a ghost ship. They were pirates who had died in a shipwreck at sea. Because of their resentment, they could not go to heaven. They could not fall into hell either. They could only float on the sea with their rotting bodies full of maggots. If a ship came near, they would attack and express the hatred in their hearts. They only appeared when the weather was foggy like this. Moreover, every time they appeared, there would be the sound of a gloomy bell coming from afar, like this. Ken Ken. It sent chills down everyone's spines. Aruba was shivering as if he had a fever. The patriarch said it was too scary. It sounded as if he had heard that sound before. Nick was so embarrassed to have such a father. Suddenly, Nick asked Jessica if she had said earlier that when there was thick fog at sea, yellow lights would indicate the location of ships. Jessica said yes, and asked why he was asking that all of a sudden. Nick pointed to the distance and said that there was a yellow light there, which made Aruba and the patriarch panic and scream. The ghost ship is here. The white fog pirates are here. Tan Thien thought, how could it be so coincidental? Maybe it's just a coincidence. Yi Lin wondered if another ship had been drawn into this world. Like the microcosm pirates. Tan Thien called Qatar. You guys take your weapons and come with me to check it out. The rest of you stay in the cabin and don't run around. Jessica asked Pahama to ring the bell twice to say hello and see if there was any response. But there was no response. She said to ring the bell five times to warn them. Pakuma's group used binoculars to observe, but they could not see anything. Aruba thought that it must be a ghost ship. Tan Thien saw that the other party did not respond and could not contact them. Maybe it was not a ship, so he told them to avoid it for the time being. He felt that it was too unreasonable. Looking at the distance in front of him, surely the other party could hear the bell? Could it really not be a ship? In case of an emergency, we must be prepared. He told everyone to get their weapons ready. He also hoped that it was just a false alarm. Pakuma saw something and called Tan Thien to look. When they both looked over, they saw a large ship approaching. Tan Thien shouted for everyone to be prepared. Aruba panicked and shouted, the ghost ship is here. In the cabin, Yi Lin observed that it was indeed a real ship. Jessica asked Tan Thien if they should try to communicate again, but Tan Thien said that they had already sent two signals and the other party had not responded. Obviously, they don't want to communicate. Let's go our own way. If the situation is not right, we will shoot immediately. Tan Thien was on the deck and aimed his crossbow at the strange ship. He did not know if it was friend or foe when suddenly a cannon barrel protruded from the other ship. He panicked and shouted, it's an enemy. Fire. He had to seize the opportunity to strike first so that the other side would not have time to react. A volley of arrows was fired, but they did not hit the other ship and passed straight through it. Tan Thien was about to load more arrows when the other side fired a volley of guns and cannons at him. He panicked and shouted for everyone to get down. He saw that the other ship had both guns and cannons, and with Fa Xiao's weapons, they could not fight back. Moreover, the hull of the ship was made of wood and could not withstand cannon fire, so they had to leave quickly. Judging from the structure of the other ship, it was only a sailboat. Under the same conditions, his ship had oars in addition, so it should be able to outrun it. Everyone on the ship lay down to avoid the attack, but there was no movement. Tan Thien wondered if they had missed, or if they were out of range. Pahama reported that it had passed through, it had passed through. Tan Thien asked what had passed through. Pahama reported that he had seen the cannonballs pass through the Fa Xiao ship. Tan Thien saw that his own arrows had passed through the other ship, and the other ship's cannonballs had passed through his own ship. He wondered if it was an illusion. Qatar and Nick told him to be careful, as a cannonball was flying towards Tan Thien. The cannonball flew over and passed through Tan Thien's body. Everyone was shocked and worried as they looked at him. He knew that he had been right. Everything was an illusion. Ruba was terrified and asked Tan Thien if he was okay. Tan Thien told everyone to stand up. 
the ship that they had seen was not real, it was just an illusion. Jessica laughed and said that she never thought she would see an illusion here, it was really lucky. Everyone stood and watched. Yi Lin said that it was indeed a rare sight. Nick did not understand and asked what an illusion was, so Yi Lin explained. It is a natural optical phenomenon that appears as a mirage in other places after the light reflected from an object is refracted by the atmosphere. Nick did not understand after listening. Tan Thien was at a loss with this kind of explanation. What was the use of explaining it like that? Even a frog would be at a loss with her. Explaining to a native who had never seen a gun before in that way, if anyone could understand it, then poke my eyes out. Tan Thien had to explain it again, saying that it was simply like the shadow we cast on the ground. Mirages used a more special method to project the shadow. Nick finally understood that it was basically a shadow. Then the ship sailed past. Tan Thien found it strange that the mirage appeared on the sea and could move, and even reacted to their group. Jessica had also never seen a mirage on the sea before, so she did not know how to explain it. Yi Lin thought that perhaps this was not a mirage, but an existence in this world, or a natural phenomenon that humans had not yet discovered. Just then, the fog also cleared. Jessica saw that as the fog cleared, the other ship also disappeared. Yi Lin said that such a scene could only be seen in the fog. After leaving the fog, the Fa Shao ship continued to sail, continuing towards the third life scroll. But this time, meeting it could be considered a kind of magic. In the time that followed, many tribesmen talked about it enthusiastically. The sea route was restored to peace. Although occasionally there were storms and gales, but compared to the thunderstorms when leaving the desert island, it was really not worth mentioning. Relying on the Fa Shao's capabilities and Jessica's sailing experience, they were always able to overcome it easily. It had been a month since the Fa Shao left the island. The Lara tribe had long been accustomed to life at sea. Apart from eating and drinking, everyone had to eat grilled fish, steamed fish, and braised fish. Cooking all kinds of things had made everyone miss their previous life on the desert island. Although there was still dried pork and canned food in the warehouse, it was all precious food that was reserved for later. There was nothing new, and the monotonous daily life made many people feel bored and tasteless. Tan Thien saw this and discussed with the patriarch about training the others to become warriors. He wanted to divide them into two teams to train in turn. If the ship encountered an unexpected situation, there would be manpower to respond. The patriarch said that training warriors was a good thing, but it would take a long time and there was no guarantee that it would be effective. Not everyone was suited to be a warrior, because warriors were born with talent. Tan Thien knew this, so he prepared for an examination system to select potential people for training. Although the ghost ship was just a false alarm, it was also a wake-up call for everyone. The only warriors on the ship were Qatar. Although the other tribesmen could also participate in the battle, their strategy was too weak. If they encountered danger, it would not be good to rely only on the Qatar group. At least all the tribesmen should have the ability to protect themselves. The patriarch agreed with Tan Thien, but he told him that he had to help and not just leave everything to him. Tan Thien asked how one could become a warrior in the previous tribe. The patriarch said that it was very simple. At the coming of age ceremony, one only needed to bring back a wolf or a beast stronger than a wolf by oneself. He also thought bitterly that it was very simple. How did he know that wolves were pack animals? Hunting a wolf meant facing the entire pack. This could be seen as a comprehensive test of strength and intelligence. But what surprised him was how the young man Aruba had managed to pass. That was the strange thing. Tan Thien and the Patriarch discussed the assessment criteria for a long time. In the end, Tan Thien decided to still adopt the warrior selection method of the Lara tribe. However, the content of the assessment had changed slightly. The tribesmen only needed to defeat one of the three wolves, or persevere for more than half an hour under the siege of the three wolves, to be qualified to become warriors. Then Tan Thien discussed with White Eye about selecting warriors through Babo. This was also a good opportunity to train the wolves. Soon after, Tan Thien and the Patriarch finalized the regulations and announced them to everyone. The Lara tribe cheered endlessly because becoming a warrior in the tribe was a great honor. A battle between wolves and humans was about to begin. A week later, the test was conducted. Apart from the elderly and the children, all the tribesmen participated. This selection lasted for more than a month. In the end, 13 tribesmen passed the test. The tribesmen who passed cheered with joy, while those who were not selected were sent by Tan Thien to learn archery with the Pakuma brothers. He found that the Puka tribesmen were very bad at archery. If they could improve their technique, it would enhance the overall combat effectiveness. Yi Lin told Tan Thien that she also wanted to learn archery. She did not want to be protected by everyone all the time. When necessary, she had to learn to protect others. He agreed to teach her. First, he let her try shooting to see how good she was, then he guided her step by step. 
When drawing the bow, do not be too rigid. Relax a little and find the most comfortable position for your right hand. Meanwhile, Pakuma's group was practicing pulling water buckets with one hand to increase the strength of their hands. To draw the bow steadily, one had to pull the bow and arrow 100 times. Yi Lin asked if she should not practice like them. Tan Thien was at a loss for words and said to her, Just get used to the basic posture first. It is too early to train like the others. At this time, it was not only Tan Thien's group at the stern of the ship who were training. The tribesmen who had passed the test were launching a fierce attack on the three men. Katar and Nick kicked one person away because they had no foot protection. Rana gored one person because he was running around and not fighting. Katar was instructing someone that if he wanted to give his opponent a fatal blow, he had to use the weapon in his hand to hit his opponent first. Just like when they were testing the Qatar group's training. It was extremely simple and brutal. In Kata's words, it was combat skills. It was the skill that could allow one to survive and return from the battlefield. When Yi Lin was resting, Tan Thien was not idle either. After exchanging martial arts with the pirate captain, he realized that his combat experience was too poor. Therefore, he asked the patriarch to be his opponent to hone his combat skills. A month later, Jessica was steering the ship when she discovered something. She immediately informed everyone that their long journey was coming to an end. Everyone got ready because the ship was about to reach the third life scroll. The Fa Shao once again entered the storm area. Although the thunderclouds were terrifying, they had already successfully conquered them once. This time, although everyone was afraid, they were more excited. The Fa Shao was 100 meters away from the thunderclouds. Everyone got into position and held their breath, waiting for Jessica to shout and start the paddles. Full speed ahead, the ship rushed into the space-time storm. Half an hour later, the ship had passed through the storm and entered a safe zone. Pahama announced that they had arrived. In front of them was the continent. Nick looked at it and still did not know if it was a continent. Everyone on the ship cheered. It really was a continent. We're here. Finally, the sea route was over. Jessica saw through the binoculars that they had reached the third life scroll earlier than expected. Tan Thien felt great. He thought it would take half a year to get there, but he did not expect it to be done in just three months. The ship slowly approached the land. Everyone lowered the small boats first and sent a group of warriors to scout the way. Ilu asked what they were doing and Jessica explained that the area near the sea was shallow and easy to hit reefs, which was a great threat to ships. Therefore, we must send small boats to scout the way first to ensure a safe route. Everyone on the ship was observing the area of the third life scroll, thinking that there must be a lot of food. Seeing many trees growing straight in the water, Jessica asked Tan Thien if he knew where the ship was now. Tan Thien said that the ring did not have a positioning function. It was probably because the ring was related to island number two, not the third life scroll. But through this characteristic mangrove forest, combined with the shape of the coastline, they had determined the location of the ship. Tropical Rainforest Area D3. Jessica did not like it because it was all rainforest here. Tan Thien suggested that they could change to another place to go ashore. Tropical rainforests were the most biodiverse ecosystems on the continent, with an abundance of poisonous snakes, scorpions, and ferocious animals. Even well-armed explorers would not dare to venture deep into them, let alone crossing this Amazon rainforest. Going ashore here was not a good idea at all. Jessica agreed with Tan Thien's opinion. She asked him if there was a safer place nearby. Tan Thien opened the map on the ring to see. He said that the temperate monsoon hills in the next area were the most suitable stopover point. We will go there. Then Tan Thien quickly informed everyone about this news, but they did not rush to set off. Instead, they rested for a night before following the coastline to continue their journey. According to the data in the ring, the location where they were standing was in the middle of the D3 coastline. The tropical rainforest was more than 400 kilometers away from the A1 temperate monsoon hills. If the wind was favorable, they would arrive in about three days. Even if the wind was unfavorable, with the Fa Shao's slowest speed, it would take at most five days. But in reality, things did not go as they wished. Aruba and the Patriarch were tired of being on the boat and just wanted to go ashore. On the morning of the seventh day, the ship was still moving. Tan Thien found it strange. According to the plan, they should have arrived at Area A1 the previous evening, but the group was still lingering on the D3 coastline. Yi Lin wondered if they had already arrived without realizing it. Jessica said that was impossible because the vegetation in the two areas was completely different. However, there were only trees and water outside, and no other species. Suddenly, Pakuma shouted for Tan Thien. Tan Thien asked if he had found any hills, but Pakuma said that he had not found any hills, but there was something that everyone should see for themselves. Tan Thien's group was walking out when they saw everyone talking. 
They felt very familiar. Did they not know that they had been here before, or were they mistaken? Tan Thien walked over and saw the scene of the first day of anchoring on the coast. He did not know what had happened yet. When Yi Lin arrived, she was frightened and asked, This coastline is just similar, right? Jessica hoped so too, but she felt that it was really too similar. Tan Thien said that it was not similar, but this place was the first stop when they arrived here. Tan Thien immediately ordered to drop anchor and stop the ship. It was noon now, and the sun was emitting strong heat, but even so, the three people in Tan Thien's control room still felt a chill down their spines. Yi Lin wondered if the ship had already sailed around the third biosphere. Jessica thought that was impossible because there were many different terrains on the third biosphere, and it was impossible to miss them. And such a large continent could not have been circled in just seven days. Tan Thien decided that they could not continue moving before they figured out what was going on. After that, the group discussed for a long time, but in the end, they still could not figure out the reason. Finally, they made a hypothesis based on the known situation. Hypothesis 1. They had encountered a ghost that was blinding them at sea and had been circling the coastal area. Hypothesis 2. There was an error in the map, and the ring had given them incorrect instructions. Hypothesis 3. The third biosphere had collapsed in the previous experiment, and only the D3 tropical rainforest remained. But no matter how they guessed, in the absence of the corresponding equipment, they could not go and verify it. Tan Thien looked at the map and encouraged everyone. Since they had come this far, they should stay there. He remembered that the ring had always pointed to Area D3 along the way, so he decided that they had to go there no matter what. Everyone on the ship shouted to each other because they saw a strange monkey. Its nails were very long. Tan Thien and Jessica said that it was not a monkey, but a sloth. He did not think that it could swim, and its speed was even faster than when it climbed trees. He remembered that they only climbed down from trees to go to the toilet. Jessica added that they would also climb down when looking for a mate. Sloths were solitary animals in the wild and only gathered when they were courting. Most sloths chose to mate in the early rainy season because that was when food was most abundant. At that time, the female sloth would emit a sharp call to attract the male. The male would approach the female and scream during this time. The sloths would no longer be lazy in order to reproduce. The male sloths would even travel all over the bay. After Jessica finished speaking, everyone understood and discussed with each other. In that case, they would not eat it even though it looked very delicious. Yi Lin, Tan Thien, and Jessica were speechless. As soon as those guys saw something moving, they wanted to eat it. Jessica informed everyone to wait until the tide went down and then they would all go down to see what it was like. The mangrove forest was relatively lively after the tide went down which made everyone happy because they had all been suffocating on the ship for too long. In the evening, the tide had receded and everyone used small boats to go ashore. Tan Thien was happy. It felt like a long time since he had stood on the ground. Standing on the ground made him feel more at ease. Aruba and the Patriarch were so happy that they laughed and ran around, then slipped and fell. Yi Lin reminded everyone that the mud on the ground was very slippery and to be careful. Tan Thien saw the scene and decided to pretend to be blind. Rana pointed and told everyone to go over there and take a look. Ilu and the child saw a crab and caught it to show everyone. Jessica told them to be careful not to get their hands pinched. Yi Lin saw that the crab had large and small claws and long eyes. It looked like Mr. Grab, Tan Thien said. Although they looked similar, the original form of Mr. Grab was the red crab of Christmas Island, while this one was the UCA Akota crab. The two brothers, Pakuma and Pahama, were looking at a tree with strange fruits. They did not know what they were or if they were edible. Jessica came over and explained. These were not fruits, but seeds. They were called red sea olives. Unlike other plants, most plants in mangrove forests belong to the V. viburu species. Their seeds begin to germinate on the tree before they leave the mother plant and develop into stick-like cotyledons. After the cotyledons grow to a certain extent, they detach from the mother plant and fall to the silt on the beach. After a few hours, they can take root in the silt and grow into new plants. Pahama understood a little after listening and said, so they can't be eaten. Tan Thien said that their seeds were definitely not edible, but there were often large green fruits the size of a thumb called sea mangoes. If you cook it in soup with clams, it will become a rare delicacy. When the tribesmen heard that they could eat it, they all became excited and ran off to find the sea mangoes. Tan Thien was speechless at these gluttons. The tribesmen were unusually enthusiastic about finding sea mangoes. It didn't take long to find the green fruit. Tan Thien also understood this. After many days of drifting at sea, the tribesmen were tired of the food on the boat. It was a good thing to be able to change their taste. 
Therefore, for the rest of the time, they all went to pick sea mangoes, dig for clams and mussels, and catch crabs. After returning to the boat, they made a sumptuous seafood feast. Everyone praised how delicious it was. They had never eaten such fresh and delicious soup before. Yi Lin felt that the sweet and strong taste was like being back on the beach, being hit by the seawater. Jessica found that the crab meat was firm and soft like jelly. Tan Thien was bored and did not want to talk to the two women. Once those two started, there was no stopping them. After the sumptuous seafood feast, everyone was full. The patriarch could not eat anymore. Aruba sat there and could not move. Tan Thien was about to go on a reconnaissance mission when Jessica advised him that there were too many dangers in the Amazon rainforest. If he went, it would be best to take all the soldiers with him. Tan Thien disagreed because there were still old people, women, and children on the ship, so there had to be soldiers left behind to look after them and protect them when necessary. Moreover, this time he was marching quickly, so the fewer people, the faster the speed. Yi Lin felt that this way, they would bring less supplies and their ability to deal with emergencies would be weaker. However, Tan Thien had already spent time selecting the supplies so that everything they brought with them would be as useful as possible and avoid waste. During the following period, Tan Thien was still preparing the necessary supplies for the trip. Yi Lin and Jessica were also not idle. At Tan Thien's request, Yi Lin commanded the tribesmen to sew tight-fitting clothes, leg bags, and high-top shoes. Jessica picked mint and refined it into essential oil to repel mosquitoes. Tan Thien's team had already set off. Early the next morning, Tan Thien and a group of tribal warriors set off in a small boat to scout. Everyone on the boat told his group to be careful. Tan Thien raised his hand to signal that he understood and that everyone should rest assured. He told Nick that the rainforest was very large and the trees in the mangrove forest were intertwined, making it too difficult to walk through. He had looked at the map and chosen a location closest to the mainland and went straight to the river on the mainland. It would be very easy and faster to go straight in by small boat. He signaled to the people behind him to go ahead and lead the way, and everyone followed. Half an hour later, Nick reported to Tan Thien that there was no way ahead. Tan Thien was surprised. This river should have gone straight to the mainland. Perhaps the current had changed, which was why it was like this. He called everyone to get off the boat and step on the trunk of the tree to walk. He thought that it was noon now and they were deep in the mangrove forest. If they changed their route, they could only go back the same way, which would be a waste of time, and there was no guarantee that the other routes would be passable. When they stepped on the mangrove tree to move, they saw mud and algae on the trunk of the tree, so they told everyone to be careful. Nick was surprised to see fish on the tree. The mudskipper is a type of fish belonging to the Gobi family. Mudskippers are small fish that live near the shore in warm climates. They prefer to live in brackish water, such as estuaries, harbors, and mangrove swamps. They dig burrows and feed on algae and small invertebrates in the sand or mud. They can breathe air using their lungs and have strong pectoral muscles. They can crawl on land and climb trees. Everyone was surprised. Aruba wondered if they were good to eat, and White Eye caught one but spat it out immediately. Seeing this, Aruba thought that they must not be tasty. Tan Thien told everyone that they had to hurry and get ashore before dark. It was already evening and getting dark. Pakuma reported to Tan Thien that he could see land. The whole group was overjoyed that they had finally arrived. Tan Thien saw that it would be dark in about two hours, so they had to find a place to spend the night first. They would go deep into the rainforest tomorrow morning. Aruba saw that the trees here were very lush. White Eye sniffed around and began to growl. Aruba saw White Eye's actions and wondered what was wrong. Was there danger ahead? Rana said that perhaps the group had entered the territory of some wild beast. Katar smelled a very strong smell of urine. When Tan Thien heard him say that, he thought, is his nose a dog's nose? Why is it so sensitive? A jaguar emerged from the jungle. The American jaguar, also known as the American panther, is the third largest cat species still in existence. Its appearance is similar to that of a leopard, but it is more like a tiger and has a shorter tail. It prefers to live in dense rainforests, seasonally flooded wetlands, and other water-rich areas. Like tigers, they are solitary cats that like to swim, sleep in trees, and ambush their prey. Rana thought it was a lion. Nick had never seen such a strange lion. It had so many spots on its body. Tan Thien told everyone that it was an American jaguar, not a lion. It was good at sneak attacks and could be even more dangerous than a lion, so everyone had to be careful. Suddenly, it urinated right in front of everyone causing everyone to freeze for a few seconds. Pakuma asked if it was declaring its territory. After urinating, it turned to look at everyone and growled, Do you know who my father is? Tan Thien asked White Eye to ask it if it needed to ask its mother, because who knew? Unexpectedly, it roared and charged at Tan Thien's group. 
And so, that night, they had roasted jaguar to eat. So, my friends, you see how tigers, leopards, and jaguars end up. Therefore, we should not be impulsive, even if we have to endure humiliation. But we should also try our best. That's how it is, my friends. Tigers, leopards, and jaguars. What do you think? That's why we shouldn't be impulsive, even if we have to endure humiliation. But we should also try our best. It was already dark. Everyone divided the tasks of preparing for the night, setting up tents, and making a fire. Since they were all experienced campers, they had set up their tents before dark and were ready to enjoy the jaguar they had hunted. Aruba sat waiting in front of the roasted leg, which was giving off a delicious smell. His mouth was watering. Tan Thien found the meat a bit dry and fishy. It wasn't very tasty without any spices. Pakuma thought it was okay. Nick thought it was good. Qatar just ate his leg, thinking that it was filling his stomach. After a simple meal, everyone quickly went into their tents to rest, leaving only White Eye and Sa Dieu outside to keep watch. With the night as a backdrop, the rainforest was more lively at night than during the day. The sounds of wild animals were prominent, so everyone stayed half awake, not daring to be careless. The next morning, Tan Thien's group began to pack up their tents. Tan Thien told everyone that they would set off as soon as they had filled their water bottles. The further they went into the forest, the denser the trees became. Qatar used a knife to clear the way for the group. Tan Thien found it very hot in the rainforest. Sweat kept pouring out and his clothes were sticking to his body. Suddenly, he looked down at Kata's feet and saw a centipede crawling past. The giant Amazonian centipede usually has a red body and is mainly distributed in countries and regions in the Amazon River Basin. Along with the giant Galapagos centipede, the giant Amazonian centipede is 25 to 30 centimeters long and highly venomous. It can cause redness, swelling, burning, and inflammation of the lymph nodes. However, the systemic reaction is mild and may include chills, fever, and a rapid pulse. In severe cases, it can even be fatal. Tan Thien shouted at everyone to stand still and not move. Tan Thien told Qatar not to be afraid because there was a giant Amazonian centipede on his leg, so he had to stand still. After it crawled past Qatar's leg, Tan Thien breathed a sigh of relief. It had just passed by and had no intention of attacking. He took out his knife and stabbed it. Aruba was startled when he saw how big the centipede was. Rana saw its teeth and thought that even shoes would be bitten through. Nick was glad that Tan Thien had spotted it in time. Tan Thien told everyone to be careful, as there were animals everywhere in the rainforest. Everyone continued walking for a while and was overjoyed to have made it out of the forest. Tan Thien told everyone to rest for a bit. He said that the next part would probably be easier, but the deeper they went, the more dangerous it would be. Everyone needed to be more careful. As Tan Thien's group continued to move, they were attacked by a lot of mosquitoes. Everyone was annoyed. Aruba exclaimed, why are there so many mosquitoes targeting me? Tan Thien threw him and everyone else a bottle of peppermint to repel the mosquitoes. Mosquitoes prefer hot and humid environments. As it approached noon, the temperature rose and the number of mosquitoes increased. After everyone applied the peppermint, the mosquitoes all flew away. He had said before that Jessica's peppermint oil was indeed effective. Suddenly, Qatar stopped abruptly. Tan Thien asked what was wrong, and Qatar said he thought he heard the sound of running water. At this point, everyone stopped. Rana thought it sounded like a river. Nick guessed that it was probably on the other side. Only Tan Thien didn't hear anything. Tan Thien told everyone to go and have a look. After walking over, everyone saw a river. Tan Thien didn't know if it was fresh water or not. He was about to send White Eye to test it when Aruba exclaimed that it was fresh and cool water and told everyone to come and drink. Tan Thien was speechless with this guy. Qatar went over and punched him for drinking wild water without permission. Tan Thien immediately opened the ring. By following the river, he could determine their current location, which would make it easier to decide where to go next. When he looked at the map, he saw that there were too many rivers and streams. If he relied on that to determine their location, he might as well give up. They needed to find another reference point. Seeing that it was getting dark, they decided to spend the night by the river. By the river, apart from pebbles, there were also dry branches and fallen leaves. Tan Thien's group didn't need to clean up the surroundings like they did on the first night. In just half an hour, they had finished setting up their tents for the night and solved the problem of sleeping. Next, they needed to consider the problem of dinner. As the saying goes, if you live near a mountain, eat from the mountain. If you live near water, eat from the water. Since they were by the river, they should naturally eat fish. Nick thought the fish here were too small and they would need to catch a lot to have enough to eat. Rana thought it would be very difficult to catch them. Pakuma said it would be great if they had a net. Qatar thought they should go around and see if there were any wild animals. Maybe they could find a tiger or a lion and catch one. Tan Thien slapped his forehead and thought, 
please, give tigers and lions some dignity. Don't talk like you're going to catch a chicken in your backyard. Tan Thien suddenly noticed a herb called Rao Ram growing near the water in a ditch or in a damp place. It was a traditional Chinese medicine that was also used to repel pests. After crushing it and putting it in water, it could also paralyze small fish. He told everyone that they would eat fish. Some people crushed the Rao Ram, while others went to build a dam with stones to block the stream. Pokeyuma doubted that the fish would just float up like that, he said to wait and see. Then Tan Thien took the crushed Rao Ram and put it in the water and waited. A few fish began to be paralyzed, as if they had been electrocuted, and they began to float up. Then more and more of them floated up. Tonight, they had grilled fish. Aruba found that the fish had few bones. Qatar found that the taste was different from the fish they had eaten before. Tan Thien explained that this was tilapia, a tropical fish that could not survive in the climate of island number two, so everyone had probably never eaten it before. He didn't expect the resources in the river to be so abundant. In less than an hour, they had caught more than 200 small fish, more than enough for one meal. Suddenly, Tan Thien saw a person floating face down in the stream. Everyone else was still unaware and were talking to each other. Nick saw that Tan Thien was acting strangely and asked him what was wrong. Tan Thien asked everyone if they saw the black shadow that looked like a person. He ran over and shouted, quick, save him. Moment later, the whole group was gathered around, looking at a man with many cuts on his body. Tan Thien had thought that Volume 3 might also have people who had been caught in the space-time rift, but he hadn't expected it to be confirmed in this way. From his appearance, he must be a native of some tribe. From his loincloth, it can be seen that this tribe's civilization is more advanced than the Lara tribe, but it is not known whether this tribe is as friendly as the Lara tribe. Qatar examined the wounds and said that they were caused by stone weapons. He turned to Tan Thien and asked what to do next. Tan Thien said to deal with the body first, as the purpose of this trip was to find the target indicated by the ring. If possible, they should avoid contact with the tribe to avoid any unnecessary trouble. As soon as he turned around, Tan Thien saw Qatar throw the body into the stream, which shocked Tan Thien. Then Qatar put his hand on his chest and said, May the spirits of the faithful comfort his soul. Tan Thien realized that this was a water burial. After dealing with the body, Tan Thien's group sat around the fire again and continued to eat dinner while talking about the body. The appearance of the body proved that there were other tribes in Volume 3. After some discussion, Tan Thien made it clear that they should try not to make contact with other tribes. In order to guard against unknown tribes, they started to take turns on night watch, with six people taking turns every two hours, so that everyone could get enough sleep. After a peaceful night, they ate small fish for breakfast the next morning and continued to follow the river. Then they arrived at a place. Nick noticed that the banks of the river were getting higher. Tan Thien explained that the source of a river is usually in a highland or mountainous area with a higher altitude than the upper reaches. The terrain is undulating and the drop is large, which has a significant impact on the cutting action of the river water. Therefore, there are many V-shaped valleys in the riverbed, while the lower reaches are the opposite. We are going from the lower reaches to the upper reaches. Normally, the area on both sides will become higher and higher. Aruba suddenly asked, will the water become more and more turbid? The river water suddenly became turbid, reminding Tan Thien of a survival show he had watched before. Someone said that when the river water suddenly becomes turbid, it is likely that there is heavy rain in the upper reaches. It is best to find a high place to take shelter. If a flood comes, there is no chance of survival. He shouted and told everyone to get to the shore quickly. Tan Thien tied a stone to the end of a rope and threw it at a tree trunk high above. Everyone climbed up together. Aruba wondered why they had to rush away like that. Tan Thien had a guess, but he didn't dare to confirm it. But for safety's sake, it was better to be prepared. Tan Thien, Qatar, and Pokeyuma were at the bottom when the ground began to shake violently. Qatar thought it was an earthquake. Pakuma shouted that it was a flood. Tan Thien saw that it was indeed as he had guessed. He told Aruba to hurry up and call the other two to climb up as well. The flood came, sweeping away trees and overflowing. Everyone managed to get up in time. Aruba felt lucky that they hadn't been swept away by the flood. Qatar was retrieving the rope. Fortunately, Tan Thien had reminded him, or else they would all be reunited with their ancestors by now. No wonder the river occupies 13 rivers, but the riverbed is so wide. It turns out that it was created by flash floods. Pakuma saw a python swimming in the flood on the river, 
but he didn't know what it was. The Amazon anaconda is the largest snake in the world today. Its jaws can stretch up to 180 degrees, and its four fangs can operate independently, allowing it to swallow prey larger than itself. It mainly lives in South America and is as long as an adult human body. Anacondas prefer natural water and often live in shallow, muddy water. They mainly prey on waterfowl, turtles, and even crocodiles. They are at the bottom of the river food chain. Aruba thought it was a small titanoboa, but Tanthine explained that it was an anaconda, not a boa constrictor, and certainly not a titanoboa. Although they look similar, boa constrictors have obvious scales, while anacondas are smooth. They are a bit like loaches. He said that these two animals are very dangerous, so they had to be careful. Before Tan Thien could finish speaking, the three young men, Qatar, Aruba, and Rana, had their eyes shining brighter than the stars and their mouths watering. We have food tonight. This thing must be delicious. He felt that what he said was a bit useless. These young men only care about eating and don't care what it is. Everyone started to take wooden sticks and put them where it was swimming. When it saw the branches, it crawled up. As soon as it raised its head, it saw a group of people staring at it. Rana estimated that its head was small and its body was so big that it must have a lot of meat. Nick thought it was a bit cute, which made it flinch and wonder if it would end up with cold feet this time. After a while, it was cut into many pieces. Aruba had never eaten it before, so he didn't know how it tasted. Pakuma asked if it should be grilled or cooked. Rana said grilling would be more convenient. Tan Thien felt like bowing to them. Perhaps only encountering a herd of beasts could pose a threat to these saints. Otherwise, no matter how strong or ferocious the beasts were, they would become food that came to their door. The beasts they had encountered before were all of normal size, which seemed to indicate that the area affected by the experimental accident did not affect this area. Unlike island number two, some species had mutated, so they could not relax yet. Aruba thought it was better to embezzle than to waste it, so he decided to finish all the meat and gritted his teeth so hard that he almost got hemorrhoids. Tan Thien said that Aruba should bring a little bit, because this python weighs 100 kilograms when it is fully grown. Who can carry all of that? And you can't finish it all. Why bother bringing it? The flood was spreading. Tan Thien's group could not continue to follow the riverbank. They had no choice but to turn back into the rainforest. Compared to the river, the rainforest was much more difficult to navigate. There were dense bushes everywhere. Tan Thien's group had to use knives to clear a path before they could continue moving forward. It was almost dark, and they decided to rest in the rainforest for the time being. After walking all afternoon, they had only covered about 8 kilometers. At this speed, they could be called turtles, but this was also a helpless situation. At 5 p.m., although the sun had not yet set, the sunlight was much weaker. But in the rainforest, it was very dark. At this time, they had used knives and machetes to clear a clearing and prepared to spend the night. The group grilled the python meat. Aruba thought that the meat was cooked and ate it while it was hot. Tan Thien told him not to rush and let him sprinkle some salt first. Aruba thought that the snake meat smelled good and tasted better than the leopard. Both Matt Trang and Sa Diu also had a share. While they were eating, Matt Trang heard some movement and growled. Tan Thien saw Matt Trang like this and Sa Diu reported that Matt Trang said that someone was coming. Tan Thien told everyone to put out the fire quickly. Very quickly, everyone put out the fire and hid in the forest. Tan Thien didn't know if the person Matt Trang was talking about was a native like the one they had rescued from the river. Although one should not judge a book by its cover, the other person's clothing and tattoos made people think of a cannibalistic tribe. So it was better to be cautious and avoid contact. Two torches appeared from the forest. As they approached, there were three natives wearing human skull jewelry. They were holding weapons in their hands. The three were talking to each other about losing a girl who was very beautiful. She was a sacrifice to Christia the Great. Tan Thien hid behind a tree. It seemed that the three did not find them. Pakuma told Tan Thien that the group had left. Tan Thien said to wait a little longer, just in case there were more people behind them. Two hours later, everyone had made a fire and was grilling meat. Aruba complained that the meat was cold and the taste had changed. Tan Thien was thinking that the three people might have just been passing by, but what caught his attention was the jewelry on their bodies. It was clearly human skulls. Could they be cannibals? Suddenly, Nick asked Qatar if he had ever seen those people in his old tribe. It seemed that those people spoke the Lara tribal language. Qatar had never met them either. Pakuma said that if Nick hadn't mentioned it, he wouldn't have noticed it. Rana saw that the people were indeed speaking the Lara language. Aruba thought that they should ask the patriarch, because he often went to other tribes to exchange supplies. Tan Thien asked everyone again if the three people were speaking the Lara tribal language. Pakuma confirmed that it was correct and that he had not misheard. Rana asked if there was a problem with that, and Tan Thien said that there was a problem. Moreover, it was a big problem. 
After receiving everyone's confirmation, Tan Thien felt a little confused, just like Pakuma had said. If Nick hadn't reminded him, Tan Thien wouldn't have noticed this point, because when the three natives were talking, he had clearly heard Mandarin. They were people who didn't speak the same language. They began to discuss this issue with each other. Everyone had heard the three people talking, but they had heard the tribal language. However, Tan Thien heard Mandarin. After a while, because he had to use his IQ too much, Aruba fell backwards on the ground. Rana told Tan Thien that Aruba was about to die. Tan Thien advised him not to think about it and not to force himself, or else he would end up going to the Western Paradise in vain. Even Tan Thien didn't understand what was going on, let alone the Qatar group. If he couldn't figure it out, then Tan Thien didn't need to think too much about it. It wasn't a big problem. In another place, an injured girl was catching some ants and using their mandibles to bite the wound and using the ants' heads to pin the wound together. She limped to her feet and looked towards a village. The next morning, Tan Thien's group was moving when they saw a Qatar village. They didn't know if this was the village of the three people from last night. Aruba looked around and didn't see anyone. Could they have all gone out hunting? Akuma used binoculars to observe and reported that there were dead people. They saw that two people had died. Rana saw that the village was so small that it couldn't have been wiped out. Aruba wondered if it was a conflict between tribes. Pakuma said, let's go quickly. Tan Thien didn't know what had happened in the village. His group was unfamiliar with the place. It was best not to get involved in this matter. So he decided that the group would take a detour when suddenly they heard a cry. Nick heard that it was the voice of a child. Pakuma said that there were still children alive in the village. Nick asked Tan Thien if they should go in and take a look. Qatar thought it would be better to leave this place. Tan Thien looked at the silent village like an abandoned temple. The sound of a child crying followed this script. If they went in, they would meet a ghost, and then they would meet the ghost itself. He told everyone to be on high alert and to go over there together to take a look. The group went in and saw a dead body. Qatar assessed that a very fierce battle had taken place here. Everyone had to be careful. Tan Thien went to the house where the sound of a child crying was coming from. He went into the house and saw a child lying on the bed crying loudly. The group stood and discussed. Pakuma thought that it seemed like the child had peed. Nick said to go and change its diaper. Tan Thien asked if anyone had experience taking care of children. Qatar said, of course someone does, but I don't. Night fell. The injured girl had run back to the village. As she was walking in, she heard a shout telling Aruba not to come near. Aruba was holding his nose and holding the baby's diaper, which he had just taken off. Pakuma said that they had to wash the baby first before they could put on a diaper. Aruba ran out with the diaper in his hand, shouting that it stunk. The girl didn't know who Aruba was. The clothes on his body were strange. The fabric was exquisite. She wondered if he was a noble from the city. After a while, the child fell fast asleep next to Matt Trang. The three were sitting by the fire, talking to each other. Aruba said that there wasn't a single bit of food in the entire village. It must have been looted. Qatar asked if there would be any problem staying here tonight. Rana said that there probably wouldn't be any crazy robbers who would come back to the tribe they had just robbed. Nick thought that this child was truly lucky. Pakuma thought that perhaps these robbers hadn't completely lost their humanity and had decided not to harm the child. However, leaving it to fend for itself here was probably a more cruel and vile pleasure. Qatar asked Tan Thien's opinion, but his face was as expressionless as a question mark. Everyone asked if there was anything a child under one year old could eat besides breast milk. For Tan Thien, if he had met this child, he definitely wouldn't have been able to leave it alone. However, they still had to continue their journey and couldn't take the baby with them. While everyone was talking, Tan Thien was thinking about whether to take it back to the ship or hand it over to another tribe that might be living on this planet. But before that, Tan Thien discovered an important problem. What was the baby going to eat? Aruba exclaimed, of course it eats meat. Qatar and Pakuma stared at this idiot. It was estimated that the baby was only three or four months old, so apart from breast milk, it probably couldn't eat anything else. As if on cue, just when everyone was racking their brains trying to figure out what the baby could eat, it woke up and started crying loudly. Tan Thien said to stay calm, it wasn't necessarily hungry. Let's see what happens. Aruba, the child said to make a piece of meat, it smells so good. Then Qatar came up from behind and slapped him in the face, dislocating his jaw. He scolded him for being an idiot. How could such a small baby chew such a tough piece of meat? At the very least, it should be chewed up before it's fed. Aruba said that chewing it up would be disgusting. Wouldn't it be better to tear it into small pieces of meat? Qatar laughed and praised Aruba, saying that he wasn't bad and that he was getting smarter. Tan Thien saw that the baby was crying, so he gave it some water to drink. It cried out, and the men had no choice but to give up. Nick asked what they should do now. Rana suggested making meat soup. 
While everyone was still trying to figure out how to take care of the baby, the injured girl outside was using a flint to make a fire. Inside, Qatar came up with a new idea, to knock the baby out. If it was asleep, it wouldn't feel hungry. Ruba immediately agreed with this idea, which made Tan Thien jump in surprise. Suddenly, Qatar looked outside and saw that several houses were on fire. He reported this to Tan Thien. He saw that the fire was getting bigger and told everyone to put out the fire and not let it spread to this place. Qatar took an axe, and Aruba took a stick. Qatar used the axe to break down several houses. This would create a firebreak to prevent the grass from flying up and catching fire to other houses, causing the fire to spread. Suddenly, Tan Thien realized why the houses had suddenly caught fire and why it wasn't just one house. He knew that this was man-made. The injured girl from before jumped into the house and ran to hug the baby. Tan Thien activated his cheetah talent and jumped into the house, saying, do you think I'm heir? The girl was startled. With one hand, she hugged the baby. With the other, she held a spear and slashed at Tan Thien. He dodged and avoided her, saying that she was too slow. He jumped into combat and realized that she was a woman. He struck her in the neck with his hand and knocked her out. He looked at her and thought that she was probably from the tribe. Suddenly, she reached out her hand to the baby, wanting to feed it. Tan Thien said, hey, wait a minute, what do you want to do? A moment later, the fire had been completely extinguished. Pakuma said that this must have been done by her. Katar agreed. Who else would have done this? Rana wondered if she was the baby's mother. Tan Thien thought that even if she wasn't, she must be an acquaintance of the baby's, or she wouldn't have been so close to it. Suddenly, the girl woke up. Nick asked her if she was awake, and she shouted, don't come over here. Everyone ran in and asked Nick what was going on. She held the baby in one hand and a cudgel in the other. She said that this was her village. You bird brains, go somewhere else, you evil ones. Tan Thien advised her to calm down. There was still time to talk things out. Everyone raised their hands and told her not to be afraid. They wouldn't hurt her. She saw that everyone was backing away and thought that Tan Thien's group was strong in numbers. If they had wanted to harm her, they would have done so already. The clothes that Tan Thien's group was wearing didn't seem to be the same as those of the other people. Tan Thien was thinking that he had forgotten that he was speaking in Mandarin. How could she understand him? Then she said that her name was So Lam, and the baby is her child. She grew up in this forest. Her father and grandfather and the other members of her tribe have lived here for a long time. Tan Thien introduced himself. He said that his name was Tan Thien and that he was from another place. He was just passing through and had no malicious intent. He asked her if she understood what he was saying. When she heard the name Tan Thien, she knew that it meant a child from the sky. Tan Thien saw that she understood him. He wondered if perhaps in this D3 zone, everyone could communicate without language barriers. He asked So Lam if she would like to sit down and talk, and she agreed. However, she suddenly fell backward. Nick asked So Lam if she was okay, and she said that she was just tired and hungry. Tan Thien observed So Lam and saw that her eyes were deeply sunken and her face was haggard. She must not have slept in a long time, and her nerves were always on edge. It seemed that she had been relying solely on her faith to keep her going. Everyone gave So Lam food, and she ate ravenously. Nick told So Lam to eat slowly, as there was still more. After she finished eating, she was very grateful to Tan Thien's group. He told her not to be polite and asked if she could tell him what had happened to her village. So Lam told the story of what had happened three days ago. Because it was a painful memory, her voice trembled as she spoke. Her eyes were filled with both fear and anger. According to So Lam, three nights ago, her village was suddenly attacked by another tribe. Although they didn't know what had happened, the warriors of the tribe immediately fought back, engaging in a bloody battle. But the enemy outnumbered them, and their village was no match for them. Aside from the tribesmen who were killed, all of them were taken prisoner. According to them, killing children would be cursed by the gods, so her child was abandoned in the village and was able to escape death. Later, the process of escorting her tribesmen away created an opportunity for her to escape, which is how she managed to get away. As she spoke, so Lam could no longer contain the grief in her heart. She cried out in pain. Tan Thien's group also fell silent. A moment later, Nick came out of the hut. Tan Thien asked him if she had fallen asleep. Nick said that she had cried herself to sleep. Tan Thien asked if the Lara tribe accepted people from other tribes. Qatar and Rana didn't know either. He asked if the tribe had never encountered this situation before, and Qatar said that they had not. Nick asked Tan Thien if he wanted to take her back. He said that if there was a tribe nearby that was friendly with Salam's tribe, his group would escort her there. Otherwise, he would have to take her back to the ship, but he would wait until she woke up to ask her what she wanted to do. Because he knew that a wounded woman with a baby less than a year old could not survive in the rainforest, 
He told everyone to rest for now. Aruba was sent outside to stand guard. The next morning, Tan Thien planned to find So Lam and talk to her to see what her plans were, but when he thought about how weak her body was and how she had not yet recovered her energy, even after resting for a night, she still hadn't woken up, so Tan Thien decided to leave Nick and Rana behind to keep watch. Tan Thien led the others around the village to see if they could find anything to eat. The three of them followed a trail. Pakuma thought that this path was probably the one that So Lam's tribesmen often took, but he didn't know where it would lead. Tan Thien thought that it was probably a place where they hunted and gathered food. When they came to a fork in the road, they didn't know which way to go. Tan Thien decided to take the easier path. Ruba saw a spider and used a stick to pick it up and show it to Pakuma, who was so startled that he almost jumped out of his skin. Pakuma was furious. He used an arrow to kill the spider and warned Aruba that if he did it again, he would be dead meat. Tan Thien was puzzled, so Katar explained that Pakuma had always been afraid of these hairy, many-legged creatures. Tan Thien turned to look at the spiders. They were Nephia Philip spiders. He remembered that Lao Wang, his dorm roommate, had once spent a lot of money to buy one. If that was the case, then they could probably be sold for a few thousand here. The rainforest was truly full of treasures. Suddenly, Pakuma and Aruba discovered a type of tree that looked like a coconut tree. Everyone rushed over to look for it, but they couldn't find any coconuts. Aruba wondered if they had all been picked. Pakuma noticed that this coconut grove was different from the coconut trees he had seen before. Tan Thien said that it was different because it wasn't a coconut tree. Although the name of this tree was Powder Coconut, or Shagu, it wasn't the coconut tree that we were familiar with, and it didn't have coconuts. However, before it bloomed, the middle of the tree trunk would store a lot of starch, which was a large starch storage organ. Tan Thien said that the trunk of this tree could be eaten, and Pakuma, Katar, and Aruba were very surprised. Three of them ran to the tree. One of them peeled the bark and ate it, saying that it didn't taste good. Another one bit into the trunk and said that it was too hard to chew, which made Tan Thien want to bang his head against the wall. A moment later, they had cut down a tree. Katar saw that the inside of the tree was white, and Pakuma asked if that was the part that could be eaten. Tan Thien said that it was where the starch was stored. He explained that you could also understand it that way, but to be more precise, we soak the inside of the tree in water. And after filtering it, the starchy part is the edible part. Qatar said that the problem was that the group didn't have enough water to filter it, and there wasn't much water left in the village. Tan Thien had already thought about this problem. He noticed that many trees had been cut down, and if he wasn't mistaken, there must be a water source nearby. That meant that one of these two paths was the path to the water source. Aruba asked which way to go. Qatar noticed that the ground on the right-hand path had marks from trees being dragged, and although they weren't very clear, they knew that this path led to the water source. A little further down, there was a river. Tan Thien's group arrived and saw the river. Aruba saw that this river was bigger than the one they had encountered before, and there would probably be a lot of big fish. Tan Thien said that if time permitted, they could catch a few and bring them back. When Tan Thien's group reached the riverbank, it was already noon, and there wasn't much time left. After a short rest, they began to extract the starch from the trunk of the coconut tree. Tan Thien's group of four split into two teams. Katar and Aruba were responsible for using knives to cut the inside of the tree into wood chips, while Tan Thien and Pakuma split the outer bark of the powder coconut tree into squares and used branches to fix them into tools. After making the tools, Tan Thien and Pakuma soaked the wood chips in water and rubbed them together. After a while, the water gradually turned milky white, which was the liquid form of starch. After rubbing it for a while, Tan Thien and Pakuma used a linen cloth to filter the starch solution. After letting the starch solution sit for 10 minutes, the starch that was suspended at the beginning would gradually condense at the bottom. Aruba saw it and asked if this was starch. It looked like wheat flour. Tan Thien explained that wheat flour was also starch, but the extraction methods were different. In essence, the two were the same. Tan Thien saw that it was about 3 p.m. now, and he calculated that if they returned now, they could reach the village before dark, so he told everyone to pack up and return. In So Lam's village, she had woken up. She thanked Nick and everyone else, and Nick said that she should thank the great shaman. She was puzzled. What was the great shaman? Nick explained that it was the messenger of the great shaman. She was confused. Was the messenger of the shaman the great priest? Just then, Aruba shouted that the great shaman was back. When she saw everyone carrying boxes back, she asked what the white stuff was, and Aruba said, isn't it disgusting? This is starch extracted from the trunk of a tree. Then, 
So Lam suddenly came out of the house and knelt down to Tan Thien. She called the great priest and asked him to forgive her for her previous rudeness, which made Tan Thien and the others open their mouths in surprise, not understanding what was going on. A moment later, Tan Thien placed the starch on a coconut leaf, then placed a piece of meat on it, and placed it on the fire to grill. While waiting for the cake to cook, So Lam explained to Tan Thien that the great priest was a representative chosen by the gods. He could communicate with the gods and impart knowledge on their behalf. The shaman that everyone was talking about was the great priest of her tribe. Finally, Tan Thien understood, but unfortunately, he was a fake. Tan Thien asked So Lam what her plans were next, since his group had to continue deeper into the rainforest and wouldn't be staying there for long. If there were any tribes nearby that were friendly with her tribe, his group would take her there. If not, then. Tan Thien didn't finish his sentence when Salam said that she wanted to go back to the city. Tan Thien was surprised. Was there a city? So Lam said that she had never actually been to the city, but the elders of her tribe had told her about it. They said that the city-state was a large tribe with large houses made of stone. There was plenty of food there, and they grew a lot of corn and cocoa. They were the descendants of the gods. The king and the nobles all lived there. On every holiday or in the event of an accident, the king would send the great priest to prepare a grand ceremony. The great priest in the city would offer sacrifices to the gods praying for blessings and protection for the people. Tan Thien's group was thinking about the city-state in silence when the two cakes on the stove suddenly made a popping sound. After grilling them for a while, the cakes were done. So Lam took the cake and was surprised that sago flour could be cooked like this. Aruba took a big bite and praised the cake, saying that the grilled starch cake was crispy on the outside, fluffy on the inside, and the fat from the dried meat melted out, making it delicious. Tan Thien was deep in thought. If what So Lam said was true, then the layout of this continent was much larger than he had imagined. Everyone was gathered around the campfire when Tan Thien asked So Lam how they normally process starch. So Lam said that they usually cooked it into porridge. Tan Thien asked her if this knowledge had been passed down to the tribe by the great priest, such as how to extract starch from the tree, wash the flour, and make sago. Apparently, the elders of the tribe said that the great priest knew everything. Tan Thien thought about it. It was clear that powder coconut and sago were new terms in modern times, but now he was hearing them from So Lam. It was possible that they were just using similar names, but one similar word was reasonable. Two similar words were strange. Could that great priest be a modern person? Maybe he was a student or a teacher, and then, like you, he became a fake shaman for the tribe. He asked So Lam if she wanted to go to the city-state. She said that on the way she was being escorted, she heard the other people talking about wanting to take her tribe to the city-state to sell them. She wanted to go and buy back her tribe. His conversation with Salam tonight had really surprised Tan Thien. The amount of information was so great that he couldn't digest it all at once. Especially the news about the city-state. Even so Lam herself didn't say much about it, she just said whatever came to mind, which was very trivial. Tan Thien had no choice but to summarize the information he had obtained and combine it with his own guesses into two points. The first point was that the city-state was the center, and around the city-state were distributed various large and small tribes. Normally, the tribes did not know the location of each other, and even if they did, they did not interact with each other, but only operated in areas they were familiar with. But this was not absolute. Some tribes would raid other tribes, and if they were caught, they would be enslaved, traded, or made into human sacrifices for the city-state. Secondly, So Lam did not know the exact location of the city-state. At present, the only clue was a saying that was passed down in the tribe. Follow the direction of the sunrise. Tan Thien thought he would just try going in that direction. The ring was also pointing east, which was convenient. Thinking about the situation of So Lam and her child, Tan Thien decided to help them. He couldn't bear to leave a woman and her month-old baby to go through the dangerous rainforest to find a city-state that didn't know where it was. He knew that the great priest could impart so much knowledge. If he was really a modern person, he might be able to join their group and be a great help. Early in the morning, Tan Thien and Aruba took two stone hoes to dig the ground. As they dug, Tan Thien thought, a group of natives actually had the concept of money and even hid it under the floor. It was really rare. Ruba didn't expect to stay and do coolie work. If he had known earlier, he would have gone with Rana to collect starch. The two young men dug up something and thought it was money. They dug some more and found a skull. Aruba panicked and screamed. So Lam, who was standing next to him, told everyone that it was the patriarch's family. He would always stay with the patriarch to protect the house. Tan Thien felt like he had been sleeping in a tomb for the past few days. The two of them dug up a jar 
so Lam said that it was probably a jar of money. Tan Thien picked up the jar and was a little worried. I wonder if it's an urn. So Lam looked at Tan Thien, not knowing what an urn was. Tan Thien thought it probably wasn't an urn. He opened the jar, not knowing what was inside. When he opened it, it was full of seashells. Tan Thien smiled. He should have thought of what the tribe's currency was sooner. Nick, do you think the seashells are pretty? Lam took the jar and said, these precious seashells will definitely be able to buy back the tribesmen. Tan Thien asked her when she planned to leave, and she said happily, Tan Thien, are you willing to help me? Tan Thien said yes. She thanked him profusely and wanted to ask him for another favor. Tan Thien told her to go ahead and say it, and he would help if he could. She wanted him to organize a Haru Meeker ceremony for her child and give it a name. Tan Thien didn't know what a Haru Meeker was, so So Lam explained it to him. Hara Meeker was a birth ceremony of the Jade Rice people, used to wish the child a smooth growth. Depending on the child's different personality, the time of the ceremony was different. Usually, it was held in the third month for girls, and in the fourth month for boys. This ceremony was usually performed by the patriarch of the tribe to help the parents of the child. If the great priest could be invited to preside over it, it meant that the child would be noticed by the gods, which was a great honor. That's why So Lam wanted Tan Thien to help preside over the ceremony. In So Lam's eyes, even though Tan Thien was not a great priest, he was also chosen by the gods and could bring good luck to the child. Tan Thien asked her when it would be held. He thought this ceremony was similar to the Chinese full moon ceremony. It seemed that his guess was somewhat credible. She was happy and thanked him when she saw that Tan Thien agreed. Tan Thien said that she trusted him to organize such an important ceremony, and that it was his honor. She planned to hold it next month. Tan Thien saw that today was the 18th. He thought that it was a long time to wait for a ceremony, so he asked her if she wasn't worried about her tribesmen. Then she said, although two days was a bit rushed, if they started preparing now, they would probably have everything ready. Tan Thien was surprised to hear this, because there were still two days left. After he asked again, he found out that a month in the calendar used by Salam's tribe had only 20 days. After learning this, Tan Thien finally solved the doubt in his heart. It was true that before the appearance of a standard calendar, each place used a different calendar, which was not unified. So it was not strange that Solam's calendar had 20 days in a month. Tan Thien didn't pay much attention to the calendar either. After getting the money, he and Aruba carefully reburied the bones that had been accidentally dug up. When they were done, it was already noon. Tan Thien was not idle during the remaining time. He took Aruba to the coconut forest to help the Qataris. Nick stayed behind to help So Lam prepare the necessary items for the ceremony. The two of them were on their way to help the Qataris when Aruba told Tan Thien that he wanted to go down to the river to catch some fish because he had some free time. Tan Thien thought that fishing was fine, but how could he catch anything in a river? It wasn't a small pond. I think it's true that crazy people always have their own way of doing things, even with this guy. Tan Thien looked at the documents related to Area D3. This rainforest was a miniature version of the Amazon rainforest. The species of animals found in the Amazon were also found here, including crocodiles and piranhas. The stream that had dried up before was not too deep, and one could see the bottom, so there was no danger. But this river was both deep and wide. If one went down into the river, it was not certain that one would be able to get back to shore. Unless it was absolutely necessary, it was best to stay on the shore to be safe. Ruba asked why he couldn't go down to fish, and Tan Thien said that it was for safety reasons, of course. Because they had been eating dried meat for the past two days, the remaining amount could only last for two more days. They couldn't continue to consume it. Before they set off, they had to try to collect sago starch. If possible, it would be best to smoke some dried fish to take with them. Ruba went away for a while and came back bragging that he had dug up a lot of worms. He asked Tan Thien what he was doing and was told that Tan Thien was making an automatic fishing device. Tan Thien explained that when a fish bit the hook, this latch would open, holding the fishing rod straight so that the fish could be pulled up. Aruba thought it was really clever. Tan Thien made three automatic fishing rods and set them up on the riverbank. While everyone was working, the fish kept biting the hooks. Aruba found that this automatic fishing device was really convenient. He didn't have to sit and watch it, and the fish would bite the hook by themselves. Aruba grabbed the fishing rod and pulled with all his might. When he found it too heavy, he called for everyone to come and help. Tan Thien rushed over and told Aruba to be patient. Even Aruba couldn't pull it up. It must be a big fish. He and Aruba grabbed the fishing rod and shouted to each other to pull together, but it didn't work. The fish pulled the two of them to the riverbank and then dragged them into the river. The Qataris saw that something was wrong and jumped up to throw a harpoon, but it didn't stick into the fish and bounced off. The fish splashed water everywhere. It was a seven-star arapaima, 
a species of ray-finned fish in the family Osteoglossidae, belonging to the genus Arapaima, also known as the Piraruku. Adult fish can grow to be 2 to 6 meters long and weigh up to 100 kilograms. They have hard teeth in their jaws, which are a remnant of an ancient species of freshwater fish that first appeared 10 million years ago. They live mainly in natural lagoons and slow-moving sections of the Amazon River. They are the largest freshwater fish in South America. Despite their large size, they are very powerful jumpers. In the wild, they have been known to jump out of the water to catch prey. Their tails are very strong and powerful, and they can easily knock over adult males and break their bones, causing severe internal injuries. Tan Thien saw that the Piraruku was so large that, due to the force of gravity, its falling force would definitely make it impossible for Tan Thien and Aruba to stop it. They had to kill it before it fell into the water. Just now, the Qataris had failed to kill it with one blow. At this distance, only Pakuma could do it. He told Pakuma to aim for its head. Pakuma drew his bow, concentrated on the fish, and shot it in the head. Before it fell back into the water, they pulled it up. Aruba had never expected that such a large fish could live in the water. Tan Thien said that in the rainforest, even small fish could not be underestimated. Aruba thought that this fish was enough to feed the whole group for three days. The Qataris pulled out some of its scales and said that its scales were too hard. Tan Thien explained that in fact, in addition to the hardness that could be felt intuitively, the micro nano structure of the spiral veneer inside the fish scales also greatly reduced the impact of the Qataris's blows. That was why it had been able to withstand the harpoon earlier. When he saw that the others didn't understand his explanation, he simply concluded that the scales of this fish were extremely powerful. Pakuma asked if that was why Tan Thien had told him to shoot it in the head. Tan Thien said that he didn't know if Pakuma had hit it in the head because the Piraruku not only had thick scales, but its skull was also extremely thick. Its defensive ability was even higher than its scales. But in that situation, its large size would definitely not allow it to deliver a fatal blow. Once it returned to the water, it would escape. But if it was shot in the head, it was possible to keep it. Pakuma now understood that Tan Thien had just wanted to take a chance, and he had unexpectedly succeeded. By evening, everyone had returned to the village. So Lam was processing the fish scales. Aruba was making a large piece of fish meat. He said that the meat of the Piraruku was quite tasty, but he thought that tilapia was tastier. Rana held the fish head and saw that it was indeed hard and thick. Pakuma said that it was a good thing he had used an iron arrowhead, or he might not have been able to kill it. Nick saw that So Lam was processing the fish scales and asked her what she was doing. She said that the scales of this fish were very hard and that she wanted to use them to make a suit of armor. Catching the Piraruku had truly been an unexpected joy that day. Its appearance had provided Tan Thien's group with a large amount of meat for the next three days. The group would not need to go out hunting again. However, fish meat could not be preserved for long and was not suitable for use as emergency rations. Therefore, the next day, Tan Thien and the others still collected sago flour as usual preparing for their next journey. So Lam and Nick prepared the necessary items for the ceremony. The two days passed quickly, and the day of the ceremony arrived. Tan Thien's group had also prepared early and were just waiting for the sun to rise to its highest point before beginning. Tan Thien stood inside the circle with the star drawn on it. He stood in the circle and read some English numbers and some nonsense sentences, because he remembered that every time he had performed the ceremony before, he had had to say a few sentences like that. He asked the gods for protection and blessings. It was really too much trouble. But fortunately, the others were standing far away, so Tan Thien could say anything to fool them. A few minutes later, So Lam handed the baby to Tan Thien. He took the baby, but he didn't know what to do. So Lam told Tan Thien to start the ceremony. All he had to do was lift the baby's bottom so that it was sitting up straight and then raise it up so that the baby's eyes were level with his. As he lifted the baby up and shouted Sheba, he thought of the scene in The Lion King where the monkey lifts up the lion cub. He thought, oh no, this is too similar. He couldn't help but shout it out. He had to calm down. Surely the others wouldn't understand what it meant. He tried to find an excuse to cover it up, but he didn't have to. As soon as he shouted, the others raised their hands and shouted Sheba along with him. The dogs barked. He figured that he didn't need to find an excuse anymore. So Lam told him that he needed to introduce the baby to the uses of the nine model objects. After each introduction, he should walk around the circle once. It represented perfection. Tan Thien picked up a knife and said, this is a short knife. With it, you will cut the throats of wild beasts. This is a fishing rod. With it, you will catch fish in the stream. This is a bow and arrow. With it, you will shoot prey from hundreds of meters away. This is a hoe. 
With it, you can dig the earth. After introducing them all, he placed the baby in the circle and said to the baby, go ahead and choose your future path. He would give the baby a final blessing based on whatever it chose, and then give it a name to end the ceremony. Unexpectedly, the baby grabbed a whole bunch of them. Tan Thien saw that the baby was holding the bow, so he knew that it would be an archer in the future. Holding a knife would make it a brave warrior, but what was this little dark-skinned baby going to do with so many things? Now Tan Thien didn't know what kind of blessing to give it. Suddenly, Tan Thien had an idea. He stood in front of So Lam and said, Mother Earth nourishes all things and tolerates all things, just like everything the child is holding. Gaia is its name. So Lam hugged her child and said, Gaia. The child Gaia nurtures. From today on, your child has a name. Nick thought the name was very nice. When the Kataris heard the name, they thought that the child would definitely become a strong warrior in the future. Aruba didn't expect Tan Thien to come up with such a good name. Inside the house, Tan Thien asked So Lam how her wound was. She said that the wound was no longer a problem. Tan Thien opened the map on the table and showed it to So Lam. She was surprised to see the shape of the forest. It was truly miraculous. Nick laughed and said that it was the power of the great shaman, a kind of power called science. Tan Thien asked So Lam if she could determine the location of the village. She said that it would take a long time to determine it. She pointed to a branch of the river and said that it was probably nearby. When Tan Thien saw this, he knew that the positioning range was very wide and not very clear, but at least he knew the general location. It was not like before, when they had been walking blindly. The night before they set off, with So Lam's help, Tan Thien had determined their current location and spent a few more hours mapping out their route forward. Early the next morning, the group packed up their belongings and left the village early. This time, with So Lam leading the way, the group's speed was much faster. There were basically no obstacles along the way, but the group was able to travel so smoothly because the path had been cleared by So Lam's village in the past. Tan Thien wanted to give So Lam a set of clothes to wear, but she refused to accept them. However, by the third day, they had reached the end of the small road, which meant that their journey would not be as smooth as before. Tan Thien saw that there was no road ahead. Aruba said that they should prepare to spend the night and continue on their way early the next morning. Tan Thien was collecting water from the leaves of the trees. He didn't expect to collect so much water overnight. The whole group collected water together, which saved a lot of time. The baby was sleeping soundly on white eyes. Nick told Tan Thien that they had finished collecting water. Tan Thien said that they should pack up and set off. The group continued on their way. After walking for a while, Aruba felt that the rainforest was too hot. Tan Thien looked over at So Lam and saw that she had stopped. He wondered what had happened. So Lam felt the wind blowing and she could sense that the wind was howling. She told Tan Thien that it was going to rain soon. He looked up and saw that the sky was clear and beautiful. The group was surprised. The weather was so nice and there wasn't a single cloud in the sky. How could it rain? So Lam said that it would rain, and it would rain heavily. Tan Thien thought that So Lam could probably detect anomalies because she could predict the weather by looking at the sky, or maybe because she was a local. Tan Thien told everyone to put up the tents. A moment later, the sky was covered in dark clouds and the rain came down. Everyone ran into the tents to avoid the rain. Pakuma saw that the rain had come too quickly and that they didn't have time to put up two more tents for shelter. Garana said that if So Lam hadn't reminded them, they wouldn't have had time to put up the tents. Nick thought that So Lam was amazing. He didn't know how she had guessed it, but she said, Listen carefully and I'll tell you when the rain stops. Tan Thien heard So Lam say this and wondered if he could hear the sounds of the heavens and the earth if he listened carefully. Fortunately, thanks to So Lam, the group was not soaked to the skin. The rain continued until night and was still heavy. Qatar thought that the rain would probably not stop that night. Aruba didn't like the rain. So Lam told everyone that judging from the weather changes that day, it would probably rain for the next week. Tan Thien was glad that Jessica had brought a tent with a mattress on the bottom. Otherwise he wouldn't have been able to close his eyes that night. The rain came very suddenly and lasted a very long time. From noon until evening, there was no sign of it letting up. Fortunately, the rain stopped the next morning, but it was only temporary. Just as So Lam had predicted. From that rainy day on, the sky seemed to have a hole in it, and it would pour down rain every now and then. Whenever they encountered such a situation, no matter where they were, Tan Thien's group would immediately put up their tents as quickly as possible. But it was as if the heavens were playing a joke on Tan Thien. Sometimes it would rain three times a day. When it was important, it would rain very quickly, in half an hour, ten minutes, or even a few minutes. But no matter what, every time the weather changed, Tan Thien had to spend a lot of time putting up the tents. In addition, the dry leaves in the rainforest were like sponges that had absorbed all the rain from the past few days. 
From the outside, it looked like nothing, but when they walked on it, they would get soaked through. Even Tan Thien's waterproof shoes were soaked through to the skin. Tan Thien was very uncomfortable when his shoes got wet. Rana suggested that they take off their shoes to go faster, but now his feet felt both cold and heavy. Tan Thien advised them not to. So Lam looked back at Tan Thien. He understood and told everyone to set up camp. Aruba was glad that the rain had come late, and that the leather tent was already done. Tan Thien said that it wasn't just that. It was just that they had practiced a lot these past few days and had become more proficient. Tan Thien saw that the leather tent was really good. They could light a fire inside to keep warm. Ruba was sitting there when he saw something strange. He asked Qatar if he had six toes on his feet. Qatar was also surprised. He looked down and saw that his feet were swollen and red, and there was a lump on the side. Rana and Pakuma said that they had the same thing. When Tan Thien heard the others talking, he felt like vomiting blood. I'm begging you guys, if there's anything unusual about your bodies in the future, you have to tell me right away, he said. This is very important. Tan Thien asked Qatar and Rana if they felt any discomfort, pain, or itching anywhere. Rana said that it hurt a little when he pressed on it at first, but Qatar said that he didn't feel anything. Tan Thien looked at the lump on the sole of his foot and wondered what it was that was causing him such a headache. Although the others said that they were fine, any abnormality in the rainforest could be potentially fatal. Tan Thien opened the system panel. He remembered that there was a medical book in the system's achievement letter. He hoped that there would be useful information in the book that could help them. After a while, Tan Thien found the type of book he needed. It cost 2,000 points. Tan Thien was glad that he had collected a lot of points in the past. 2,000 points was nothing. Tain, host has successfully exchanged for the book. Tain, book has been issued. Tan Thien hadn't felt this feeling in a long time. He sat down and searched through the medical book. He soon found what he was looking for. Plantar warts are a type of wart that usually grows on the sole of the foot. They can be transmitted through small cuts, and usually occur on the sole of the foot, the toes, or the instep. They are a common type of wart. Some people feel pain, but others don't feel anything. The current treatment is usually systemic treatment, topical medication, physical therapy, or injection, depending on the area affected by the patient. The treatment is therefore different. After Tan Thien finished speaking, the group of men panicked and cried out, Will plantar warts kill you? And so, the two of them dragged each other out and cried, saying things like last words. Qatar and Nick said that their safety in the future depended entirely on Tan Thien. Pakuma said that if he ever returned, he should tell Pahama not to be too heartbroken. Rana held the black dog's paw and cried. Tan Thien was also speechless with these men. He told them that this was just a minor illness and that they wouldn't die from it. Even tigers and lions can't kill you guys, so how can you die so quickly? Aruba asked Tan Thien when he heard that they wouldn't die. Will the kata really not die? Tan Thien said that they would probably still die of old age in a few decades. Tan Thien began to treat everyone's plantar warts. The treatment for plantar warts is very simple. Just pour warm water on the wart to soften it, and then cut it off with a knife. It's like cutting a corn. Tan Thien cut Kata's wart and asked him if it hurt, but Qatar didn't feel anything. But there was one place that was different. Cutting corns would hurt. But this wart was like a fingernail or toenail. You could cut it without feeling anything. When he was finished, Qatar asked if it was cured. Tan Thien said that it wasn't. It will probably grow back tomorrow. When that happens, we'll have to cut it again. We'll keep cutting it until it stops growing. Of course, there was a faster way. We could use a hot iron rod to burn the wart. That would destroy the cells that cause the disease. Do you guys want to try it? Rana and Pakuma shook their heads faster than a fan. So Lam thought that the rain might last all day. So they should just rest for the day. Tan Thien sat down and thought about the cause of the kata's plantar warts. There were two possibilities. One is that walking for many days causes the feet to rub against the shoes continuously. This is the main cause. The second is that the continuous rain wets the shoes, making the feet damp and providing conditions for bacteria to grow. This is the main contributing factor. Tan Thien opened the system. If this continued, he would only be able to control the disease for Rana's group. The others were also likely to get the disease. Tan Thien hoped that there would be a book in the system that could help him solve this problem. Tan Thien found the first aid encyclopedia, Ultimate Wilderness Edition. Perhaps there was something useful inside. Tain. Host has successfully exchanged for the book. Tain. Book is being issued. Tan Thien had spent 10,000 points in less than half a day. He would have to save up again later. After downloading the book from the system, Tan Thien had a way to treat the warts. He used a small stove to boil some water in a glass jar. He added some lard to it, then some sodium hydroxide. 
The lard and sodium hydroxide would form glycerin. Starch, water, sodium bicarbonate, vinegar, and glycerin would form a biodegradable plastic. So Lamb was surprised when he saw the test tube. Is this a weapon? He asked. It looks so beautiful. Nick laughed and said that it was made of stone. It was a technique that the great shaman had taught them. After a while, Tan Thien thought that it was probably ready. Aruba was curious and asked Tan Thien what it was. Tan Thien applied it to his shoes and said that it was something that could repel water. It was called plastic. Half an hour later, the system displayed. Host has successfully crafted rain boots. 3,000 points have been awarded. Tan Thien held the boots in his hands and examined them. Qatar was surprised because he had never seen boots before. Aruba thought that the boots were really cool. Tan Thien turned to the others and asked if anyone wanted to try them. Aruba volunteered to try them first. He put on the boots and walked out to a puddle of water. He stepped on it and exclaimed that it was really amazing. The water couldn't penetrate it. Qatar was sitting nearby when water splashed on him. He got up and punched Aruba on the head, giving him a big bump. Aruba apologized, saying that he hadn't done it on purpose. Tan Thien saw that the plastic had adhered firmly to the inside. With these boots, the group with plantar warts would quickly recover, and the others would not get the disease. It had taken Tan Thien's group almost a day to make the boots. They didn't set off again until the second day, but it was worth the time. It was important to remember that the rainforest had been raining continuously for several days, and there was a lot of rainwater on the ground. The rainwater couldn't seep into the ground quickly, so it formed many pools of water. Even the shallow pools were deep enough to reach the ankles. If they didn't have boots, the group's feet would be soaked in dirty water all the time. Over time, they wouldn't just get boils. Their feet would rot away. Tan Thien realized that the amount of rain was really too much. He hadn't expected it to flood the forest. Some of the pools were as high as their knees. Some of them couldn't even be called pools anymore. They were lakes. Depending on the situation, Tan Thien's group would either jump over the pools or go around them. But most of the time, they had to go around them. While they were traveling, Nick and Qatar discovered a shark. And so, the next part of the story is obvious, right? They added it to the scoreboard right away. They had another warm meal of roasted shark. I feel sorry for the shark. It was lying on the fire, sweating profusely. The white-eyed bull shark is the only species of bull shark that can live in freshwater. It is large and often rests near the shores of bays. Because of the pools of water that had formed due to the change in weather, following their original route would mean crossing those pools. But that was too difficult. They could only take it one step at a time. At night, the group rested. Tan Thien dried the boots. Nick played with the child and so lamb. Because they had to go around the pools of water, the group's route became very roundabout. Over the past few days, they had taken many unnecessary detours. Early the next morning, as the group was traveling, they came across an avocado tree. Avocados belong to the Lauraceae family. They have green leaves all year round and can survive in shady climates. They grow to a height of about 10 meters and have gray-green bark. Their fruit is a type of berry. The fruit is highly nutritious, containing many vitamins, fats, and proteins. In addition to eating it raw, it can also be used in cooking. Akuma ate one and found it strange. Nick thought it was delicious. The young man Aruba was climbing the tree to pick some when he suddenly shouted, Why are you eating without waiting for me? Suddenly, he saw a red dot and told Tan Thien that there was a fire. Tan Thien didn't understand how there could be a fire. Pakuma said that it had been raining for the past few days, so how could they possibly start a fire? From within the forest, a red mass was moving, growing larger and larger. Nick saw it and thought it was a flying fire. So Lam said that it wasn't a fire. It was red fire ants. Their Latin name is Invicta. Their name reflects their prowess. Red fire ants are widely distributed and highly destructive. They are social insects that are highly aggressive towards humans. When they attack, they pierce their mandibles into their victim's skin and then repeatedly insert their their barbed stinger into the victim's body, injecting venom from their venom sac. This causes the victim to experience intense pain, as if they were being burned by fire. Blisters then form. In severe cases, they can even be fatal. Tan Thien saw what was happening and shouted at everyone to run away. Aruba asked Tan Thien as they ran, are those just ants? Tan Thien said that they were ants, but that they could kill people with their bites. Aruba was horrified to hear that ants could kill people. Tan Thien saw that the system's data indicated that although their name contained the word red, 
they were normally gray in color. However, the entire swarm of ants was now bright red, and they were moving in a pack like a pack of dogs. Normally, there would be about 7 million of them, but the swarm they had encountered was at least 10 times that number. Han Thien couldn't let anything happen to his group. He realized that the experimental accident had had a significant impact on this place. Tan Thien told So Lam and White Eye to take Big Earth and go ahead. The others took out the alcohol, spirits, and torches. He saw that the ants were moving too fast. They couldn't just keep running. They had to find a way to fight back. He told everyone to take a mouthful of alcohol and wait for the ants to get close before spitting it out. The three of them stood in a line, waiting for the ants to fly towards them. They had the alcohol in their mouths and held up the torches. All three of them spat out at the same time, creating a flame that covered a large area. Many ants were burned and fell to the ground, but to their surprise, the ants charged through the flames. Tan Thien realized that things were not going well. Qatar shouted that there were too many ants. Tan Thien's group was surrounded and attacked by the ants. Everyone screamed in pain. Tan Thien shouted at everyone to protect their heads, and quickly rush out. The ants clung to their necks and began to bite them. Suddenly, Sa Diu shouted and rushed over. Tan Thien's group was being attacked by the swarm of ants. He continuously flapped his wings, creating a strong wind that blew the ants away. Tan Thien praised Sa Diu for doing a good job, but suddenly the ants turned towards Sa Diu. Tan Thien worriedly shouted at Sa Diu to get out of the way. He grabbed a bottle of alcohol and threw it into the air, telling Pakuma to shoot the bottle. The arrow flew up and shattered the bottle, creating a flame that engulfed the air above. This part is so ridiculous. Shooting an arrow that doesn't have fire and making it burn is truly miraculous. I wonder if the person who wrote this story was high when they added fire to the arrow. Tan Thien told everyone to leave immediately. This would only slow down the ants. Tan Thien cursed. Where the hell did these crazy ants come from? They see people and just start biting them, and they bite harder than dogs. The group continued to run as fast as they could. Tan Thien thought to himself, why did my mother only give me two legs when I was born? Why not four, so I could run faster? Tan Thien was running so hard that his pants were about to fall down. He also thought about the natural enemies of red fire ants, humpbacked flies, anteaters, wasps, parasitic ants, green mold, and white mold. Red fire ants are so aggressive that they must have natural enemies. Otherwise the entire rainforest would have been destroyed by now. Tan Thien searched the system's knowledge base for humpbacked flies, a species of parasitic fly that lives in South America and primarily parasitizes red fire ant eggs. The larva can kill red fire ants, white mold and green mold. White mold can attach itself to the bodies of red fire ants and then germinate and penetrate their bodies. It then grows continuously, eventually causing the red fire ants to die. Green mold causes red fire ants to become infected with bacteria and die within five days. Dragonflies after the rain. The dragonflies will catch red fire ants as prey. At the same time, this will also reduce the number of red fire ants to a certain extent. Tan Thien found a suitable species. He opened the ring and searched the system for a location with dragonflies. He pointed and called for everyone to run in that direction. There was still some distance between the group and the dragonflies. Pakuma told Tan Thien that the ants were coming again. Tan Thien said to throw the bottles of alcohol and not let them get close. Tan Thien threw out three bottles of alcohol for Pakuma to shoot. This part must have been written by someone who was really high on papaya leaves, because there's fire again, my friends. Since there was still some distance to go before they reached the riverbank, they had to persevere a little longer. Pakuma shattered the three bottles of alcohol, and flames erupted throughout a section of the forest. Finally, the group reached the dragonfly's habitat. Tan Thien told the group to jump, and everyone jumped into the water together. He dived down into the water and gave the ants the finger, saying, if you're so good, come down here and fight me. I'll bow down to you if you come down here. The dragonflies all started to fly away. They flew into the swarm of fire ants and began to bite them. The group surfaced. Pakuma saw that they were emperor dragonflies. Tan Thien said that was right. Emperor dragonflies, a type of dragonfly. Looking at the dragonflies, Tan Thien saw that they were indeed being controlled by their instincts. Faced with the dragonflies, the fire ants didn't even dare to fight back. Rana couldn't believe that the battle had ended just like that. Pakuma asked Tan Thien, These dragonflies don't bite people, do they? Tan Thien said, Don't worry, my friend. They're not interested in humans. When the group reached the shore, Tan Thien asked everyone if they had any headaches or nausea. Everyone was fine, but the ant bites were burning. 
Tan Thien was relieved that everyone was not allergic, but the wounds from the red fire ant bites needed to be treated quickly. But first, they had to meet up with So Lam. A moment later, they found Nick and So Lam. Rana told Tan Thien that the ant bites were now very itchy. Tan Thien said to try to endure and absolutely not to scratch. Tan Thien took out some soapy water and poured it on the ant bites. He explained that because soapy water is alkaline, it can neutralize the acid from the red fire ants and reduce the pain of the wounds. After a while, Aruba was amazed to see that the wounds were no longer itchy and had completely healed. But Tan Thien said that Aruba was thinking too much, and that it would take several days for the wounds to completely disappear. I think that soapy water is not a miracle cure. It can't heal wounds that quickly. Fortunately, White Eye sniffed them out and found them, saving them the time it would have taken to meet up with So Lam. The wounds were treated in time. Otherwise, with the toxicity of the red fire ants, the wounds would definitely have turned into blisters. Today could be considered the worst day since Tan Thien's group entered the rainforest. They had been chased by red fire ants for half a day, and the group was now extremely tired. Even though it was still light out, the group had no strength to continue. They decided to take a break, set up camp, and rest. They would continue their journey the next day. To be honest, they never would have thought that the ants they could normally crush to death with ease would one day chase them and make it impossible for them to fight back. Aruba was sitting down when he suddenly looked at his boots and gasped. He grabbed the boot and ran to Tan Thien, tears streaming down his face as he cried that his rain boots were broken. Tan Thien was startled and said, They're not broken. It's just that the plastic inside is crushed. We can fix it. Don't get so worked up. Hurry up and wipe your nose for me, old man. Tan Thien found that plastic boots were still not as good as rubber boots. But in a stroke of luck, while they were running around to avoid the ants, Tan Thien's group accidentally discovered a fertile land. Tan Thien didn't expect to find a rubber tree. Nick asked what was so special about this tree. Tan Thien said, It's very special because this tree can produce milk that you can drink. Nick and Aruba were surprised that they could drink it. Tan Thien used a knife to cut into the tree and then used a tube to insert into the cut and collect the sap that flowed out of the tree. He said, The sap from this tree is similar to milk. Although it has a bad smell when it is first extracted, if you add a solvent and heat it, it will give off the smell of milk and taste like milk. Rana and Nick smelled it and it was very fragrant. They had never smelled this smell before. Aruba made a cup and asked what it was, saying that it was so delicious. Pakuma asked if this was what was called milk. Tan Thien saw that first there was the coconut tree that they could eat from, and then there was the rubber tree that they could drink from. The natural world was truly miraculous. It was getting late. Tan Thien was still sleepy. He came out of the tent and told Pakuma to change shifts, and saw So Lam praying with her hands together. He went over and asked her if she was worried about her family. So Lam said that it was less than a month until the grand ceremony for her. The elders had said that at the beginning of the sixth month, when the summer solstice began, the city-state would hold a grand ceremony. Tan Thien thought that because he had heard So Lam say that when the ceremony was held, living people would be sacrificed to the gods, she was worried that her tribespeople would be chosen. Tan Thien comforted So Lam. It took a month for her tribespeople to travel from their tribe to the city-state and back. But it only took about 10 days to travel from her tribe to the city-state. The group had already been traveling for a week, so they should be able to reach the city-state in time to redeem her tribespeople. So Lam thanked Tan Thien. The ceremony at the beginning of the sixth month had put pressure on Tan Thien's group. Although the group had enough time, they did not know the exact location of the city-state. They only knew a general direction. In other words, Tan Thien's group did not know how far they were from the city-state. And at their current speed, they did not know if they would be able to arrive before the grand ceremony. Therefore, the group had to increase their speed in the next few days. It was worth noting that as the group continued on their way, they happened to discover more small villages. The villages varied in size. The smaller ones were similar to so lambs, with only 10 or so people, while the larger ones had 45 or 10 people. There were even more than 100 people. Tan Thien thought that it was probably because they were getting close to the city-state that they were encountering so many small villages. But with the principle of not making contact, his group chose to go around them to avoid any unnecessary trouble. In the next few days, many people appeared, with groups of people moving around. Pakuma observed the people moving through binoculars, but he didn't know where they were going. Tan Thien asked So Lam if she knew what was going on. 
so Lam didn't know either, because she hadn't heard the elders mention it before. Rana said that this path led in the same direction as the group wanted to go, but she didn't know if it led to the city-state. Tan Thien suddenly heard a noise, and two people emerged from the forest. A young man was carrying a child on his shoulders. The child was urging the young man to run faster, and the young man said that the smell was getting stronger. After running for a while, the two people came face to face with Tan Thien's group. The two groups faced each other. Tan Thien saw that a young man and a child were not a threat, when suddenly the child cried out and pointed at the bread that was baking, saying, that's the smell, I want to eat it. Tan Thien didn't understand what was going on. The young man put the child down and told him not to run around. The child said angrily that he was not a child anymore. The young man took a thigh out of his bag and said to Tan Thien, can I exchange this deer thigh for some food? Tan Thien's group looked at each other and smiled. The young man saw that Tan Thien didn't say anything and was afraid that it wasn't enough, so he wanted to give him more. But Tan Thien felt that it was enough, but that he had to answer a few of Tan Thien's questions. Because he knew that if this person had appeared here, he might know something. After exchanging the bread, the young man introduced himself as Mong Ho, and the little girl was his sister, ANHA. He thanked Tan Thien's group for sharing their food with them. The little girl cried as she ate, saying that the food was so delicious that it must have been a gift from the gods. Mong Ho asked Tan Thien if he was also going to participate in the ceremony. Tan Thien said that this was their first time here, so his group didn't know if they were going the right way. Though his group had guessed correctly that this path led to the city-state. Just as Tan Thien had predicted, he had gotten the information he needed from Mong Ho. According to Mong Ho, this path led directly to the city-state, and these people were going to participate in the ceremony. But at the moment, it would take Tan Thien's group another two days to reach the city-state, Mong Ho said. There was still some time before the ceremony, so Tan Thien's group could take their time and not rush. Mong Ho asked Tan Thien if he had prepared enough money to enter the city. Tan Thien was surprised and asked if he needed money to enter the city. Because Mong Ho had met many people before who didn't know and couldn't enter the city, he asked Tan Thien. But he didn't expect that Tan Thien hadn't prepared either. Tan Thien asked Mong Ho what the fee was, and if he could pay with seashells. Mong Ho said that seashells were only one type, and that he could also use cocoa beans, corn medicine, and other valuable items. Tan Thien asked how much it cost per person, and Mong Ho said that it cost 20 seashells per person. Tan Thien thought it was too much, as much as 20. Mong Ho said that if he didn't have enough, he could exchange other items for money with others. If he needed money, Tan Thien could trade with Mong Ho, but he only had cocoa beans. Tan Thien realized that this guy was trying to find an excuse to trade with him. Tan Thien hadn't expected the city-state to have a rule of using fees to enter the city, and it seemed to be more sophisticated than he had thought. But compared to that, Tan Thien was more concerned about whether there would be any robberies on the way to the city-state. Because So Lam had said that there would be looting between the tribes, and now that many tribes were heading to the same place, it would be strange if nothing happened. Tan Thien was thinking when a NHA said with a bright smile, it's okay, just kill them all, and there will be a lot of loot. Mong Ho also laughed and said, unless the other side has too many people, otherwise there will usually be less combat, because when the two sides fight, the scavengers around will wait for the house to burn down and then go to steal. Hearing the two siblings talk, Tan Thien asked again, wouldn't it be dangerous to travel with only two people? The NHA said that her brother Mong Ho was very powerful and could fight one against 10,000. He could ride a red rabbit horse into the middle of 10,000 troops and take the enemy general's head as easily as taking something out of his pocket. Oh, wait, I got it wrong. I'm mixing it up with the three kingdoms. He can only fight one against ten. Ha ha ha. Tan Thien thought that was right. If these two had been to the city-state many times, then they must not be ordinary people, otherwise they would not have been safe until now. He was worrying too much. Tan Thien talked to Mong Ho about how to exchange the items. Tan Thien had a lot of delicious food, but Mong Ho said that he didn't have much money on him at the moment and was afraid that he wouldn't have enough to exchange. Tan Thien said that the price would be the same as before, and that if there was more, he would consider it a gift to the two siblings. Although So Lam had a bag of seashells, after learning that he had to hand over 20 seashells to enter the city-state, he couldn't help but worry whether he would be able to redeem So Lam's tribesmen. So Tan Thien had to use wheat flour and dried meat to exchange with Mong Ho for a bag of cocoa. The price between the two was one roll of meat for 30 seashells. Calculated like this, Mong Ho's seashells were not enough, but Tan Thien still gave all the wheat flour and meat rolls to the two siblings, because they had only needed a deer thigh to exchange for a roll of Tan Thien's meat. So Tan Thien also felt that it was a good deal. 
After completing the transaction, the Mong Ho siblings bid farewell to the group, and Tan Thien also packed up and prepared to find another place to spend the night. Don't think that Tan Thien was talking nicely to the Mong Ho siblings earlier, but in their hearts, they were still wary, afraid that the siblings were scouts from some tribe, and would go and bring back a gang to return, so Tan Thien made this decision. Night had fallen and the moon was high in the sky, and the Mong Ho siblings were moving through the forest. The NHA was eating and saying that Tan Thien's group was very good to give them so much food. Mong Ho also said that it was a good sign, and that maybe after the ceremony was completed, the gods would bestow blessings upon them, and then they would not need to participate in the holy prayer activity. And even if they did participate, he would win the championship. Suddenly, ANHA hugged herself and shivered. Mong Ho stuck his spear into the ground. The NHA said that she felt cold. Mong Ho opened his cloak and hugged the NHA encouraging her that everything would be fine with her brother hugging her, and the two of them sat under the moonlight in the forest to spend the night. Early the next morning, Tan Thien's group moved along the trail, and Pakuma asked Tan Thien why they didn't take the main road, which would be easier. Tan Thien said that there was no need to rush, and that they should observe for a while first, because he had heard from Mong Ho that there were often robberies on this road, so if they ventured out, they would definitely be noticed. Although this place was not far from the main road, it was not necessarily safe. There were already a few figures hiding in the forest, and suddenly Tan Thien saw an arrow coming towards him. He turned around in panic and activated his cat's reaction talent, and it was true that what he was worried about came to him. Time seemed to stand still as he observed the ambushers and found that they were very clever, and knew that the main road was the only way to the city-state, so there would definitely be many people passing through. They passed through the ambush in the rainforest like this, not afraid of the scavengers waiting to ambush them, avoiding the scene of the praying mantis catching the cicada and the sparrow lurking behind. But unfortunately, they met you. Tan Thien broke two spears and stepped on one of them. The two were horrified because they didn't know what was going on. Qatar rushed in and slashed at one of them, and Aruba also took care of one of them. Before they could do anything, three of them had been killed. When they saw that Tan Thien's group was holding weapons that could emit light, they thought that they were divine weapons that could break all their weapons. Seeing that Tan Thien's group was outnumbered, they thought they could win. Because Tan Thien's group had So Lam standing behind them, they thought that So Lam was very important, so they would deal with her first to restrain Tan Thien's group. Aruba held a knife and said with a happy smile that this was the advantage of the weapons they had used to deal with the pirates before, and that it felt really good. Qatar said that good weapons were of course important, but that technique was the foundation for survival on the battlefield. Tan Thien saw that there were more than 20 people in the ambush, and that if they hadn't had the superior weapons, they might have been able to control them. But they still had to be careful and protect So Lam and the others. Suddenly, a spear flew out of nowhere and stuck in the ground, startling everyone. Ong Ho was carrying his sister and running towards them, shouting, My friend, we're here. The ambushers were shocked when they saw Mong Ho and shouted, That straw coat? Why are they here? Let's get out of here. Then the whole group ran away as if they were being chased by dogs, and Tan Thien didn't know why they had all run away. As he was running, he tripped over a stone and Mong Ho fell over, throwing a NHA out. Mong Ho fell flat on his face, and a NHA rolled around and said, See you later. Tan Thien also laughed and said, See you later. Before he could get up, Mong Ho asked if Tan Thien's group was okay, and everyone was speechless. Why didn't he ask about himself first? Tan Thien went over and helped Mong Ho up and asked, What a coincidence that we met again, as if they knew that Tan Thien's group would be here. Mong Ho waved his hands wildly and explained, that he and the others were not the same group. Because the weather was nice this morning, they went out to look for food and were returning to the city-state when they encountered a leopard, and chased after it for a long time. Then he remembered that Tan Thien had given them a lot of food yesterday, and that it would be great if they could meet again to repay him. Thinking that Tan Thien was going back to the city-state, Mong Ho thought to follow the main road to find Tan Thien's group, and unexpectedly, he actually found them. The NHA said that it must have been the gods who guided them to meet again. Mong Ho asked Tan Thien if he wanted to go with them, and the NHA said that if they went together, they could eat delicious food. Tan Thien now realized that the two siblings had eaten all the dried meat yesterday, so the younger sister had asked Mong Ho to chase after them. Under the pleading of the Mong Ho siblings, Tan Thien finally agreed to let them join them, because for them, having Mong Ho's guidance would make the next part of their journey easier. As for whether or not they would encounter bandits, Tan Thien had already thought about it, and if they were already in the rainforest, they would have to face them sooner or later, so they might as well show themselves. As the group walked out onto the main road, 
they suddenly met many people, and it felt a bit unreal. Akuma asked why it felt like the people around them were keeping their distance from the group, and Mong Ho said that it was probably because of the clothes the group was wearing. Because only people in the city state could afford to buy so much cloth. Rana said that compared to the others, their group's attire was a bit too conspicuous, and Qatar asked if they needed to change their clothes to match the people around them. Han Thien thought that it would be better to leave it as it was, so that they would be afraid of them and avoid any unnecessary trouble. For people who used stones as weapons, people with iron weapons could cope even if they were outnumbered three to one. Which was why Tan Thien dared to come out of the rainforest. Aruba was glad that they were finally out of the mud. Nick asked So Lam if it would rain in the next few days, and So Lam said that the weather would be nice for the next few days. Although they were on the main road, they couldn't avoid the puddles, but there were much fewer of them than in the rainforest. Moreover, the visibility was better, which made everyone in the group feel much better. At night, everyone made a fire to rest, and Tan Thien's group was also sitting together. Mong Ho was very surprised when Tan Thien showed him the salt, because it was so fine. And he asked Tan Thien where he had gotten it and if he could show him. Tan Thien asked Mong Ho what his salt looked like, and Mong Ho showed it to him, saying that it was the same as what was obtained by drying out seawater. Tan Thien saw that it was all granulated salt. NHA, who was next to him, was drinking some milkweed juice and kept praising how delicious it was. Suddenly, there was a loud noise, and everyone looked over. Pakuma said that it seemed like something was going on over there. A group of people were escorting some bound people over, and the leader said to rest in place. Tan Thien was curious, so he asked who the people were and why everyone was afraid of them. Ong Ho said that they were soldiers from the city, and a NHA said that they were all people who made others uncomfortable. Tan Thien asked if the bound people were prisoners of war, and Mong Ho said that before the grand ceremony began, these soldiers would all go and raid nearby villages to capture sacrificial offerings. Tan Thien was surprised and asked, raid the surrounding areas? Do the soldiers know where the villages are? Mong Ho didn't know either. They spent a lot of time searching. Because in addition to preparing enough sacrificial offerings, they would also buy slaves and prisoners of war from those who came before them. Tan Thien wondered if Mong Ho's village had been raided, and a NHA said that it had been, but they had all been killed. They had collected quite a lot of things that time. Tan Thien asked, aren't you afraid of being retaliated against if you kill the soldiers of the city-state? And a NHA said, if you kill everyone, no one will know. Tan Thien was surprised that a little girl of 7 or 8 years old could talk about killing so casually. Although it was typical of this era, it still made people shudder. Suddenly, So Lam stood up, and the whole group wondered what was going on. She stared into the distance, and Tan Thien handed her the binoculars and told her to use them to see more clearly. As they approached the city-state, So Lam became more and more anxious. When she saw the prisoners, she couldn't help but have an idea. But none of them were in the prisoners, so Tan Thien could only comfort her and tell her that they would definitely find her when they reached the city-state. Tan Thien didn't set up a tent that night, but slept right there. The tent was too conspicuous in this situation, and they needed to be more discreet. The Mong Ho siblings looked through the binoculars and were amazed. The NHA liked the binoculars so much that she took them to Tan Thien and said that she wanted to trade her brother for the binoculars, and Tan Thien didn't know what to do. He was afraid of this woman. On the second day, Tan Thien's group followed the group of people back to the city-state, which made Tan Thien feel like he was going from the village to the town when he was a child. But the journey was not peaceful, and there were occasional conflicts. The reason was very simple. They saw something they wanted and wanted to rob it, so a bloody battle ensued. Many people were used to this situation. Unless someone wanted to get involved, even the soldiers would turn a blind eye. Fortunately, perhaps because of the clothes Tan Thien's group was wearing, or perhaps because of some other reason, no one came to provoke them. After three days of walking, a large area of land appeared before them. This was the city-state. Nick thought the city-state was so big that it looked like a mountain. Tan Thien had seen the laboratory before, so he found the city-state a bit intimidating. But he wasn't too surprised. Mong Ho said that they would arrive in half a day. He felt strange. And the city-state seemed a bit familiar, so he asked Sa Diu to go and investigate. Through Sa Diu, he saw a familiar row of buildings. Tan Thien was surprised to see it here. When Sa Diu flew closer, Tan Thien could clearly see the pyramid structure. It was a Mayan pyramid. He turned to ask the two Mong Ho brothers if they were Mayans, but they didn't know what that was. A NHA said that they were Mayans. Tan Thien thought about it. Although he had never seen a Mayan pyramid in person, this legendary structure had appeared in the media many times. The structure in front of him was indeed Mayan, 
but the Mong Ho brothers and So Lam all said they were Mayans. And the name Mayan was taken from the city of Maya, and the name Mayan was given to them later. The real Mayans actually called themselves Mayans. Seeing that Tan Thien was confused, Mong Ho asked him if something was wrong, but Tan Thien said it was nothing, let's continue. Tan Thien asked Mong Ho if he knew about the five prophecies, which were about the end of the world, but Mong Ho didn't know about them either. Tan Thien felt that the inhabitants of this D3 area were Mayans who had been brought here from another era by the time space. Everyone was paying the entrance fee, and the soldiers were shouting, hurry up, don't block the way. Behind Rana, he saw a pile of something yellow and didn't know what it was. Mong Ho said it was sulfur. NHA said that it smelled bad when burned. Tan Thien observed the surrounding terrain, and saw that the Mayan city-state had a moat, but it was so small that it looked like it was only for decoration. He asked Mong Ho why there were so few guards, and why there were no guards in other places, and why they weren't afraid of people jumping over the moat. The moat is so small that it's easy to jump over. The Mong Ho brothers were shocked and said, don't even think about it. If the gods find out, they will give you a bad mark and you will die. NHA said that the gods are everywhere, which made Tan Thien surprised and said, I know. He felt that it would be no problem to just jump over it. Suddenly, a man walked through without paying a fee, and Tan Thien was curious and asked Mong Ho about it, who told him that the man was probably a resident of the city. Because the residents of the city had their own identity cards, they didn't have to pay any fees to enter or leave the city. Tan Thien asked how to become a resident of the city, and Mong Ho said, there is no way. Because he heard the elders of the tribe say that the city-state was originally a village, but one day the gods came down and passed on their wisdom to the people of the village, so the city-state came into being, so the city-state did not accept people from other villages. Outside, some people who had come from afar and did not know that they had to pay a fee to enter the city were chased away by the guards. After entering the city, the first thing Tan Thien saw was a cultivated area, and this cultivated area was on fire. As Tan Thien walked by, he saw that there were many Mayan slaves on the land burning corn stalks and dry leaves under the watchful eyes of the soldiers. Tan Thien was very familiar with this, and he liked to do it the most. It's not that he liked it, but because it was a good way to get rid of the dry plants, and after burning it, it could also be used as fertilizer. The cultivated area in the city was relatively large. Tan Thien walked along the road for more than 10 minutes before he found some low houses. According to Mong Ho, the Mayan city was divided into three layers based on its function. The outermost layer was the planting area, the next layer was the residential area, and the innermost layer was the temple where the nobles and priests lived. According to this division, the Mayan city was divided into four areas by the moat, each with a large market. As soon as they entered, Tan Thien's group found it very lively. Mong Ho asked Tan Thien what he wanted to do next, and Tan Thien asked Mong Ho where they could buy slaves. The NHA did not expect that Tan Thien and the others would be so hateful as to want to buy slaves. Hearing her sister say this, Mong Ho said that Tan Thien was just curious. Tan Thien also smiled and said that he was curious. Mong Ho pointed to where the crowd was gathered and said, The place where slaves are bought is not fixed, but it is always in the market, and the most lively place is the place. A man was holding a bell and shouting to sell a man he had caught. He had to use three people to catch him, so he could do the work of three people but only eat for one. He squeezed the man's face and asked everyone to come and see. He was very strong, and the starting price was 200 cocoa beans. Below, people began to bid against each other, some for 250 beans, some for 300 beans, and some for 100 shells. Below, Tan Thien saw So Lam sigh, and he didn't know what to say. NHA only now realized that people from So Lam's tribe had been captured, and could be sold here. Mong Ho asked Tan Thien if this was the reason he had come here. Tan Thien said that it was part of the reason. NHA felt that she had wronged Tan Thien. Mong Ho told Tan Thien that there were other places where slaves were sold, not just this one. Let's go and have a look. So Lam suddenly said thank you to Tan Thien for bringing her here, and she remembered that he had other important things to do. She said that she would not bother him with the matter of finding her tribespeople anymore. She did not know how to repay Tan Thien's kindness. If she found her tribespeople, if he returned to the tribe, she would be willing to be his slave. And even after death, her soul would always follow him. Tan Thien smiled and said that he was really grateful for her help, but he also had to thank her for bringing him here. Although the focus was on exploring the pyramid, but So Lam's matter was more important. So for the rest of the time, Tan Thien helped So Lam search for her tribespeople. In particular, the Mong Ho brothers also helped to search. 
In their words, they had nothing to do, and their friend's business was their business. Tan Thien didn't know how to react to Mong Ho calling him a friend. He had to know that they had only known each other for a few days. And it was only during the transaction that Tan Thien gave them a little more discount. It could be considered as an acquaintance, but not a friend. As such, Tan Thien was very grateful for their help, and his feelings for the two of them grew a little. It must be said that the Mayan city was really big. Although it could not be compared to a modern city, its area was not much different from that of a modern county town. Tan Thien's group arrived at the city about 10 hours later. After entering the city, they always looked for traces of So Lam's tribespeople. But after searching for five or six hours, they only found out that they had only gone through the West District. By the time they reached the South District, the sun had set. Rana saw that there were fewer and fewer people, and Pakuma saw that it seemed that they could only stop here for today. NHA and Aruba said they were hungry. Mong Ho heard his sister was hungry and asked what to eat or go eat that. Tan Thien was curious about what it was. A moment later, a fat man was smiling at NHA. NHA wanted to eat hot chocolate. A moment later, a table full of food was served. Aruba saw that it was all delicious food. Tan Thien was surprised that there were street stalls in the Mayan city and that there was a lot of food. The vendor said that the price of chocolate was 30 cocoa beans. He asked a NHA that the cocoa had been traded before, but a NHA said. So her elder brother had to go to work to earn money. Tan Thien looked over and saw Mong Ho carrying a log and saying, You guys eat up, just leave this place to me. Tan Thien said that he had brought food and thanked Mong Ho for his kindness. Why should I eat what you worked so hard to carry? How can I swallow it? Suddenly, the owner asked Tan Thien if Sa Diu was his. After a while, he put the cocoa cup on the table. The three of them had just finished three cups of chocolate when they were about to log out. Rana ate it and found that it tasted like rotten fruit with honey added, but it was too bitter and spicy. Tan Thien found it curious and deadly. It was amazing to add chili to cocoa. The other three people were drinking it very enthusiastically. The two Mong Ho brothers thanked Tan Thien for inviting them to eat. As for Aruba, she found this dish magical, with all kinds of flavors. Tan Thien laughed and said, if you want to thank me, thanks Sa Diu. Because just now, the owner bought a feather for 100 cocoa beans, which made the bird cry because it had lost some of its feathers. Tan Thien asked where the two brothers would sleep tonight, and Mong Ho said that at night, outsiders were not allowed to stay in the residential area, so they had to go back to the cultivation area. As night fell, many people also gathered in the cultivation area to set up tents and light fires to spend the night. Tan Thien was thinking about some trivial matters when a NHA suddenly cried out that she was hot. Seeing this, Tan Thien was afraid that the fire was too big, so he was about to remove some firewood when Mong Ho hugged a NHA and ran away, saying that he would be back in a while. Tan Thien didn't need to worry. A NHA kept crying out in pain. Mong Ho comforted her, saying, be patient, we're almost there. Mong Ho hugged his sister and jumped into the river. The next day, the bird was plucked again to buy food. Mong Ho said that it was too embarrassing to let his friend invite him to dinner. Tan Thien saw that this guy was saying this, but he was not embarrassed at all. He saw that last night when Mong Ho brought a NHA back, he looked like he had been fished out of the water. His whole body was soaked, but the important thing was that a NHA was in a coma and weak. He thought something had happened, but unexpectedly, when she woke up this morning, it was as if nothing had happened. Although he wanted to know what had happened to a NHA, it was each person's secret. If Mong Ho didn't want to say it, then forget it. Suddenly, some people shouted that there was a holy game competition at the temple. Han Thien didn't understand, so he asked Mong Ho, and Mong Ho said, Do you want to go and see it? People from all four districts have gone there. It's a very sacred game. There are a lot of people gathered at the pyramid. Tan Thien's group also came here. Nick saw that it was very big when he went in. Pakuma thought that this architecture was too strong. Tan Thien exclaimed that this architecture was completely man-made. What made him pay more attention was that the heads at the door looked like dragon heads. Going inside, the two walls were full of paintings. Tan Thien and the others were very surprised. When everyone stood in front of the master of this is the moon goddess Ishal. This is the great serpent god Kukulkan. Tan Thien stood in front of a painting and did not know what god it was. It felt like it was added later and was known to be the goddess of wisdom. Who once descended to this place? To Both of these places are full of images of gods and are treasures of their respective peoples. But in addition to painting gods, the Mayan murals also depict other things, including the process and experience of sacrifice. Although it is only a mural, it still makes one feel cold. 
it must be said that the Mayans were the most brutal and bloodthirsty people in the primitive world. And in the primitive period, there were still traces of human sacrifice. Tan Thien's group did not watch it for long before they went out. When they left the Mayan pyramids are all concentrated in the important temple area. Walking among the tall pyramids, Tan Thien felt like he was walking under the footsteps of a giant. The vision turned to a kind of horror. There was a square in front of a pyramid where many, and at this moment, quite a few people were, people were shouting and shouting, go ahead and kill him. Are your legs just for decoration? Kick him. A football game was going on below. Bong Ho told Tan Thien about the rules. As long as the ball was kicked into the opponent's stone ring, they would win. But the game could not be played with hands or feet, but only with the thighs, shoulders, knees and buttocks. Below the game, one person had been punched in the face by his opponent. Tan Thien asked, Can you stun your opponent too? NHA said casually, Brother, if you kill your opponent and then put the ball in the ring, you win. Then, unexpectedly, the ball flew straight towards Tan Thien, and he reached out to catch it. The ball bounced off hard. Tan Thien felt the power was too terrifying. On one side, Mong Ho had already caught the ball and asked Tan Thien if his hand was okay. Tan Thien said it was okay, and he wanted to see the ball. Tan Thien held the ball and found that it weighed at least three caddies. He thought that if the ball was so heavy, how could he play with it at that speed? If he was hit by it, it would be like being punched. He was surprised to find that the ball was made of rubber. Someone on the court shouted at Tan Thien to return the ball. There were already people lying on the ground on the court. He found that this competition was too dangerous. Mong Ho said. Normally, only the holy game is like this. In ordinary competitions, there is rarely such a fight. Someone said that this was the holy game. Mong Ho said that the grand ceremony had been held. The other person said that this year, the time of the holy game had been changed to before the grand ceremony. Hearing this, Mong Ho hugged a NHA and ran away. Tan Thien asked Mong Ho where he was going. Mong Ho said that he could not help anymore. When the group saw Mong Ho leave, they did not know what had happened. They did not know if it was related to the holy game competition. Tan Thien wanted to start acting before the competition was over. He told everyone to disperse and find a place to sell slaves. They would meet again in 30 minutes. Tan Thien's group had not come here to watch the holy game, but their main purpose was to find someone from Salam's tribe. Mong Ho had said that this competition was very sacred and everyone would come to watch it, so Tan Thien's group did not need to run around looking for it in the other four districts. But unfortunately, after searching all day, they still did not find any of So Lam's tribesmen, not even their masters. Suddenly, there was a cry for help. Looking over, he saw the parrot calling for help, So Lam. Tan Thien asked to buy the parrot, and the other person asked for 300 cocoa beans or 100 shells, or it could be exchanged for Sa Dai or Mat Trang. He asked if he could reduce it a little, but Sa Dai or Mat Trang would never be exchanged. He used up all the cocoa he had traded with Mong Ho before and added some of Sa Dai's feathers to exchange for the parrot. Everyone found the parrot to be amazing. The bird could talk. Tan Thien asked So Lam about the parrot and learned that the parrot's name was Xiao Huang, and was raised by Hei Yu. So Lam asked the parrot if it knew where Hei Yu's group was, and the bird flew up and said, follow me. Tan Thien told Sa Dai to pay attention to the parrot, and the others quickly followed it. Xiao Huang and Sa Dai flew to a pyramid. The group followed behind and saw that the pyramid was too big. Suddenly, the ring in Tan Thien's hand lit up and the arrow pointed towards the pyramid. At the gate, there were two soldiers. Seeing Tan Thien's group running towards them, they blocked their way and said, Stop, there is a temple ahead, and you are not allowed to approach without permission. Tan Thien immediately told them that they would leave immediately. No need to be nervous. Tan Thien saw that this was the pyramid where the king and the priest lived. It was so closely guarded that it would be difficult to sneak in. Suddenly, Tan Thien met the cocoa seller from before, and he asked why the owner was here and was told that he had come to deliver cocoa to the priests in the temple. He said that his cocoa was the best in the city, which was why it was sent to the priests. He and Pakuma had to compliment the owner on his skill. Tan Thien was thinking, how could something like dishwashing liquid be so popular? And it was said to be the most delicious. As he was thinking, he was scolded by the guard, are you finished talking? If you're done, then go away. Then he led the owner into the temple. So Lam was still looking inside. Tan Thien said, let's go. Tan Thien looked at the pyramid and saw that under the sunlight, the shadow of the north wall of the pyramid turned from a straight line from top to bottom into a wavy line that extended to the snake's head of the temple tower. This shape looked like a large snake moving from the top of the tower to the ground. The reflected snake shape, I wonder if it is a unique image of the Mayans? Nick felt unwilling to go back like this. Tan Thien said that the place was too heavily guarded. There are so many soldiers that it would be difficult to sneak in. 
let alone charge in. So we need to prepare a little so that they invite us in. The group was surprised. How can they invite us? Tan Thien said that the best cocoa in the city would be brought into the temple. The next task for the group would be to collect a large amount of cocoa. He didn't know why the ring pointed to the pyramid. But there must be a reason to go inside and see. As for how to get in, Tan Thien had a plan after meeting the cocoa seller. The specific plan was to make delicious cocoa and then let the priests invite them in. So after they had an idea, Tan Thien and the others split up to collect Sa Dai's feathers in exchange for cocoa. After all, they didn't have a single cocoa bean in their hands. But besides cocoa, Tan Thien also collected sweet potatoes and herbs, because these things would be the source of the plan's success. In the evening, everyone roasted potatoes to eat, and found the sweet potatoes to be very soft and delicious. Nick saw that Tan Thien had bought so many sweet potatoes and thought he was making food reserves. Tan Thien said no, although sweet potatoes were delicious, they were quickly digested and would soon make you hungry again, so they were not suitable for storage. But it has one disadvantage. Before he could finish speaking, Aruba let out a quality fart, and Qatar had to move his hands and feet again. Tan Thien said that if you eat too much, you will be like Aruba. The reason he bought so many potatoes was to make a kind of syrup to mix with the hot cocoa. After eating, Tan Thien and the others began to prepare the hot cocoa. In order to save time, everyone split into two groups to make the syrup and the hot cocoa. Tan Thien's group was in charge of putting the sliced potatoes into the cooking pot, so Lam's group dried the cocoa. Soon, the water in which the sweet potatoes were cooked turned a light pink color which was evidence that the sugar had been released. So Lam used a mortar to grind the cocoa beans into powder. After a period of distillation, the excess water in the syrup was removed, and what remained was the precious, sticky syrup. After so Lam had finished grinding the cocoa, he put the herbs into the mortar and ground them into powder. The ingredients were ready, and everyone stood by the pot of hot cocoa. Pakuma said, if I hadn't tried it once before, I wouldn't believe that something that smells so intoxicating could be so hard to eat. Tan Thien said, don't worry, it will be very delicious this time. Because he knew that cocoa was bitter, he added syrup to balance the bitterness. Milk will make it more delicious, and finally a little bit of the smell of herbs. After it was cooked, everyone came to try it and everyone found it to be too delicious. A hundred times better than the one the owner had sold. The whole body felt warm, the bitterness and sweetness complementing each other. Han Thien felt that the smell was still a bit strong and needed to add a little more syrup. Pakuma asked Tan Thien why he didn't use honey, which was also sweet and available in the city, but Tan Thien explained. Honey is sweet, but if it is heated above 60 degrees, it will turn sour and lose its original sweetness. But syrup is not like that, and it can also be added after it has cooled down, but doing so does not harmonize the flavors of the two, but rather makes the flavor impure. Early the next morning, in the market, there was a delicious smell in the air. Tan Thien's group was opening a shop to sell hot cocoa. Tan Thien invited everyone to come and try the best cocoa in the city, and people rushed to buy it, and even asked to buy another bowl. Everyone was busy buying and selling, and everyone was smiling happily. Just like when I make videos for you guys and you guys welcome them and watch them a lot, I'm also very happy. The people who drank Tan Thien's group's cocoa felt as good as a pangolin. It was truly a delicacy that felt like a god summon. Tan Thien's group's hot cocoa was more popular than they had imagined, and it was sold out within an hour. So Tan Thien's group got a lot of cocoa, but the finished product was more than doubled, earning a lot of money. Although cocoa was not something valuable, the money earned from their own labor still made Tan Thien happy. But making money from cocoa was not the group's goal. What they wanted was to expand their hot cocoa to the whole city, and eventually to the priests. To achieve this, the group had to continue to produce delicious hot cocoa and then sell it everywhere in the city to spread the reputation of the hot cocoa as soon as possible. Tan Thien saw that there were about 30,000 to 40,000 people in the city, and according to the current situation, it would probably be less than a week before the priests would notice. In the holy city, a haystack appeared, and several people were rushing towards it. One of them punched it, but was unexpectedly knocked away. And he saw that he had clearly punched through the body of the haystack. Tan Thien and Qatar found it too powerful. The five people who had surrounded him had changed the situation with just one move. He was as strong as the pirate captain. Suddenly, someone asked if he could work there. When he turned around, he saw a young boy carrying a load of things on his back. If he could work, he would only need to be given a little hot cocoa. 
Tan Thien brought out a bowl of cocoa and placed it on the table. The boy was surprised and asked with wide eyes, is this big bowl of hot cocoa really for me? Tan Thien said yes, go ahead and drink it, it's free. The boy quickly thanked him and picked up the bowl of cocoa to drink. Tan Thien saw that the basket on the boy's back seemed heavy, so he told him to put the bamboo basket down first and then drink. When the boy put the basket on the ground, Tan Thien discovered calcium carbide, the main component of which is calcium carbide and the chemical formula is CAC2. It is called calcium carbide, a white crystal, and the industrial product is a black rock shape with a purple or gray surface. And it reacts strongly with water to become acetylene and releases heat. Tan Thien asked the boy if he could see the stones in the basket, and the boy happily agreed. Tan Thien took a stone and put it in a bowl of water, and the three saw the water boiling. Tan Thien took a torch and told everyone to step back. He put the torch into the boiling water and suddenly the bowl of water exploded and burst into flames. Nick was surprised to see fire rising from the water, but Tan Thien knew he had guessed correctly. This is a calcium carbide lamp. Tan Thien turned to the boy and asked if he could tell him where he got the stones, because this kind of stone absolutely cannot exist in nature. A moment later, at a pyramid complex in the middle of the forest, Tan Thien did not expect to find a forest like this in the city. The boy said that he had heard his father say that this place was not like this a long time ago, but that since it was cursed by the evil god, very few people came here. And gradually it became this forest. Tan Thien was curious about what the curse of the evil god was, and the boy told him. That day in the temple, a dazzling light shone out, followed by an explosion. At that time, everyone in the temple turned to ashes and their souls were taken away in an instant. But that was what his father had told him. Tan Thien was speechless. When he heard the boy speak, he thought that he had seen it with his own eyes. He asked the boy if he was not afraid of the gods when he came here, and the boy said that the priests had said that the evil god had been driven away by him, so there was nothing to be afraid of. A moment later, the two arrived at their destination. The boy led Tan Thien to a pyramid. Tan Thien was worried because the pyramid was a sacred place where only priests and nobles could enter, so he was worried that if the boy led him here, there would be trouble. He asked the boy if it would be okay for the two of them to come here, and the boy said it would be okay, because the area where the god of light had left was not a concern for trespassing. The two of them walked to the top of the pyramid. When Tan Thien went inside, he saw a large hole in the ceiling. He did not know what had happened here. A stone wall had melted. The boy called Tan Thien over and said that the stones had been picked up here. Tan Thien observed and saw wood dust, calcium oxide, limestone, and calcium carbide. Tan Thien thought. In industry, there are two ways to obtain calcium carbide, smelting in an electric furnace and oxythermal, in which the reaction of the first method is calcium oxide and carbon into an electric furnace, and then calcium carbide will be produced under 2000 degrees of electricity. What he saw before his eyes, the raw materials can be said to be complete. As for the reaction conditions, judging from the wall, except for the electric current, he could not think of anything else that could leave this trace. It's just where does this electric current come from? Even lightning could not create this power. Tan Thien looked over and saw a purple stone. He found this thing very familiar but could not remember it for the moment. But the Mayans definitely could not have created this thing. He put it in his pocket and asked the boy why he had to collect so many stones, and he learned that the temple needed limestone to build it. He picked it up to sell. Tan Thien felt that he had wasted the boy's time and said that he would pay him. The boy said that because he had given him hot cocoa, he was very grateful and did not need to be paid. He looked at the boy and saw that he did not even have a shirt. He must be a commoner in the city, as the saying goes. Children in poor families grow up early. The boy led Tan Thien to another pyramid. He saw a shelf and asked the boy what these shelves were for before, and the boy said that they were for limestone, but he had already taken them away. He asked him what he was looking for, and he said he was looking for a glowing stone. The boy took him to another pyramid. Tan Thien stood on the top of the pyramid and observed. He saw a blue stone surface and asked the boy, Do all the other pyramids have this? I understand that some places have it and some don't. He found it similar to a solar energy panel. He decided to go to a few other places to see how it was. By nightfall, the two had returned. He thanked the boy very much. The boy said goodbye and left. Aruba held the jar and wondered if it would explode if the calcium carbide was put in it, but Tan Thien said that it would be fine. As long as it did not come into contact with fire, there was no need to worry. He found that calcium, after adding water, would become a very good raw material. It is possible to make a soldering iron that can be used on a boat when there is no stove. It can also be used for high temperature experiments. But unfortunately, I found only a small amount, so I have to use it sparingly. What caught his attention was the metal sheet that looked like a solar panel. 
There were several holes in the caps on top, which must have been deliberately damaged, and the damage caused the sheet to explode, which led to the incident with the evil god. The explosion also frightened the saboteur, so he did not take the entire sheet and left in a hurry. The sheet metal is something that should not exist in this world, but it appeared on the pyramids of this period. More importantly, someone went to sabotage it, which suggests that the person who did it may know what it is. At first, he thought that the calcium was made by the priests, but he did not expect it to be the product of an accident. While he was thinking, Nick came and told Tan Thien that the hot cocoa had sold out. Tan Thien said to pack up and get ready to go. He felt that there was no need to think about it anymore. The news of these things would not be of any use. The next day, the pyramid held a grand gathering, and there were a lot of people. Aruba wondered why there were so many people today. Pakuma did not know what had happened. Yesterday, he had heard people in the city say that today was the final, so that was why so many people had come here. But even though there were a lot of people, the stalls were very quiet, and the three of them sat around with their chins in their hands. Tan Thien thought that the straw man must have made it to the finals. Qatar said that it had been a 1-5 to five from the beginning to the end. Suddenly, everyone knelt down. Rana wondered why everyone was kneeling. Aruba asked if they should kneel down too. So Lam suddenly said that it was the great priest. Two people were sitting on a sedan chair. One was as fat as a pig and the other was as thin as a stone man. Tan Thien told everyone to hurry up and pay their respects so as not to attract their attention. He did not know which of these two was the priest, but no matter how he looked at them, they looked like two uneducated people. The stone man went up to the temple and spread his arms and said something. Tan Thien could not hear clearly and asked Pakuma if he could hear it, but it was too far away to hear. He stood up high and looked down. His mouth curled into a smile, thinking that he was very powerful. Everyone cheered as the game began. The two people sitting high up observed the game and saw that the straw man was very strong, so they wanted to take advantage of him to do their work for them. A servant came forward and offered the priest a bowl of hot cocoa. Below, Tan Thien and Nick were still making cocoa when someone came and said, You farmer, you are very lucky. Tan Thien turned around and saw two soldiers approaching. Tan Thien learned that he could either get hot cocoa or a slave as a reward. He could only choose one of the two. Tomorrow morning, the group of soldiers would come to pick up his group, and told him not to make any mistakes. Remember, it was an honor for his group. Tan Thien told them to rest assured that he would make thorough preparations. Tan Thien thought, no wonder the fat man he had met before was so happy. But this time it was also a big surprise. He had originally thought that after entering the pyramid, he would use the form of a transaction to buy So Lam's people back. Now one less thing to worry about. Suddenly, Pakuma shouted, everyone, look over there. Everyone looked up and saw a man with a green body being carried up by two soldiers. The man was placed on a stone table, and he struggled and shouted, what do you want to do? Let me go. The stone priest appeared overhead and laughed, you are very lucky. You can become the power of the great god. With a thud, blood splattered everywhere. And then a soldier kicked the man's body down and it fell in front of the straw man. Then the stone priest held the heart in his left hand and shouted, the holy light of the great god will protect us. Below, everyone cheered. When Qatar saw this scene, he said that this kind of sacrifice was clearly an insult to the gods. Nick thought it was too cruel. Tan Thien said, everyone, we should leave this place as soon as possible. In the evening, Tan Thien stood in front of the jar and said, Rana, how do you feel? Do you have difficulty breathing? Rana emerged from the jar and said that he did not, it was just that it was too hot inside. Tan Thien then punched a few more holes in the bottom of the jar for ventilation, and he would wait until tomorrow morning to deal with the rest. The next morning, Tan Thien's group pushed the cart carrying the jar, each wearing a mask. Tan Thien did not know if they would be asked to remove their masks. He remembered that many Mayans in the city wore masks as an ornament. The guards checked and found no problems, and then told Tan Thien that he must follow them closely when he entered, and not to wander around. When the guards saw the wheels, they realized how useful the circle was, because it made pushing the cart very easy. Tan Thien walked in and looked around. He saw that the residences of the priest and the king were more than 10 meters wide, and it was impossible to jump over them in the usual way. They were also more solid, not like the decorative rivers outside. Suddenly, Tan Thien saw a fish jump up. The man-eating fish is distributed in the Amazon River in South America. It is a kind of tigerfish. According to its habits, it is divided into omnivorous and cannibalistic types. 
Because of its sharp jaws and hunting in groups, it has become one of the species with a very bad reputation. In particular, cannibalistic fish can live in groups or alone. The gregarious species are small in size but very aggressive. But those that live independently are very large, but their personality is a bit humble, and they usually do not actively attack larger animals. Tan Thien was also afraid when he saw this. My goodness, if I had fallen down here, there would probably be no bones left. Fortunately, I did not sneak in, or I would be walking slowly now. When he approached the pyramid, Tan Thien saw that at first it looked big from the outside, but he did not feel much. Now that he was close, he could see how magnificent it was. How many years would it take to build something like this? There were people coming and going inside, but it was not like a normal pyramid. Only priests and people in charge were allowed to come and go. The pyramid in front of him really amazed Tan Thien. Compared to other pyramids, this pyramid is like a skyscraper, like a child compared to an adult. For a moment, Tan Thien was curious about the pyramid, so he spent a little hot cocoa and got some information from the soldiers. But the soldiers were not high ranking and only knew some general information about the pyramid. According to the soldiers, the pyramid can be divided into three architectural layers. The first layer is where the slaves, servants, and soldiers live. The second layer is where the nobles live, and the third layer is where the priests and the king live. Only the priests are allowed to enter and leave the temple area freely. Even the king must have the permission of the priest to enter. Tan Thien's group was quickly taken to the second floor by the soldiers. In front of them was a long, intersecting corridor, and at the end of the road were stone rooms connected to each other. Following the soldiers around several times, they finally arrived at a place that could be considered a kitchen. When they arrived, the soldiers told Tan Thien's group to get ready, and they would come to get the hot cocoa in an hour. Tan Thien did not expect there to be guards here, so he could not go and investigate. Fortunately he had made preparations last night, but first he would make hot cocoa. When the fire was lit in the stove, so Lam saw that all the smoke was sucked away. It's amazing. Tan Thien explained to her that this is called a fume hood. When smoke enters it, because the gas density is small, it tends to rise, which will create pressure at the entrance of the fume hood, which is the suction force. In this way, the smoke generated in the stove will be continuously sucked away, and at the same time, suction force will be continuously generated. Although this fume hood is simple to say, and the method of making it is also simple, but to understand the principle behind it is extremely difficult. The soldiers on guard heard a cough in the kitchen, and one of them pulled the curtain and went in to ask what was going on. Why is it burning? So Lam said that the firewood suddenly went out, and the soldiers were also choked by the smoke, so they shouted to put out the fire quickly, and quickly cleaned up. Taking advantage of the chaos, Tan Thien slipped out. A soldier saw Rana and found it strange. Why is this person a little taller? Rana was worried about being exposed, but the parrot flew out and flew out, and the soldiers saw it and shouted, your bird is flying away. So Lam said it was okay, it would come back by itself later. Tan Thien hid outside the corner of the wall with the parrot. He saw that the soldiers did not notice the change at all. He only had an hour, so he had to act quickly. The glowing ring opened up the arrow, and Tan Thien ran quickly in the direction it pointed. He saw that the indicator light was getting stronger and stronger, and he must have arrived. There were people laughing and talking in the corridor, but fortunately he avoided them in time. He suddenly heard a loud voice, so he went closer to see what was going on, and saw a group of people taking papaya leaves. Now he knew why there were so few people in such a big place. It turned out that they were all in this room taking papaya leaves. But that's good too, so he could get in more easily. The ring guided him in different directions. Han Thien came to a wall, but he didn't understand, did he have to go through it? A moment later, the parrot flew to the front of the kitchen, and when it flew back, the smoke rose again. And the two soldiers went in again, shouting, what's going on again? What are you guys doing? Tan Thien quickly went back and changed places with Rana. So Lam and Tan Thien laughed and apologized to the soldiers. The soldiers turned around and said in exasperation, it's best not to have any more trouble. You'll be dead if you miss the time. Tan Thien laughed and said, don't worry, there won't be any more. He regretted that he had not yet harvested anything. At this time, Tan Thien was extremely depressed. The reason was not because of him, but because after he met the wall, the ring seemed to have malfunctioned, constantly pointing to the original wall. Tan Thien didn't pay attention, it's like a triple A open world game. When doing tasks, although there are instructions, the goal and the player are in a straight line. Therefore, in the situation where there is a clear guide, some players climb mountains and cross mountains and follow the signs. So there are some situations like a high mountain that can't be climbed, or a wall blocking the way. 
But Tan Thien thought that this wall was just an obstacle between him and the task. When he directly crossed the wall, the problem could be solved. When he first discovered the ring, it kept pointing to the wall. Tan Thien changed direction several times, but finally found that the target point was not the wall, but the area surrounded by the wall. This judgment scared Tan Thien, but after calming down, Tan Thien decided that it was not an unsolvable problem. As long as the wall was broken, everything would be clear. But the most important thing at the moment was to finish the hot cocoa. Tan Thien had not been back for long when the Mayans took away the hot cocoa, which disappointed Tan Thien because he wanted to meet the priest to spy on him and see if he was a Mayan. If not, see if you can pull it into the club. But unfortunately there are too many things going on right now. This is not important, so it can only be put on hold for the time being. Troubled by the problem of the ring, Tan Thien thought about trying it again, but he was afraid that the Mayans would not know when they would return, so he had to give up. The result proved that Tan Thien's choice was correct. The Mayans didn't take long to bring back the cocoa, and they brought back news. The priest was very happy after eating and wanted to give a reward. As for the reward, it was as the soldiers had said before. So Tan Thien chose the slave reward. Tan Thien's group was leaving on the stairs when he suddenly saw the straw man who had won the ball game. The soldier knew that this was the winner of the sacred ball game, so he was not easy to provoke. The straw man wanted to meet the priest to ask for something. There were many people in the slave prison. The soldier told Tan Thien that he could choose two people to take away. Or if he didn't like them, he could exchange them for 500 cocoa beans. Tan Thien just noticed that the reward didn't say how many people he could get. He asked the soldiers if the slaves here could be bought. The soldier said yes, men for 200 cocoa beans, women 100 beans, and children 80 beans. Tan Thien looked into the prison and saw that more than half of the people had green paint on them. He didn't expect there to be so many sacrifices. Suddenly the parrot flew away and said, here, it flew over and landed on a man's hand. Everyone around was surprised to see the parrot, so Lam was overjoyed to see his tribesmen outside. The soldier asked Tan Thien if he wanted to buy all these people, and he said yes. When he went in, he saw that the children wanted to buy them back too. Although he couldn't bear to see so many people die like this, looking at the current situation, he could only do so much. Suddenly, the ring on Tan Thien's hand lit up and shot a beam of light into the wall, and a voice rang out. Identity confirmed, visitation permitted, the door is opening. The soldier didn't know what this voice was. The ground shook violently and everyone wondered what was going on. Some people said that this was the sound of the gods. Tan Thien stood in front of the wall and thought, could the experiment be right behind the wall? Why is there such a change? He hasn't had time to prepare. The soldier stabbed him with a spear and said, die, evil god. He quickly dodged, wondering why he had become an evil god. Could it be because of the strange phenomenon of the ring? In that case, he didn't need to be polite anymore and attacked the soldier. The soldiers shouted that his group were evil spirits and messengers and had to be killed. Everyone told Tan Thien that all the soldiers were killing their way here. Tan Thien saw that they had to leave quickly or they would all be killed. Tan Thien told So Lam to take her tribesmen away quickly. Fortunately, he had prepared before coming here. He took out a smoke bomb. Tan Thien threw out the smoke bomb, and told Qatar and Rana to quickly open all the surrounding cells. Because many people rushing out would hinder the guards and they could also escape and avoid becoming sacrifices. Everyone started to flee. The soldiers shouted to stop the sacrifices from escaping. The system kept reporting that the door opening had failed. Restarting. The priest was sitting on a chair, and the straw man was kneeling below him. When he heard this sound, he wondered if that place was starting up. But where does the energy come from? This is impossible. The straw man thought that this sound was the voice of the gods. A soldier ran in and reported bad news. There's an evil god messenger. He went out to observe the situation and saw Tan Thien's group escaping. He saw the light in Tan Thien's hand and thought that some people had come here and his reign was coming to an end. Suddenly he saw Tan Thien's group's iron weapons and knew that they were not some people. But he didn't know why the door had started up. Had Tan Thien's group inherited something? He turned to the straw man kneeling there and ordered him to kill them all. His group was fleeing outside. Pakuma looked through the binoculars and saw what was going on and told Nick and Aruba that things were not going well. Tan Thien's group inside was surrounded and captured. Nick didn't think much, called Pakuma, and rushed forward with his saber. The two rushed to the door and were told to stop by the guards. Pakuma shot one and killed one. Nick slashed one. Tan Thien rushed in and slashed one, but the parrot shouted to the left. He turned his head and saw a soldier attacking one of So Lam's tribesmen. He dodged and punched the other man down. Tan Thien saw that the parrot was very good and had a sense of teamwork. Qatar shouted to Tan Thien, right. The straw man slid behind him. 
Tan Thien dodged it. He saw that this man was too fast. He took his sword and stabbed the straw man, but nothing happened. Katar saw that something was wrong and jumped in to slash him, but the straw man jumped out of the way. Tan Thien didn't know what had just happened. He had stabbed him, but it didn't feel like he had hit anything, as if the inside of the pile of straw was empty. But the important thing now was to get out quickly. If he waited, more soldiers would come to help, and it would be more difficult to get out. Just then, Nick and Pakuma ran across the bridge to help Tan Thien. Tan Thien was glad that he had told Nick and the others to stay outside before. Now they just needed to regroup. Relying on their superior weapons, it shouldn't be difficult to get out. Katar was fighting the straw man. He thought that it would be better to have a long spear now. He was not used to using a long saber. The straw man saw Tan Thien and So Lam running out and turned to look. Katar jumped up and slashed him, saying, How dare you be distracted? The straw man pulled his hand back and suddenly stabbed out a spear hidden in the straw. Katar dodged it. He didn't expect this man to have a weapon hidden on him. The straw man attacked Katar and then ran away. He chased after Tan Thien. Katar shouted to Tan Thien to be careful. He was running towards him. He threw a punch. Tan Thien raised his saber to block it, but the force was too strong. Rana came over and asked Tan Thien if he was okay, and he said he was okay. He told Rana not to worry about him, and that he and Katar would deal with the straw man. He had to stop this man. As long as Rana could leave safely, with his and Katar's strength, even if they couldn't defeat him, they could escape. At this moment, Aya was lying sick in bed in the temple. She woke up to the noise and asked her brother why it was so noisy outside. What was going on? She realized that her brother was not there. She went out of the house and saw the soldiers running away. On the bridge, Rana was leading people to meet Nick and Pakuma. Nick saw Rana and asked where Tan Thien and Katar were. Rana said that Tan Thien had told her to go ahead and that they would follow. Nick immediately ran to help Tan Thien, but Rana called Nick back and said to her, Did she not believe Tan Thien? In the city, Katar and Tan Thien were fighting fiercely with the straw man. After fighting with this man for a long time, Tan Thien understood why he had not been able to hit him with his saber. His heavy straw coat was like a suit of armor, helping his body to conceal its condition. The straw coat protected him and blinded his enemies, like the cloth of a bullfighter. But no matter how well he hid, his body could not leave this straw coat. Just attack around it. If the straw coat sinks in, he won't be able to hide anymore. Tan Thien activated his cheetah talent and slid behind him, slashing him with a saber. But he jumped back two steps and escaped. Tan Thien felt like he had met a ghost. Even though he was wearing such a heavy straw coat, his movements were still as flexible as ever. If he ran now, he could escape with his agility, but Katar would be surrounded. The straw man had been injured on his arm and he pulled out his weapon. Tan Thien said, let's go together. Don't hold back. We have to cut off his weapon. He had to deal with this man quickly. If the soldiers who had gone to capture Nick's group came back, he and Katar would be like turtles in a jar, sure to be caught. Tan Thien and Katar rushed forward, attacking from two sides. Tan Thien slashed the spearhead with his saber, and he punched him away. Katar jumped in and slashed him. The two sides faced each other. Tan Thien saw that this man was stronger than he had imagined. If they kept fighting like this, they would be surrounded before they could decide the winner. They had to fight quickly and win quickly. Suddenly, someone asked, Brother, what are you doing? Tan Thien turned around and saw Aya. The straw man was also startled. Aya was standing in the doorway, looking very tired. When Tan Thien heard Aya call the straw man brother, he wondered if the straw man was Mong Ho. When Aya came out, the straw man panicked. Aya remembered that the priest had said that if she sacrificed Tan Thien's group, the gods would bless her and she would be cured of her illness. She said that he had once said that no matter what, he would not harm his friends. She didn't have such a bad brother. Katar now realized that it was Mong Ho. Tan Thien laughed and said, There was no one else who would let a Ya call him brother. No wonder he thought the straw coat looked familiar. It turned out to be Mong Ho's. But compared to staying here, they should take this opportunity to run. The two were about to leave when Mong Ho stopped them. Before they could figure out what was going on, Mong Ho ran off, startling them. Mong Ho rushed forward and hit a soldier on the head with his spear. He took off his hat and apologized to Tan Thien, crying. Mong Ho didn't want to hurt Tan Thien, but he had no choice. A yaw had fainted from exhaustion. The priest was furious when he saw Mong Ho betray him and smashed a bowl. He announced that whoever could kill the evil god and Mong Ho would become his personal attendant. He wanted everyone to die. He would not let anyone survive outside. Three soldiers rushed forward and were beaten. Mong 
Zheng Ho single-handedly defeated them, knocking down any soldier who dared to approach. Tan Thien saw this and knew that he had gone easy on him in Qatar before. Now this is Mong Ho's true strength. Mong Ho turned and told Tan Thien to rest assured. Even if he died, he would take his group away safely. Mong Ho felt that he was not qualified to be friends with everyone. Tan Thien said yes, they should leave here first and then figure out what to do next. Another soldier was defeated. Tan Thien's group retreated to the bridge. The soldiers saw that Tan Thien's group of three was too strong. Could it be that the evil god Appas had possessed them? No one could stop them. The three ran to the end of the bridge and saw that there were still a few soldiers blocking their way. They just needed to hold on a little longer and they would be able to cross the bridge and enter the forest. Then their advantage in numbers would be gone. Mong Ho knocked two soldiers off the bridge. The soldiers behind them shouted, not good. They want to run into the forest to the west. Stop them. The soldiers picked up wooden spears and aimed them at Tan Thien's group. A volley of spears flew towards them. Tan Thien shouted to everyone to be careful. Mong Ho saw this and grabbed his straw cloak, sweeping away all the spears. Tan Thien's group broke through the encirclement and escaped into the forest. The soldiers rushed into the forest and organized a search. Tan Thien, Qatar, and Mong Ho were running deep into the forest. Tan Thien saw that the rainforest with its many trees was not suitable for an army to enter together. The soldiers with their large numbers were slowed down. It was only a matter of time before they were cut off. They just didn't know where Nick's group was. Suddenly, Sa Diu's voice called out. Nick's group had escaped and were gathering in the forest. Everyone was bandaging and treating their wounds. So Lam told her husband about what had happened. If it hadn't been for Tan Thien, she would not have had the chance to see her husband and the others in the tribe again. Tan Thien's group had arrived. He saw that everyone was safe and sound. After walking for a while, Mong Ho knelt down. Tan Thien anxiously asked Mong Ho if he was okay. Mong Ho said he was fine. This was the punishment from the gods for betraying his friends. In order to break out of the encirclement, Mong Ho had used his body as a shield, single-handedly creating an escape route for everyone. Looking at Mong Ho's body covered in wounds, it seemed that he had reached his limit. A Ya had also woken up by now. He asked Mong Ho if he had finished what he had promised her. Mong Ho said that he had. He had brought everyone to safety. Tan Thien saw that a Ya's face was pale. Her body was sweating. Was she suffering from an infectious disease? He anxiously asked Mong Ho when a Ya's condition had started. Try to tell me in detail. Maybe a Ya can still be saved. I see that she has developed jaundice. It may be in the late stages of the disease. If we can determine exactly what disease it is in the Wilderness Emergency Encyclopedia, there may be a way to treat it. Mong Ho was overjoyed when he heard this. He asked if it was true. What did Tan Thien need him to do? Did he need to make a sacrifice? He could sacrifice himself. Tan Thien told Mong Ho to calm down. He just needed him to answer a few questions. Mong Ho took a deep breath to calm himself down and then recounted a Ya's strange symptoms from a few months ago. At first, she felt very cold all over, and even lighting a fire next to her could not dispel it. Sometimes her body was extremely hot and her breath was hot. These two conditions alternated, each lasting about an hour, but most of the time she was normal. Tan Thien pondered. Hot and cold alternating, fear of cold and fear of heat, cyclical. There were too many people with this kind of condition, and there was basically no way to determine what disease they had. Mong Ho thought that a Ya had offended the gods and that the gods had sent mosquitoes to attack her, causing her to become like this. Tan Thien asked Mong Ho, mosquito bites? He said that a Ya developed this condition after being bitten by mosquitoes, right? Mong Ho said yes, they were very large mosquitoes. Tan Thien finally understood the problem. So that was it. Damn the gods. It's malaria. It's just malaria. This is not a punishment from the gods, it's a disease. Mong Ho asked Tan Thien if he knew how to treat this disease now that he knew what it was. He begged Tan Thien to save a Ya. Tan Thien searched through the Wilderness Emergency Encyclopedia for a way to treat malaria. This disease is an infectious disease caused by the black modium insect, mainly caused by the bite of the Anopheles mosquito. There are four types of black modium that parasitize the human body. Plasmodium vivas, Plasmodium malari, Plasmodium fansiparum, and Plasmodium oval. The diagnosis of the disease is divided into two stages, the cold stage, in which the whole body is cold and shivering, lasting from half an hour to two hours. The hot stage, in which after the cold stage, the person feels extremely hot for 45 hours. Plasmodium occurs every other day. If two types are infected at the same time, it occurs once a day. Plasmodium malari occurs every three days. If two types are infected at the same time, it occurs once a day. 
Plasmodium fanciparum has unclear symptoms. Severe symptoms can include high fever that does not go down, coma, vomiting, diarrhea with red or black stools, shock, etc. Treatment. 1. is Acupuncture at the new acupoints. Acupuncture at the Dazui and Jianchu acupoints to treat yang deficiency 1 to 2 hours before the onset of the disease. Strong stimulation method. If it does not work, add Hegu and Taodao acupoints. 2. is Herbal medicine. 1 leaf of Changshan 1 hectogram boiled with water to drink, or 3 coins of Changshan root taken 2 hours before the onset of the disease. Method 2 to 4 HG fresh Sam vegetables. Boiled twice. Drink once 2 to 3 hours before the onset of the disease. Method 3 to 1 HG of the whole plant of Renchenhao boiled with water to drink 2 to 3 hours before the onset of the disease. Method 4. Changshan called roasted wine 2 hectograms, betel nut 1 hectogram, and tansao 1 hectogram, all ground into a fine powder. Each time add 3 coins of water to make a bowl, cook until half a bowl is left, and drink 2 hours before the onset of the disease. 3 Anti-Ghost Medicines, 1 Treatment. During the onset of the disease, take the prescribed medicine for 5 days. Take an additional organ for the first 3 days. Method 2. Treatment during the resting period is based on the source of infection. Anyone who has been infected for two years, except for those with severe conditions, should stop taking the medicine during the resting period of the disease. Take the prescription for five days and at the same time take perine edamin. Method 3. If the above treatments cannot be used, you can just use the original quinine or quina green. Method 4. For patients who are too sick to drink, quina green 0.1 to 0.2 grams can be injected every 8 to 12 hours until they can drink and switch to oral medication. After reading everything, Tan Thien asked Mong Ho to lift a ya up. He had nothing in his hands now, so he could only try to press the acupoints to see if it would work. If he could just relieve some of her symptoms, he could save some time looking for medicine. Tan Thien began to circulate his internal energy, using the yang finger to press several points on her back, then her arms and hands. A ya had regained some consciousness. Mong Ho asked if that was enough. Tan Thien said of course not. Did he think he was the first lamp grandmaster with boundless internal energy? Pressing a few points would not cure her. This would only relieve the pain, Tanthine said. To cure a Yaz disease, he needed specific medicine. A few minutes later, Tanthine opened the map and found the locations of several medicinal plants, but the problem was that it was basically impossible to collect all of them. Moreover, even if he had the medicines, the distance was too far to travel in a few days. There were no herbs, and the others were even more impossible. Suddenly, Tan Thien remembered the combination of Chinese and Western medicine. He remembered that he had previously discovered that the quinine used to treat malaria came from the bark of the cana tree. And cana was found in the Andes Mountains, and part of the Andes was in the Amazon rainforest. If he took the rainforest as the center, he would definitely find cana. He looked at the map on the ring and saw cana. Tan Thien told Rana that the cana tree was not far from their camp. Aya's condition was urgent, so they set off day and night to return quickly. Everyone had to be careful to hide. Remember to arrange for someone to stand guard at night. Then Tan Thien and Qatar White Eye set off to find the medicine. He estimated that it would take half a day to get to the medicinal plant. And if all went well, they could return tomorrow. Change scene to the temple. The priest also had a ring. He opened the map and laughed, saying, go ahead. No matter where you run, you won't be able to escape his sight. After a while, he found the location of Tan Thien's and Nick's groups. Tan Thien held a flashlight at night and tried to move as quickly as possible to the location of the medicinal plant. Suddenly, a tree branch blocked their way. Qatar and Tan Thien dodged it in time. He looked back and saw that it was too dangerous. At that speed, if he was hit, his nose might collapse. Tan Thien said to Qatar, Aya's condition is serious. We can't delay any longer. We have to get closer. The rainforest at night was pitch black. You couldn't see your fingers in front of your face. Even with a flashlight, you could only see a small area a few meters away. You had no idea what you would bump into next. Tan Thien looked at the map and saw that the medicinal plant was still some distance away. Once they crossed the river, it would only be about a two-hour walk. White Eye jumped into the river to cross, but suddenly he screamed. Seeing that White Eye was in great pain, Tan Thien rushed over anxiously. As soon as he stepped into the water, Tan Thien suffered the same fate as White Eye. Qatar was so frightened that he wanted to run over to Tan Thien. But Tan Thien said, be careful of the river. Don't step into the water. Qatar used his spear to hook Tan Thien's backpack and pull him back to shore. 
Tan Thien didn't know what was in the river. It was late at night, and Tan Thien's group rested by the river for the time being. Katar saw that the flashlight was no longer working and asked, is the artifact broken? Tan Thien said it probably was. That's really bad luck. When you're unlucky, even drinking water gets stuck in your teeth. Katar said that they would have to use torches to continue on. Tan Thien said no need. If the flashlight was broken, he could make another one. The little bit of light from the torch would only shine on the person holding it, not on the others. But walking in the dark, in the densest part of the rainforest, you definitely needed to have a wide field of vision. The carbide lamp was a type of general lighting lamp divided into two layers, upper and lower, with the upper layer containing water and the lower layer containing carbide. The principle was to burn the acetylene produced by the reaction of these two substances in order to achieve the purpose of lighting. In terms of structure, it was not considered a product of science and technology. After gathering all the tools, Tan Thien began to build it. Time was of the essence. Tan Thien didn't pay much attention to details. He directly cut the bamboo tube holding the water in two, separating it into one part to hold water and one part to hold carbide. Tan Thien told Qatar to knead some mud and make it into a ceramic to separate the two bamboo tubes. Very quickly, Tan Thien and the others had made the necessary items. However, before assembling them, they still needed to test the water absorption rate of the carbide, because acetylene was a flammable and explosive gas. If the rate of acetylene production in the carbide lamp far exceeded the rate of combustion, then over time the carbide container would fill with acetylene and could easily explode if not handled carefully. It took Tan Thien nearly two hours to assemble the carbide lamp. Tan Thien found that although a lampshade had been added, it was still affected by the wind. With a reflector cup, the light emitted would all go straight and would not affect the brightness. The two men used a large tree trunk to build a bridge across the river and then crossed it. To Tan Thien's surprise, the brightness of the carbide lamp was even better than that of the flashlight. The white light emitted when the acetylene was burned was even brighter than the yellow light. Qatar asked Tan Thien if the fish here were as dangerous as he said, and Tan Thien said they were very dangerous. It could kill a large fish like the walrus they had hunted before, which showed how dangerous it was. Electric eels are a species of fish in the bare-backed knife fish family in South America. They can emit electricity to shock their enemies and to hunt for prey, and are the most powerful freshwater electric fish. The voltage they emit can reach 300 to 800 volts, which is why they are called high voltage currents in the water. They are mainly distributed in the Amazon region of the Americas, and usually live in ponds or dirty water. They are very large and usually go out to hunt at night, but humans have no natural enemies. Fortunately, White Eye did not directly engage with the electric eel at that time and was only shocked a little. Otherwise, he would have been stiff by now. It would probably take several hours for him to recover his mobility. Next day, Tan Thien's group arrived at the place where the medicinal plant was. The cana tree is also known as the Queen and Cana tree. Sanchona tree, Sanchona group 7A. The tree is usually 3 to 6 meters high, and the tallest can reach 25 meters. The bark is dark brown, slightly thin, and has cracks like a farm. It originated in the Andes Mountains. The bark and root bark are important sources of quinine and quinidine. Qatar asked Tan Thien if he needed the bark of this tree. Tan Thien said yes, and if possible, he would take a few more branches. Tan Thien had taken out all his experimental equipment because he needed to be quick as time was running out. Tan Thien thought that quinine could be divided into two types. One was quinine sulfuric acid and the other was quinine hydrochloric acid, which was used for manufacturing. Since there were no syringes at the moment, only quinine sulfuric acid could be made. The way to make quinine sulfuric acid was to mix the bark of the cinchona tree with sololime, then extract it with kerosene, combine it, and then extract the liquid. After filtering, the extract was taken with dilute sulfuric acid. After waiting for the crystallization to complete, it would become quinine sulfuric acid. The bark of the cana tree plus sololime plus kerosene plus sulfuric acid would become quinine sololime. By 70 calcium oxide plus 20 water plus 3 sodium hydroxide plus 1 potassium hydroxide. Of all the things Tan Thien needed, the cana bark that Qatar was collecting, the sololime, and the sulfuric acid had been prepared in advance. Now only kerosene was left. But kerosene was a light oil product, and it was impossible to make medicine here. But the function of kerosene was only as an extract, so Tan Thien could use another method. To replace the medium extract with alpha acetus. But in the things needed to make acetus, Tan Thien still lacked acetic acid. So the first step was to make acetic acid. Fortunately, the method to make acetic acid was not difficult. All you had to do was add slaked lime to water until the temperature dropped below 16 degrees Celsius and above 0 degrees Celsius. Cooling the sour liquid, 
the dry acetic acid would separate out, giving you acetic acid. Next, take from three bottles in the composition of two ethanol, three parts concentrated sulfuric acid, and two parts acetic acid to make eta acetus. Then add sulfuric acid to the ethanol and shake gently. Finally, add acetic acid and then heat to obtain eta acid. Now that everything was ready, tanthene could start making quinine. The process of making quinine was to first dry the cinchona bark and then crush it to remove the contents. But now time was pressing and he couldn't be meticulous. He could only use the simplest and crudest method to deal with it. Then pour the chemicals into the cana bark and use the eta acid water mixture. Tan Thien began to pour in the calcium acid, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and edicitis, then used the extract of sulfuric acid, and finally left it to concentrate and crystallize. Finally, Tan Thien finished making the quinine. Anya had the medicine. On Nick's side, Tiger Claw was holding Anya and whispering to her to hold on. Tan Thien was about to return. Nick suddenly shouted that Tan Thien's group was back. Pakuma took a look through the binoculars and saw that it didn't seem to be Tan Thien's group. He felt that there were a lot of people. On this side, Tan Thien and Qatar were running like dogs chasing their tails because they were worried about Anya's condition. Hoping to get back in time, the two saw a torch ahead and Qatar said it looked like they had arrived. But when they got closer, it was not Nick's group but soldiers from the city. The group of soldiers also spotted Tan Thien and Qatar. Qatar saw that there were only six people, so they could be taken out. Tan Thien said to take them all out and not to reveal their position. The group of soldiers ran up to take the heads of the two brothers when suddenly someone swooped down from the tree and knocked out two of them. Qatar said that it was the tribe of So Lam. Tan Thien thought it seemed to be Hei Wu. The two of them rushed up and took care of the remaining four, and then the three of them ran away together. Qatar found that this parrot talked incessantly and was even noisier than Aruba. On the way, Hei Wu recounted what had happened when Tan Thien had not yet returned. About three hours ago, the soldiers in the city suddenly surrounded the base area. Three hours ago, Pakuma observed that it was not Tan Thien's group returning, but soldiers from the city. Aruba panicked and said that Tan Thien was not here now, so what should they do? Rana told Aruba to take everyone to Nick first. Pakuma and Rana would stay and use smoke bombs to buy time. Tiger Claw and Hei Wu also wanted to stay. Pakuma said that the soldiers had not yet discovered their location, so there was still time to retreat. Before leaving, Hei Wu was worried that Tan Thien's group would not be able to find Nick's group and would also encounter the soldiers, so he stayed behind to wait for the two to return. Tan Thien thought that because Sa Dai was with the group that could look at the sun without being dazzled at night, he did not take it with him. Fortunately, Hei Wu had come to their aid, otherwise it would have taken a lot of effort to deal with those people. But Tan Thien didn't understand that even though they had run deep into the forest, the soldiers were still able to quickly find their resting place. Fortunately Nick had led everyone to escape. Pakuma was sitting in a tree watching when he saw that Tan Thien's group had returned. Tiger Claw said happily that Anya and the others had returned. Tan Thien gave Anya the medicine. Next, it would depend on Anya's will. If she was quick, she would wake up tomorrow. Tan Thien had done his best. He hoped the medicine would work. Tiger Claw thanked him profusely. Tan Thien told everyone to put out the fire. Although it was a bit inconvenient, the fire could easily reveal their location at night. It could only rest for the time being. Tan Thien leaned against the base of a tree and sat down to rest. Tan Thien had not had a rest since yesterday. He had been awake for two nights in a row. He was too tired. Suddenly, the ring on his hand lit up. He didn't know what was happening. Suddenly, the ring emitted a woman's voice calling out the name Tu Jung Feng, and then the ring flashed continuously. Tan Thien didn't know what was going on. This had never happened before, and the voice. Suddenly, the ring displayed a message. Note, the translation service is requesting information. Tan Thien found this note from Tu Bat Ba very strange. The information board appeared, warning that the system had been hacked, and then a figure appeared, a girl in a white coat. Everyone was surprised that a person had appeared in the ring. The girl only now noticed and looked around as if looking for something. She looked at Tan Thien and saw that it was not Tu Jung Feng. And then the girl asked Tan Thien's group who they were and where the ring came from. Tu Jung Feng and Huang Shalan were dead at the base of some tree. Tan Thien thought this woman was really beautiful, also very domineering. She wanted to be the big sister as soon as she appeared. He couldn't be weak, or he would be led by the nose again and be taken advantage of. He said that before answering the question, she should introduce herself first. That was basic courtesy. She stood looking at Tan Thien for a while and then said, looking at Tan Thien's clothes, she guessed that he came from the 20th century, so what she said next he might not be able to understand. But she didn't want to be interrupted while she was talking. Even if there was something, she wanted to wait until she had finished speaking before saying it. 
Only then would he understand the current situation. Tan Thien smiled and said that she could rest assured, he would not interrupt. Tan Thien was also surprised that she was so stubborn but so easy to follow. She introduced herself as Huang Yishu, the director of the D3 laboratory. She also didn't know what Tan Thien's group's relationship with Tu Zheng Feng was, where the ring had been found, so she would start from the beginning. Huang Yishu suddenly appeared. Tan Thien had not expected it at all, but for Tan Thien it was also a good thing. Not to mention anything else, but based on Huang Yishu's identity, from her Tan Thien could learn the specific location of the laboratory without having to rely on the ring's guidance and stubbornly search. But Tan Thien also understood that now was not the time to ask. In keeping with his promise from earlier, he remained silent and listened carefully to Huang Yishu's words. What Huang Yishu said was not long. But the information was so shocking that Tan Thien could not calm down for a while. After Huang Yishu had finished speaking, Tan Thien also answered her question and also answered the story about Tu Zheng Feng and Zhang Shalan. The conversation between Tan Thien and Huang Yishu was not hidden. Everyone around could hear it. But hearing was one thing, understanding was another. Apart from a few people like Nick, who had been explained by Tan Thien, who understood a little, the others were all confused. Rana suddenly saw the torch and reported it to Tan Thien. The soldiers were chasing again. Tan Thien was worried that he had met a ghost. It was so dark, yet these people had found them so quickly. He had been told by Huang Yishu that the priest also had a ring in his hand. It was connected to the laboratory and could find any location in Area D3, so it was useless for his group to hide anywhere. But now that Huang Yishu had awakened, she had done something. And as long as his group escaped this time, the priest would not be able to find them again. The soldiers had found the place where Tan Thien's group had just rested. And when they checked, they found that the fire was still warm. Tan Thien's group had not been gone long. They must have seen the light of the fire and fled in a hurry. The soldiers laughed and joked with each other, saying that the prey in the cage kept running and running until they were exhausted, and that was when it was most exciting. Not far away, Tan Thien's group was hiding and saw that the soldiers had finally left. Huang Yishu said that her bait had worked. The priest was laughing happily because he thought that Tan Thien's group was scared and had scattered to escape. Tan Thien wondered why they didn't just take back the power of the ring. Why bother with bait? Huang Yishu asked Tan Thien if he wanted to challenge the high difficulty level. Tan Thien realized that that was how it was. These baits were used to lure the tiger away from the mountain and draw all the soldiers out of the city. Had this been planned after she had awakened? Could she have guessed all the details? She was really amazing. Huang Yishu began to disappear, saying, that was all for today, and for the rest, they should go to the laboratory themselves. Tan Thien immediately said that this was not his mission. This was her territory. Huang Yishu said no, if he was afraid, he didn't need to go, and then she disappeared. Tan Thien sighed. There was too much news. When would he have time to sort it all out? Turning around, he saw a group of people looking at him, and he said, what are you all looking at me for? The whole group rushed up to ask if he was the divine light, the great goddess? Was he the messenger of the gods? Tiger Claw wanted to serve Tan Thien, and the others also wanted to follow him. Tan Thien didn't know how to explain. He would just make up some excuses to get through this. But for the Mayans, Huang Yishu was also considered their god. Huang Yishu's appearance, for Su Lin and her people, who had never seen any scientific or technological capabilities, had indeed brought great excitement. It took Tan Thien nearly an hour to calm them down. It was only then that Tan Thien began to think back to what Huang Yishu had said. Tan Thien had summarized four useful points in the current situation. Firstly, the D3 laboratory was right in the temple where the priest lived. Secondly, the D3 laboratory could open a time channel to send people back to their original time and space. Thirdly, for some reason, Huang Yishu could not appear before reaching the D3 laboratory. Fourthly, the priest now seemed to have a gene-altering drug similar to the serum of the senior soldiers. After summarizing everything, things were much clearer to Tan Thien. He quickly determined what to do next. He had to find a way to enter the D3 laboratory. But before he took action, he still had to get some sleep. After all, he hadn't had a good night's sleep in the past two days. And both his body and mind had reached their limits. Tan Thien slept for a whole day and night, and did not wake up until the afternoon of the next day. Fortunately, Huang Yishu had led the soldiers away, otherwise Tan Thien would not have dared to sleep so long. And he did not dare to light a fire. Tan Thien drew a simple map. When he was in the city-state, he remembered that when he entered and exited, apart from the bridge, there were almost no guards in other places. Except for the bridge, all other roads were the same. Moreover, the west side was covered by dense forest, 
so it was a little safer to go that way. After they finished eating, it would probably be dark. They could use the cover of night to enter the city and listen for information about the temple, which would be helpful for their future plans. Inside the city, the soldiers were arresting people around the city. Nick saw that the guards inside were getting tighter. Qatar said that it must be due to the influence of Tan Thien's group's escape. Tan Thien saw that it was just as Huang Yishu had said. The priest had guessed that Tan Thien's target was the laboratory, so he had increased his defenses. While the soldiers were driving people out of the city and not allowing them to spend the night in the city, Tan Thien's group was hiding and trying to enter. His group had already entered. Nick said that there was light over there. The whole group hid in a place and looked through the pyramids. Qatar saw that there was no one around. Tan Thien explained that the boy had said the day before that this was where the evil god had cursed, so the people in the city would not normally come here. The group climbed to the top of a pyramid. Tan Thien began to observe and saw that on one side there were bright lights and on the other side it was dark and gloomy. Groups of soldiers with torches patrolled everywhere. Tan Thien used binoculars to observe. He did not expect there to be so many soldiers in the temple. If Huang Yishu had not lured some of them away, his group would not have had a chance to sneak in. From the current situation, the temple had a large number of troops. In addition to guarding the bridge, there were also groups patrolling around the temple, while other places were guarded by only a few soldiers, especially the two bridges in the middle, which had even more open spaces. Perhaps the priest thought that it would be difficult to climb such a high wall, not to mention that there were piranhas below. He probably thought that no one would enter the city that way, so he had relaxed his guard. It was possible to climb up the wall and sneak into the temple. Tan Thien told Qatar and Nick to go and make a wooden raft. A while later, the wooden raft was finished and put into the water. The whole group was using ropes to climb down. Tan Thien saw that the water was not flowing fast, and with the cover of night, it should not be a big problem to get to the other side by wooden raft. The only problem was climbing up. The situation on the other side was unclear. If they climbed up rashly, they might be in danger, so they needed to investigate first to find a suitable route. Had to be clarified before the plan to sneak in could be carried out. But suddenly the wooden raft made a noise. Everyone wondered what was going on. What was this sound? There was something under the wooden raft. Suddenly the head of a piranha pierced through the raft. The three of them were stunned, and in a moment the wooden raft was in pieces. It was really too scary. Tan Thien told Qatar and Nick that they should go back now, that was enough for today. He found that these fish were as scary as fire ants. He had not expected that they would be able to gnaw through the wooden raft. Tan Thien saw that it was not possible to cross the river by raft, and he had to think of another way. Tan Thien opened the map on his ring and searched for the rubber tree. He had seen the shadow of the rubber tree during the Holy Bridge battle. So he had guessed that there were rubber trees in the D3 area, but he had not expected there to be so many. From his current position, it was not far away, so it should be easy to find. It was just that collecting the natural coagulant solution required a lot of manpower and time. He wondered how many people could take action now. Tiger Claw was holding a yaw in his arms when she suddenly woke up and told Tiger Claw that she was hungry, which startled Tiger Claw, who immediately shouted to Tan Thien that a yaw had woken up. Tiger Claw asked Tan Thien to check on a yaw and found that her fever had gone down. Perhaps the medicine had taken effect and there would be no more problems. But quinine still had to be used until all the toxins in the body had been cleared and there were no more problems. Tiger Claw was overjoyed to hear this and picked up a yaw, saying, Do you hear that? You're okay now. The most worrying thing was finally solved. Tan Thien could now rest assured and go to collect the natural coagulant from the rubber trees. A rubber tree is a large tree species in the plant family. Rubber is a large tree species that grows for many years in tropical forest areas. Up to 30 meters tall with a rich sap and is a typical tree species in the tropics with an economic lifespan of 30 to 45 years. The coagulated sap is an important raw material for industry, and most of it is produced by rubber trees. Aruba saw the rubber tree sap flowing out and laughed, telling Tan Thien to come and see. Tan Thien reminded him that it was the coagulated sap of the rubber tree. Although it looked like the milk tree, the two were different and should not be confused. This one could not be drunk. Everyone started to collect the rubber sap. Tan Thien told Tiger Claw that he did not need to come here, as there were already enough people here, and Tiger Claw should stay with a yaw. Tiger Claw felt that Tan Thien's business was also his business, and besides, a yaw had told Tiger Claw to come here to help. Tiger Claw asked Tan Thien what he wanted to collect so much of this for, 
did he want to make a holy bridge? Tan Thien said no, it was to catch fish, a species that was not afraid of crocodiles and was extremely dangerous. It could kill people. Qatar heard Tan Thien talk about the bastard fish that was not afraid of anyone and asked if it was an electric eel, and Tan Thien said yes. Electric eels can discharge up to 800 volts of electricity, and even humans can be electrocuted to death. If it was used as bait, even piranhas would be nothing. But if he wanted to catch it, he had to have rubber solution first. The main components of rubber are natural rubber and synthetic rubber. Natural rubber is from the rubber tree, synthetic rubber is a chemical compound. Both have their advantages and disadvantages, but from the current situation, it is impossible to make synthetic rubber. Only natural rubber can be made. Making natural rubber is relatively simple. Just add folic acid to the rubber solution. Tan Thien did not have folic acid at the moment, so he had to prepare it first. Fortunately, it was not difficult to prepare folic acid, just add oxalic acid to glycerone. Glycerone was prepared before, now only oxalic acid is missing. Tan Thien combined cane sugar with nitrous acid to obtain oxalic acid. Tan Thien saw that the glass flask was evaporating white, indicating that the reaction had begun. Oxalic acid mixed with many impurities could be obtained. He continued to do more steps because that way it was not pure but contained impurities. So he had to crystallize it again. Tan Thien saw that the color was pure, then continued to pour in a cup of saffron and then heated it up to precipitate the gas to obtain a solution of accessory acid. Tan Thien looked back and saw that there were not many people, and he wondered how much natural rubber could be collected. In the late afternoon, Tan Thien used the base of a tree to hold the collected rubber sap. He added folic acid and stirred it. Tiger Claw was curious and asked him what he was adding to it, and Tan Thien explained that it was folic acid, which had the effect of quickly concentrating natural rubber. Nick brought Tan Thien gloves made of animal skin. The two Qataris and Nick thought they could smell the folic acid, and Tan Thien said. They must have smelled it when they were attacked by the fire ants. Folic acid is also known as ant acid. Tan Thien dipped the animal skin gloves into the rubber sap solution. Normally, rubber gloves were made using rubber particles that were pressed together after they had solidified. Now this was the only way to do it, and the results would be seen during the day. The next morning, a rubber coat was born. Tiger Claw held the coat and thought the folic acid was amazing. It had coagulated the rubber overnight, which normally took two days. Qatar felt that this was similar to what was called plastic, and Tan Thien explained. From a scientific point of view, it could be said that rubber was actually a type of plastic, so it felt a bit similar to the touch. Tan Thien brought out a battery and put on gloves to test the insulation of the rubber gloves. Tan Thien felt no sensation, the rubber gloves were successfully made. The system appeared. Host has crafted an item, reward 3000 points. Everyone had reached the stream with the electric eels. Tan Thien grabbed one and dragged it over to Qatar. On the bank, Aruba and Pakuma watched the electric eel. Aruba thought it looked like an eel, and did not see anything dangerous about it. Pakuma said that if Tan Thien said it was dangerous, then it must have some dangerous point. Aruba thought that putting his hand in to touch it would be fine, but he got a shock that made his mouth go numb. Tan Thien said that this time it was not convenient to go to the temple with too many people, so Tan Thien would go with Qatar and Nick, while the others would stay outside and Rana would be in charge of the specific situation. When necessary, they would make some noise to attract the attention of the soldiers but had to ensure a safe retreat. Pakuma remembered to watch Aruba so that this madman would not do anything crazy again. Pakuma laughed and said that perhaps after this incident, he would not dare to do it again. Tan Thien reminded them, if they saw anything unusual in the temple, they should not pay attention to it and leave immediately. Nick asked if they did not need any backup. Tan Thien said no, it would probably be safe by then. Because when he talked to Huang D2 before, she said that when he entered it would be her territory, so he did not need to worry about anything. Beside the people who were discussing, Hei Wu was sitting behind a tree listening. So Lam asked him what was wrong, and he said that he was just a little distracted. Tan Thien came over and greeted everyone. So Lam was surprised when he heard that Tan Thien wanted to leave. He said that he had some things to do and if all went well, he would be back tonight and would not need to come back here again, so he came over to greet So Lam first. So Lam bowed and said that because of her previous oath, she would be his servant and only hoped that before he left, he would give her some time to say goodbye to her people. Tan Thien said that this trip was to help each other, so it was a draw, and she did not need to take it to heart. Tiger Claw also wanted to follow Tan Thien, 
Thinking that he might be able to reach the divine world, he said that Tiger Claw was being hunted by the city state, so he should not appear around the city, and it would be better to return to the tribe. Tan Thien saw the two stupid faces of the two men and thought he had said something wrong. The two gods turned around and said dejectedly that Tan Thien meant to abandon them. Tan Thien was helpless and wondered why it was abandonment? Did these two gods really not intend to return to their tribe? At this time, Hei Wu stepped forward and said, Perhaps Tan Thien still had a mission given to him by the divine, so he could not take them with him. Tan Thien said the same as Hei Wu. This was not abandonment. It was true that he was grateful for Hei Wu's help. Tan Thien did not announce anything about leaving. He just said a few words of greeting to So Lam. In any case, Tan Thien had witnessed the devotion and enthusiasm of So Lam's people. He was not sure if he could retreat safely if he said he was leaving. But Tan Thien did not leave immediately, but continued to rest until the afternoon before leaving. Although Tan Thien and So Lam were just acquaintances, they had been through a lot together over the past few days, which had made them friends. Tan Thien also felt a little sad, but Tan Thien probably did not know that this was not a real goodbye. As soon as their group left, Hei Wu told So Lam and Tiger Claw that Tan Thien's group would enter the city that night. When night fell, Tan Thien's group had entered the city. Nick's group was standing on the pyramid, observing. Tan Thien below had lowered the raft. Tan Thien was tying a bag and then handing it down to Qatar. Tan Thien slid down the rope and told Qatar to hurry up, perhaps the man-eating fish had already caught the scent of the two of them. Tan Thien suddenly gasped and looked over, a school of man-eating fish was rushing towards them. Tan Thien told Qatar that they were coming, hold on tight. The electric eels sensed the danger and began to discharge electricity to defend themselves. A whole section of the river was filled with electricity, causing everyone to float up to the surface of the water. Qatar was horrified. No wonder Tan Thien had to prepare so much before catching the electric eels. Fortunately Aruba did not see this scene, otherwise it would have been lucky to see her faint. Tan Thien gave Qatar the paddle and told him to hurry up and get over it. Qatar said that if the man-eating fish came back, he could shock them again. The two quickly paddled away in the raft. Tan Thien knew that electric eels needed time to recharge after discharging electricity, and the threat was not only from man-eating fish. He was afraid that this would attract other things. Tan Thien had thought that the fish here would be stunned by the electric eels, but he did not expect that quite a few of them would only be temporarily paralyzed. This was different from what he had imagined. It seemed that after the mutation, the man-eating fish had become more and more ferocious, and they themselves were tougher. In the future, when he thought about plans, he had to pay attention to these unexpected events. The two had climbed to the edge of the cliff. Tan Thien looked at the cliff and saw that there was a rope when he arrived, but now he could only climb up with his bare hands. This cliff was not high, and with the physical strength of the two, there should be no problem. Qatar told Tan Thien that he was very familiar with climbing cliffs and did not need to worry about anything. Tan Thien smiled and said that he was counting on him for everything. The two of them groped their way up the cliff in the night. As soon as they poked their heads up to observe, they saw the patrolling soldiers. The two immediately retracted their heads. Tan Thien pointed Qatar to the other side and the two hid behind a clump of trees. Tan Thien had to think of a way to infiltrate, because the temple was lit by torches at night, so Sa Dai could also play a role. Tan Thien called Sa Dai to see what the situation was. Sa Dai flew into the pyramid. Tan Thien observed the situation through Sa Dai and it was as he thought, the east and south gates were the easiest to attack, so there were more soldiers guarding them. He told Sa Dai to give a signal. Sa Dai flew around above the heads of the soldiers, cawing and annoying them. One of them jumped out and pointed at Sa Dai, saying that if he made another sound, he would take him and cook him. I don't know why a bald eagle can make a cawing sound. It's really the best. On the other side of the pyramid, Nick's group of four had received the signal. Rana said that Pakuma and Aruba would be in charge of providing cover for Nick and him. Rana asked Nick if he had remembered the plan that Tan Thien had given him. Nick said he did. The two of them rushed forward quickly and then dispersed. Pakuma held a bow and lit a flaming arrow. He drew the bow and fired an arrow, which flew into the temple. A soldier saw it and thought it was a shooting star, but he soon realized that it was not a star. The arrow pierced him right in the crotch, nearly taking his little boy away. He screamed in horror. Outside, the other groups of soldiers heard the scream and wondered what was going on. Saying what's going on over there, why don't we go and have a look? On the west side, Rana saw that this was a good opportunity and rushed across the bridge, using his shield to knock down two soldiers. Nick also jumped into combat on the south side, taking down two soldiers. 
One of the soldiers managed to scream out before he was killed, enemy attack. The other soldiers inside heard him and shouted, enemy attack, be on alert. Where are the enemies? How many of them are there? When they ran out to the bridge, they saw that Nick was alone and shouted, capture her. When they saw the soldiers running to their aid, Rana and Nick turned and ran away without even bothering to fight back, because Tanthine had told them beforehand to just draw the enemy's fire and then run away, and not to get into a fight. In the control room of the temple, the fourth priest was listening to the report from the soldiers. He was told that only one person had attacked the west bridge and one person had attacked the south bridge, and that at least 17 soldiers had been killed. The soldiers were now pursuing the two people. He thought that only two people could have killed 17 people. This useless bunch of soldiers had to be retrained. At first he had to deal with this matter. He told the soldiers to stand down. He looked at the screen and thought that he had been watching the screen for the past few days, eating, drinking, and going to the bathroom without taking his eyes off the screen, let alone sleeping. But he had discovered one thing. The bright spots were constantly moving, whether it was day or night. The red ones are Tan Thien's group and the blue ones are the soldiers. He was so angry that he wanted to vomit blood and curse his mother. These guys don't need to sleep. Even the soldiers sent out have slowed down. Can't you guys just go to sleep so that I can get some rest? He sat down on the ground, exhausted. He thought that two people could not have killed all his soldiers to get here, otherwise they would not have needed to run away in the first place. But by the time he found out about this, Tan Thien's group had already arrived. Moreover, the divine artifact could not detect Tan Thien's location. He suddenly realized Tan Thien's purpose. Outside, Tan Thien had already approached the temple, and he saw that half of the guards outside had been lured away, but there were still four of them here. He was not afraid to fight, but if he had lured the soldiers here, it would be a case of gains not being worth the losses. Tan Thien decided that since things had come to this, he would just fight. What was there to be afraid of? A playboy is not afraid of the rain, but if the rain is too heavy, the playboy will go home. The two of them crept into the temple like two thieves, and after a while, they were inside. The two of them went to the prison. Tan Thien observed that after Tan Thien had released all the slaves, no one had entered here again. Tan Thien and Qatar walked to the wall that the ring had shown on before. Tan Thien observed everything. Based on what Huang Yishu had said, behind this wall was the main entrance to Laboratory D3. The last time he had come here, he had accidentally triggered the command to open the door, but because of this stone wall, the door could not open smoothly. After that, it had caused a big commotion and the stone wall had cracked under the force. Qatar asked Tan Thien what to do next, use explosives? Tan Thien said, if we use explosives, neither of us will be able to leave here, and more importantly, we don't have any explosives now. Tan Thien opened his bag and said not to worry, he had been prepared and had already thought of a way. He took out two tubes of limestone and sulfuric acid from his bag. Qatar took one of the tubes from Tan Thien and asked if he should put this in the crack. Tan Thien said yes. Put the limestone powder into the crack, it's the white powder. But be careful to pour it into the small cracks. Qatar began to pour the limestone powder into the cracks. Tan Thien saw that Qatar had finished, and the last step was to pour in the sulfuric acid. Suddenly, there was the sound of hurried footsteps. Qatar heard it and told Tan Thien that someone was coming. The fourth priest was leading the soldiers into the dungeon. The soldier walking next to him flattered him and said, Your honor, rest assured, I bet they are here. The dungeon only has one exit, so they can't escape even if they have wings. One of the soldiers saw two shadows and shouted, I see them. He ran over excitedly and shouted, don't move. They looked over and saw two mice swinging near the torch. The two mice ran away as soon as they saw the humans. The other soldier was embarrassed and said, your honor, they might know sorcery. Those two mice might be them transformed. He was immediately slapped in the face. What's wrong with your head? Do you think they're Sun Wukong? They can probably transform 72 times. He suddenly glanced at the cracked stone wall and saw that it was full of limestone, and shouted, they must still be here. Close all the doors. Increase the guards. There are two of them. Even if we have to dig three feet into the ground of this prison, we must find them. They began to search the prison, turning over everything, stabbing piles of straw with spears. The fourth priest told the soldiers not to miss any holes, to see if there were any secret passages or anything. On this side, Tan Thien and Qatar were hiding in a pile of straw. Tan Thien said, this is not good. If we continue like this, we will be discovered sooner or later. On the other side, Qatar was glad that Tan Thien had been smart enough to pull him into hiding here. Tan Thien calculated that there were a total of 21 people here, and it would be a pipe dream to think that they could deal with all of them, 
When capturing the enemy, the first thing to do is to find the leader. But after observing, he realized that this fourth priest was smarter than a dog and kept hiding among the soldiers. But in such a narrow space, the protective circle was also limited, which created an opportunity for Tan Thien. He told Qatar to charge forward with him and deal with the fourth priest. Qatar rushed out, startling one of the soldiers. And he quickly rushed to where the fourth priest was hiding behind the soldiers. The fourth priest was also shocked and shouted, Stop him! Stop him! Qatar had already stabbed one of them to death. Tan Thien jumped up right behind Qatar. After the battle with the pirates, he had learned a bloody lesson. Showing mercy to those who wanted to kill him was a very stupid thing to do. Tan Thien rushed in front of the fourth priest and shouted, Surrender. He was not afraid, but smiled slyly and said, It's great that you're here. He reached out and grabbed Tan Thien's saber. Tan Thien wondered how this weak fourth priest could block his full force saber strike. He smiled and said, Young man, don't be so careless. Don't you know that the older the ginger, the spicier it is? He hit Tan Thien with his staff. Tan Thien activated his cat-like reflexes and saw that the attack was very slow. He used all his strength to pull his saber out, causing the fourth priest's hand to bleed, and then jumped back. Another soldier was knocked down by Qatar, and the two of them stood back to back. The fourth priest spoke up and said, Nice to meet you both. Let me introduce myself. I am Stuffin, the fourth priest of the city-state. When I thought about it, I thought I would be late, but it seems that I arrived just in time. He thought back to when he was in the control room and analyzed that the two people attacking the west and south gates were just decoys, hiding the fact that the other's main target was the laboratory. There is one thing I must admit, before I came here, I was afraid, because I couldn't find out where you were, which made me very passive, to avoid any further incidents, and also to punish you for trespassing in the temple, I must kill you. Outside, there was a loud clamor of pursuit as a group of soldiers chased after Nick. She ran and dodged, and the others wanted to catch her, but they had to catch up to her first. On Rana's side, he had already run until his pants were falling down, but he didn't know when these soldiers would stop chasing him. If this continues, it will be a matter of time before we die. Pakuma was standing on top of the pyramid and activated his marksman skill. He loaded one by three arrows into his bow and fired three arrows that hit three soldiers. They realized that Pakuma was standing on top of the pyramid. Rana ran and threw smoke bombs behind him causing the soldiers to lose their sight and crash into each other, screaming. Ruba was observing with binoculars and saw that Tan Thien had been in the temple for a long time and hadn't come out yet, so he asked Pakuma if he needed to go and help. Because Tan Thien had previously told Pakuma that even if he and Qatar were in danger, they didn't need to come to their aid. He had his own way. Pakuma said no, just wait. Aruba asked again, really? Pakuma said, just trust Tan Thien, don't worry about anything. Pakuma observed with his binoculars and said in surprise, why are they here? In the distance, a falcon circled in the sky, observing the temple in the prison. Tan Thien was laughing and said, do you want to kill the two of us? That's the funniest thing I've heard since I got here. The fourth priest was so angry that he gritted his teeth and said, funny? What's so funny? Do you really think you can escape from this prison? Escape? Are you talking to me? What are you talking about? Stuffin. Oh right, Stuffin, you really don't understand me. The fourth priest was worried because he thought that Tan Thien had some other power to resist. He asked, what do you want to do? Tan Thien laughed and said, look at the dark circles under your eyes. You must not have been sleeping well lately, right? You're worried every day that I'll show up out of nowhere, aren't you? He told Tan Thien to tell him why Tan Thien was able to move around all day and night without stopping, and not to try to deceive him, or else the consequences would be dire. Tan Thien said that he had a special characteristic, which was that he talked a lot of shit, but out of respect, he would tell him. In fact, the ring he was wearing was of a higher level than his, and could restrain it. He asked if he knew what higher level meant. His ring was the great-grandfather, and his ring was just a great-great-grandson. Hearing this, the old fourth priest was so angry that he cursed Tan Thien and told him to shut up and stop talking nonsense, or else he would not be responsible for the consequences. He said that if he had any other tricks, he should just use them, or was he just bluffing? Although he pretended to be tough and calm on the surface, deep down he was worried. He was worried when he saw Tan Thien's expression. He was too calm, and it didn't seem fake. Tan Thien's eyes didn't show any despair. Tan Thien must have some other tricks up his sleeve. I hope Tan Thien doesn't hear his provocation. He can't act recklessly now. Tan Thien looked at the people surrounding him and said, I definitely have a trick up my sleeve. And it's this little bamboo tube. When he saw this, all his pent-up anger exploded. Are you playing with me? Charge. Kill them for me. 
Just then, a noise from behind startled the soldiers. Tan Thien looked out and smiled. You're just in time. A soldier was knocked flying away. It turned out that Tiger Claw and Black Feather had arrived. As soon as Tiger Claw arrived, he asked where Tan Thien was. When he saw Tan Thien, he was overjoyed. I'm so glad to see you. Earlier, Tan Thien had seen Tiger Claw and Black Feather running here through the fool so he had stalled for time with the fourth priest because of this moment. He smiled and said, everyone's here. The fourth priest shouted, so you have reinforcements. Charge. Kill them all. Whoever takes his head will be greatly rewarded. Tan Thien called out to Qatar, Tiger Claw, and Black Feather to buy him a minute. Everyone told him to leave it to them. He saw that although Black Feather and Tiger Claw had come to help, reducing the pressure on him and Qatar, the number of enemies was too great and the situation was becoming difficult to predict. He needed to hurry. He opened the lid of the container of sulfuric acid and poured it onto the cracks in the wall. The chalk powder of the limestone, with the chemical formula CO3, combined with the sulfuric acid to create a reaction. The limestone chalk powder and sulfuric acid will create a white smoke. After the reaction, it will create calcium sulfate, which are white crystals. He took out a container of water, put it in his mouth, and sprayed it into the cracks in the wall. At the cracks, the cracks began to swell and break. When the gypsum was formed, its volume would increase by 30 times compared to when it was crystallized. The force created at this moment was so great that it could break rocks and split mountains. The wall cracked open and stones flew everywhere. The fourth priest was furious when he saw this. You deserve to die. He smashed his staff, revealing a tube inside that contained a blue liquid. His face twisted as he picked up the tube. Tan Thien saw that he was holding a blue glass tube and knew that this was definitely not something that the Mayans could have made. He pulled it out and injected it into his body. The blue liquid entered his bloodstream, causing him to transform from a stone guard into a fam van mock. In just a moment, his muscles bulged and his veins became prominent. Suddenly, his heart began to beat violently, causing him pain. Tan Thien was shocked by this. He looked up at the sky and screamed, life is so unfair. He buried his face in his pillow. Is it really unfair? Why is it unfair? If you sing the song, confused, then it's really unfair. Tan Thien saw that the wall had cracked open. Based on this situation, the cracks would get bigger and bigger and the wall would collapse. But would the fourth priest give him a chance? The fourth priest charged forward. Tan Thien saw that his speed was similar to when he had activated his talent. Two soldiers who were standing in front of him were knocked away by the fourth priest before they could even react. He grabbed a spear. Qatar saw that the situation was not good and immediately stood in front of Tan Thien to protect him. Qatar could sense a terrifying power coming from the fourth priest, but he was a warrior who had to fight bravely. No matter how strong the enemy was, he had to fight. Qatar held his spear and stabbed forward, but the fourth priest dodged it. He launched an attack, which Qatar blocked with his spear. The fourth priest's spear was broken. Qatar was knocked back. He had only blocked one attack, but his hands were bleeding from the force of the blow. The spear was trembling violently. Before he could regain his composure, the fourth priest charged forward again and struck another blow. Qatar raised his spear to his head and blocked another blow. If this blow had hit his head, he would have been dead for sure. Qatar was knocked back and fell to the ground. He knew that he was out of time. This time, he was really going to die. The fourth priest was about to deliver the finishing blow when he suddenly looked back and saw Tan Thien jumping in and slashing him from behind. But before he could succeed, the fourth priest counterattacked. Tan Thien had to dodge out of the way. He couldn't believe it. Did the fourth priest have eyes in the back of his head? How could he see him coming? Tan Thien had already activated his cat-like reflexes. Everything around him had slowed down many times. He could only rely on his cheetah-like agility to maintain his normal speed. But stuff and speed was equal to his. In other words, his speed was the same as Tan Thien's when he activated his talent. Tan Thien had never expected this gene to be so powerful. Even someone as strong as Qatar had been beaten like this. He was just cannon fodder. The fourth priest charged at Tan Thien and struck him. Tan Thien could only dodge to the left, avoid to the right, and dodge to the back to avoid the blow. The fourth priest laughed and said, what happened to your bearing from before? Where's the confidence on your face? And you only talk the talk? It turns out that you're just an empty barrel making a lot of noise. What a good show. He almost got burned by Tan Thien. He smashed the wooden bars of the prison with one blow. Believe me, you're dead. A soldier was grabbed by the neck by Qatar and lifted up. He panicked and called for help from those around him. Qatar threw him into the wall and then shouted, If you're so good, come over here and fight me. 
I'm so scared. One of the soldiers saw that Qatar was a little weak and said to his comrades, he's just pretending to be tough. Let's all charge together and take his head back to the fourth priest. Hearing this, the whole group shouted and charged forward. Han Thien was still struggling with the fourth priest. When he looked over and saw that Qatar was being surrounded, he became very worried. He thought, damn it, these guys are attacking too fast. I don't have time to call the system. He wanted Qatar to hold them off so that he could go and destroy the wall, but he didn't expect that it would put Qatar in such a dangerous situation. The fourth priest continued to attack Tan Thien. He jumped up and dodged the table behind him, which was smashed in half. He snorted and said, you still have the mind to care about the safety of others? Don't you think you're going to die fast enough? Tan Thien looked to the side. Tiger Claw was also in a fierce battle. Many soldiers were charging at Tiger Claw. Tiger Claw shouted to Tan Thien to hold on a little longer, and that he would come over and help Tan Thien after he was finished on this side. Tan Thien observed and thought at the same time. Although Tiger Claw and Black Feather were very strong, they couldn't fight against 20 soldiers. Not to mention that they had to save Tan Thien, which divided their focus. He had to think of a way. Suddenly, a soldier rushed in and shouted, Tan Thien's head is mine. Tan Thien was startled, but then the fourth priest suddenly grabbed his staff and hit the soldier, cursing. I told you to get lost if you didn't want to die. Are you deaf or just stupid? How dare you come here, you idiot? Suddenly, Tan Thien had an idea. He stopped and said to the fourth priest, You've been chasing me for so long, but you haven't even touched a hair on my head. You're such a useless person. Hearing Tan Thien's provocation, the fourth priest was furious and cursed. Do you want to die? Tan Thien turned and ran, saying as he ran, If you have the guts, come and get me, brother. If you can't kill me, then that guy is your nephew. Tan Thien was running towards the group of soldiers. When the soldiers saw this, they shouted, Fall back. Don't come over here. Run away. Tan Thien used his cheetah speed to dodge all the soldiers in front of him. The fourth priest was like a madman on drugs. He didn't know what he was doing. He just kept hitting everything in his way with his staff. He didn't care who was friend or foe. Tiger Claw and Black Feather stood by and watched in surprise, not knowing what was going on. Tiger Claw turned to Black Feather and said, This guy is high on something. This is a good opportunity. Let's play some remix music and make him dance. Tiger Claw and Black Feather jumped in and took down a few more soldiers. Tiger Claw told Black Feather to hurry up, as Tan Thien needed them badly. On this side, Qatar was choking a soldier when he heard the other soldiers calling each other to go and protect the fourth priest. He saw that there were only three left, so it would be easy to deal with them. He jumped forward and stabbed one of them. He then hit another one in the neck and coldly looked at the last one and said, it's your turn now. The soldier was so scared that he broke out in a cold sweat. On the other side, Tan Thien was running away, luring the fourth priest to chase him. He taunted, come on, brother. Why are you running so slowly? Hurry up. How can you catch me if you run like that? The fourth priest was extremely angry. As he chased him, he cursed. What are you doing? Are you playing a game of tag? If you're good, come back and fight me one on one. Tan Thien said, why would I be so stupid as to stop? This is a game of the grandson chasing the grandfather. Just catch me first, and then we'll talk. The fourth priest was so angry that he felt like his lungs were going to explode. He couldn't catch Tan Thien, and he couldn't catch up to him. Suddenly, someone called out to him. He turned around in anger and asked, what's the matter? Then he saw his soldiers lying all over the ground. He had taken drugs, and his strength had increased so much that he couldn't control himself. Tan Thien knew this, so he provoked him into killing all those soldiers. He turned around and was about to curse again when Tan Thien said, Fourth priest, you're really amazing. Is this the power that the divine god gave you? It really broadens my horizons. This man was hit by his staff and his intestines came out. The other man's shoulder blade was shattered and had to be amputated, but fortunately he was still alive. The worst one was this guy. Even his mother probably wouldn't recognize him. The fourth priest shouted angrily, shut up, someone, kill him for me. But the soldiers were all terrified. Seeing this, Tan Thien said, your words don't seem to be working very well. He said angrily, a bunch of cowards, then let me do it myself, I'll take care of it. Suddenly, a spear stabbed towards him. The fourth priest dodged it. Qatar, Tiger Claw, and Black Feather had arrived. They said, we're here, hold on a little longer. The three of them stood in front of Tan Thien. Qatar told Tan Thien to go and do what he needed to do, and that they would take care of things here. Tan Thien said, everyone, please hold on for a little while. Tan Thien turned and left, leaving the three Qatari behind. He said, I'm counting on you all. 
Tan Thien ran quickly back to the prison. Suddenly, Tan Thien felt his body weakening. He knew that his body had reached its limit. He thought, even though the Kataris have the advantage in numbers, the fourth priest is too powerful. I'm afraid they won't be able to hold out for much longer. As for himself, even if he used his points to exchange for a talent now, he wouldn't be able to use it in his current physical condition. So he could only open the laboratory as soon as possible. When the fourth priest saw Tan Thien running away, he turned around and said angrily, You want to escape? Well, you have to ask me first if I agree. He turned and ran into the prison. Tan Thien was running when he heard a noise. He turned his head and saw Black Feather being thrown towards him. He caught Black Feather and asked, Are you okay? Black Feather said, I'm fine. He looked over and saw that Katar and Tiger Claw were struggling with the fourth priest. Tan Thien remembered that Zhang Shalan had once told him that he had put a protective barrier inside the ring. In times of danger, he could open the protective barrier. However, the protective barrier would consume a lot of the ring's energy. After using it, it would only be a useless piece of metal. He felt that if he continued like this, he wouldn't have time to open the laboratory. In the end, he still had to use his trump card. However, such a large loss would affect his data, and he might not be able to return to his own world. Black Feather asked Tan Thien if he could extinguish the torches in the prison. Tan Thien asked, extinguish all the torches? Black Feather confidently said that no one could defeat him in the darkness. Tan Thien observed that Black Feather's eyes were very cloudy and unfocused, which meant that his eyesight was very poor. However, his hearing was very strong. Tan Thien agreed with Black Feather. He handed his saber to Black Feather and said, use this. This saber was much sharper than the stone spear in Black Feather's hand. The two of them quickly ran to extinguish the torches. Everything was plunged into darkness. Black Feather was holding the saber behind the fourth priest. He slashed at the priest's hand. The priest shouted at the soldiers, What are you standing there for? Hurry up and stop them. The soldiers didn't know why it was suddenly so dark. They shouted that they couldn't see, and neither could the people on the other side. They all formed a circle and defended against the outside. When the fourth priest saw Tan Thien running away, he said, Do you think you can stop me with this little trick? Just as he was about to chase after him, Black Feather ran out to stop him. The fourth priest dodged Black Feather's saber. He didn't know what was going on. Why was Black Feather so fast? He blocked another of Black Feather's sabers. He suddenly realized that it wasn't that Black Feather was fast, but that Black Feather's ears must have been specially trained. The darkness reduced his eyesight but enhanced his hearing, allowing him to anticipate the priest's movements. Black Feather found the saber very easy to use and attacked with ease. The fourth priest realized that he couldn't fight Black Feather in the dark. He had to stop Tan Thien. That was the most important thing. Tan Thien's destination must be the broken wall. He turned and ran, using his glowing ring to move and observe. When he arrived, he didn't see Tan Thien anywhere. He shouted, if you're here, come out, don't hide anymore. He knew that even though he couldn't see anything, his body had been greatly enhanced by the effects of the drug. If he could just stay calm, he could use the sound to find Tan Thien. On this side, Tan Thien was hiding behind a pile of straw. He realized that this fourth priest was very intelligent. He had adapted to the darkness, and with the light from the ring, Black Feather wouldn't be able to get the better of him as easily as before. He had to think of a way. If he waited until morning, they would all be dead for sure. But suddenly, there was a scream from the soldiers. Someone had been attacked and killed. Tan Thien heard it, but he didn't know what was going on. The soldiers outside told each other to stay calm and be alert. Black Feather was holding his saber and standing nearby, waiting for the right moment to attack. The fourth priest was furious. He cursed, you idiots, shut up. The soldiers were so noisy that he couldn't hear anything around him. But in response to his words, there were more screams for help. Tan Thien was overjoyed. Only Black Feather could act like this in the darkness. This was great. But the screams were so horrible that they made his skin crawl. Fourth priest, your soldiers are about to be wiped out. What are you going to do? The fourth priest realized that if this continued, his soldiers would all be killed. He couldn't wait any longer. He ran towards his soldiers and shouted, If you want to fight, come out here. I'll kill you all and show you how powerful I am. Then he took his staff and started beating his own soldiers. Think this scene is really a leopard's life. Black Feather has returned to Tan Thien. Tan Thien asked him about the situation over there. Black Feather didn't know either. He heard that many soldiers were crawling on the ground to avoid being stabbed by the fourth priest. It seemed that he had gone mad. As soon as Tan Thien heard this, he understood. He was pretending to be crazy to lure Tan Thien into a trap. On one side, he pretended to be crazy and made noises to deceive Tan Thien into thinking that the noise would drown out the sound of his footsteps as he approached the stone wall. But as soon as Tan Thien reached the stone wall, 
he would be discovered by the soldiers lying on the ground. Although the soldiers didn't know the fourth priest's intentions, if Tan Thien moved and stepped on the soldiers, they would make a sound. In this way, he would know Tan Thien's location. It was really impressive to come up with such a countermeasure in such a short time. But he had overlooked one thing. Tan Thien whispered something in Black Feather's ear, and Black Feather left. The fourth priest was still pretending to be crazy and screaming. He knew that Tan Thien's target was the stone wall. But why hadn't he seen any action from Tan Thien's group? Suddenly, a stone flew towards him. He heard the sound and wondered how Tan Thien had gotten to the other side. He immediately struck it with his staff. Then, several more stones were shot out. He didn't understand why there were so many noises. He shouted angrily, if you want to fight, come out here. Don't play these petty tricks anymore. Tan Thien smiled. Have some more stones. Tan Thien threw a few more stones. It turned out that earlier, Tan Thien had told Black Feather to use the bamboo tube to spray water on the wall to help him. He also asked Black Feather to get him some stones to use. Suddenly, the wall broke open, and a dazzling light shone out from behind it. Tan Thien looked and wondered if the door had opened. The fourth priest didn't know what was going on. Black Feather was standing in front of the broken wall when he sprayed more water on it. The fourth priest felt that something was wrong when he saw this. He turned and left. He felt that this power was even stronger than the ring in his hand. He had to get out first and remember this direction. Then he ran out and punched a door to pieces to escape. The soldiers were also panicked when they saw the fourth priest running away. They abandoned everything and ran after him. Qatar helped Meng Hu over. He asked Tan Thien if he was just going to let them all run away. Tan Thien said to let them go. Fortunately, they had Black Feather. Meng Hu saw that Black Feather had just fought the fourth priest in the dark and asked how he could see. How did you do that? Qatar also thought that Black Feather was amazing. Because Black Feather had always lived in the dark, he could only rely on sound to judge things. The wall began to break open, and behind it was a gate with a triangle in the middle. Tan Thien was overjoyed that it had finally opened. He reached out his hand, and the ring shone a light on the door. The door sounded a voice saying, Enter. The door slowly opened. Meng Hu was surprised and asked, Is this the temple where the great goddess lives? Was that the great goddess's voice just now? Is she in here? The three young men were stunned because it was the first time they had witnessed such a scene. They were like three country bumpkins who had just arrived in the city. Tan Thien patted Kata's shoulder and said, Let's go in. The group walked into a modern corridor. Tan Thien felt that this place was a little different from the laboratory on island number two. At one point, a door opened. Huang Yishu suddenly appeared and said to Tan Thien, What kind of gene did Zi Jungfeng give you? A gene for redemption? Don't you see that your body has weakened after using that gene? Meng Hu was surprised. He didn't know how Huang Yishu had appeared. Was this the power of the goddess? Tan Thien didn't know what she meant when she said that. He thought that maybe Huang Yishu thought that he was also using a gene like that fourth priest because of his speed. He asked Huang Yishu if she had been watching him from the beginning to the end. She said that she had told him before that she had met him thanks to the laboratory. At that time, the laboratory's energy had been exhausted and was only enough for the two of them to meet once. Only after he had entered the laboratory and met the necessary conditions could she appear again. As for why she knew about the battle, it was simply because she was also a part of this place. Tan Thien asked if it was all like this. Was there nothing to go back to? Huang Yishu said that Laboratory D3 was only a regional laboratory. It couldn't compare to a large-scale laboratory. There were only a few things. Tan Thien was overjoyed when he heard a few things. These few things must be good things. Huang Yishu snapped her fingers, and a spaceship appeared. She told everyone to get on. After everyone was seated, she said that it could drive automatically. It then shot off and flew for a while before making a sharp turn and landing on the sidewalk. This frightened the young men in the back. The spaceship flew to a room. Tan Thien asked where this was and was told that it was the medical room. Huang Yishu began to operate the controls to open the door. She called Meng Hu, Qatar, and Black Feather over and told them to lie down. Tan Thien went over to observe and asked if these were the things in the Dragon Pearl. He was told when they would recover. The effect is not exaggerated. The people of Qatar were badly injured. This thing can relieve pain and, through the method of water treatment, add various fluids to the body to promote recovery. When Qatar went inside, the door closed and water began to flow out of several pipes. The three men were confused. Will this treatment not drown us? Huang Yishu said with a smile, don't worry, you won't drown in this treatment. Just lie down comfortably. Qatar saw that the water was about to submerge him, so he took a deep breath and dived down. But to his surprise, he was fine. Huang Yishu saw that the people of Qatar trusted Tan Thien very much. Outside, Nick's group was running into the prison to support Tan Thien. 
They walked over and saw the door of the laboratory. Pakuma said, no wonder we haven't seen Tanthine come out. He must have gone in here. Aruba asked if they should rush in, but Pakuma said, didn't you see that fourth priest run away with his tail between his legs? Trust me, Tanthine is definitely fine. Aruba said, then we'll just wait outside. There was still some time before dawn. They had just fought a battle and were tired. The group decided to rest here first. Rana also agreed with this idea. He was also thirsty, so he decided to go get some water for everyone. Inside the laboratory, Tan Thien thought that this treatment machine was very good. He wanted to try it out later. Huang Yishu said that even though he had only lost physical strength, he could still go in now. She snapped her fingers and a treatment machine appeared. He wondered if there was any sleeping agent in the treatment fluid. Huang Yishu said that the ingredients in the treatment fluid were mostly the same, but different medicines were added based on the condition of each person's wound. Therefore, she didn't know if there was a sleeping component. She would have to check the EEG results to find out. Tan Thien just wanted to sleep, but if he went in and the machine malfunctioned, he might be in trouble. Besides, Nick's group was still outside. He had to wait until everything was over before he could sleep. Even if he was tired, he had to persevere. Huang Yishu asked, why don't you use Zi Jungfeng's method? The video clearly recorded it for you to use, but you gave up in the end. Tan Thien took off the ring and said, I don't want to become so ugly. If I use it, the data will disappear. What kind of medicine is that gene? If that fourth priest didn't have it, he wouldn't have suffered so much. Huang Yishu said that this matter should have been discussed before she was summoned to wake up. Before she could finish speaking, she saw Tan Thien looking for something. She asked him what he was looking for, and he said he was looking for a chair to sit on. If possible, could he have some popcorn and Coca-Cola? Wasn't he going to watch a movie? She opened the video. Earlier, on island number 2, when he was watching the video of those two gods, she turned her head and said, If you don't want to hear me talk, then forget it. Tan Thien saw this scene and thought, could it be that she has been lonely for too long and needs someone to talk to in order to relieve her boredom? He sat down and said with a smile, go ahead and talk. It's a way to kill time. I need to take something out of the ring, which will take some time. Huang Yishu began to speak. Laboratory D3 and the Five Elements Laboratory. After that incident, time was affected. All the staff of the laboratory were killed, and only I remained. I uploaded my consciousness into the computer. After that incident, the Five Elements Laboratory lost more than half of its energy. In order to keep Jade Island Number 2 from being destroyed and to preserve the time data, the Five Elements Laboratory went into a standby state. Try to consume as little energy as possible and do your best to maintain your current state. The purpose of doing this is to allow someone to carry the data and information away. However, the Five Elements Laboratory and D3 are different. Due to the disruption of time, when energy is needed, it will come from the Five Elements. As for D3, it was caused by the Large Egg Laboratory, which affected time. It did not need energy to support it, so it was in the same state of being affected by time. The Five Elements Laboratory needs energy to maintain itself, while Laboratory D3 does not. That's why she was still alive here after that incident, but she started to investigate the cause of the incident after that day. It took her a whole year to figure it all out. Based on the time of the incident, the data recorded by the laboratory's EEG would start counting backwards and use that as a reference to return to the old world. This process was very long and tiring. Although she had become digitalized at that time and didn't feel tired under those circumstances, it still took her almost six years to find a way to return to the original time and space. Tan Thien asked, you found the loophole yourself and returned to the original time and space? So, even without this ring, you could still send me back to the old world? She smiled and said, I told you when we first met, Laboratory D3 can send you back to the old world. Tan Thien finally realized that whether or not he had the ring would not affect his return. Huang Yishu said, even so, this ring is very important because the data in the experiment inside is a priceless treasure. But to Tan Thien's group, it was worthless. Tan Thien spat out a mouthful of blood. Because of this ring, he had been running east and west. In the end, it was a bit shocking to know this. He sat down again and listened to Huang Yishu continue. After the laboratory went into standby mode, when she found a way to return to the old world, she discovered that opening the door of time and space required a huge amount of energy. Since the energy in D3 was not enough, she used the method of the Five Elements Laboratory. Tan Thien asked, what do you mean by, not enough energy? Huang Yishu explained, the energy required for the time jump is beyond her imagination. Instead of giving Tan Thien hope, she said bluntly, I remember that Tan Thien came from the 21st century. When she said that the energy was not enough, she meant the energy to create a passage to the current world. As for how much energy is needed to open a time passage to the 19th and 21st centuries, we won't know until we calculate it. Tan Thien wanted her to explain more clearly. 
Huang Yishu said that because this was not a linear jump, the further away the era, the more energy would be required. The jump from one point to another would be determined by the distance between the two points. The Eeg needed to calculate the result. Tan Thien asked Huang Yishu if she had ever thought of a way to generate energy. That way, no matter how much energy was needed, it would be available. Laboratory D3 already had stored energy, so could that energy source be used as a foundation to create even more energy? For example, could it be used to create robots that could repair things? Tan Thien and Huang Yishu stood looking at the screen. They saw that outside, the soldiers were using a log to try to break down the door to the laboratory. Tan Thien realized that they were really trying to kill him. The people on this island had run away because they wanted to kill him, and now they wanted to come back again? It would be strange if a laboratory that could withstand the flow of time could be destroyed by those guys. Just let them smash it. Tan Thien turned to Huang Yishu and asked about the gene drug. He learned that after the laboratory was shut down, Huang Yishu had set up a startup program that would be activated if anyone came. In addition, in order to search for other humans, she used radar to search around her. If there were people, they would send a signal to the laboratory, but there was still no one. 100 years after the laboratory went into hibernation, it was restarted. In that incident, everyone in Laboratory D3 died. So the people who came were outsiders? But when she saw the so-called humans, she realized that they were Mayans from ancient times. There were more than 20 Mayan tribes in this world, with nearly 1,000 people, and they were distributed in the areas around the laboratory. She had no intention of disturbing them, but after observing some creatures in Laboratory D3, she found that they had mutated because of coming to this world. These creatures could be said to be deadly to the Mayans, so she couldn't bear to see them die here, so she helped them. I used radar to send images to the tribes there. Her sudden appearance. The flickering and blurry image made the Mayans worship her as a god. From then on, a relationship of dependence was established. Under her guidance, they gained a lot of knowledge in harvests. But this was only for their Mayan civilization. Hearing this, Tan Thien was shocked and asked, Is the Mayan knowledge and culture taught by you? Huang Yishu said that it was taught by her, but don't look at her with such a shocked expression. Let her finish speaking. While teaching them, I mentioned the issue of energy, thinking that maybe I could get these Mayans to do something. So I used my status as a god to give them solar panels. After that, she continued to fall into a deep sleep to conserve energy. But during this time, thanks to the foundation she had laid for them, the Mayans had achieved this level of knowledge and culture over 300 years. And the Mayan pyramids were a product of their development. As for their function, it was to place the solar panels. The higher they were placed, the better. Tan Thien now realized that the Mayan pyramids were actually pillars for placing solar panels. Huang Yishu added that it was also true that they were used for sacrifices, because after all, this was a special custom that appeared in their culture. It was not something she had taught them. Tan Thien asked why the panels had been damaged, and Huang Yishu told him that they had been destroyed by the Mayans. The second time she woke up, the Mayans had reached a new level of development and their population had grown to 10,000. By this time, the Mayans had a deeper understanding of knowledge, so she intended to find the smartest people among them to be her students. She proceeded to teach them the second step. This time, they knew about Laboratory D3 and that she was not a god, but they still respected her as before. She was overjoyed after the teaching was finished, and she gave them a ring to use for studying. After all, her existence consumed the laboratory's energy. In addition, she left behind a dose of gene medicine. This gene medicine was much more powerful than the one that the American captain in Tan Thien's time had injected to strengthen his body and increase his perception. She did this because she was thinking of the safety of those students. After all, they had the responsibility of spreading civilization on their shoulders, so there could be no mistakes. Because the Mayans had always protected the solar panels before, they had accumulated quite a lot of energy. She thought that everything would go smoothly like this. But she did not expect that more than 100 years later, the successors of her students had all become priests, taking on the responsibilities of their predecessors and developing generation after generation until a priest with ambition appeared. Tan Thien looked at the screen and said, Is that the guy named Gao outside? Huang Yishu said that it was not as he had guessed. She raised her hand and a red light enveloped her hand. The door made a noise and a laser beam shot out and pierced the priest's forehead, causing him to fall backwards. The soldiers were shocked when they saw this and turned and ran away, thinking that the priest had been punished for offending the god. On this side, Nick and Pakuma also saw this scene and were glad that they had not done anything. Huang Yishu said, he actually had a chance to live, but he didn't cherish it. He's not afraid of death, so there's no cure for him. It's better to kill him than to let him harm others. Tan Thien asked, who is the priest you're talking about? Huang Yishu said that it was Huang Haitu. 
The Mayans in the early days often used things in their lives as their names, such as black bear, white dog, and thorny hedgehog. Unlike the previous priests who showed themselves to be wise, he was very ambitious. After becoming the priest's apprentice, he began to set up a sinister plan to take the entire Mayan kingdom into his own hands. After becoming a priest, he secretly sent people to assassinate the other priests and secretly controlled the power of the king. Then he used my name to establish a military regime of inherited death, a time when theocracy was above all else. After that, through some means and the efforts of several generations, the Mayan kingdom fell into the hands of the Huang Haitu family. Han Thien said, isn't this too much trouble? Why not just kill the king and replace him yourself? You have to act like that Sao guy, pretending to be the emperor and ordering the vassals. You know, that's what's really scary about Huang Haitu. He kept the king not out of kindness, but to use him as a scapegoat when he encountered a natural disaster that he couldn't handle. At this point, Tan Thien understood. So he used the king as a scapegoat? Huang Yishu said that was right. He used the crime of incompetence and offending the gods to sacrifice the king in order to stabilize the people's hearts and maintain their loyalty during this time. In order to prevent her from being a threat to his rule, he initially used large stones to block the entrance to the laboratory and built it into the pyramid that stands today. He then gradually destroyed the solar panels. Tan Thien wondered why she didn't just kill all of them like she had killed the priest earlier, and was told that, she only found out about everything after they had finished. It was all seen from the materials recorded by the radar. In other words, by the time she found out, everything was already over. During this time, she also intended to go outside, but the door of the laboratory could not be opened, so she had no choice but to lock the energy source of the laboratory. She also determined that at any time, energy would only flow into the laboratory, doing her best to prevent laboratory D3 from collapsing and keeping a small amount of energy for when she woke up. That's why the first time she met him, she told him that she didn't have enough energy and that she couldn't help his group before entering the laboratory. Judging from the appearance of that priest, the story of the laboratory must have been lost by his generation. As the two of them were talking, an alarm suddenly sounded. Tan Thien was surprised when he looked at the screen. The king was leading a group of people carrying offerings to kneel and beg the gods for forgiveness. The whole group shouted, Gods, forgive us. Tan Thien saw this scene and knew that the soldiers must have reported the death of the priest to the king, so he thought that it was because of the anger of the gods that he was doing this. Tan Thien asked Huang Yishu what to do now, and she said that it was enough to deceive this group. Since Haitu's death, no one knew the truth anymore. Whatever she said now, the whole group would believe it. She appeared before the Mayans and said that the priest had dared to enter the temple and deserved to die a thousand deaths. But since they had realized their mistake, she would forgive them, causing the whole group to jump up with joy. Tan Thien saw this scene and felt like he was seeing himself in the past. At first, in order to protect his life, he had lied to the La people and said that he was a shaman, but gradually, this shaman's position, which was fake at first, became real. Now he had to lead them forward so as not to fail their trust in him. Outside, Huang Yishu was giving a multi-level marketing speech to the young Mayans. Listen up, everyone. Tan Thien is the incarnation of our god. You must listen to him in everything. Tan Thien's face darkened when he heard this. At this rate, even if he wanted to explain that he was just an ordinary person, no one would believe him. Suddenly, the medical machine beeped and emitted a puff of smoke. Tan Thien knew that it was over. The door of the room opened and the three people from Qatar, Meng Hu, Hei Wu, and Hei Wu, came out with their wounds healed. Meng Hu was excited because he had just had a nap and the pain in his body was gone. Hei Wu felt that if he rested for another month, he would be completely healed. Tan Thien asked Hei Wu if his eyesight had improved, but Hei Wu shook his head. He thought that congenital injuries could not be treated by the healing fluid. Tan Thien thanked the two of them for their help, which had been a great help to him. Meng Hu had come here because Hei Wu had told him to, and Hei Wu had overheard Tan Thien's group talking and told Meng Hu about it. Because Tan Thien had done them a favor, they had come to see if they could help. At first, they had only followed Tan Thien's group and would only jump out to help if there was any danger. When Huang Yishu came back in, Tan Thien asked her if everything outside was finished, and she told him that everything was okay and that the calculation results were also out. Tan Thien was surprised that it had been so fast. Huang Yishu said that there was good and bad news. The energy in the laboratory was not enough to open a passage to Tan Thien's time, and could only open a passage to the Mayan time. Tan Thien felt that his luck was a bit bad. Huang Yishu said that the energy in the laboratory was constantly flowing out, and that in less than 100 years, the laboratory would collapse and sink to the bottom of the sea. Being able to open a passage to the Mayans was already very lucky. Hearing this, 
Tan Thien felt a bit depressed. It was really too lucky. Tan Thien asked Huang Yishu what would happen if they used the solar panels. He remembered that she had said that the robots needed a lot of energy to operate. If the robots were transformed into Mayans, the kingdom's manpower would increase greatly. Huang Yishu told him that transforming robots into Mayans was indeed beneficial, but it would take a lot of time to accumulate enough energy. And she was afraid that even if Tan Thien's group died of old age here, it would not be enough. It would be better to go to the egg laboratory and try their luck. Tan Thien sighed when he heard this. When he heard Huang Yishu mention the egg laboratory, he asked in surprise, what is that laboratory? Huang Yishu told him that the egg laboratory was the central laboratory in Area 3 of the Golden Crow nuclear biosphere, and that it was located independently outside the laboratory. The energy there was definitely greater than here. As long as his group could find the Golden Crow nucleus and borrow the energy of the equipment there, returning to their original world would not be difficult at all. Tan Thien was overjoyed when he heard this, so there was still a chance for him to return. Tan Thien was furious and asked Huang Yishu if she had deliberately refused to mention the important point in order to strike me when I had to hear the bad news? She pretended not to understand. Tan Thien asked how his group was supposed to get to the egg laboratory. The ring seemed to have a problem. It was supposed to only lead to Area 3 of the biosphere, but it had brought his group here instead. He was surprised to learn that it was not the ring that had the problem but Area 3 of the biosphere. The after effects of the experimental accident directly affected all the creatures in Area 3, causing the fragments of the continent to crack and drift to different corners of the world. Because Island Number 2 was the first place to be affected, the people on Island Number 2 did not know that Area Number 3 had also been destroyed. But according to the sequence, the two people there had designed the ring to use the direct point-to-point -point guidance method to lead directly to the laboratory. Hearing this, Tan Thien understood that if Biosphere Number 3 had not been damaged, such a setting would have been fine. But now that Area Number 3 had collapsed into many pieces, when the ring searched for Laboratory D3, it would treat it as the egg laboratory. No matter how he went, the destination was in one direction, so it caused him to wander around Area D3. Huang Yishu said that was right. She had made some additional modifications to the ring, and now it would only point to the egg laboratory, so there would be no more mistakes. She handed Tan Thien two rings, the other one being a spare. She had transferred the protective plate from the previous ring to the spare one, so that in the future, when he needed to use it, he would not have to worry about losing data anymore. He asked her if there were any more of the gene drugs that the priest had used in the laboratory. He planned to use it to train more warriors, and then he would have no enemies at all. Hearing this, Huang Yishu laughed, and pointed to the screen showing the priest's body. Tan Thien looked at the body in shock, wondering why he had become like this. If it weren't for the familiar clothes, he really wouldn't have recognized him. She wondered if Xu Zhengfeng hadn't told him, and waved her hand. And a laser beam shot out from the door and burned the body. Huang Yishu told him, that the drug was powerful but had side effects. Tan Thien knew that she was worried that he would have side effects, so he said, that his speed was not due to that gene but that after he was drawn into this time and space, he felt that he was more outstanding than ordinary people. He didn't mention that he had a boot system. She was also surprised that he could achieve such speed without the drug. Then she put her face close to Tan Thien's and stared at him. She used the body scanner on Tan Thien, and she was also surprised that time and space had mutated the human body. From the data she knew, Tan Thien's physical fitness had surpassed that of the time by 99%. 99% belonged to the high-level type, which made her want to check his whole body. Tan Thien was a little scared when he heard what she said. He broke out in a cold sweat and immediately refused. No way. She said that this drug worked by drawing on life force in exchange for strength, and that this strength was not temporary. After the injection, the priest could live for more than 10 years. This was a semi-finished drug, and its side effects were even greater. She currently knew of seven types, which were mainly used to treat congenital diseases and gene deficiencies. Although they were not very effective for Tan Thien, there was a type called Shan Chong that could increase lifespan to the limit, which might be effective for him. Hearing this, he immediately reached out to ask for it, but Huang Yishu poured cold water on him and said that there was none. This kind of drug was also very important in her time. Where could she get it? It wasn't like candy that she could eat whenever she wanted. Perhaps there was some in the egg laboratory. Tan Thien thought about it and agreed. Drugs related to lifespan could not be sold casually in the market. Huang Yishu said that the things here were the same as on island number two. He shouldn't even think about it. He wouldn't be able to take anything away. But the treatment room could be used multiple times. If he wanted, he could use it whenever he wanted. Tan Thien was so shocked that he didn't dare to use it. He said that he would use it later. She cared about his body like that. Wait until he falls asleep in there. 
It wouldn't be good if she pulled out a knife and stabbed him while he was sleeping. He asked Huang Yishu, if there's nothing else, then let's go. Huang Yishu called everyone to get in the car. And just like when they entered, they sped away like the wind and crashed into the stone sidewalk. When they reached the door, the two young men got out of the car and saluted. Huang Yishu saluted them and waved goodbye, then disappeared. Tan Thien felt that this kind of greeting was enough for one time. And suddenly Qatar patted Tan Thien on the shoulder, making him wonder what was going on. He looked over and saw all the Mayans kneeling and shouting, Great Envoy. At this time, Nick's group also appeared. Tan Thien asked everyone if they were okay. Nick reported that everyone was fine, except for Rana, who had been slightly injured. He was relieved to see that everyone was okay. He had been busy all evening, so he told everyone to go out to eat. The scene changes to the Fa Xiao boat. The children are playing with the wolves, and everyone is happy, saying that it is all thanks to Tan Thien that they have such a comfortable life. In the mangrove forest, Jessica and Yi Lin are on a boat painting a bird. Jessica says that it is a pheasant, one of the species in the rainforest that looks very much like a water bird and a peacock. She had to redraw it for research. But Yi Lin found it too stinky to bear. And she was about to vomit. Jessica told Yi Lin to hold on, because the pheasant's body was so stinky that it was famous. Suddenly, Sa Diao flew into the sky. The bird was startled and jumped into the water to hide. Jessica said angrily, Sa Diao scared away her research object. It had better bring good news, or else she would stew it. Sa Diao flew over and landed on Yi Lin's hand to deliver a letter. Yi Lin smiled and said, don't be afraid. Jessica is just joking. The two of them opened the letter and read it. They didn't expect that in such a short period of time, Tan Thien's group would encounter so many dangerous things. They didn't know when they would be able to return. On the side of the temple, Tan Thien's group was having a grand feast. He told everyone to raise their glasses and celebrate their survival. While they were eating and drinking, a servant came to report that there were five roasted goats outside. Did they need to be served? He said to bring them up and asked her to tell the king that he was very satisfied with the meal. He would send his best wishes to the Mayan king, which made her happy and she thanked Tan Thien. He went into the room to rest. As soon as he got into bed, the ring lit up. Huang Yishu video called him. He asked her what was going on and learned that Huang Yishu had already opened the passageway. It would be opened in a few days. He should arrange his own time to go. Tan Thien was overjoyed to hear that it had been opened so quickly. He thought that it would take a few months to repair the passageway. And he planned to use that time to stock up on more food on the boat. He immediately left, saying that he would go to the laboratory right away. He sat in the car and thought that it was unexpected that it had been repaired in one evening. It had taken time to return from the second, so could it be that Huang Yishu was trying to get rid of him? Tan Thien went to the energy room. He opened the door and walked in to see Huang Yishu in a swimsuit sunbathing on the beach. Seeing that Tan Thien had arrived, she snapped her fingers and the projection began to disappear, returning to the appearance of the laboratory. Tan Thien saw an energy core and thought that it was probably the energy center of the laboratory. Tan Thien went over and said that he wanted to transmit the time passageway. Could it be delayed? He wanted to gather enough supplies before he went, but Huang Yishu said that it was too late. With the energy of this place, it could only be maintained for a year. The process of the time-space passage could not be slowed down. Once it was started, the countdown would begin. The ecosystem on the island would collapse. For safety, she advised Tan Thien to leave within half a month. She knew what Tan Thien was worried about. From Laboratory D3 to Laboratory A1, based on the speed of his boat, it would only take half a year, so it would be enough to collect supplies in half a month. Tan Thien asked if she already had the specific coordinates. She said that she had already entered the data into the interior. There were a lot of documents that he hadn't read yet. Tan Thien said that he hadn't paid much attention to them because he had been too tired yesterday. After dealing with the priest for several days, he didn't have the energy to look at them. He asked Huang Yishu, was she also a data body like Yu Jungfang? If the laboratory collapsed, would she also be lost? Huang Yishu said that was right. From a biological perspective, she was already dead. Now she was just a pile of data. Keeping her in the laboratory was useless. Being able to meet him and retrieve the laboratory data made her happy. She felt that she had been lonely for too long. After coming here, her colleagues had all died and she had been holding the fort alone, which had even become a kind of pain. Tan Thien thanked her for always trying to keep the laboratory. This is a great contribution to science. Huang Yishu turned around and said, Tan Thien, go away so I can sunbathe. If there's nothing else, don't bother me. Tan Thien scratched his head and said goodbye to her. As he turned to leave, 
Huang Yishu also shed tears. Tan Thien returned to the temple and told everyone that he would be leaving the island in a few days. Meng Hu asked him where he was going, and Tan Thien said that they had to go to a faraway place. Meng Hu wanted to go with Tan Thien, but Tan Thien said that Meng Hu had somewhere to go. Huang Yishu would take the Mayans to a more fertile and larger place than this. Tan Thien knew that if he told the truth, they would not listen so he had to use this method to get them to accept it. Instead of going with him to an unknown place, it might be better to send them back to where they belonged. Meng Hu smiled and said that he had wanted to go to another place for a long time. Moreover, if it was a good place, he had to go and see it. Qatar also congratulated him. Next, Tan Thien would prepare the supplies to leave. Everyone said that they would help him. Tan Thien immediately called the king to mobilize manpower to help them prepare the supplies. Then he read the documents in the ring again. In the morning, he went around to see if there was anything good, and told the guards to collect it. In the evening, he would find Huang Yishu to talk about the future and stay by her side to relieve his boredom. On the fifth day, they had finished collecting their belongings. Tan Thien's group prepared to leave under the escort of the guards. Tan Thien felt that this time, fortunately, they had a familiar team to escort them on their way, so they would probably return two days early. He looked at Hei Wu and saw that he was not in a good mood, so he knew that this farewell would probably be the last time they would see each other. On the beach, the group on the boat was waiting for Tan Thien to return. Finally, Tan Thien's group returned. He waved to everyone. Jessica and Yi Lin ran over and hugged Tan Thien. They welcomed him back and said that they missed him very much. On the beach, Tan Thien gave So Lin and Meng Hu something. A Ya took it and saw that it was a wooden bird. She said that the bird's head was too big and ugly. So Lin thought it was very cute. Tan Thien gave the bird to Da Di. This was Tan Thien's farewell gift. He told Da Di to keep it safe. When he grew up, he had to remember that he had an older brother who loved him very much on the other side. Yi Lin and Jessica were saying that this time they would not have a chance to meet again, so they cherished this moment. After a while, Tan Thien came back and heard that the supplies had all been loaded onto the wooden boat. Everyone said goodbye and left. Night fell and everyone on the boat was celebrating. Jessica and Yi Lin were very concerned about Tan Thien and brought him food. They could see that he must have suffered a lot on this trip. Eating and drinking wouldn't make him full, and it scared him to see this. Nick was about to say something when Tan Thien covered his mouth. In the letter he wrote to Yi Lin, he said that he was living a very hard life. If the other two knew that he was eating and drinking well, it would be a self-destructive move. Hearing that he had had a very hard trip, Jessica and Yi Lin said that they would eat and rest later. They would give him a massage. The kind and honest brother refused this tempting offer. Late at night, Tan Thien sat in his private room on the boat. Although his eyes were already dark, he had to list the amount of supplies he had collected. He felt that the problem of food was not a problem anymore. Tan Thien yawned. He was very tired and sleepy. He decided that he would rest for a day and set off for the egg laboratory the next day. It was time to set off. They were about to cross the time-space storm area. Atar felt that the storm was a bit strange, but Tan Thien said that it would only affect them a little. They returned to the room, sat down, and then rushed through it. Po Xiao once again entered the time-space storm area. As before, Tan Thien directed the tribe, while Jessica steered the boat. After a while, Po Xiao also passed through the time-space storm. Tan Thien saw that everyone was not in chaos this time, and had made progress. Qatar said that everyone had been through it twice, so they were used to it. But Qatar wondered why Tan Thien had suddenly gathered everyone here. Tan Thien said that he had something good for everyone. Tan Thien raised his hand with the ring on it, and Huang Yishu appeared, surprising everyone. As soon as she appeared, she teased Tan Thien, saying that the boat was so shaky and that he was holding someone in his arms. Be careful not to get kidney pain. It made everyone blush. Jessica saw Huang Yishu and praised her for looking so attractive. The two of them seemed to have met an old friend and praised each other back and forth. Tan Thien saw that the two ladies were so enthusiastic that he told Huang Yishu to stop dawdling. Let's get to work. She opened the image of the Mayan city. At Tan Thien's request, she would open a time-space channel to send the Mayans back to their own time, and it would be shown on the screen. In the Mayan city, everything began to shake. Outside, everyone looked at the screen in surprise. Inside the city, the Mayans were also panicking because they didn't know what was happening. Everyone knelt down and talked about how the goddess would take them to a place with more abundant food. The pyramid was covered in a red light, and the energy core began to activate. From the laboratory, a beam of red light shot up into the sky creating a whirlwind with lightning bolts. When the Mayans saw this, they thought that the goddess was angry. Suddenly, one person was enveloped in the red light and pulled up into the sky. Then a second person was enveloped, 
and then many more people were enveloped in the red light and pulled up into the whirlwind. Then all the Mayans were pulled up, and the red light receded. The whirlwind gradually dissipated, and the sky returned to its original blue. Everyone who had been pulled away was gone, leaving only the objects that the Mayans had used. Tan Thien was watching intently on the screen when suddenly someone called out, Huang Yishu. Her body gradually faded away. Everyone was shocked and confused about what had happened to her. She said that her energy source was exhausted. She wished everyone a safe journey. She wanted to say many things to Tan Thien, but in the end, she only uttered a word of thanks. She thanked him for coming to find her during those days and spending her last lonely days with her for the past few hundred years. Then her body began to crumble. She told Tan Thien to take care of himself. The energy core was exhausted, and everything on the peninsula was plunged into darkness. Tan Thien told everyone not to worry. All the others had been taken to a better place by the goddess. He told everyone to disperse. Yi Lin, Jessica, and Nick saw Tan Thien standing there in a daze, looking out at the sea. Jessica said, he must be sad about Huang Yishu. Should we go and comfort him? Yi Lin said to leave him alone for now. In another place, the Mayans had been successfully transported. They didn't know where this was. Aya thought this was a new world. It looked quite similar to the place where they had lived before. Everyone suddenly realized that their tools were gone. They now realized that everything had been left behind. A Wu laughed and said, then let's start over. Meng Hu was shocked to learn that everything had been left behind. Aya, do you remember the five parables that Tan Thien told us on the way? We have to write them down quickly, or we'll forget them. The king stood up and declared that this was the place that the goddess had chosen for the Mayan tribe. They would build houses here and establish a nation based on their previous system, but they would abolish slavery. But for now, they didn't know what to do next. Suddenly, there was a thunderstorm and a heavy downpour. The king told them to take shelter from the rain first. There were banana trees on the other side. On the Po Shao boat, the children were playing with the wolves. Two of them were riding wolves, galloping and shouting that they would defeat the demon king. Yi Lin told them to slow down. Jessica thought that children really had a lot of energy. Jessica suddenly discovered something in the boat. Tan Thien was lying on the bed. He saw that his points in the system had increased slightly on this trip to Zone D3, but it was less than he had expected. Before entering Zone D3, he had 18,000 points. On the way to the city-state, he had bought two books, the Wilderness First Aid Encyclopedia and the Modern Technology Encyclopedia, which cost him 9,000 points. Then he invented rubber and a lamp, which earned him 3,000 points and 2,000 points, respectively. Then he invented quinine, which earned him another 7,000 points. After the battle with the fourth priest, he realized that it was necessary to change his talent. Otherwise, when he was in mortal danger, he wouldn't have time to change it. Tan Thien wanted to change to a talent that gave him the strength of an ox. At first, he thought that the best martial art in the world was speed, but after changing to the speed of a leopard and a cat, his speed was still not so fast that no one could catch up with him. He needed to improve further. He clicked on the mysterious item and saw that the explanatory book was sold separately. No wonder there was no explanation for the items in the system. It was all calculated, but he had to buy it. He could understand some of the talents, such as the sensitivity of a leopard and a cat, but he didn't know the effects of the others. Ding. Host has successfully purchased the item. Ding. Item is being distributed. Ding. Host has successfully received the item. Tan Thien lay down and held his head because every time he received information, his head would hurt. But this time, there was no pain. He checked the system and saw that it had changed. It cost less silver. After obtaining this talent, the host's recovery ability would increase exponentially when he had enough energy. At the same time, it could enhance some of his bodily functions. He had thought that this turtle breath art could block all of his aura. A skill that would prevent fast animals from detecting him. It turned out to be a talent for holding his breath. He found this talent very interesting. The unbreakable heart song could resist poison, but it cost 15,000 points, which was all of his assets. Tan Thien thought about it and decided to forget it. He would wait until he was in danger to change it. As for time, he would pay attention to it. Geometric shapes with the solution formulas for each ring appeared in the system. Tan Thien felt that this was not something that a simpleton like him could understand. He just needed to look at the geographical layout of Zone A1 of the Egg Laboratory. He decided to name the two rings. The one with the information would be called the Five Directions Ring, and the one with the defense mechanism that Huang Yishu had given him would be called the D3 Ring. The two rings could communicate like a telephone. In this world, the heaven-defying map was indeed very useful. Suddenly, the cup of water in his room shook. 
Tan Thien didn't know what was going on when Jessica announced over the loudspeaker on the boat. We are entering hyperspace. Speed is increasing rapidly. Please hold on tight. He didn't understand what was going on. Why is it a highway? He went up to the boat and asked Jessica what a highway was, but Yi Lin called Tan Thien over to watch. Tan Thien went over and saw a huge whirlpool. Jessica laughed and said that she had guessed that the two of them would have the same answer, but they were both wrong. She said that this was an ocean current, and it was a high-speed ocean current at that, 8 kilometers per hour. What he was seeing was the result of the extremely fast speed of the whirlpool. Tan Thien then remembered the definition of an ocean current from his geography lessons. Flow of water at a certain level with a stable speed and in a certain direction. It is a large-scale movement of water from one sea level or perpendicularly to another area. And it is the main form of movement of a water course. Now he understood. No wonder the ship was going so fast. The speed of the ship plus the speed of the fast ocean current was just right. This was worthy of being called a highway. A highway on the sea. Yi Lin thought that it would be good if the ocean current kept flowing towards zone A1. Jessica didn't think it would be that easy, but if it continued like this, they would be very lucky. They could reach their destination in just four months. Tan Thien told everyone to go back to the control room because it was too windy outside. When they went inside, Yi Lin finally understood why the Mayans had such a high level of civilization. Jessica knew about the Mayans from when D3 had gone back to the past to impart their knowledge. The Americas, the homeland of the Mayans, was where the Mayan civilization had flourished. Mayan civilization can be divided into three periods. The pre-classic period, the classic period, and the post-classic period. The classic period was the most glorious. Moreover, it was particularly glorious. There was no orderly development, so modern archaeology has made many speculations about Mayan civilization. Later, based on the murals of flying arrows and people from other dimensions, it was speculated that Mayan civilization came from outside of time and space. Mayan civilization was supported by aliens and so on. Speaking of this, Jessica felt very excited. Up to now, archaeologists still have not reached a consensus about the Mayans, but now she knew all the secrets inside. No wonder the Mayans had such a high level of development in astronomy. It turned out that their teachers were senior scientific researchers from the future. But she didn't know why their calendar was like that. Tan Thien said that their calendar was from the time of Huang Yishu, and that she came from the location of the major planets of their time, similar to ours. So there was a clear error. Therefore, the original calendar was a bit unsatisfactory. In order to adapt it to agricultural work and rest, she used scientific calculations to adjust the calendar. When she imparted her knowledge, she passed on this calendar, so this was the reason why the Mayan calendar was similar to ours but slightly different. Outside, Pakuma was on the lookout with binoculars when he saw a boat moving towards them in the distance. He immediately reported to Tan Thien that he had spotted a boat approaching. Tan Thien and the other two went outside to investigate. Jessica thought the boat looked familiar, as if she had seen it somewhere before. Tan Thien felt the same way. Jessica wondered if it was the ghost ship that the group had encountered before. Tan Thien saw that it was indeed that ship. Yi Lin didn't expect to see it again. Everyone gathered on the deck to watch. The chief didn't know what the black tubes were, so Tan Thien explained that they were large guns. Alex thought that the ship was too big and wondered how much manpower and money it would take to build such a large ship. Nick thought the ship was really cool. Pakuma looked through his binoculars and saw that this time he could see clearly. Could it be because the fog was no longer covering it? Nick thought so too. The last time, he couldn't see clearly no matter how hard he tried, but now he could see very clearly. There was a black flag on the other boat, with a skull on it. When the other two finished speaking, Tan Thien was also shocked. He realized that something was wrong. He immediately took out his binoculars and looked. He saw that it was just as Pakuma had said. This time, he could see very clearly. But no matter how he looked at it, the flag was a pirate flag. He told everyone to go back inside the boat and wait, and not to go outside. Jessica asked if there was any danger, but Tan Thien told her to just do as he said and he would explain later. Tan Thien told Qatar to prepare for battle and start the oars. He knew that these people were not here with good intentions. They had to escape quickly. Tan Thien suddenly noticed that the other boat had put out its oars and was chasing after the Fa Hu. Tan Thien didn't expect that they would actually chase them. Qatar didn't know why the ghost ship was chasing the Fa Hu. Nick thought that the people on the other boat were very different. She had never seen anyone so white before. When Tan Thien heard Nick, he took out his binoculars and looked. He saw that the people on the other boat were also looking at them. He thought that the people on the boat would be fierce and rude, 
but they were actually a group of well-dressed people with guns. It seemed that they were the commanding officers of the army, and they had a noble air about them. He wanted to observe them further. On the other boat, they also thought that Tan Thien's boat was a ghost ship. The men saw that the Fa Hu had oars and could move, which was truly miraculous. Perhaps it was possessed by evil spirits. The one-eyed man, Swat, cursed the ghost ship for only existing to cause trouble, but the captain, Charlie, said that he was not afraid of the ghosts on board. Hearing this, Swat laughed and said that he hoped Tan Thien's group would hear them and come over to them. At this moment, his eyes flashed with a fierce look as he said that he would show Tan Thien's group that the crossbows on the Fa Hu were nothing compared to his cannons. Captain Charlie said that Swat could not be so rude. If this boat was real, then they could not be forceful with it. This was a treasure ship. Swat did not understand why it was a treasure, but the captain said that if he gave this ship to the king, he would be rewarded with an ancient city. Swat was drinking a bottle of wine. He thought that life at sea was free and easy, but there were no women and he was about to go crazy. Charlie told him to hold on a little longer. Ghost ships were fake, so there would be no women. Tan Thien used his binoculars to observe and saw that the people on the other boat were talking, and in English. He knew that the boat in front of him was not an illusion, but a real boat. He had seen the projection of this boat before. This boat must have also seen the projection of his boat. He absolutely could not let them discover that the boat was now a real boat, not a ghost ship. He had to make the oars go as fast as they could. Charlie said that they would stop chasing. It was too boring. Tan Thien thought, thank goodness. All we have to do is stay quiet and leave quickly. Suddenly, Swat threw the bottle of wine heart. Tan Thien knew that something was wrong. The bottle flew over his head and landed on the deck, shattering into pieces. All three of them were shocked and surprised. Tan Thien shouted, get ready to defend. There's an enemy. Jessica didn't understand what was going on. He told Yi Lin and Jessica to speed up the boat as fast as they could and then turned and ran. Tan Thien called for Rana's group to prepare their crossbows for battle. Tan Thien also took aim. He had to gain the advantage first. At this moment, the one-eyed man, McQuirt, shouted, the ghost ship is real. He used his binoculars to observe and saw that Tan Thien's boat had women on board, so he called for his crew to speed up and head towards them. Tan Thien's group was surprised to see that their boat was getting faster and faster. Tan Thien's group had already started their engines at the highest level, but they could not shake them off. Tan Thien knew that they were outnumbered and that they often changed people in the middle of the road. The one-eyed man was very annoyed because Tan Thien's boat was getting faster and faster, and they could not hold out for long with just the manpower on board. Charlie said to stay calm, that there was no need to rush. He ordered someone to bring up the grappling hooks. He called for the crew to be brave, saying that the women and money would all be theirs. Let's see what you can do. The grappling hooks were set up and aimed at the Fahu. Tan Thien saw this and knew that something was wrong. The captain ordered them to fire, and a series of grappling hooks were shot out and flew towards the Fa Hu, then dug deep into the stern of the boat. Swat saw this and laughed happily. With the grappling hooks embedded in the boat, Tan Thien's group would not be able to escape. He ordered squads A and B to lock the chains, and the others to cover the flintlocks, and to seize the Fa Hu while they had the chance. Pakuma and Pahama had gone up to the deck to shoot down the enemies who were trying to climb up the grappling hooks onto the Fahu. Swat was furious when he saw this and ordered his men to shoot the men with flintlocks. Tan Thien saw this and shouted for everyone to run away. Everyone ran into the hold of the boat, and the other side began firing flintlocks at the Fahu. Tan Thien hid inside and saw that fortunately the flintlocks were not very powerful. The distance between the two boats was far, and the bullets fired could only penetrate one layer of wood. Yi Lin's group would probably be fine, so they would hide for now. Tan Thien had to discuss with everyone. Flintlocks took time to reload, and that was their chance. Nick and Katar were in charge of dealing with the men who were crawling along the chains to get to the Fa Hu. Akuma and Pahama found a good spot and took out the flintlocks. Suddenly, he heard another gunshot. Tan Thien was surprised because he always used his heartbeat to calculate the time. But how could the interval between the two shots be only a few seconds? Tan Thien suddenly realized that they had split into groups and were taking turns shooting, shortening the time to a minimum and creating absolute suppression. They wanted to chase them down and kill them all. Rana suggested that they had to remove their grappling hooks in order to escape. Akuma said that they didn't have enough time because they were about to come over. Tan Thien thought about the difference in numbers and the fact that their weapons were being suppressed. Once their boat was targeted, it would be over. Qatar decided to risk going outside to buy some time for everyone. Tan Thien decided that he would go out alone and told everyone to wait for his signal, which made everyone panic. Everyone wanted to go with him. 
Tan Thien went outside and raised his hand, which was wearing the ring. The ring glowed, and everyone wondered what it was. They thought it was the power of the shaman. Tan Thien put his hand forward and opened a shield that blocked a series of bullets. Tan Thien was glad that he could use the shield. Tan Thien called for Qatar and the others to follow him, saying that it was time to fight back. The whole group shouted in unison, and everyone charged forward. Qatar jumped out and used his shoulder to knock one of them away. Nick jumped up and unleashed a furious dragon's kick on another one. Pakuma shot one of them through the chest. The soldiers who rushed over saw that their comrades were dying too quickly and began to panic. One of them said that he wanted to go home to his mother because she was old and no one was taking care of her. Another one said, brother, please let me go. Consider this a mistake. Tan Thien was standing up and protecting everyone with his shield, but he realized that he could not defeat them with the power of the ship alone. We have to take this opportunity to scare them so badly that they never come back, or beat them so badly that they are bedridden, so that they will never think of coming back. Otherwise, the Fa Hu will be in danger. Inspired by the saying that Hai Fong is not a place for beating around the bush, Tan Thien told everyone not to go easy on them, just punch them to death for me. Captain Charlie, who was standing on the other side of the boat, saw that Tan Thien had opened a shield to protect himself from the bullets, and thought that his group was immortal. Swat said, you're not afraid of guns and bullets? Then we'll use something else. He ordered his men to prepare the cannons. The soldiers turned the cannons towards Tan Thien's group. He saw that it was dangerous and told everyone to be careful and hide behind him. They fired the cannons, and Tan Thien put up his shield to protect them, muttering that he had to block it. The cannonball hit the shield hard and bounced away. The force of the cannonball hitting the shield made Tan Thien's whole body go numb. After the shot, he ordered everyone to counterattack. A volley of arrows was fired, and two of the soldiers were pierced by arrows. Two arrows also hit the cannon gunner. Tan Thien felt that the shield was really good, as it could even block cannons. His hand was a little numb, but it was okay. He was rejoicing when the ring made a sound. He looked down and saw that the ring had run out of energy. Tan Thien saw that the current situation could not be resolved in the blink of an eye, so he had to think of another way. Tan Thien called for Aruba to bring the ring and continue to support him. Aruba said that he did not have any divine power, so how could he do it? Tan Thien said that it was okay, and that he would be back very soon. Tan Thien gave him the ring and ran away. He knew that Aruba was the weakest, but he could also act as a support for the defense and maintain his combat power. He went to open the door to Babo and Matt Trang's room and ran to a chicken coop, grabbed a chicken by the head, and asked it to help him. Then he tied three chickens together in a bunch. In the laboratory, Tan Thien placed the chicken's head on the floor and used a knife to draw a straight line. He placed the three chickens on three sides, with three straight lines intersecting in the middle. This was a trick he had learned from an old woman in his hometown. It was a very powerful move. It was not until university that he learned about this material. It was nothing more than an animal survival response. Using his integrity, he took out a small piece of wood and placed it on the heads of the three chickens. When he was finished, he felt that it was good. This way, he could create a table that could balance on a rocking boat. Then he smiled, because the next moment was the moment to witness the miracle. Tan Thien was also a little worried. He thought, don't be nervous. You can do it. Next to him, he had set up the laboratory equipment. He poured a solution from a test tube into a glass jar. First, he needed to prepare a solution of sodium carbonate in HNO3. Then he had to carefully add nitric acid, HNO3, first, and then add dry ice to control the temperature of the solution. At 20 degrees, he would then add sulfuric acid, H2SO4, and low temperature nitric acid, HNO3. Tan Thien saw that the mixed acid solution was ready, but the most important step was yet to come. Tan Thien nervously began adding glycerin. Tan Thien held the dropper over the glass jar. The acid mixture had to be handled with care. One drop every 10 seconds. There could be no mistakes. He thought that it would be better if he had a pipette, but he had only recently acquired the rubber and had no time to make one. Drop by drop, the solution dripped into the glass jar. Outside the boat, the battle was still raging, and one of the soldiers had fallen into the sea. Nick saw that Aruba was starting to get tired and asked him if he could hold on. Aruba said that he could hold on. Everyone, hurry up and wipe out the enemy. We can't let them get to us. Our people inside can't retreat. Pakuma encouraged everyone to persevere, saying that Tan Thien would definitely find a way. Inside the laboratory, Tan Thien had finally finished making it. The system announced, nitroglycerin successfully crafted, 10,000 points awarded. Tan Thien smiled as he looked at the glass jar. It smelled both alluring and dangerous. The liquid explosive that was famous all over the world was called nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin was very unstable in liquid form. Even a small amount of impact could cause it to explode. 
The separation process that came next had to be done with extreme caution. Tan Thien added the nitroglycerin and the acid mixture to a beaker of distilled water. In normal circumstances, oil would float on the surface of the water, but nitroglycerin was different. It would sink to the bottom. This was what separated it from the acid mixture below. The nitroglycerin had been extracted. Nitroglycerin was a major topic of discussion in modern industrial encyclopedias. However, due to its dangerous nature, it had not been synthesized until much later. If it was not stored carefully, it could easily explode. Adding nitroglycerin to a solution of sodium carbonate and a certain amount of vinegar would cause a reaction. This would make the nitroglycerin more stable. Although the effect was limited, it was better than nothing. Outside the ship, the pirates were firing cannonballs continuously. Aruba was exhausted, but he was still trying to hold on a little longer to wait for Tanthine. Swat saw this and laughed out loud. The spiritual power is about to give out. Keep firing the cannons and see how long it can hold out. On the other side, Captain Charlie was using a telescope to observe the battle. Hearing this, he spoke up and told him to take it easy. Don't forget that his woman is still on the ship. The two were talking when the captain suddenly noticed something. Tan Thien was running out of the Fahu. Aruba was overjoyed to see Tan Thien. Tan Thien said that everyone had done well, and that he would take care of the rest. He took the ring from Aruba's hand and activated the cheetah talent. He jumped off the boat and stood on the chain, holding a chicken in his hand. There was a bamboo tube tied to its head. I did a little research on why the explosive was placed in the chicken's head. It was because the chicken's head always faced forward and remained upright. It had excellent anti-shake capabilities, comparable to the expensive anti-shake equipment used by cameramen. Therefore, the unstable liquid placed in it would be less likely to be affected by shaking and explode. Han Thien used his cheetah speed to run quickly along the chain. The captain was shocked when he saw this and shouted for someone to stop Tan Thien, to shoot him down. Swat shouted, get out of here quickly. Then he also jumped onto the chain and ran out to stop Tan Thien. He was trying to show off his prowess. Before he could do anything, Tan Thien punched him in the mouth and he fell into the sea. Tan Thien continued to run forward and shouted, Westerners, your ancestors are here. Why don't you come out and greet me? He jumped onto the ship's railing and stood there, startling the soldiers who didn't know what Tan Thien wanted to do. He stood there observing the ship. He didn't know how long the energy shield would last, so he had to hurry. Tan Thien kicked the ship's railing and glided forward quickly, making it impossible for the crowd to stop him. They opened fire, but Tan Thien activated his protective shield to block the bullets. He broke the door and rushed into the ship's hold, running to the deepest level of the ship. This was the most important place. If this place was destroyed, the ship would be ruined. Tan Thien took a liquid-filled tube out of the bamboo tube and threw it into the explosive hold. Outside, Nick was startled when she saw the enemy ship explode. She was very worried about Tan Thien. Katar pointed and said, look, that's Tan Thien. He's opening his shield and falling into the water. Nick told everyone that she would go and save Tan Thien. She grabbed the rope and dived straight into the sea. When everyone heard the screams, they looked over and saw that the soldiers on the other side were trying to climb up the mast. They were afraid that if they fell, they would be caught in the whirlpool. One of the soldiers pushed his comrade off the mast and he fell straight into the whirlpool. Rana saw that the sinking ship was causing a whirlpool. He was afraid that Tan Thien would be swept away. He told Jessica to stop the boat. Tan Thien had fallen into the water. He also jumped into the sea to help. Jessica found that the boat was going too fast and she couldn't stop it. Deep Lamb ran over to help. The two of them prayed that nothing would happen to Tan Thien. Outside, Nick had gotten into the water and swum over to Tan Thien. She reached out her hand and told Tan Thien to grab it. She had caught Tan Thien's hand. The rope suddenly tightened and both of them were caught in the whirlpool. Tan Thien told Nick to let go of him. If she kept pulling, they would both die. But she refused to let go. Tan Thien saw that the whirlpool was so strong that it would be difficult for Nick to save him, let alone herself. Suddenly, Nick's hand slipped off the rope. She thought, this is it. I'm done for. Tan Thien grabbed her hand again. He pulled her into his protective shield with him. And so, the two of them were swept into the whirlpool. After drifting for a while, Tan Thien was awakened by the crowing of the chicken. He opened his eyes and saw Nick lying unconscious on his lap. He realized that the surroundings were very strange. He didn't know where he was. He woke Nick up. She woke up and felt a lot of pain in her hands from pulling Tan Thien out of the whirlpool. Tan Thien knew that the muscles and tendons in Nick's hands were injured. It was just pain now, but it would get worse if left untreated. He checked the wilderness first aid kit to see if there was a cure. Nick asked Tan Thien where they were, 
but Tan Thien didn't know either. But he was sure that this place was not safe at all. There was nothing here. The chances of survival were extremely low, so they had to leave as soon as possible. Tan Thien was fortunate that he still had the D3 ring, while the Five Directions ring was on the ship. He just needed to contact them to meet up. The ring beeped and he knew that Deep Lam had a signal. The two of them video called to ask Tan Thien and Nick if they were okay. They found out that the two of them were okay. He was also trying to contact everyone. Deep Lam was about to ask something when the signal suddenly cut off because the energy was exhausted. The protective shield also shattered and the two of them fell into the sea. Tan Thien hugged Nick and swam to shore. When they got to shore, they were both freezing. Tan Thien took Nick's hand and carried the chicken in the other hand and ran. He said that they had to leave immediately and couldn't stay there. Nick didn't know where they were going. Her nose was very uncomfortable. Tan Thien said that even if she was uncomfortable, she had to keep going. He knew that in a low temperature environment, the body would prioritize concentrating blood in the brain and heart to ensure the normal functioning of the physiological organs. Therefore, there would be less blood in the limbs. And the wind on the ice flow was dry and cold. In just a few minutes, the mucous membrane in the nasal cavity could dry out and crack. Now the blood had congealed from the cold, so it didn't flow out. But it wouldn't last long. If this continued, it would not be good. They needed to leave the snowfield quickly. This place had a polar climate. This type of climate was formed by the sea ice, the snowy area, and the forest and mountains inside. The forest and mountains were definitely the best places to stay alive, but they couldn't get there quickly. However, if they could just reach the snowy area, they could build a snow hut or dig a snow cave to avoid the cold wind. The two of them had been walking for a while, but they didn't know how much longer they would have to go. They were both so tired and cold that they didn't want to go on. Nick suddenly fainted. Tan Thien carried Nick and told her to hang on, they were almost there. She told him not to worry about her anymore. He told her not to faint because they were almost there. After a long walk, they finally reached the snowy area. Tan Thien gave Nick the chicken to hold so that she would be warmer, and he went to dig a cave. After a while of digging, he finally finished. He told Nick to come down quickly. Tan Thien said that the cave was a bit small, so they should rest for a while and then dig some more. Then the two of them started digging the snow to widen the cave. Nick sat inside and wondered why it was warmer inside the cave even though it was also made of snow. She asked Tan Thien why he had dug a hole in the middle. Tan Thien explained to her that with this hole, the cold air would go down and only the warm air would remain at the top. Moreover, snow had poor thermal conductivity, so the heat emitted from their bodies would be retained in the cave. The CO2 that they exhaled could also generate heat. Therefore, the snow cave was warmer than the outside. Nick didn't understand what thermal conductivity or CO2 was, but she could tell that the cave was really useful. She was already starting to feel a little warmer. She wanted to take off some of her clothes because she was too hot. Tan Thien was startled when he heard Nick say that. They had only just entered the cave and the temperature had only risen a little. How could she be hot? Could it be that she had hypothermia? Tan Thien grabbed Nick's hand and told her to stop. He had read in the wilderness first aid kit that in low temperature environments, people who were cold would feel their bodies heating up and then want to take off all their clothes to cool down. This was commonly known as the paradoxical undressing or hypothermia paradox, and it was a sign of impending death from cold. This phenomenon usually occurred when a person's body temperature dropped below 35 degrees Celsius. The human body would suddenly experience this sensation. Experts believed that when the body was too cold, the blood vessels to the limbs would constrict to prioritize sending blood to the vital organs. After the body had withstood the cold, the blood vessels would dilate again and blood would flow to the limbs, causing them to feel hot and even hallucinate. This was why people couldn't control themselves and took off their clothes. There was also another hypothesis that had been proposed, which was that the subconscious mind knew that it was about to die and so made the decision to take off its clothes so that death would come more quickly and less painfully. At this point, Nick couldn't bear it anymore. She felt like she was burning up. Tan Thien was trying to stop her. He thought of the lighter in his pocket. Fortunately, it was a flint lighter. He knew that this source of fire was very valuable now. But if he didn't use it now, he was afraid that there would be no chance to use it later. He took off his shirt, lit the lighter, and hugged Nick in his arms. After a while, Nick suddenly turned around and hugged Tan Thien. He told Nick not to touch him inappropriately. He took off his clothes not because he was thinking about something inappropriate, but because he was worried about their survival. In such freezing temperatures, if their clothes got wet with sweat, they would turn into blocks of ice in just a few minutes. At that time, not only would their clothes not be able to keep them warm, but they would also take away their body heat. Therefore, it was best to take off their clothes. But if it weren't for the sake of survival, 
neither he nor Nick would have gotten so close to each other. He didn't know how Nick would react when she woke up. Tan Thien secretly cried out to the heavens. Faced with this scene, how could his chicken bear it? As he was thinking wildly, Nick suddenly woke up, making him jump in surprise and tell her to listen to his explanation. Then Nick kissed Tan Thien. He felt that this was not right. He couldn't just ignore it. He hugged Nick and told her not to move. Finally, Nick fell asleep without causing any more trouble. Tan Thien sat in the cave and looked up, thinking. Their body temperatures were stable for now, but their limbs were still a bit cold. At least they wouldn't freeze to death, but it was still very cold. He had to find a new way. The next day, Tan Thien felt his neck was very sore. When he touched it with his hand, Nick also woke up. She screamed. She didn't know why she had so few clothes on. Tan Thien was about to explain when Nick, without thinking, threw herself into Tan Thien's arms and laughed happily. Tan Thien thought back to when they were on island number two. He didn't understand why he had become Nick's husband. At that time, he had to do that in order to protect Nick's safety. So he had never paid much attention to that status before, and he had forgotten about it later. But now it seemed that Nick had never forgotten about it. In fact, he had noticed it before, but he had just pretended not to notice. Because Deep Lamb and Jessica had already made him very tired. Besides, how could he stand a 1 by 3 broken stove? He would probably die of kidney failure or something. The thought of having three wives and four concubines was unimaginable. How could he possibly cut ties with those two now? He hadn't thought that Nick would be the same, but today had been a surprise. She had risked her life to save him. Thinking back, every time he had been in danger since they had met, she had been there. That night, when he wanted to explain to Nick, she said that she already knew that he had done it to keep her warm. She didn't think much of it. She thought she was just an ordinary person, so how could she compare to Deep Lamb and Jessica? Tan Thien hugged Nick and said that he had done it because he wanted to survive with her. Tan Thien hugged her tightly. Nick also hugged him happily. While Tan Thien was hugging Nick, he suddenly took out a shirt and told her to put it on. The ice water on the shirt had already melted, so she could put it on. The two of them finished putting on their clothes. Tan Thien said that moving around a bit would get their blood flowing and warm them up. Tan Thien felt very comfortable as he moved his body. Then Nick's stomach growled. Tan Thien took out the chicken that he had brought with him. He saw that it was getting late, so they should eat it now. Since there was nothing to start a fire with, he and Nick had to eat it raw. Tan Thien used a knife to cut open the chicken's stomach. He saw that it was very cold outside. If it was this cold, all the parasites would have frozen to death. This was no different from eating sushi. Nick saw Tan Thien cut open the chicken's stomach and was about to remove the organs when she asked him if he wasn't going to eat the organs. He explained that he couldn't eat them because there were often parasites in the organs that couldn't be seen with the naked eye. If they were eaten raw, it was best to avoid them. But if they were running out of energy, they could also be used as a last resort. Otherwise, it could also be used as bait to hunt animals. Nick's eyes lit up at the mention of wild animals. She wanted to meet an animal and kill it for food. Tan Thien said not to think that this snowy area was empty. Even though there weren't even any tree roots, animals still existed, such as leopard seals, snowbirds, arctic foxes, or the strongest species in the arctic, polar bears. Don't read it backwards. Tan Thien also wanted to try eating its meat to see what it tasted like. Because a polar bear's sense of smell was extremely sensitive, seven times that of a dog, it could find food even in the middle of this snowy wasteland. Therefore, it was extremely sensitive to the smell of blood. As for arctic foxes, they were omnivores, but their temperament was rather timid. Even if they smelled blood, they might not dare to come and investigate. However, polar bears were the strongest species on land. This was their home ground, so even if they met Tan Thien, they would be a little afraid. It was unknown if they would be able to eat him. He might even be a happy lunch for them. Nick saw that Tan Thien was a little stunned and asked him, Why aren't you eating? He said that he was not used to eating raw meat. He would just take a bite to get something in his stomach. Tan Thien took a bite and chewed, then immediately spat it out. He found that he really couldn't swallow it. Nick told him not to think about it and just eat it. Didn't he say that he was trying to survive? He held the raw chicken leg in his hand and thought that now was not the time to be picky. Tan Thien took a big bite. He tried to chew and swallow the meat, but he still couldn't get used to the feeling of eating raw meat. He was about to vomit the meat back out when Nick grabbed a handful of snow and stuffed it into Tan Thien's mouth, not letting him spit it out. She hugged him and said that he had to try, that he had to keep living, that he had to finish eating. Tan Thien suppressed his nausea and swallowed the meat. Outside, in the snow, gusts of cold wind were still blowing past Tan Thien's shelter. Tan Thien and Nick were both breathing heavily like buffaloes. They were trying to exercise to warm their bodies so that they wouldn't freeze to death. Tan Thien did push-ups, while Nick did sit-ups. 
Tan Thien felt that they had exercised enough. Now that their bodies were warm, the two of them would go outside and see what the situation was. The two of them looked outside and saw that it wasn't too cold, so they decided to explore the surroundings. Tan Thien held the chicken's organs in his hand and saw that they were frozen solid. He thought that keeping them might be useful. The two of them began to move away from their shelter to explore the surroundings. After walking for a while, Nick told Tan Thien that she felt like they were just marking time. Tan Thien said that because there was only white snow here and nothing else, it gave people that feeling. That was why many people gave up. He told Nick that the two of them still had to get out of here to find a chance to live. The two of them continued walking. After a while, Tan Thien rubbed his eyes. He felt that his eyes were uncomfortable. Nick saw that Tan Thien was acting strangely and asked him if he was okay. He told Nick to rest for a while. He saw that Nick's image was becoming blurry. He wondered if it was because his body was overexerting itself and not getting enough blood to his brain. Tan Thien sat down on a rock to rest. Nick worriedly asked Tan Thien if he was okay. Suddenly, Tan Thien saw Nick becoming even more blurry. His eyes began to lose all sight. Nick anxiously said that she would help him. Tan Thien told her not to worry because it was so desolate here that he couldn't have gone blind for no reason. He searched through the wilderness first aid encyclopedia to see what was wrong, and he found that this was snow blindness. It was caused by ultraviolet rays inflaming the cornea and conjunctival epithelium. The symptoms were photophobia, tearing, and inability to open the eyes. The time it takes to recover clear vision. If severe, the person will be temporarily blind. At this time, the person should go to a dark place or apply a cold towel to the face, and avoid looking at things. After a few days of rest, the person will be able to see again. If possible, breast milk or fresh cow's milk should be used as eye drops. Five to six drops each time, with each drop three to four minutes apart, which can relieve pain. In urgent cases, acupuncture or massage of the Zubaihi and Nigan acupoints can be used to relieve symptoms. It should also be noted that repeated snow blindness will weaken eyesight and lead to chronic eye diseases. And in severe cases, permanent blindness. Tan Thien was relieved to know that it would only last for a while. He bent down and used a knife to cut a piece of cloth from his pants. He gave it to Nick and told her to cover her eyes. Don't tie it too tightly. This cloth is linen and has large holes. If you tie it lightly, you'll be able to see. She didn't understand why she had to cover her eyes. So Tan Thien said that his eyes were already blind. Now I have to protect your eyes. I think this is the best way to avoid ultraviolet rays. He told Nick that from now on, she was his eyes. He would follow behind her. She would say stop, and he would stop. She would go in whatever direction she wanted, and he would go in that direction. Nick told him to rest assured and let her lead the way. He said that it would consume a lot of energy, but now the two of them had to exercise. By expending energy, they could fight the cold. If they didn't exercise, they would freeze to death here in less than 10 minutes. The two of them began to move. Tan Thien found that even though he couldn't see anything, the snow was quite soft, so he wasn't afraid of falling. However, if they encountered a wild beast, it would be very difficult. If they did, they would use the Silver Wolf's innate ability. That way, his eyes would recover in the shortest possible time. Tan Thien immediately opened the system. He saw that the system had appeared in his head. Even though he was temporarily blind, he could still see it. Tain. Announcement. Talent change successful. Silver Wolf's talent. When the host's body has sufficient energy, recovery will be easier to a certain extent. The host's physical fitness will also be improved. Tain. Starting to process the item. Tain. The host has successfully received the item. After receiving the item successfully, Tan Thien felt more comfortable. His whole body felt warm now, and his eyes didn't hurt as much anymore. The talent had taken effect, but his eyesight hadn't improved much yet. He realized that he had been thinking too far ahead. The list of items in the mall also clearly stated that this talent only helped to recover a small part, not as strong as the Wolverine. Nick noticed that Tan Thien was acting a little strange and asked him what was wrong. He said that it was nothing and to just keep going. Tan Thien felt that even though he couldn't fully recover, it had helped him improve his health quite a bit. He didn't have to worry about his chances of survival in the snow anymore. The sun was setting. A snowstorm was coming. He saw that the snow and wind were getting stronger, so he told Nick that they should stop for the day. They should find a place to spend the night first. The two of them had dug out a temporary shelter. Nick told Tan Thien that there was still a lot of time. The sun had just set, and they had to dig a deeper hole. Tan Thien hugged Nick and said that the two of them had to keep going like this. If they persevered, they would be able to get out of here. Nick also said that she believed in Tan Thien. Next morning, the two of them continued on their way. In the evening, they dug a shelter and exercised to warm their bodies. They hugged each other to sleep to keep
keep each other warm. Tan Thien's nose was a little red. He didn't know when he would finally be able to leave this place. Even though his talent had been strengthened, his health still couldn't hold up. His ears had been frostbitten from the very beginning, and then they had become stiff and swollen. Now they were ulcerated, crusted over, and blackened. Fortunately, there were no bacteria here, or his ears would have rotted away long ago. The snow blindness was gone, but now his nose was about to give out. Even with socks and shoes on, his feet were still freezing. The soles of his feet were the worst. Just a light touch was extremely painful. His skin was red and wrinkled, and when he touched the scales, they would fall off. When he put on clothes, those places would blister. That was just the external manifestation. When the temperature dropped so low, it disrupted normal physiological functions. Tan Thien could clearly feel that this body was getting weaker and weaker. His strength was dwindling. In particular, his stomach couldn't adapt to raw meat. Although Nick had been on island number two for many years, she still got frostbite in many places. Moreover, she had been injured before. The wounds were getting more and more serious. Her entire shoulder and arm were numb. Just a slight movement caused severe pain. She had a fever, chills, and a cold. Tan Thien and Nick were sleeping when they heard a loud noise. The two of them woke up and wondered what the noise was. They were worried because they were both much weaker now. Tan Thien didn't know if it was a snow fox or a wolf. The sound kept moving, but it was focused on the internal organs out there. It was obvious that it was attracted to the internal organs. He had to catch it and not let the internal organs go to waste. Outside, a beast was digging. The two of them prepared to fight. The polar bear is the largest land-based mammal. Its body is large and strong. When standing, it can reach 2.5 meters. Its head is smaller than that of other bears. Its ears are round and small, and its neck is slender. Its skin is black, but its fur is transparent, so it looks white. Some are yellow. It is tall and fierce. Each limb has five toes. The front feet are large and flat like paddles, suitable for walking on ice and diving in the sea. Living in a place where the water is frozen like the Arctic, sometimes they have to wait months for the ice to melt before they can go into the sea. Tan Thien didn't expect that this encounter would be with a polar bear. He had to use all his strength. As soon as the bear saw the two of them, it roared. Nick flew up and stabbed it twice in the stomach with her daggers. Tan Thien activated his cheetah talent, jumped behind it, and stabbed it once. However, because his body was too weak, he stabbed the bear in the head and it didn't even flinch. The bear was stabbed several times and became furious. It roared and charged at Nick, but fortunately, she managed to dodge it. Tan Thien flew up once again. He stabbed it once, but this bear had thick skin and fat. He couldn't stab it deeply. Tan Thien quickly retreated. The bear became even more furious and glared at Tan Thien. He threw a handful of snow in its face and told Nick to run quickly while Tan Thien acted as bait. He didn't expect that the polar bear, despite its large size, was so fast. If he didn't have his talent, he would have been slapped to death. If this went on, it wouldn't be good. He might end up being exhausted to death by the bear. So Tan Thien couldn't just run. He had to find a way to kill it before he became exhausted. He stood facing the charging bear. He activated his cat's reaction talent, and the polar bear was no match for him. Tan Thien slashed its eye, then circled behind it and slashed its back and chest several times. When it attacked, he retreated and dodged. Tan Thien found this method to be very effective. If he continued like this, he would be able to kill the bear here. It stood up straight and roared at Tan Thien, then turned and ran away. He saw that this shameless bear was pretending to be dead to deceive people. Tan Thien chased after the bear. It had eaten all of his food and still dared to run away. He had to kill it. If he could catch it, he would definitely not have to worry about food. Polar bear fur could be used as a blanket to protect against the cold. No matter what, Tan Thien would not let this shameless bear go. Tan Thien flew up and stabbed the bear in the side, causing it to roar in pain, but it continued to run away. He saw that it still had the strength to run, but at this moment, Nick had already run over. The bear suddenly turned around and used its head to ram Tan Thien, sending him flying backwards. He fell and lay on the snow. He thought, has this bear become a demon? It even knows how to pretend to be dead and then come back to life? The bear was already standing in front of Tan Thien. He knew that he was in danger and had to get up quickly, or else he might end up with cold feet on this trip. The bear raised its paw to attack Tan Thien, but Nick, standing behind him, threw a dagger at the bear and shouted at Tan Thien not to get hurt. The dagger flew and stabbed the bear in the eye. At this moment, Tan Thien had bought something from the system. He had bought the ox-like strength talent. He immediately activated the talent and punched the bear in the throat. It stood still for a moment, then fell on top of Tan Thien. Nick quickly ran over and pulled Tan Thien out, asking him if he was okay. He said he was fine. 
Fortunately, this was snow, or else he would have been crushed to death by the bear. He told Nick to quickly cut open its stomach. He and Nick took off their clothes and crawled into the bear's stomach. Nick felt very warm inside. He asked Nick if he was feeling better. Nick felt that his body was much better. Because the bear's body temperature was dropping, the two of them couldn't stay in here forever. Tan Thien told Nick to dig a snow cave for tonight. He would give her a gift, which made Nick curious about what it was. After giving her the gift, she asked him happily, was the gift he was talking about this? Tan Thien had made the bear's fur into a coat, gloves, and fur boots. Nick found these items to be very warm and praised Tan Thien's craftsmanship. He hadn't damaged a single piece of the fur. He said that as long as he understood the subcutaneous structure of the polar bear, he could do it smoothly. He also had one more thing, which was a large bear skin that he used as a blanket, and a lining made of bear fur. Today, they would use it to sleep soundly. Nick's arm had been injured while saving him. Plus, she had been living in a cold, snowy environment recently, and her body was probably reaching its limit. The two of them hugged each other and slept under the blanket. The next day, Tan Thien didn't expect that he had only fallen asleep for a short while, but he had slept for a day and a night. Nick found that her spirits were much better now, and the wounds caused by the cold were also getting better. Tan Thien asked Nick to open her mouth and then fed her something. She asked Tan Thien what it was, saying that it didn't taste good at all. He told her that it was the eye of a polar bear. It contained a lot of fatty acids, vitamins, and was made up of elastic, multi-element substances such as collagen. Lipids are good for the body. He closed his eyes, opened his mouth, and put it in his mouth. Immediately afterwards, his expression was not good at all and he even gave a thumbs up to show that it was very okay. Nick laughed and said that he looked so ugly now. He couldn't stand it either, so he vomited it out right away. He found that the taste was really terrible. Nick asked Tan Thien when they would continue on their journey. There was still a lot of meat left. Would they take all of it with them? Tan Thien thought that if possible, he would like to take it all, but this was impossible. In such a harsh environment, it was not wise to carry a load of one ton. They could only choose the best parts and take them with them. Besides, Nick was seriously injured, so the two of them could rest here until they recovered and then set off. Tan Thien had been tired for so long that he couldn't recover after sleeping for a day and a night. In fact, if he hadn't previously exchanged for the talent that was only inferior to the Silver Wolves and increased his recovery ability by ten times. Otherwise he would be like Nick, lying down and sleeping soundly. In order to deal with the polar bear earlier, Tan Thien had used 11,000 points to exchange for the talent of ox-like strength. Only then did he regain his strength when he was exhausted and finally pierced the polar bear's throat. It was slow to accumulate points, but fast to spend them like water. He checked out the mystery items. He saw the lifetime experience of a veteran hunter. Several experience packs cost only 1,000 points. He wondered why it was so cheap. He knew that these valuable experiences could reduce a lot of detours. But then he noticed something. The Snow Plains Experience Pack, the Snow Forest Experience Pack, and the Snow Mountain Experience Pack. These things should have been grouped together, but now they were being sold separately. The system treated him like an idiot. It was such a scam. But now this thing was a life-saving item, so he had to exchange it anyway. The system successfully purchased the item. The item began to activate and was transferred into Tan Thien's head. He found that it was indeed a good thing. After gaining experience, he realized many things. There were many places in the snow cave in front of him that could be improved. For example, changing the flat roof to a dome roof could make the snow cave more stable. To prevent the polar bear from attacking the base again, it was best to install an exit above. That way, he wouldn't have to worry about becoming a turtle in a jar anymore. Moreover, the location chosen to build the snow cave was not good. The snow that accumulated below was different from the snow that was formed by the wind blowing in the distance. The former was heavy and dense, while the latter was slightly less so. Tan Thien found that if he didn't need to save some points as a trump card, he would really want to exchange all those experience packs. The things in this experience pack were invaluable assets that a veteran hunter had experienced himself, not something that could be learned just by reading books. With these things, he had much more confidence in getting out of this snowfield. According to the Snow Plains Experience Pack, the best time to use ice houses and snow caves was no more than seven days. Otherwise there was a risk of collapse. He planned to stay here temporarily for seven days and then set off. After a while, Tan Thien and Nick finally started to move. The two of them were crossing the snowfield. He found that the further they went, the smaller the wind became. 
It seemed that the two of them were approaching the center. Now, with each step, the snow was up to their knees, making it extremely difficult to move. If only they had a sled. Tan Thien looked back at the vast, boundless snowfield. There wasn't even a single hair, so where could he find the materials to make a sled? He could only continue walking slowly and figure it out later. Two days later, Nick discovered something in front of them and told Tan Thien about it. He couldn't see anything. Nick turned to ask her if she thought she saw a tree. Was she hallucinating because she was feeling sad? Tan Thien was worried that the appearance of a garbage bag at this time was not a good sign. But when Tan Thien took a closer look, he saw that it was not a hallucination. There was indeed something in front of them. He called Nick to come over and take a look. When the two of them got closer, Nick saw that there was indeed a tree. And it was a dead tree. Tan Thien immediately hugged Nick and said, Finally, we've made it. Nick didn't understand what was going on. 